Long Witch Night. Book Two of the Red Witch Chronicles. Sammy Valentine. Long Witch Night is the second book of the Red Witch Chronicles, an urban fantasy series containing magic, paranormal adventure, and vampire mayhem, along with swearing, violence, and adult situations. Find the novelette epilogue, other exclusive reads, updates on my new books, and the skinny on the latest hot urban fantasy paranormal titles by subscribing to my newsletter at sammyvalentine.com, mailing list uh, dedicated to the few, the proud, the pigeon shifters, all rights reserved. No portion of this book may be reproduced in any form without permission from the publisher, except as permitted by U.S. copyright law. December 15th, 5.35 p.m., The Hollywood Hills, Los Angeles, California. Sunset shone over the Hollywood Hills into the bay windows. It cast a golden hue on the white piano and vintage couch in a cozy living room that would make an Instagram influencer sigh. Latin chanting broke the illusion. Hoc non est tebi, sus tempus abire tebi est, relinquam in pesi, reliqua. Red recited the exorcism at a specter who had overstayed their welcome. Just another day for a hunter's intern in the brotherhood of bards and heroes. The furious pinks of the sundown reflected on a bowl of holy water and a blessed silver cross on the coffee table. She held the battered leather journal higher to block the reflected light. It was easier to ignore than the celebrity looking over her shoulder. Vic Constantine whizzed past behind her in his wheelchair, holding a bundle of sage in one hand and a stick of Palo Santo in the other. The Korean hunter didn't look like your standard New Ager. Watchful brown eyes narrowed as he glanced around the white living room, his shaggy black mullet slicked back. He wore his fancy outfit, a blazer over his Led Zeppelin t-shirt. Usually, the hunter wore denim on denim and called it a day. He'd been hunting for over a decade, but never done a job for a movie star either. With the eight-year gap in her memories, Red was clueless about recent popular culture. It was her worst category at pub trivia. Yet even as Amnesia Girl, she had heard about Neve Morgan. It was hard to escape the blonde starlet's face smiling from magazine covers and truck stops and convenience stores. Red would rather focus on the dark, shadowy spirit in the corner. She was used to ghosts. Famous people, not so much. Did y'all feel it get colder in here, or is it just me? Navaye rubbed her neck, pushing her blonde hair off her shoulder. She shifted in her designer dress. Her husband, introduced as Steve but known to the world as DJ Shake, put an arm around her. Visible goosebumps rose on his dark skin below his rolled-up beige cashmere sleeves. His brown eyes widened. It's not just you, baby. We aren't alone. Red concentrated on the figure in the corner. With her nearsighted third eye, she couldn't see more than that it was tall. Trauma spiked from it. She might have been a witch, but she'd picked up only a few magic skills on the streets. Others might have been able to clearly see the spirit's form and other traces of paranormal activity in the room because of proper training. She saw elusive smudges in the air of varying colors unless something wanted her to see more. Obviously, this ghost was shy. According to their celebrity clients, it hadn't been last night. DJ Shake told them, with a repressed quaver, how the specter's silhouette ran screaming into their bedroom. The ghost had been bold enough to show sound and fury then. Vic joined Red in the chant, reciting the words from memory. Hey, I thought I said that if it was going to get freaky, they couldn't go all old priest and young priest in here. DJ Shake tried to keep his voice gruff, as befitting a rising West Coast rapper. The cover-up was more obvious than the temperature drop. It wasn't little blonde Nevie who dialed up some ghost busters. He had been the one to call Quinn Investigations. They need to take the Amityville horror outside. They can't, handsome. It's a ghost, not a mouse. Neve's southern accent grew stronger from fear. They're trying to send him into the light. Attention flickering, Red slowed her chant. Don't stop. 
Vic warned before he turned to the clients. Hey, this is a standard cleansing. We need to focus. The shadowy ghost in the corner began to take human shape. Chains on his wrists appeared first. Long loops of spectral metal drooped to the floor. A middle-aged black man in white antebellum clothes, rough and poorly made, stepped forward. Deathly weariness cut deep wrinkles into the man's forehead above darting eyes. Vic, are you seeing this too? She asked over her shoulder. Nevi screamed. Everyone is seeing it. Vic, shoulders squared and jaw clenched, set the extinguished Palo Santo stick on the coffee table. He rolled forward in his electric wheelchair. Red gave him the journal. There was a reason she was still an intern. She took too long for simple cleansings. He had way more experience. Let's get some true faith up in here then. Even as the air grew colder than Los Angeles had any right to be, the situation didn't feel dangerous. She could tell after a year of monster hunting that the spirit was one of those poor souls trapped between this world and the next. He had appeared when the couple bought an antique candlestick set salvaged from an abandoned Tennessee farmhouse. Is he... DJ Shake stumbled over his words. He's a slave. The chained man opened his mouth to speak, jowls trembling. His squinted gaze traveled over them to land first on Nevai and then on DJ Shake. He shook bound hands, yelling harder. His words might have boomed in the spirit plane, but they weren't even a whisper for the living. Vic chanted, his eyes focused on the ghost. Sweat beaded on his brow. He repeated the Latin banishment. Red leaned down to hover over the wheelchair. This was taking too long. He usually could bless confused spirits into the beyond with the best of them. She whispered so the clients couldn't hear. He's getting stronger. I see that, Vic snapped and chanted louder. The spirit glided toward DJ Shake, chains scraping against the wood floors. The glow emanating from his face highlighted the whites of his rolling eyes. He tried to raise his hands, but even in death the shackles stopped him. What are you trying to tell me, brother? DJ Shake stretched his arms out between them and the spirit. Stop. Vic only lowered his voice. Red looked over his shoulder at the book and started to chant the cleansing spell under her breath along with him. A spirit manifested to this degree could become unpredictable. They could either have a touching scene connecting two men across centuries or have a poltergeist trying to choke them. The ghost rumbled a trembling echo, as if dragged out of the beyond with all his might, yet his voice skipped like an old CD. The last words came out in a boom. You suffer self free. Yes, brother, we're all free. Lincoln did it. DJ Shake rested his hand on the spirit's shoulder, making contact as if it were flesh and bone instead of spectral matter. Neve called out from behind her husband. You can be, too. Go into the light, friend. With an unearthly clatter, the chains fell off the spirit's wrists, disappearing as they hit the ground. The long-dead slave looked down at his freed wrists. He stuck out his hand to DJ Shake. You're free, brother. Free. The rapper pulled the ghost into a hug. Red spoke the last line of the cleansing along with Vic. Releasing a deep breath, she wiped sweat off her brow. She lowered her sage tension fading from her shoulders, smiling at the haunted hallmark moment. A golden glow brighter than the sunset radiated in the living room before dissipating in a flash. DJ Shake blinked down at his empty arms. He sniffed, biting at his lip. Oh, Steve, you did it. You put that poor Saul to rest. Neve wrapped around her husband's waist, nuzzling his shoulder. Vic frowned, sitting on the edge of his wheelchair seat. They had heard that kind of talk before a private client decided to run out on a bill. This was why they preferred bounties from the Brotherhood. The bards always paid up. Smiling, Red whispered into Vic's ear. Don't worry, they paid in advance. Then let's get this over with before they start taking post-exorcism selfies. Vic sank back in his wheelchair. He went to speak to the couple to give them the sage and post-haunting directions. Red was happy to be the intern when it came to clients, even if it meant lugging the supplies. She gathered up the cross and put the journal in her leather hunter's kit. A lingering presence of mystical energy remained, but she wasn't worried. 
Vic did the exorcism after all. Usually ghosts didn't leave a stain, but she could imagine a tormented slave had more than its fair share of unfinished business. Paranormal activity could leave a residue in general. It was a lot of money and effort for an antique candlestick set. The brass candelabra adorned a bookshelf. Cute, but she wouldn't brave a ghost for it. Hopefully the famous couple had learned their lesson. By new. Haunted furniture aside, she liked how cozy the room looked. The gold records and framed posters of Nevy's movies popped in the otherwise light decor. It made her want to do something more with their place, even if the views were of the parking lot. Red had been slowly adding personal touches to the landlord-furnished apartment that she shared with Vic, but two months in, there were still stock photographs in the hanging picture frames. After so long on the road, she had the urge to nest. Something fluttered in the corner of her vision from the open archway to a dining room. The dark mass that made up the head did not have eyes, yet it watched the young couple hugging in the center of the room. It felt different from the other spirit. Only curiosity stemmed from it. Then the faceless shadow turned. Red felt the unseen probing stare like demanding fingers. It recognized her, too. December 15th, 6.05 p.m., the Hollywood Hills, Los Angeles, California. Red stared into the void. The void smiled back. It didn't have a face, but it had a presence. Indistinct shades of churning shadows hovered shapeless yet sentient between the living and the dining rooms. It stared at her like it knew her. She stepped back, the creepy realization drying her mouth. Smoke curls split the air between herself and the void. Vic wheeled ahead of Neve, Morgan, and DJ Shake, burning sage held high, instructing them on perimeter cleanses. The two celebrities walked past the archway with the lit herb bundles. The void disappeared. Red cocked her head, eyes darting. She squinted, trying to see auras to detect if it remained, but it only made her regular sight blurry. Paranoia chilled her hands. She knew it was her imagination. Weak shades were repelled by smudging. She hurried anyway, packing up the other hunter's kit and getting out of the house. The last hint of sun disappeared over the Pacific. City lights reflected on the dark, smoggy sky. Not a single heavenly constellation could be seen above the bungalow as she walked away from the two stars far closer to Earth. She pulled out the keys to the Millennium Falcon, the black van that used to be their home before they'd put down stakes in Los Angeles. Grinning, Red hopped into the driver's seat and waited for Vic to get onto the wheelchair lift. She tapped on the steering wheel along with Tom Petty's Running Down a Dream, playing on the classic rock station. The night was still early, and they had finished the only case on their docket. She had a couple of ideas on how to spend the rest of the night after she ditched her mentor. What's that smirk about? Vic asked, suspicion slowing his words, strapping his chair into place in the back. We're going to have to fill out paperwork. She flattened her smile, ducking her head, putting the van into reverse. Oh, just happy. Helped a spirit find peace. Met some of those beautiful people everyone keeps talking about. Sure, he snorted, watching her face through the rearview mirror. Has nothing to do with a certain vampire who probably just woke up and is heading into the office. Red turned onto a small road toward Mulholland Drive. She was grateful that the twilight hid her twitching grin at the mention of Lucas Crawford. Notorious sold vampire to some, potential boyfriend material to her. She had written in her hunter's journal that his punk leather coat hid a poet's heart. That was an entry that she hadn't shown Vic. She tried to steer the conversation to less embarrassing waters and brought up their boss. Quinn needs to learn to charge rich people more. Good save, Vic cackled, but you're right. Q needs to learn that a sliding scale can go up, too. Don't get me started, but since you mentioned him... His opinions about how Quinn investigations ran continued as they drove south through the Hollywood Hills. He might have started out as an intern there himself, but after running his own crews, she knew being an employee rankled him sometimes. Red didn't mind his venting. She let the road wash over her, marinating in that calm contentment after a job where no one got hurt, and they got their money up front. 
it wasn't often enough. Glittering beside the dark ocean, Los Angeles sprawled in the valley below. Tiny headlights of distant cars clogging the highways and streets traced out the arteries of the city. Traffic would be a bitch, but she still smiled. She had a home down there. Finally. The Millennium Falcon trekked down from the hills to a quiet Culver City street. Their creature of the night boss served hot coffee and cold justice for the supernatural stressed Angelino in a dingy office strip. Sandwiched between an Indian restaurant and a massage therapist, it didn't look like much from the outside, more like a place where you could get a payday cash advance. Red parked in a lot tucked behind the low building. Her smile wilted as she listened to Vic unstrap his wheelchair in the back. The Millennium Falcon used to be filled with beanbags, blankets, and wooden bullets. There were still wooden bullets, but the rest had been put away to make room. Seeing him in his chair made her wish she could slam a gardening hoe into Michel de Gramont's head again. The rogue master vampire might have gone to his final death, but she'd give a good chunk of her newfound inheritance to do him in again. Vic had warned her when she joined him. Life could change in a blink of an eye as a hunter. Stepping out of the van, she waited until the wheelchair was off the lift to click the van remote. A familiar motorcycle shined nearby, tempting her eyes away. She bit her lip to hide her smile. He whizzed ahead through the automatic door and opened the small office in the shared hall. Q, he called out before using his nickname for Lucas. Greg, we forgot to get you an autograph. Red checked out her reflection in a glass doorway and wiped off a bit of smudged mascara under her green eyes before letting her red hair down from its ponytail holder. She wished she had something nicer on instead of her usual hunting outfit of black tank top and jeans. Sensible, yes. Glamorous, no. Despite her new mysterious trust fund handled by Smith and Reaper, the creepiest bank in L.A., she still hadn't gone on a clothes shopping spree. She rolled her eyes at herself. What was she doing? Lucas had seen her covered in blood, the opposite of glamour. He knew what she looked like. She trotted into Quinn Investigations after Vic. The long desk in front of the wide windows had a typical pile of invoices and envelopes on it. Rolling cabinets and a couch lined the walls. Everything was in place but the vampires bickering with each other. Lucas usually slept in, but Quinn kept human hours. Red still hadn't figured out if he did that to maintain a semblance of human business hours, or it was the crippling guilt from centuries as the patriarch of a family of soulless vampires that even demons feared. A little from column A, column B, she supposed. There was a reason why the original soul-cursing spell had been invented for them. Lucas might have dressed like a punk with a mouth like one, but he felt the weight of two decades slaughtering the innocent, even after living more than a lifetime with a soul. She couldn't imagine the guilt Quinn carried from centuries of unrestrained bloodlust. Lucas? She stiffened when no one came out of the door to the private office leading to the basement apartment. They could hear you, right? Do you think Lucas is still sleeping? If he was here... He would already be mooning over you and trying to make with the Sid Vicious charm. Vic looked at the memo pad by the laptop on the desk. Looks like Cora Moon has them doing an investigation at a recording studio. Good deed for the neighborhood, or is she getting protection money? Hard to say, Red shrugged. The Supreme Master Vampire of Los Angeles fed the hungry and homeless in Inglewood, then turned around to torture her own best friend when Delilah had been falsely accused of a coup. Souls were a mixed bag and a demon. She furrowed her brow as she realized something. It takes away the exclusive fun of us seeing celebrities if they did too. Fuck yes, it does, he chuckled. She picked up a newspaper from the couch, then set it on the coffee table, betting it was Lucas who'd left it there, probably to annoy the older vampire. The entertainment section had fallen onto the floor. Their client, Nevaeh Morgan, smiled in black and white from the pages, under the headline, The Nightmare Before a Christmas Carol. She cleaned up the newspaper without skimming the gossip article. She'd had front row seats to the ghostly encounter. She didn't need to read about it. 
It was either inspired to generate clicks online or manipulated to uphold the secrecy of the Black Veil. Mage covens, shifter packs, vampire clans, and other supernatural creatures upheld the conspiracy to hoodwink the human public. Shakespeare's quote about there being more between heaven and earth was a cliché for a reason. After the fallout from the Blood Alliance's summit, she figured the vampire authorities were stamping down hard on the media in L.A. You'll have to tell me if Nevae and DJ Shake are more famous than whoever they see, she said. Fingers crossed, it's just a YouTuber. Vic pushed the rolling desk chair aside and fired up the desktop computer. He chatted as he typed. At least I can get this report done quick. Yeah, sounds good. She pulled out her phone and started writing a text message to Lucas. Finished the job in the hills. Went fine. Want to come by later? Did you hear me? She squinted as she tried to remember what he asked. Oh, yeah. Low main sounds good. Does everything sound good? He raised an eyebrow. I know who you're thinking of and texting on the clock. I won't rag on you because you pretty much filled out this form before we left. Standard ghosty, standard supplies. After the haunted Proctor house, it's hard to be too impressed by your run-of-the-mill specter. She shrugged. It wasn't that the supernatural didn't scare her. It was just that life as a hunter had raised her standard for spookiness. We had some good times in Oklahoma. Vic looked up at the ceiling with the dreamy expression of a romantic remembering a Parisian night. We both nearly died, and a werewolf exploded all over an ice cream parlor. Red put a hand on her hip. I couldn't have frozen yogurt for weeks. I walked away, though. He wrinkled his nose at the keyboard, then resumed typing furiously. She didn't reply or look away, hoping he would continue and let some of that grief out. Of course he didn't, not even to Quinn. Weeks ago, they might have saved Los Angeles, but that didn't mean they hadn't taken hits. She had been claimed by a notorious unsold vampire, Christoph Novak. Quinn had been tortured. Then there was Vic. He'd been a regular churchgoer with the kind of faith that could power a cross. When he cleansed a ghost from a room, it didn't linger around to give hugs. Until tonight. It was something she noted but wouldn't put into any report. You're getting the usual, then? Red asked instead of her real questions. They were best friends, but hunters weren't the touchy-feely type. She could only keep getting him out of the apartment and out of his own head. Staying in L.A. had its risks, but at least they had a chance to be a part of something for a while. Connect with friends longer than a dinner while passing through the same place on a bounty, have the time to put their clothes in drawers. She needed the stability, at least. He raised an eyebrow at her. Caught in a melancholy stare, she ducked her head and fiddled with her phone. They had ordered enough times from old Shanghai that her food delivery app already had options in the cart. She snuck a look at her notifications. No reply from Lucas. Vic had gotten territorial about writing the reports, so she went to clean up the mess of envelopes and paper in the inbox on the desk. She separated them into piles behind the computer. The first was bills for Quinn to pay, then invoices that needed to be filed. The last pile were the random letters that the two vampires received from what she presumed were ye old pen pals. Red hit a bill from Vic's physical therapy. He had been told that Cora Moon was paying for it, but Quinn, filled with guilt, had taken over the payments. Being a member of the Brotherhood of Bards and Heroes didn't come with health insurance. She shuffled through the next papers, sorting them quickly before she stopped and clutched at the last one. The area for the sender's address was blank except for a name. Celine. Her lips formed an O as it sunk in. That was Lucas's sire an ex-girlfriend. Apparently, he was still in contact with the sold vampire seer. That hadn't come up in any of their long talks. Red had opened the door to her life to Lucas, confessing to the monsters she had killed and the amnesia she still couldn't explain. She tried to rationalize it. She had only 15 months that she could remember. He had over 160 years of stories behind him. That took time. She set down the unopened letter. Don't worry about that crazy desert hermit. 
She probably just drew a picture of a cat with a man's face. I would guess in a creepy woodcut style. Vic rolled away from the computer. She's not just a nut. She's the whole peanut farm, even if her visions have been occasionally useful. Huh, yeah. Her laugh sounded dry and short to her own ears. Red had read about Lucas's sire. Before she died, Selene had been a hero, one of the special champions trained by bards to shield humanity from darkness. Heroes were one hell of a step up from common hunters. A portrait of a black-haired woman with far-seeing eyes came to mind, beautiful even in a low-res photo on BardNet, the Brotherhood's ancient web database of notorious demons. Let's hit the road. Vic passed her in his chair. Those losers won't be back until late. Sure, the takeout should come soon anyway. Another rewatch of the office? He held the door to the hallway open before locking it behind her. Red agreed to the TV show choice even as she looked over her shoulder. She tried to ignore her disappointment. Usually, she was happy when a vampire didn't show up. What a difference time could make. At their apartment, the Netflix marathon lasted longer than the Chinese takeout. She dozed off. Hearing Vic's electric wheelchair whirl behind the couch, she turned over on the cushions. The dream crept up on her like a shadow in the darkness. She sat up on the couch. The darkened living room had that surreal touch of sparkling twilight. Moonlight and the glow of the TV's screensaver bathed the furniture. She stretched, wondering if she had gotten the moon phase wrong. Wasn't it a new moon tonight? Scratching her side, her idle thoughts turned to wishing there were more tasty noodles left in her bowl. She blinked, finally realizing she wasn't alone. The white woman on the end of the couch was in a homemade dress that could have been a museum piece, its pattern faded from a lifetime of laboring in fields. Graying hair pulled up in a tight bun. She had a thin, weather-beaten face that Charles Dickens would have dubbed sensible. Dour, long wrinkles lined her worried mouth, but her smile warmed it up. Red wasn't alarmed to wake up next to a colonial sharecropper. It was a dream, after all. Benjamin Franklin might just ride up on a centaur next to tell her that hunger was the best pickle. She smiled at the bizarre offering from her sleeping subconscious. Hello, have we met before? We haven't yet been introduced, ma'am. The woman spoke with a lilting accent that made Red think of rolling green hills in Appalachia mixed with the flavors of England. She tried, but she couldn't place the accent. What's your name? Kate Batts, they call me, and they call you Red. She clasped her hands in her lap. The moonlight reflected off shiny burn marks on her arms. Healed in death, the raised skin, like a topographical map, spoke of a dark tale. You are a mage. I'm barely a witch. Waving her hand in dismissal, Red shook her head. She could do things like blessings and spirit cleansings, but she barely added more punch to the mix than a muggle like Vic. The good stuff only really popped out when she was facing certain death. I was once like you, Kate sighed, the sound rattling in her thin chest. Even in a dream, the other woman looked so real. A witch? Full of fear, the stranger put a hand over her own heart. You have the blood of cunning folk in you, old mages and wise witches, yet you resist it something fierce. I don't have anyone to learn from. Red looked away, pulling her legs up and wrapping her arms around them. When was the dream centaur coming? She didn't need a random figment of her subconscious criticizing her. It's also kind of a sensitive subject. She wanted to master her magic, but learning about Juniper St. James had dimmed the fire under her butt. Living with the idea of being the doppelganger of a vampire's long-dead courtesan was bad enough. Then finding out that Juniper had really been a dark witch who had cut through London on a revenge trip. That was enough to put anyone off the craft. You want answers? Kate gestured to the tidy living room filled with Ikea furniture lit by unnatural moon rays. You beckoned me to your home, young witch. Beckoned? Was this one of those supernatural dreams that Red would have to tell Vic about? 
or had her brain found a new wacky trick to make her anxious? Had it been too long since her last panic attack for her subconscious? There were a lot of ways to beckon spirits, and she hadn't done any of them. Had she accidentally mispronounced some Latin over some mysterious grimoires recently? Control over your destiny. That is what you seek. Resisting your power won't bring you that control. Kate rubbed the burns on her arms. Not until you understand how to use it. I don't want what could come with it. Red looked down, surprised at the truth coming out. Maybe it was the feeling of being in a dream that made her confess something she would never dare in the light of day. Or maybe it was just the feeling that Kate might understand. She had met more hunters than witches on the road. Were you the spirit that I saw in Neve's house? To was only my shadow. Your spirit gaze is too weak to see for good and true. She tapped the space between her own eyebrows, smiling gently. This is the eye you should use. The third eye, hers might as well have been blind. Red only saw nearly transparent blotches of auras, sigils, and other magical residues when she really focused. Or they were really powerful. How? Like a hound with a raccoon, you sink your teeth deep into this physical realm. The textures, the colors, the passage of time, they blind you, young'un. Your spirit gaze can't cut through the mundane to the mystical. Kate leaned in, the flicks of green in her brown eyes becoming clearer. Visualize that peeper in your brow. Imagine it fluttering open. Close them physical ones if you need to. I've tried this before. Red obeyed even as she groused. She could see vague mists and shadows through her third eye sometimes, but nothing like that kaleidoscope vision of spirits and sigils some mages claimed. When you are awake and resisting the call, I reckon, you are on the border to the dreamland. Your barriers are down. Kate's instructions sounded like they were given with a smile, as if she had taught many a novice before. Stubborn like a mule, you cling to the truths you see, not the ones you feel. Loosen the expectation of what is and allow yourself to see what could be. Red breathed deep and tried to relax. Magecraft started and ended with concentration in order to manipulate esoteric energy. Your intentions had to be clear. No wonder that her magic only obeyed sporadically like a willful teenager. A life spent dodging demons and collecting supernatural bounties made it hard to carve out the time to meditate and hone her focus. As Kate predicted, magic felt so much closer to the surface in this dream. Eyes still closed, she let her spirit gaze open. The shadows deepened as spectral mists in the living room grew brighter. The mists grew more defined, blazing like neon signs hanging on the walls, sigils, symbols of power and intent etched into the ether. She opened her real eyes. The sigils remained as if snapped onto her vision like a photography filter. The apartment, rented through a Smith & Reaper service for supernaturals, had been charmed to resist fire, burglary, and other threats. The spells never burned so brightly before. She turned to Kate to see how the other woman looked in the spirit gaze. You're curious about my true form? Red gasped at the swift transformation. Radiance shined through Kate's face, softening the toil lining her features. The rainbow flame swirling at her seven chakras outshone the sigils on the walls. Her green heart chakra pulsed brighter than the others. In the spirit gaze, her burn scars shined like silvery armor. She smiled. The brilliant display disappeared as if she had flipped a switch to leave only the facade of a colonial farm worker behind. It's a wee bit distracting. Look to yourself. Red glanced down at her own body. Oh, whoa. Her blue throat chakra looked like it needed dusting. The orange sacral chakra glimmered vividly at her navel. Smudges hung over the rest. Chagrined, she covered her dingy solar plexus chakra with her palm. Looks like I need to sage myself. Maybe take these out for dry cleaning. Kate chuckled. Concentrate on hiding them. You can, if you will it so. Focusing on pulling a mental curtain over her telltale chakras, Red closed her eyes. 
Excitement bubbled up. She hadn't really practiced her magic with anyone else. It was more fun than trying to decipher flowery grimoires. Reopening her eyes, she frowned. A faint glow still radiated from her torso. She poked her stomach. It's peeking out. Kate shook her head, eyebrows arched in amusement. No, that is your magic, sister witch. So that's where it's been hiding, next to my spleen. Red squinted at her belly. She concentrated on camouflaging her power, visualizing a curtain closing. It worked. This was so cool. You can see and be unseen. This is my gift to ye for freeing Dean. Kate smiled and gestured around the room. The knowledge is locked inside of you. I sense a library's worth. That binding on you is suppressing it, but it's still there. How do you know this about me? Red asked, taking the other woman's hands. They felt real. Another ghost told her once that she had come from a long line of witches. The old pilgrim, John Proctor, hadn't told her more than that her mother had run away from her own magical talents. The questions had haunted her worse than he had. Can you see more? What about my family? Then Red woke. She sat straight up. What was that? Had the woman really visited her? Had it been her imagination or an omen? Maybe it was dinner digesting weirdly. She looked around, expecting to see the woman still sitting on the couch. Kate? Red knew that she should have been creeped out. She'd had a conversation with a ghost that followed her home. Instead, she was simply curious. Looking around the living room, she saw the protection sigils as clearly as the TV screen. She shifted off her spirit gaze. Wow, some gift. The blinking notification on her phone distracted her. She picked it up from the coffee table, squinting as the artificial light blinded her. It was 5 a.m. She looked at the text message that had come in. It was from Kristoff Novak. Her cheeks warmed. Oh, Kristoff was a wild card. The undead entrepreneur had bitten and claimed her on the dance floor of his nightclub. Being claimed had the positive effect of keeping other vampires from attacking her. The negative was that by vampire law, he owned her. Novak hadn't acted like it. He had saved her life even when she'd been investigating him for the murder of a bard's daughter. After it all, he simply went back to Portland. Most unsold vampires would have dragged her back to their lair by now. Kristoff said he wasn't like other vampires. He was also another man that her doppelganger had twisted around her finger back in the Victorian age. It was complicated, more than complicated. Red should ignore him. She opened it anyway. How are you? I am in my cabin on Mount Hood, and we had a snowfall tonight. It made me think of you in sunny L.A. If you yearn for a white Christmas, you're always welcome in Oregon. The text message looks so normal. If a stranger had read it, they wouldn't have guessed it came from a master vampire who had killed rogue demons to defend her. The text message didn't unsettle her. Much like the dream, maybe it should have. It only made her wistful. She checked her other messages. Still no reply from the vampire that she really wanted to hear from. It felt weird to answer Kristoff's message, and not just because he didn't have a soul. Lucas was his sire, and there was little love between them. It didn't feel like a love triangle on her end, because she already made her choice, Lucas. She was still waiting on him to decide about her. The specter of Juniper St. James hung heavier than even the ghost she had cleansed earlier. She shot off a quick message to Kristoff. I'm fine. Thanks for the offer, but I am happy spending Christmas on the beach. I have enough ghosts here in L.A. without going back to Oregon. The second she sent it, she sighed at herself. That was stupid. The reply came back vampire fast. What's wrong? Did someone upset you? It was uncanny how he seemed to know her. Doppelganger shenanigans aside. By someone, Kristoff meant Lucas. He had told her not to trust his sire. He should have told her to not develop a crush. Then again, Vic had, and look how much she'd listened. Red typed, nothing is wrong, then deleted it. She paused, then typed, enjoy sunrise, thanks for the concern. She scowled and deleted it, then settled on. Try not to eat anyone. 
Good night. I have a she turned off her phone and tossed it on the other side of the couch. Putting her hand on her forehead, she fell back on the couch with a huff. She didn't need to think about how easy it was to talk to Kristoff or how much she wanted to talk to Lucas. Life was simpler before Los Angeles. Three, he sees you. December 16th, Sunset Hollywood, Los Angeles, California. A fabricated street rose from the movie set floor in a sterile Hollywood styling of Victorian London. Storefronts of fake brick and gray wood sponged with grime loomed over her. An actress in a checkered historical dress walked by, talking to a young woman in coveralls holding a paint can. Red stopped, gripping the strap of her boxy leather hunter's kit, and breathed deep. She knew it was all fake, but the historical accuracy brought up her doppelganger. Dark, remembered words echoed through her brain. Juniper St. James was one of the most powerful dark witches of her age. Ever since she had come to Los Angeles, that woman had been like a shadow. Vic looked back and stopped his electric wheelchair. What's up? She coughed to cover a slow reply. I've never been on a movie set before. It looks smaller than I would have expected. The grandeur is added in post-production, a British voice called out in confession, dripping with acidic wit. The shaman was a walking anachronism with his California tan, dangling crystal necklace, and sky-blue tunic shirt. Basil, you're giving away my secrets. A harried man followed in a designer suit, sunglasses propped on his head. Airy Goldstein... Director and current poltergeist victim. Hello. Red, lovely to see you. Basil pulled her into a hug and gave her a quick air kiss on both cheeks. The so-called Hollywood shaman had guided her through a ceremony that had unlocked some dreams, but nothing else from her amnesia. He had given her a freebie in exchange for a few IOUs. The piper had come to call. Again. Hopefully this time she wouldn't end up painting a room of his vacation house in Tahoe again. She hadn't realized when she made the deal it included manual labor. Vic rolled forward to give Basil a fist bump. Bansko, old bean, how's psychic tricks? Basil Bansko was the highest-priced shaman on the West Coast. Like most self-proclaimed shamans, he wasn't one, but unlike most, he had powers. He was a soul mancer, but shaman was a safer label to hide behind. Soul mancers had the power to sense, analyze, and influence souls. They could also curse a vampire better than any kind of mage. Over a century ago, most covens tried to recruit one. The first souling spell changed that by making them enemy number one for the undead. Even in a city ruled by a souled vampire, there were enough who wanted to stay soul-free. People like Basil had short lives if they were too chatty about their powers. Sweat dripping off his neck, Airy piped up in a panic that sounded straight out of Hell's Kitchen. Yeah, yeah, it's lovely to see everyone. I hate to break up the meet and greet, but this production is costing thousands a day and I can't get my cast anywhere near this part of the set. Reshoots are past due. My producers are about to chop my balls off. A Christmas Carol is becoming the nightmare before Christmas. Basil put a hand on his associate's shoulder. Ari is trying to save the day. I thought we'd gotten rid of the dead weight when I fired Neve. I'm still unraveling that mistake. Ari waved them over to go through the false storefront of Scrooge and Marley. Now, I have a fucking poltergeist throwing priceless antiques in every goddamn shot. Helen Mirren got hit in the face. Dame Helen Mirren! Red stepped up on the porch behind Basil and Ari. Her face fell as she realized Vic couldn't follow and turned on her heel to look at him in his wheelchair. Ari winced, his ears flushing. Sorry, it's not a handicap accessible set, even with Teeny Team in the cast. Cheek twitching, Vic nodded. His head lowered for a moment before frustrated eyes met hers. Resigned, he gestured her away. It's fine, give me the dirt later. She swallowed down her guilt. Vic hated his chair, but he hated pity more. Asking him how he felt would only make him feel worse. Stomach sinking, she trotted after the others into the darkened maze of set. Pointing at a hallway entrance, Ari rubbed his forehead with the other hand. He grimaced as if yearning for an antacid. 
That's where the sandbag fell through and nearly killed John C. Riley. Naturally, that is where we are going, Basil commented lightly. Leaving the store replica, Red followed them down the hallway, eyes darting up to see if there was another sandbag on the way. She peered around the wooden frames and set pieces using her third eye. Nothing but the usual flotsam of ether currents, natural energy from the environment itself. She snapped on her mundane vision. The spirit gaze made her feel spacey. Too many lights and energies twinkled in her side vision. When the three entered a far homier room, Basil waved her over to the center. You see, my dear, Ari is one of my private clients. I've cleansed his aura, but this situation with whatever is haunting the set is beyond my skills. Don't let him be modest. Ari flapped his hands in exaggerated indignation. He didn't just clear my aura. It was like I took both peyote and ayahuasca and my brain exploded. Loved it. I saw my path and most importantly, what I was doing wrong. The first part was Nevia Morgan. Hiring Emma Watson and getting the studio to agree to the reshoots was a bitch. Then I realized I needed to truly reconnect with my wife. Where did that crazy monkey love go? Er, yes? Basil put a hand on the director's arm, chagrined. The set has always had mysterious incidents, but the ferocity has truly escalated. Hiding her smirk at Basil's conversation redirect, she looked over the homespun quilt on the bed, antiques along the walls, and the battered family table in the center. This is the set of the Cratchit's home? You know your Christmas carol. Raising a brow, Basil narrowed his deep-set eyes. Curiosity bloomed on his thin, finely boned features. Just hoping for an autograph from Emma. Red smiled. Beyond the sporadic paint job, she had the feeling that Basil kept her number because he was still trying to figure her out. She was all ears when he did. Until then, they had a ghost loose on set. The walls were fake, but some of the furniture looked authentic, like a dinged-up wooden bureau in the corner. Where did this come from? Not a reproduction, is it? I think it was salvaged from a farmhouse in the south. That's the only one on the set. Cost us a mint. Ari waved an annoyed hand at the piece and turned away, covering his eyes with the other, as if imagining the out-of-control move budget. Our set designer got a deal at Cold Water Auctions. Country chic trended suddenly on set, so it was like Antiques Roadshow up in here with half the cast buying pieces. Even Navai Morgan? Red had the sickly feeling that she knew the answer. How many plantation ghosts were they going to have to cleanse? The hassle of tracking auction pieces could take weeks. That southern troll is from Tennessee, so, of course. Red quirked an eyebrow at Ari's bile. Nevi hadn't struck her as more than a ditzy actress, trying her best. She had almost forgiven her for ruining the adaptation of Jane Austen's Emma. She always seemed bubbly on the Today Show. She puts on a solid first 15, I'll give the little witch that. His lip curled. Sweet as cyanide when I had to recast her. She hid her judgment, feeling bad for Navai Morgan. No one liked to get fired, especially after dealing with a haunted set for weeks and a haunting at home. She had a haunting at her house coming from another antebellum antique. You'll need to keep an ear out. Others in the cast might have had a spectral visitor coming out of a wardrobe. He paled, grabbing his stomach as if the poltergeist was manifesting an ulcer. Ugh, God, that is just what I need. More freaked out actors. Basil clicked his tongue in sympathy, putting a hand on Ari's shoulder to guide him out into the hallway. Let's begin our work. Of course, bust some ghosts for me. Ari spun around and put his cell phone to his ear, then called over his shoulder. Namaste. Red flipped open her hunter's kit to peer at the sage, salt, and other tools of the trade. We did a standard cleansing at Neve's place. That ghost seemed a little less riled up than this one, but let's try it. You're really earning your IOU with this poltergeist. Basil's British accent disappeared, leaving only his natural voice, which held the tones of the Midwest instead of the Midlands. 
He must have been freaked if his accent had slipped. She was one of the few who knew Basil's real name was Kevin. The English demeanor was as much of an act as pretending to be a shaman. He told her once that the accent made it easier to disappear if the vampires caught on to him, and it added 10% more gravitas to client sessions. He'd increased his fee accordingly. She grinned. Back into character. Noted. He sniffed. Anyway, I can't get a bead on the energy. I'm used to living souls, but this feels very old. Older than Hollywood, for sure. Red closed her eyes, taking a deep breath. She opened them and tried to follow the directions Kate had given her in the dream, looking past the physical to focus on the vague shadows in the room's aura. She let herself relax into her third eye, the spirit gaze as Kate had called it. Like a knife wound on pale skin, the red sigil written on the bureau stood out once she could see it. Do you see that sigil right there? No, I can see souls, not sigils. Basil scowled, but then brightened, smiling. You're learning to harness your power? Red flattened her palm and shook it. In the rush of the day and hearing from him, she hadn't really thought about her dream visitor. Eh. Uh. She examined the bureau. Some sigils needed to be imbued with intention to ignite their power. Others could have consequences just by drawing them. She hadn't studied enough to recognize this one. It looks like a treble clef mixed with a hashtag. He rubbed his chin. That sounds like a personal sigil, not a traditional one. Don't tell me they salvaged furniture from some dead hoodoo priestess or something. She tried to keep the disquiet out of her voice. Basil wasn't a psychic, but he could read souls. It made him seem like a mind reader, even to those in the know. She didn't need him to read her soul this time. Despite her recent inheritance, she still winced at his prices. This might have been the cabinet she kept her supplies inside. Either way, let's get it out and torch it. Ari might not like that. He needs to buy less haunted furniture then. Red found a lift dolly in the corner and put it up to the bureau. Can the famous Hollywood shaman give me a hand? The heavy wood required them both to push the wheeled cart forward. It became tricky when they reached the fake porch on the street front of the set. She was glad the set was empty except for Vic. The bard watched them with the air of a man chewing popcorn and enjoying a movie. Wood bashed against her shins as they moved the antique from the dolly off the porch. Pain ripped up her leg. She tightened her grip on the slippery cabinet. Basil certainly didn't sound British when it knocked into his groin as they got it back on wheels. I think we've got more spirit connected to objects. Half the cast bought antiques from the same old townhouse that Nevier did. This is one of them, Red explained to Vic, puffing out an annoyed breath as she straightened the lift. Vic grinned, brown eyes sparkling with demented glee. I'm sure that the director won't mind if we torch it here. Can't risk taking it to the office. Ghosts hate vampires. Red eyed him, pressing her lips into a stern line. These were the times that she felt their roles of mentor and apprentice switch. For a trained bard, he could be such a big kid. Controlled burn, young man. He shot ahead, nearly popping a wheelie in his excitement. Deranged pyro. Basil winced, pushing the cursed cabinet. She looked at the soulmancer, biting the side of her cheek. Even if he had failed to uncover her memories, he had shaken something loose in her brain. She couldn't stop the words from tumbling out of her mouth. They leapt forward like hungry dogs. After the ceremony, I started having these dreams. I can't hold on to them, only flashes. But some of them are images from a time I couldn't have been in. You have an old soul. I wouldn't be surprised if you have a few past lives ready to pop up and say hello. The block on your conscious memories only gives your subconscious more room to maneuver. The old theory was that a vampire had mesmerized her to forget, not just the last few years, but her entire identity. Not all vampires had that dark gift, but the one that did must have packed a wallop. The current theory was evolving. Red just didn't like the direction. Do you really believe in that stuff? Reincarnation. Can someone really come back? Can they make themselves be reborn? Pushing the bureau out of the large door into the sunlit parking lot, she cringed at the last sentence, nearly whispering it. 
Michelle de Gremmel had captured her on the cusp of victory, risking everything because he believed she could bring back his lost love. The conviction still chilled red in her nightmares. It's beyond my pay grade to know how the average Joe can make themselves come back. But some spirits are too plucky to hop off the mortal coil. Basil wrinkled his nose, peering closer with a confidential air. Problems with a glamorous yet dramatic past life. I don't even know what kind of problems I have. Doppelganger, reincarnation, who knows? It's gotten more complicated since Nevada. It was complicated enough then for you to crash my vacation in Tahoe. He shot her a dry look before closing his eyes, lips pressing together. I can sense a vampire. No, two are involved. Then you have your worry with Vic. Vic glanced at them from yards away with matches and lighter fluid in his hands. Basil waved to the hunter, smile fixed. Hey, buddy. Forehead crinkling in confusion, he waved the matches back. Can't even explain the juju wafting off that guy, Basil murmured to Red. I could try? She shook her head, feeling like she was invading Vic's privacy. The man didn't even use Google. He was so paranoid. A soul reading would mortify him. Focus on me. You're an open book, girlfriend. Classic millennial trying to find herself. Basil grunted, pushing the dolly toward the center of the parking lot. You might not know who you are, but you can still be whoever you want to be. I started off as a farm boy in bumfuck Wisconsin. Now look at me. He finished the sentence in his natural accent before releasing his hold on the lift. He wiped his brow, retreating into his British facade. It's what we do that matters. Red nodded, digesting his words. She didn't know if he was worth as much as he charged, but she had to admit he knew the right things to say. Great pep talk, coach. Vic held up the bottle of lighter fluid. Let's get the fireworks started. Fire safety, people. We don't need to burn down the studio. Basil walked to a spigot and coiled hose on the wall while the other man squirted the flammable liquid on the cabinet. She pulled out a bundle of sage and lit it as she walked around. At any moment, the spirit could come back, sensing that the object attaching it to the material world was in danger. She had a cold iron dagger and salt in her kit ready for it. Cold iron could repel or bend a dark being, while the salt was to protect themselves. They didn't always have the luxury of sending a spirit to rest with a hug and a chant. Vic grinned, lit a match, and tossed it. Flames climbed the side of the wooden bureau. Red braced herself and looked around. No screaming ghosts or furious paranormal activity appeared to defend the cursed object. Spirits protected what anchored them to this realm. No howling skulls or ghostly chains appeared over the sigil. It merely burned. Normal smoke wafted off the expensive antique. She lifted an eyebrow. Huh. What the hell are you people doing? A husky security guard jogged over to them. This is wildfire country. She flinched, backing up from the blaze. Oh shit, Vic cursed, cringing and nearly dropping his matchbook. Go on. I'll take care of it. Basil flapped his hand. I'll let you know if anyone else in the cast complains about their interior design. They rushed off to the Millennium Falcon, leaving the increasingly indignant argument behind. She got the engine running as Vic rolled into the wheelchair lift and strapped his wheels in place. The van roared out of the studio lot to join the inching crush of L.A. traffic. Her heartbeat had evened out by their second red light. She called into the back. Could you look up this antique sale? It was through cold water auctions. After a few minutes, Vic let out a low whistle. She didn't like the sound of that. He wasn't impressed by much after spending most his life as a hunter. What is it? The farmhouse they salvaged the furniture from was in northwest Robertson County, Tennessee. It's near Red River. He whistled again. She peeked through the rearview mirror at him. Do we communicate in whistles now like dolphins? He slapped his knee, grinning. I think we're dealing with the Bell Witch. The Bell Witch, like in the movies? Red gripped the steering wheel tighter. The Bell Witch was to American mages what Dracula was to European vampires. A legend. She didn't even know the Bell Witch was real. Our third celebrity, his voice pitched up. 
Her cell phone buzzed in her pocket. She pulled it out and checked the text message. Well, isn't this a star-filled night? We're meeting another celebrity, a rapper. Quinn and Lucas are sending out the bat signal. 4. December 16th, 8.18 p.m., Long Mile Records, Inglewood, Los Angeles. Red knelt by a large, muscular man in the corner of a padded recording room in the back of Long Mile Records. White acoustic panels were splashed with what looked like the blood of the innocents. A broken mic lay next to a detached windscreen at her sneakers. She murmured nonsense words of comfort to the rapper known as Mr. Hyde, yo wife. Six foot three and over 250 pounds of muscle, he was recording a concept album based on the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde after a stint in the pokey on assault charges. Rolling Stone called him the next Tupac. Right now, Mr. Hyde cried for his mother. Sweat beaded on his dark skin. Black durag lay soaked on his head. White tank top stuck to his chest. He shook, tears streaming down the tattoos on his cheeks. I need like an army of popes or something. Satan is walking in Inglewood. Hey, hun, tell me what happened. I don't fucking know, lady. I was recording a track, everything was normal, and then it got so cold like the devil was breathing on my neck. He trembled before covering his face again, falling forward against her chest. Red huffed out a breath of surprise but hugged the man, patting his back. She spoke to Quinn and Lucas on the other side of the glass-strewn room. Usually it's the musicians trashing the place. Lucas stepped forward. The walls were still bleeding when we got here. His voice was serious, but his lips quirked up in a small smile for her. That smart mouth always looked ready to crack a snarky joke. Only his storm-gray eyes showed the conflict that marked him as having a soul. His black hair, usually tousled and falling into his eyes, lay flat and streaked with dried blood. He had mopped up the mess on his leather jacket, but the white shirt, tight over his lean stomach, was speckled underneath. The spirit turned on us before it disappeared. Quinn looked around. His spiked-up blonde hair had been spared, but the paranormal activity had taken a toll on his dark trench coat, still wet on his broad shoulders. A red smear lined his strong jaw. She nodded. Ghosts weren't the biggest fans of vampires. Their presence probably saved Mr. Hyde's life by turning the poltergeist's attention away. She tried to help him stand, but the large wrapper felt like dead weight. She asked Quinn, Help, we need to get him out of here. The blonde vampire knelt, putting Mr. Hyde's arm around his shoulder and took him out of the room. In the hallway, Vic talked to the shaken producer, whose formerly white suit would need to be burned, not dry cleaned. She stood, using on her third eye, but didn't see any sigils written on anything or even any antique furniture. Only framed records on the floor and knocked over equipment. Yet a spooky ooky vibe lingered over the recording studio, enhanced by the generous splashes of blood. The spectral aura felt the same as the one in Nevaeh's home. Hands in his pockets, Lucas stepped closer to her. Sorry to drag you two in on the job. We were just amping the spirit up. We're a team. This is what we do. Red tried not to burst out with her very unrelated question that had nothing to do with the case. She was hunting ghosts, not boys. Trying to keep a peevish tone out of her voice, she suspected she'd failed from the amused curl of his lip. I didn't text you back last night. He pulled his hand out of his pocket to run a nervous hand through his black hair, rocking back on his heels. It's fine. She ducked her head. It was easy to get worried in their line of work. Sometimes you never got to send that last text. Eyebrow lifting, Lucas caught her gaze. His mouth softened. He always looked at her like she was the only one in the room. No, it's not. Cora gave us a list of recording studios that all had the ghostly smash and dash. I didn't get back in until dawn. I figured it was too early to send a text. Red shrugged, not wanting to play the role of clinging girlfriend, especially since she technically wasn't one. I get it. What is it then, love? She rubbed her face, feeling like a stupid little girl, and laughed at herself. She had spent the last year avoiding pickup lines from hunters and highway honky-tonks. It was weird to want one to text her, especially a vampire. I don't mind if you bother me. 
growing sweet on me, are you? He chuckled and wrapped an arm around her. You're growing on me, all right. She rolled her eyes, even cuddling in, like algae growing on a sloth. Lucas leaned close, brushing his thumb across her cheek, but his expression grew curious. Why do you smell like smoke and lighter fluid? Vic opened the door and popped his head in. Hey, let's roll. She stepped away before impulsively taking Lucas's hand, his touch radiated up her arm. She blushed, looking behind her, leading them out. He grinned in that way that made her lungs flutter. So, Vic, did these guys get something at Coldwater Auctions? She asked. I got a gander with my spirit gaze, and the spectral traces seemed pretty similar to the movie lot. Spirit gaze? Lucas's expression grew remote, earlier warmth fading into mild concern. It's another word for third eye. She tapped her forehead, feeling a bit pretentious to use the old-fashioned term. He let go of her hand as they reached the front door of the recording studio. I've heard it before. She frowned Reedy to ask where. No, I don't think these guys are the antiquing type. Vic interrupted, leading them through the white and black modern decor of the front lobby of the studio, untouched by the supernatural ransacking. I asked the producer anyway. They did get some swag bags at an awards show. Coldwater Auctions was one of the sponsors. I don't know if they had any of the goods here. I already told Quinn about the Bell Witch angle. Red walked to the sidewalk. We need to go into research mode, see what could be setting the activity off. I thought you were focusing on the hunter bit, not as interested in magic anymore, Lucas asked from behind them, too casual to be completely casual. Vic puffed out a weary groan, mumbling to himself as he sped away at top speed. I'm not, but I can't turn it off. It's like turning off my sense of smell. She hung back, trying to still the defensive rays to her shoulders. He was always so weird about this topic. Hitching her thumb in her belt, she towed at the ground. Why? Just wondering. Hands in his pockets, Lucas held out the sides of his jacket with a shrug. Haven't seen you much outside of crime scenes this week. Last we talked, it wasn't about magic. You were agonizing over asking Vic to sponsor you in the Hunter's Challenge. Keep your voice down, Red flushed, nerves causing a half-shriek, half-giggle in her throat. She had been dreaming about joining the Brotherhood since she woke up in that Oregon hospital. Her name was a blank, but she wanted to be one of them. Amnesia hadn't snuffed out that knowledge. I haven't asked him yet. The Hunter's Challenge is a big thing. Technically, I've only been his intern, which isn't even a thing. I have to be sanctioned as his licensed apprentice first. She bit her lip, restraining a ramble about the bureaucracy involved in joining the Brotherhood of Bards and Heroes. It was why many hunters didn't bother being licensed. They just joined up with a bard-led team to get bounties or shared passwords to get access to the databases. I have to be prepared so he doesn't shoot me down again. You're ready. Lucas tucked a lock of hair behind her ear. You could be a proper bard if you wanted, if Vic could do it. The best of the bards mentored heroes, supernatural champions from half-fairy warriors to psychics. It required extensive study in one of the scattered libraries around the globe. Red loved reading and learning, but she didn't even know if she'd gone to college. Her cheeks burned in embarrassed excitement from the idea of being a bard. I don't know what Cora has you doing tonight, but why don't you come over after, if you want to? Lucas, Quinn called out from the convertible, pulling up to the curb. He shot a long, suffering glance at the younger vampire. It's a date. Lucas kissed her on the cheek, then hopped over the car door to slide into the passenger seat. She watched him go before Vic's yell drew her attention. The trip to the Millennium Falcon and then to home seemed to happen in the blink of an eye as she mulled over the problems with men and vampires. She had been so focused on settling in, building a routine, getting Vic up and running, and making life work in L.A. Maybe she needed a vacation. She couldn't remember ever having one, unless hiding out in the Constantine family cabin in Flagstaff counted. 
She finally had the money, but the time between cases always felt too short. Sitting out on her balcony after Vic had retreated into his room, Red sipped a glass of wine. Feet curled up on the padded bench, she looked over the courtyard of the apartment complex. She and Vic had been in research mode, which had included a horror movie. They figured it had as much truth in it as the folklore that they had read. The Bell Witch had become famous after the War of 1812 for tormenting the Bell family in Tennessee. Allegedly, Andrew Jackson had gone with troops to try to investigate the haunting. The facts were short and the fiction long. All agreed that she had more powers than your average ghost or even supercharged poltergeist. What the Bell Witch could do didn't match up with any other haunting they had seen before. Not even Bard Nett had much beyond a note that she existed, and the usual rumors. There was no clue on how she could have gotten to Los Angeles beyond being attached to the old Bell family home. Had the antique salvage awoken her from her ghostly slumber? After hours of staring at screens, Red needed a break. She already had enough rumbling through her mind. Hence, balcony and wine time, which nine out of ten hunters agreed was the best part of the night. Most didn't add a vampire love interest to the mix. Almost as if he'd been summoned by her thoughts, she sensed Lucas with that curious sixth sense of hers, as if she was always waiting for him to pop up. Warm relief spread through her like she had released a deep breath. His pale hand gripped the balcony rail, then he pulled himself up and over, smiling. Did I scare you? No. I knew you were coming before I saw you, she gestured to the wine bottle. I can get you a glass. I forgot to grab another one. Eyes twinkling, Lucas sat down next to her. I don't mind sharing with you. He reached out and twirled a lock of hair hanging down from her ponytail. His fingers brushing against her neck might have been cold, but suddenly Red felt hot. Smiling shyly, she gestured to her tank top and sweatpants. I figured that after all the excitement, we could chill. You're in time for the wine and pajama portion of my exciting evening. You look beautiful. His eyes crinkled, pained for a moment, as if staring into a mesmerizing sun. He glanced down, his voice confessional. It's hard to stay away. Then don't. You can climb up my balcony like Romeo anytime you want. Flushing at the compliment, she grinned. Until the neighbors start complaining about footprints in their window planters, then you'll have to use the front door like a normal person. The hazy lights of the city caught his high cheekbones in a way that made her breath catch. Six feet tall with a swimmer's build, Lucas wore black leather and denim well. It was hard to imagine him as the Victorian gentleman that he had been in life. He had been turned in his twenties before he could lose that boyish handsomeness. His eyes, gray like a turbulent sea, became serious. Red always felt like she could sense his emotions, as much as she could sense his presence. It made them a dangerous pair on a demon hunt. It also drew her to him after the monster had been defeated. Hey, what is it? I keep thinking, which I have been told isn't my strong suit, but I still do. He rubbed his thumb under her jaw. His gaze grew distant as the silence deepened. Rolling up on his motorcycle, he had been so cocky and brash when she'd first met him. The closer they became, the more she saw the vulnerability under the leather jacket. She put her hand on his cooler one, the temperature difference stark. Curiosity fluttered in her stomach. I have a few pennies if you want them for your thoughts. Keep them. I was a writer once. I should be able to say it plain. Communicate as you modern birds like. Lucas put his hands in his pockets and slouched with his legs out, touching the rail with his black Doc Martens, conflict in his expression as he composed his words. You're brilliant and young with so much potential for happiness. I'm nothing but chaos in your path. Jaw dropping, eyes stinging, Red looked down to collect herself. Unpacking that statement, there are a lot of compliments in the doom and gloom. You're a marvel. I'm the trouble, he insisted. Even in profile, the dread was clear on his face. She made herself look at him, but he wouldn't meet her eyes. Chewing on her lip, she didn't know how to express that he was right and still an idiot. Sure, he was sexy, dangerous, and had a past. 
Most of the hunters she met were two of the three. Sexy Ashley wasn't one of them. She wasn't asking to marry him, just date a bit. The life she chose was Chotik. It would be with or without him. Silence huddled over them. I've made trouble for myself. You're not adding that much. Red put her hand on his cheek to urge him to look at her. In fact, having a supernatural hottie to back me up in a fight is a plus. Supernatural hottie? Lucas smirked. You know how you look. Wagging her eyebrows, she checked him out. He had nailed the bad boy gone good look with his sensitive eyes and mischievous mouth. She cocked her head. That's not quite it, though. Tell me, is it something I did? Oh no, Red. You're better than I could have ever hoped for. He turned his head to kiss her hand. She smiled at the tingles radiating from her palm. Okay, then I'm awesome. What's the problem? That's the rutting problem. The smile they shared faded on his lips. His eyes darkened as his brows knitted together. He shook his head. After what I've done, you're too good. The soul part of me says to let you go, but the demon says to hold on until you realize your bleeding mistake. Hey, you're a bona fide hero. I've read the records. She spoke slowly, trying to gather her thoughts. The soul curse brought both empathy and guilt to the surface, but it didn't do more than chain the demon essence that animated vampiric bodies. They had all the same strength and hunger as before. They were simply more conflicted about their condition. She knew Lucas felt it keenly, even if he played it off. Sure, you were a real bastard for the first 20 years, but then you spent more than a lifetime helping people. You saved the world. That last time, I was just cleaning up a mess that my bloodline caused in Oregon. Alaric was like my great-granddad, had to help put him down. He held her hand in his and rubbed his thumb on her wrist, his stormy gaze drawing her in. Doesn't really count. Red swallowed, trying not to be distracted by his touch. What are you worried about? It's not worries, it's fear. Stinky, soul-fueled fear. Curling his lip, Lucas shook his head and pulled back to cross his arms. I'm scared that I am choosing my happiness over yours. You deserve more. How about I decide what I deserve? It's a crazy notion that women can choose. I know. She held her eye roll in, but the snark came out. They hadn't even gone on a proper date. Unless all the hunts including dodging some overseas at Pixies and making out by the Hollywood sin counted as a date. If it did, they were some of her best. Red bumped his shoulder with hers as they sat on the bench. Her tense brow softened as she leaned against him. He might have been a century older than her, but this was just as confusing for him, too. Silent, she cuddled against him, tucked in a balcony oasis as Los Angeles settled in for the evening. The words slipped out lulled by the quiet of the night. I choose you. I get the feeling that I'll always want to. What if that's a mistake that you keep making over and over? His eyes widened as if Lucas hadn't meant to say it out loud. Neck heating and throat tightening, she glanced down. Juniper had been his courtesan for nearly eight long years in the 1890s. Red had known him for weeks. It was hard to not feel like she was in a love triangle competing with a ghost. He had broken their unspoken rule about not discussing the possibility that she was more than a doppelganger. They both had reasons to fear that possibility. Why did he? Was it because of the heartbreak of how he lost Juniper, or the guilt over how he almost turned her himself? Those were dark questions from a darker past. After battling shadows all day, Red was sick of it. They deserved their happiness. Hunters only knew it briefly, after all. They both needed to know that this was different. They were different. If it's a mistake, I'll own up to it. She squeezed his hand. I haven't ever liked someone and been in one place long enough to see where it could go. That I know of, anyway. I'm willing to take the risk if you are. Cocking her head, Red tried to keep her face neutral, even as her chest panged. If he wanted out of whatever relationship they had, then she'd give him an out. I understand if this is too much and you want me to back off. We can cut our losses and ride out a few weeks of awkwardness in the office. No. 
gaze fervent, Lucas brought her hand back to his cheek. He nuzzled against her touch. Her stomach tightened. Lips flickering in a half-smile, she broke her own rule. What if we get it right this time? What if we do? Eyes wide, he kissed her palm. The dreaminess in his gaze darkened. He sighed, putting down her hand, and slumped back. You don't get it. Mad, bad, and dangerous to know could have been written about me once upon a time. No worries. Once I get sick of you, I'll kick you to the curb, she said teasingly. That you would. Lucas glanced at her out of the corner of his eye, unclenching his jaw. A wry amusement dissolved the melancholy expression. He chuckled, then paused. What if it gets messy? Welcome to the modern world of relationships. I'm down for some mess. Red grinned, feeling the blush rise as she thought about what she was going to do. They'd had enough angst for one evening. Heart fluttering, she lifted herself up and straddled his lap, biting her lip. Her knees sunk into the cushion of the balcony bench. This feels right, doesn't it? He put his hands on her hips. Wonder twinkled in his gray eyes, even as anticipation lifted the corner of his mouth. Always does, love. She brushed her lips against his, kissing him slow, before he responded by deepening the embrace. Sucking at his bottom lip, she knew he could hear her heart racing as well as she could. Breaking away with a grin, she set her forehead against his. How about that? Hmm. He nodded as he ran his hands up her back, leaving sparks of electricity behind. Gazing into her eyes, his singular focus left them alone in the world. Then let yourself choose me. The words came out on a sigh as Red pressed against him, kissing him deeper. She shivered as his cold fingers caressed the skin exposed by her bunched-up tank top. Tingles gathered in a knot of heat inside her. She never felt like Juniper St. James, yet when she kissed Lucas, it always felt like she had done it before, even the first time. Their bodies moved together like old twin flames. More than the eerie coincidence of her looks, it was being with him that made her worry about the possibilities. She was done with worry for the night. Red, Lucas murmured against her lips, arms wrapped around her waist. Close the curtains if you're going to do that, Vic said from the doorway to the balcony, cringing like a brother accidentally walking in on his sister's date. Startled, she pulled back flames of mortification igniting on her cheeks. Sorry. You two are making me wish my eyes didn't work, too. Vic wheeled himself away to his room, muttering about a man not being able to drink in peace. Red giggled and leaned her head into the crook of Lucas's neck, assuming her face was red as a tomato. She didn't know if it was him or the embarrassment that kept her heart speeding. The timing. Finding us snogging like teenagers. His touch on her back became more thoughtful than lusty as his fingers traced smooth, unknowable patterns. She smiled, biting back a yawn and nuzzled against him, enjoying the little tingles he conjured on her skin. Her heart thumped loudly in her ears. His breath didn't rise in his chest, but she barely noticed the stillness in his body anymore. Keeps me young. That should be my line, Lucas stroked her hair. I can tell you're knackered. Biting back a sigh, she cuddled closer. She hadn't exactly invited him over for some Netflix and chill, which took on a new meaning with a vampire in the mix, but she had hoped for a bit. In baseball terms, they had been stalled at third base for weeks. Yeah, but you could still stay. I want to. His voice rumbled in his chest. I hear the butt in there. She lifted her head and pouted. I get the feeling that we'll have some sleepless nights ahead of us. That is fine with me, creature of the night and all, but you're a California girl now. You belong in the sunshine. He played with her hair, gaze warm, even if his touch was cold. You know I'm practically nocturnal. She kissed him again before she got off his lap, her muscles stiffening in resistance. If her body could talk, it would have been yelling at her to get back over there. The monsters might have been plentiful on the road, but not the suitable men. She put her hands on her hips. I'll let you escape my diabolical clutches for now. Standing, Lucas smirked. 
Sleep well. I'll dream of you. Red knew the line was cheesy when she said it, but it still felt true. She had dreamed of him before she met him. His brow furrowed, gaze growing hollow and distant before his focus snapped back to her, and a roguish smile locked on his face. The change was so sudden that she thought she'd imagined it. I hope they are sweet ones. Of course they will be. She tilted her head, a playful smile tugging on her lips. You know, you can use the front door. What fun would that be? Lucas swung himself over the balcony rail. Red looked over the edge onto the darkened courtyard of the pink-painted apartment complex. She knew he would have already disappeared into the night. Dreamily humming to herself, she turned around and gathered up her wine bottle and nearly empty glass before walking into the living room. A goofy smile yanked at her lips. Vic waited with the scandalized air of a disapproving matronly chaperone. Think that's still a good idea? She took the last gulp of wine before putting the glass into the dishwasher. Why wouldn't it be? I thought you two were friends. I have a lot of friends I wouldn't recommend dating, he frowned. Only one that I do. Stan, you should have done the second date. He owns a farm in Colorado. It's ideal for a zombie apocalypse. Ignoring yet another mention of Stan in his zombie-proof marijuana grow house, she reined in her sigh. Because Lucas is a vampire or because we work together? He has a soul, and there are couples who hunt together. She looked away, wincing. If we were a couple, which we're not officially. He jerked his hands up. I just don't want you to get hurt. Look at him. I invited him to stay, and he wouldn't. He's being a gentleman. Red gestured to herself, rolling her eyes. More than I am. Was he to Juniper St. James? Vic wheeled past her to pull a six-pack of IPA out of the fridge. She glowered. Hey, I'm not her. Does he know that? He asked over his shoulder before disappearing into his room. Red glared at the closed door. She already asked that question enough in her own head. She didn't need Vic picking up the tune. Seeing, she locked the balcony door and got ready for bed. She had told Lucas she would dream of him but she didn't know she had lied until she pulled the blankets over her. She reopened her eyes in a dream. Kate Bat sat on the end of her bed. Five. December 17th, 12.01 a.m., California Sunrise Apartments, Culver City, Los Angeles. Bright moonlight shone over the bed, casting shadows over Kate's thin, smiling face and gingham dress. It was how Red knew it was a dream. No moon hung over Los Angeles that night. Raising her knees up to her chest, she stared at the spirit who had very likely inspired vivid folklore and cheap horror movies. She pinched herself. It all felt real, even the pinch, but she still didn't wake up. What do you know of the Bell Witch? That is a false name. Kate shook her head. A weariness came over her features, like an actor being called their character's name instead of their own. In her frontier dress, she looked humbler than a legendary witch should be. Only the burn scars on her forearms hinted at a darker truth. It's not what I call myself. All signs pointed to the fact that Kate had power and was willing to use it terribly. Red didn't know why the ghost was being nice. The folksy demeanor could fall at any minute. Even so, she wasn't as afraid as she should be. There was something in the other woman's world-weary gaze, mix of light and dark in the aura. She chose her words carefully. We think it was the Bell Farmhouse. It's connected to all the hauntings. The fools should never have gone into that cursed place. Red couldn't argue with that logic. Raiding a haunted house was never a smart idea, even if it had authentic antiques and the original fixtures. That spirit that we sent away, you know, when you saw me. Who was he? Dean was a good man. His bondage should have ended long ago. Kate crossed the trinity over her chest and kissed her hand, raising the palm to the sky. He was a poor soul even before he died. Why was he trapped? Red leaned her chin on her palm. 
elbows on her folded knees. Because he had a use. We all had a use, the ghost whispered, her gaze dipping. A worry wrinkle deepened into a trench between her brows. Spirits can be valuable in the right hands. How can a witch use a spirit like that? Red asked. She knew of spirit craft, but pulling someone from the other side required strength. Finding one wasn't as easy as hitting up the local Walmart. You are unschooled in the ways of witchcraft. Tis queer, given the energy bubbling within you. Kate pursed her narrow lips, examining the area around Red's face, reading her aura. You ask about the Bell Witch, but how can you release her if you know not her ways? I never had a teacher, she said, trying to keep the defensiveness out of her voice. You learned many lessons, some harsher than others, if you could remember. Kate tapped the side of her head before shrugging. How much you want to remember is up to you, but know this, magic comes from within. A teacher only guides you to awaken it. To see what is possible, that is the hardest part. You can't be it until you see it. I've controlled the air. I've done that once with fire. Red smiled, thinking about how she had summoned a wall of fire against Michelle's forces, stopping a hail of bullets aimed right for her head. That was the highlight of her magic, and she didn't know how she had done it. Mortal fear had dragged the spectacle out of her. Her smile soured. I haven't been able to do it again. What you've done is brute force, wrenched out by self-preservation. You tire easily, don't you, child? Red nodded, rubbing an arm, looking down. When she did too much magic, she felt sick. Then she would have to wolf down food or take a run to settle her shaky energies. Calling raw fire instead of summoning an orb, it's using a rock on a nail instead of a hammer. I'm lucky if I can float a feather, let alone conjure an orb. Red huffed out a laugh. Magic is more than elements. So much more. Every culture on God's green earth has their own way, Kate said. There is a craft to fuel intention. You master your magic, then the relics, herbs, and tools. They become your beasts of burden. I've read books. Red glanced down, embarrassed. She had been thrown into the deep end as Vic's intern. He had a learn-on-the-go style of teaching. She had mostly thumbed through grimoires when in dire straits. The gaps in her knowledge were vast. When she had practiced the craft part of ritual magic, it felt like arranging a campfire without a flint to ignite it. You fear what you want, Sister Witch. It is why the energy refuses you. Kate's words took on a folksy earnestness. Pity mixed into the witch's brew that was her voice. You have this well of magic within, the deepest well that I have seen in a witch of your age. The capacity is there, but the magic is gone. Where did it go? That's what Basil said. Red curled her knees up tighter under the blanket. I don't know what, I don't know. But you do, you are more and less than you were. The memory is just locked up. That was done as a kindness, by the by. It's hard for me to sense the oddment surrounding you, but the veil covering your mind. Maybe later, you will see it as a mercy. Kate's forehead, tanned from labor in the sun, crinkled. It hurts this old soul to see a sister witch in such a condition. I don't know if I want to be a witch anymore. Few of us do at first. Kate smiled and gave Red's hand a small comforting squeeze. Her rough palm felt warm like she was alive. I remember crying the same to my ma. Red lifted her head, curiosity jolting through her. Do witches usually come from a family line? We do. It's in our blood, pumping through our core and in every fiber of our bodies. Kate put a hand on her own heart. Not all are like us. Mages can pop up in any family or skip through a line. You say you don't want the magic, but the true enemy you seek, she wanted it. That is what makes her dangerous. If she knew your potential, she would covet it something fierce. Yearning is her North Star. I feel that desire even here. What's her name? She has sworn all of her slaves to secrecy. For the first time, her face took a dark cast, giving a hint to the witch who tormented the Bell family. Dean wore steel chains. Mine are iron. 
How do we find her? She will find you. She seeks you even now, even if she doesn't know who you are. Kate intoned a dire warning. She will know you soon. Then she will come like a coonhound on the scent. Red opened her eyes, expecting moonlight, but only a high sun shone through the windows. Her phone buzzed next to her. She answered the phone with a sleepy croak. Hey! Wind chimes sounded in the background before Basil's voice boomed. Red, my huntress, I have a lead that I want you to follow on these hauntings. I tracked down some of the others who were at the auction. It's a real who's who, at least three with hauntings in the last month. I have a hunch. I detected some wicked external force, influencing some of them just like Airy. Anywho, wear a cocktail dress, I'll bring some sage, and we'll light it up. What's the address? Text you. Basil hung up. Goodbye to you, too. Yawning, she blinked the sleep from her eyes and scrolled through her phone notifications. She had another message, a single image of a cabin in a snowy forest. She still hadn't put Kristoff's phone number in her contacts, but she knew it was from him anyway. Her stomach churned as the dream came back to her. Red needed to tell Vic about the messages she was getting. Not from Kristoff, those text messages could fly under the radar, but the dreams weren't a secret she should keep. One spooky ghost dream could be thought of as a coincidence, but two? The Bell Witch wasn't alone. She said that there was a greater enemy. Were there two witches acting in sync on either side of the veil between worlds? The energy of the upcoming solstice, the longest night of the year, would boost that power. She admitted being an accomplice, only it seemed like she was trying to help Red. Groaning, Red rolled out of bed, already imagining how Vic might grouse at her. She got dressed, dreading her trek to the living room. The TV held her roommate's attention. Vic sat in his chair in pajamas, eating a bowl of cereal, his black mullet sticking up at all angles. His eyes were rimmed red. Old cigar smoke clung to him. He looked her up and down, surprised. You're dressed before noon on our day off? Did you go to sleep yet? She waved her hand, telling herself not to get distracted. Not important. You know how we cleanse that spirit from Neve Morgan's home? My legs don't work. My short-term memory is fine. Vic mumbled around a mouthful of cereal. I thought I saw another one there, but wasn't sure. Then I had a dream that night. Didn't think much of it. Until my dream visitor made another cameo last night. He tilted his head back, groaning. Oh, don't tell me you had a hitchhiker. Red shrugged, face heating as she beat herself up over the rookie mistake. Spirits could cling to objects people and places to anchor them in this realm. Some wandered more than others, attaching themselves to people. She should have taken precautions after leaving Neve Morgan's house, even after they had saged it. It was something that a real hunter would have done. It was the same woman, a witch who called herself Kate. He put the bowl on the coffee table and turned down the TV. Did she tell you what her last name was? Bats. I asked her about the Bell Witch, but she kind of sidestepped the question. She cringed, her gut twisted, knowing that everything was a red flag. <laughs> you know what some of the legends say about who the Bell Witch is? An old hag of a neighbor who fought with John Bell. Her name was Kate Batts. Vic ran a hand through his hair, the muscles in his neck tightening. I did the research on cold water auctions and narrowed down the house they got the antiques from. It fits all the folklore about the bell hauntings. She doesn't feel evil, Red insisted, even if her common sense agreed with him. She just had grown fond of the spirit. Even in a dream, it had felt so good to get questions about her power answered. She felt like less of a dunce about magic with Kate teaching her. Are you sure? Wasn't Kate like every other woman's name back in the day? There aren't any in the stories beyond the old lady bats. You're dreaming of the Bell Witch. Kate implied the Bell Witch is a red herring. Red pointed out, playing devil's advocate. The phrase could feel literal in their profession. She warned that there is someone else pulling the strings. It's like she's warning me. She says she's a slave. Slapping his spoon back in his bowl, milk splashing, 
Vic blew a raspberry. Not everyone is a little victim. She's fucking with you, trying to put on a poor me act. I'll hang a charm over my bed, try to block her. Vic leaned back, lips thinning as he shook his head. The bell witch feels a connection to you. Don't shut that down just yet. In the legends, the witch didn't harm all the members of the Bell family. She was kind to the mother and one of the sons. Are these lucid dreams? If it weren't for all the spectral moonlight, I'd swear I was awake. It was fuzzy around the edges, but my head was clear. She shrugged, pushing away her disquiet at being ghost bait. Before she visits again, I have another lead on the case. Basil invited me to a dinner tonight for the people who have been haunted. I could find out if they bought antiques or just pissed off someone supernatural. I doubt they'll have a ramp for me, so I won't bother ironing my Sunday jean jacket. Vic coughed out the self-deprecating comment, patting his chest. The rough night had hung dark circles under his eyes. Are you bringing Lucas? Red raised an eyebrow, her hand rising to her hip. The invite didn't say, bring your own vampire. I assume one will be provided. Under the stubble and hangover sweat, his features turned thoughtful. I'm serious. Basil has collected the Bell Witch's victims together for tapas. There could be sparks without adding the undead into the mix. Lowering her shoulders, she tried to keep herself cool and professional. She didn't want another tiff about her love life. No, I wasn't going to bring him. Basil came to me, not Quinn Investigations. I doubt he'd want vampires at his table, considering what he is. Good. You need to think about these things. This is the Bell Witch. A vampire's presence could piss her off enough to rip someone's face off. Red bit the inside of her cheek to keep from retorting sarcastically. This was Hunter Apprentice 101. I realize that. Do you? Because you're doing the footwork solo, in turn. I won't be there to regulate if you get sappy about your dream, buddy. Vic barked out. Red flushed, crossing her arms. In hindsight, she should have said something about Kate before, but she had plenty of weird dreams. It didn't mean she forgot the ghost rules. Besides, he was supposed to have exercised all the spirits at Nevaeh's house. She was going to ask him about sponsoring her in the Hunter's Challenge, but if he didn't even trust her with a dinner party... She swallowed back the hurt. I can do a dinner party on my own. We got a strong, independent woman over here, Vic mocked, rolling his eyes, then shook his head. A hunter puts their emotions aside. I don't want any fucking feels leaking into our cases now that we're staying in L.A. They're piling up like all the new Tupperware in the cupboard. What's wrong with the containers? Red lifted her chin. He shrugged, flashing a sullen glare around the living room, an attached kitchen which, in her opinion, was finally coming together. The apartment was pre-furnished, but for supernaturals. The furniture was right, but all she'd found in the kitchen drawers was a ball gag. She couldn't even show him what she'd found under the bathroom sink. After she bleached everything, she'd had to run to the store and outfit the place for humans. All she had done for weeks outside work was get them settled in L.A., finding doctors, running errands, and fishing gimp masks out of the drain. Now, she was working a case on her day off. Is this still about the Bell Witch? She asked. Vic grumbled, the mentally air fully dissolved into peevishness. If the shoe fits... You can run with it. Are you just going to drop some passive aggressiveness and get back to your breakfast beer? Red regretted the words once she said them. They were just fuel for the fire, but she couldn't stop herself from throwing on some more. Or do you have anything else to add? His side eye could have curdled milk. Yeah, it's a mistake to catch feels for my dipshit friend who sees you as another woman, since you asked. Did you really say that? Red shook her head, gritting her teeth, hurt wrestling with anger in her tight chest. He was making it sound like her and Lucas had been making out in the middle of a demon fight. They had shared kisses and some post-victory banter. The heavy petting was off the clock. Well, someone needs to say it. I went to college with him, or at least college parties with him. I know the guy. Ugh, I'm not saying this right. Vic groaned leaning his head back before he snapped to attention, eyes narrowed. 
Lucas is a liability to you. You're a novelty to him. What an asshole spin on it, she sputtered, heat rising in her ears. His words felt like a horse kick to the chest. It's reality, sister. You have a crush. He has nostalgia. Lucas is a damn fine hunter, but I don't get why that paranormal baggage isn't a deal breaker for you. Vic's eyes flashed, hands clenched his wheelchair's armrest. It's embarrassing. Eyes stinging and heart in her throat, Red grabbed her purse. I just can't with you right now. Picking up his cereal bowl, he huffed. Fine, go angst over Greg. She paused, fingers tightening on her purse strap. The hot spike of anger battled with her need to get Vic to talk about what was really bothering him. I get that. Physically, you're still in a lot of pain, hangover aside. You've got the right to be cranky, but you don't need to be a dick to me. I'm trying to make a life for us here. And it's smothering. He barked into his cereal, glaring at the floating marshmallows. We don't need more than what we came with. We must be ready. No pictures in the frames. How many trips to Target are you going to take to get bullshit and extra towels? Someone has to do that stuff, she swallowed, choked up at the strangled emotion in his tone. We're going to be here for a while, Vic. That means extra towels, routines, a spare key for the vampire boyfriend. He uses the balcony, she tried to joke, glancing away from his sneer. He bowed his head. I can't do anything if some dead fuck on a quest for revenge on Lucas breaks in. Or hell, some shifter coming against me. You piss off enough people, too. Why don't you see that? There's so much that can go wrong now. He snapped his head up, brows furrowing. What other dead thing is going to give you a sad story and get some kisses? The Bell Witch? Red jerked back. No. You're dreaming about her. Are you having sympathy for the devil all over the place now? Vic groaned, grabbing his forehead. His cereal slopped over the bowl's rim onto the floor. Let me clean that up. Sighing, she half turned towards the attached kitchen. Stop trying to organize everything. Glaring at the spill, he slapped the bowl back on the coffee table. Just listen to me, you're being fucking stupid. Red flushed, anger curling in her stomach at his accusations. She bit her lip on the mean words she could fling back and took a deep breath. You've got a lot on your chest, Vic. I want to be here for it, but if you're going to yell at me... She couldn't decide if he was criticizing her love life or her judgment more. Both stung like lemon squeezed into a fang bite. You know how I fight and why, but this isn't about that. She swept her arm out as if gesturing to their entire messed up situation. Whatever's going on, sleep it off. When you wake up, we can talk about what's really bothering you. Grabbing the van keys, she walked out, closing the door. Get more cereal! His muffled voice sounded through the wood. Red spun around and flipped off the door before stomping to the van. She battled traffic, running through the argument in her head before she even decided where to go. She called Basil, though she knew he probably charged by the minute. Hey, Oh, prancing Persephone, I can feel whatever is going on through the phone. Basil clicked his tongue. Where are you? I can meet you. She perked up. After that fight with Vic, she needed a session with a soul mancer. How much is it going to cost me? On the house, we're going to make a mint after cleansing all the rich and famous. She laughed, but it felt robotic. Vic's words still drummed in her ears. What a racket. Can you meet me at the pump house? Fun, a hunter's bar. We can slum it. Oh, you'll be able to get back to your roots. I die those, Basil laughed. I will see you there. Red slowed and took a right, already mentally mapping out her route east. She finally found a direction. The Millennium Falcon trudged through the lunch traffic before parking at a corner bar in an unassuming strip mall in Downey. The oldest hunter bar in L.A., the Pump House, was decked out in 1950s NASA memorabilia. America's race for the moon was preserved on dusty mounted coins and collectible posters. It served up home fries and tater tots to the lunch crowd. Red had given old Chuck the retired hunter sitting on his usual bar stool, a warning about their suspicions about the Bell Witch in the city. 
the gray-mustached hunter didn't have much to add. She bought him a coffee anyway and sat at a corner table to wait for Basil. The sallow-faced stoned waiter placed coffee and a plate of tater tots in front of her. Glancing from her phone, she smiled. I think you have the wrong table. Nah, those guys over there bought it, said something about killing a pirate. The waiter's brows pressed together. Whoa, hardcore lady. Red picked up a tater tot and raised in it salute to the group of hunters at the other table in the corner. Thanking the waiter, she gave him Basil's coffee order before digging into her potatoes of victory. She might have invited the Bellwitch home, but she did save L.A. That would have to matter to the Brotherhood when she applied for the hunter's challenge. She frowned, thinking about Vic. After that blow-up, she couldn't ask him to sponsor her now. While she was deep in thought, Basil sat across from her, wearing a yellow blazer with matching shorts. He stood out like a cockatoo among sparrows amid the hunters in plaid and denim. Nose raised like a beagle, he closed his eyes. So, it's Vic who's pissed you off, Lucas who is a dashing vampire love interest. I get that. Who is Kristoff? Why is that woodland cabin not a love shack? Red flushed, eyes darting around. She doubted she would get free tater tots if the other hunters knew about Novak. That's something to keep to yourself. A bad boy. I see. Your life has gotten more exciting than when we met at the ranch. Basil chuckled and grabbed a tater tot. He chewed it with his eyebrows raised in salacious anticipation. I know something is troubling you. I can feel it. However, so I don't just jump into telling you what to do. What did you want to talk about? Well, when I walked into L.A., it felt like cheers. All the vampires seemed to know me. Where does the woman come in? Basil sipped his coffee. I'm sensing a J name, but you're bunched up so tight. You need to ease up a bit if I'm going to be useful. You're not going to make me take psychedelics again? I thought it would lube up the works for a breakthrough. He shrugged, sniffing, clearly unrepentant. You can be sober, eating tater tots, and feeling sorry for yourself, too. I've worked with sadder sacks. You're right. I am a sad sack. Vic and I fought because... I really shouldn't complain about him. He's been through so much. He's struggling. He went from a hunter tracking down feral werewolves to being stuck in a chair doing research. I have no doubt it's making him a bitch to be around. He had a hair trigger on that tongue before. Basil lifted his coffee mug, and the rub of it is that you know there's some truth to whatever it is he said. Or at least you feel there could be. You don't know whose judgment to trust. It's certainly not your own. The trouble is that I look exactly like a woman from the past. Doppelganger? He put his hand to his mouth. Oh, honey, this wasn't like a Joan of Arc or even a Joan Crawford, was it? More like the type of witch that I would put down. Red leaned back in her chair, huffing. She tried to tell the supernatural soap opera in a way that made sense. I got these tater tots on the house because I helped defeat a big bad vampire. He twisted my head up before he went, though. Basil gazed into the distance, quipping lightly even as his expression darkened. Vampires are like drag queens. They come out at night and they like to get the last word. Red snorted. Worry chased the amusement away as she told him about her death-defying first weeks in Los Angeles. That's the scary thing about the memory loss, she said. I don't know what's normal. When I tried to scam Smith and Reaper and found I had an account there instead, I thought that was the break in the case. They even promised a mystery box in the mail from some shadowy vault. It's stuck in customs. The scan shows a necklace. No one knows what else. That's what I know about the real me. A necklace, some scars, and untraceable family money. What if I had a memory of family, but Juniper is coming through ripping it apart? First off, I'm not sensing a possession. You have a soul as seasoned as those tater tots. But I don't feel an ancient witch taking you over. Admittedly, if it was reincarnation, it wouldn't exactly be a possession. His eyes grew distant. Then he refocused on her, and as if realizing he should be more comforting, he flapped his hand. 
But I'd sense if something were sinister anyway. So what, you and Vic fought over this doppelganger situation? He didn't let her answer before he gasped. No, it was a boy. He thinks of you as a little sister, so I doubt there's romantic jealousy over the vampire. Lucas knew Juniper. They were... Red cringed at her word choice, but she didn't know what else to call a sordid human vampire affair in the Victorian era. Lovers. Oh, honey, I can see why Vic is getting the big brother grumpies over this. He wants you to date a nice hunter in plaid. Yes. I get it. He thinks I'm going to get hurt, but he has the emotional intelligence of an ill-tempered chihuahua right now. Her mouth screwed up at the memory of his implication that she was some kinky nostalgia to Lucas. She didn't need her own fears thrown back at her. Vic doesn't need to be such a dick about it. This pissed you off, but it's not what really scares you, Pumpkin. He called all your decisions out, didn't he? She glared. I don't need to pry. I'm not your therapist, but I can recommend one. Basil held his hands up. Now I told you that you aren't being possessed by an evil witch. I also don't detect any corruption in your soul. That's what really worried you. The relief felt like cold water on a hot day. Red could listen to him tell her she wasn't evil all day. She was about to make him tell her again when he rose from his chair. You're leaving? I have another appointment nearby. He looked down at her with the patience of a pet parent confronted by a puppy when leaving home. His forehead crinkled and he sighed. Darling, you're killing me. Okay, I will leave you with this. You can be a good witch just by being you. How's the line go? You're not good or nice just right. I have no idea what you're referencing, but it's good to hear. I think. Watch into the woods before you come to dinner. There will be a quiz before dessert. Basil smiled, wagging a stern finger. You're working tonight. Live a little. Do something normal. Remember, it's cocktail dress code. I will. She knew he would sense the lie, but she said it anyway. Even before the doppelganger shenanigans, she hadn't known how to be normal. A normal girl would have gone shopping and enjoyed her half day off. She would have just overanalyzed, zoning out in a mall, getting frustrated by the mysteries of dress shopping. Instead, Red went to see someone scarier than the Bell Witch, Delilah Burns. Six. December 17th, 5.03 p.m., DB Models Fashion District, Los Angeles. To the human world, DB Models was the oldest modeling agency in Los Angeles, handed down from mother to daughter. Delilah Burns hadn't so much as inherited the agency as founded it. A dragon in designer couture, she perched in a high-rise office in the fashion district for decades. She had been in Hollywood when the film industry relocated from New Jersey before the Roaring Twenties. Rumor had it, she suggested the move. Delilah had also clawed Red the last time she'd been blindsided. Sneaking into a nearly 400-year-old vampire's office wasn't how Red had planned on spending her day off. But finding a hobby was still on the build-a-life-in-L.A. to-do list. She crept past the front desk. The secretary stared at her phone, posing for a selfie at the computer. Red quickened her steps toward the back office, where a Chanel number no. five-scented immortal toiled above the city. Oh my god, Stephanie. <laughs> Closing her eyes and mouthing a curse, she spun on her heel. She tried to act like a breezy temp instead of a hunter, half regretting walking in. Linda! Linda Lee popped up from a bamboo cubicle in a rush of enthusiasm. The office manager of the agency knew her as Stephanie Connor, a mistakenly hired temp. She still sent emails asking if Red ever wanted to come back to work on their records. Are you here to see Delilah? Yes, it's early, but I hear she's working earlier these days. Awards season is around the corner and they always need models. Linda sighed with wistful longing. Please tell me you're asking for a job. Let's not jinx me. Red pointed to the tinted glass door leading to the hallway, where Delilah did business out of the glimpse of the sun. Linda held crossed fingers up, earnest yearning in her guileless eyes. Red forced a grin, walking away. She had a mixed history with the old vampiress that had nothing to do with temp work. Delilah had a soul, but the woman hadn't lost her bite. 
was being held captive together by Michelle, enough of a bonding experience to ask for a favor. She made sure to close the hallway door tightly behind her. I smell the dime store shampoo. The arch feminine voice beckoned her through the door at the end of the short hall. Don't let the light in when you enter. Creeping inside, Red shut the heavy door with both hands. She'd bet it was bulletproof. Turning around, she realized that she had never been inside Delilah's private domain. Oriental screens lined the length of one side of the office over the windows, illumined by floor lights. They blocked the famous L.A. sunshine and were probably timed to roll back after twilight. A white desk dominated half of the spacious office with the usual office equipment and chairs. The other side looked more like a diva's rococo boudoir, complete with fainting couch, chandelier, and a massive wardrobe that loomed like a general. Despite the dramatic decor, Delilah drew the eye in a scarlet dress, long blonde hair in a low ponytail rested over one shoulder, like a sneaking serpent. Glancing up from her laptop and papers, she leaned back in the white chair and crossed her legs. Linda didn't put deja vu on my agenda. I'm hoping you'll take a walk in, need some Hollywood dirt. Red put her hands in her pockets as she ambled forward. She tried to keep her heartbeat steady and breathing normal. Figured you knew where all the bodies are buried and who put them there. From the Black Dahlia on. Smirking, Delilah perched her smoky-lensed glasses on her slicked back hair. Flattery will get you far in this town, but I have an agency to run. Get to the point. Red had a lot of questions tumbling in her head from who the Bell Witch might target next to what the hell one wore to a Hollywood dinner party. The vampire might not have tossed her out yet, but they weren't braiding friendship bracelets anytime soon. I'm dealing with a poltergeist down at the set of the reboot of A Christmas Carol. We have some leads, but I want to make sure there isn't an old Hollywood tragedy we're overlooking. On Ari Goldstein's set, I thought Quinn's merry band of do-gooders were sent to care for Cora's pet musicians. Delilah pursed her lips before nodding to the chair in front of her desk. Red sat on the plush cushion unsurprised that Delilah knew about her boss's case. If it wasn't her ex-husband Quinn telling her, it was Cora Moon telling her during yoga. She was happy for the assumption that this was Quinn Investigations' business. Looks like all the spirits are gearing up for the solstice. Start busting them, then. I have a few girls waiting on a music video contract with Mr. Hyde. Everyone wants in on this new record. That's where your info comes in. Red had been over the sketchy evidence, but didn't understand why a ghost was targeting rappers and actresses. I already found out they're all new builds, from the set to the recording studios. But what about before? Cora invested in it so long ago, but I think the recording studio was a parking lot before. What about the movie set? Ari Goldstein was freaked. Do we have a frustrated starlet come back from the 1930s to raise hell? Helen Mirren was pummeled by a poltergeist. Not Helen! Delilah put her fingers on her chest, mouth gaping before Glacier Composure froze the slip of compassion. There was a fire at the studio back in the day, but no one died. Red nodded, unsettled. The vampire cleared a lot of possibilities. Now everything pointed to the Bell Witch and her mysterious master using the objects from the auction house to find their victims. Delilah's Ice Queen expression turned wistful. It was a magnificent set before, such lavish productions back when there was still glamour and mystery in Hollywood. I had a menage a trois with Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford there. Well, that's a special moment to share. Red moved the topic away from red carpet conquests. Mr. Hyde has a lot of press that we're still trawling TMZ for, but let's talk about the director. It's all coming up Academy Award nominations and accolades. You made it sound like, you know, Ari Goldstein. Got an idea of what could haunt his set or who would target it? Ari is a sweetheart despite the sailor's mouth. He tries to give every down-on-their-luck dreamer a shot, more than a few mediocre actors sent their kids to college because of him giving them bit parts. 
Delilah rolled her eyes to the side as if mystified by the generosity. I haven't even heard of him getting cross with anyone, and I have sent him some truly asinine models to work with. He was pretty steamed about Neve Morgan. He has been dragging around that scene chewer for a dog's age. Even saints have a snapping point. Delilah shrugged, leaning on the armrest. I was at one of his dinner parties, and a waiter dropped hot soup on him. He just kept saying, Namaste, no worries. Red shifted in her seat. Investigation was her wheelhouse Hollywood parties. Not so much. And a dinner party? She couldn't remember going to one. She had come here for the case, but if there was one thing that the vampire knew beyond starlet gossip was how to schmooze. Speaking of dinner parties, I was invited to one tonight. What's the small talk like? Do I need to know what fork to use? It's California. Just keep them talking about themselves. Her blue eyes scanned Red's outfit like the Terminator assessing an enemy. You're not wearing that, right? I need to go shopping. I was told cocktail dress. Red scratched her head, frowning. There is a purple and yellow dress that I liked. Delilah put a hand to her chest and closed her eyes, taking an unnecessary breath. You obviously can't be trusted with color. Crossbows, maybe. She marched to her wardrobe like a commander to the battlefield. Casting the wardrobe open, she smiled, stroking the hanging fabrics. This is my charitable act for the year, I'll have you know. We are close to the same size. The hunter shuffled behind her with the enthusiasm of a kid to the dentist chair. Red hair, pale skin, rough on dresses. What do we have? Delilah pulled out a flared lavender tube dress before wrinkling her nose, shaking her head and putting it back. She retrieved a mint green shift dress and nodded. This one. Red took the hanger and smiled. A knot of tension relaxed in her stomach. Oh, this is cute. What do I wear with it? Throw on some black sneakers, aviator sunglasses, and a leather jacket, then walk in like you're dating Mick Jagger. Delilah crossed her arms. Tell Airy I said hello. That's my cue? Red hung the dress over her arm. Delilah strode to her desk. Try not to wrinkle that dress on the way out. Thanks. Red stepped toward the door before looking back, a panicked thought popped into her heed. The vampire pulled her tinted glasses down and settled into her chair. Winged eyeliner, red lipstick. Cool, cool, I can do that. Red bit her lip as she left. She'd have to watch a makeup tutorial. But how hard could it be to get ready for a Hollywood party? Hours and multiple winged eyeliner attempts later, Red did her best shot at strutting like a rock star's girlfriend into the courtyard of Airy Goldstein's hillside mansion. Pillar candles lining the courtyard's path rose to her waist as she walked by arranged cacti, palms, and oleander. Carefully cultivated shadows between the garden lights gave an air of mystery to the collection of crystals spread over the long table. At least she was alone to settle her nerves. She might have looked the part of one of the beautiful people in Delilah's dress, but she didn't feel like one. Hocus pocus, Airy went all out. <laughs> she looked over her shoulder at the middle-aged bleached blonde who followed behind in a little black dress. Not the usual dinner party, huh? No, but my God, I could use a seance with all the spooky nonsense happening at my house. That doesn't even include my daughter's weird goth boyfriend. The woman held out her hand, smiling wide her even Botoxed forehead immobile. Shelby McGee, aren't you Leo's new girlfriend? No, wait, I think I saw you with Christoph Novak at Voltava. Something like that with, um, Leo. Red coughed, rubbing her upper arm before she changed the subject. Spooky like haunted? That's why Ari invited me. I haven't been able to sleep in weeks. Me too, Shelby gasped and put her hand to her cheek. I wish it were Casper, but I want to call an exorcist. I already have to deal with enough shit as a casting director. Did you work with Ari on A Christmas Carol? Red lowered her voice to sound more like she was dishing gossip than fishing for intel. John C. Riley nearly died on set. I heard about poor John. Shelby leaned in, taking the bait. Yes, I'm surprised that Airy even invited me after the whole Martha Cratchit debacle. I nearly lost my job after that hiring call. 
Now, I wish I had since the ghosts of Christmas followed me home. Red didn't have a chance to ask her what kind of mess Tiny Tim's sister could have gotten into. A chill tickled the back of her legs before the breeze whipped through the oleanders. The pink flowers trembled. Get down! What? A stronger gust blew through the courtyard. The window shook like a rattlesnake tail. Glass blew out of the second floor windows. Shards rocketed to the table below. The balcony door above the courtyard slammed open. Red pushed the other woman down into a crouch behind an oleander. Shelby pointed up. Ari! Yells echoing on the courtyard walls, Ari flailed, tumbling from the balcony, fingers clawing the air. His feet hit the table hard. The impact boomed like a machete to a coconut. He stumbled, falling backward, his head struck an amethyst with a terrible thudding squish. Dinner plates clattered and broke under his limp limbs. Shelby screamed, scooting back on her butt, hands waving, eyes fixated on the horror on the table. Red pulled away, cringing. She glanced up, using her spirit gaze. Basil lay on the balcony, his face half in view between the rail slats. A shadowy mass swirled above him. Call an ambulance! Red ran inside and up the stairs, following the mess of broken furniture and torn paintings to the second floor and down the hall to the right room. When her third eye focused, her shoulders sagged at the ghostly form hovered above Basil. Why? Kate bent over him, teeth bared, swinging a rough quartz to strike. She looked up, her mouth fell, eyelids lowering. She dropped the crystal paper weight beside his head and vanished. Running to Basil and dropping to her knees, Red pressed her hands against his bleeding head. In her panic, she couldn't turn off her third eye. She could only watch as his aura dimmed. Help! More dinner guests arrived before the cops did. She wouldn't leave Basil's side until the EMTs came with the stretcher. Soon enough, Detective Aisha Calloway showed up. She had flown in the helicopter, bringing back up to Moon Enterprises during Michelle's failed coup. It had brought her into Cora's orbit and guaranteed that if the LAPD was called to a spooky crime scene, she would be there. The young black detective gave out orders to the crime scene techs with the precision of General Patton despite the dark circles under her eyes. Red wasn't the only one grappling with nightmares. I'd ask how you are, but I can guess. The detective put a hand on Red's arm. Burnt orange aura was as down-to-earth and efficient as her demeanor. Her voice lowered. I have Cora Moon's so-called people breathing down my neck. I'd like it not to be literally. She'll already know the scoop. Of course she does. It's my actual boss I'm worried about. Tell me the real story so I know what to leave out of the report. Calloway's mouth pursed at end of the sentence and she looked down. Red sighed, looking over at the crime scene technicians walking through the courtyard. Poltergeist, you're going to have to leave a lot out. I'm getting better at it, the detective muttered. A lot has changed, huh? Red couldn't judge. They both had to walk the line with the supernatural. Too much. Aisha Calloway watched, lips hardened into a line, as a white-covered stretcher passed. Coming to terms with all this fairy tale nonsense was hard, but I was fighting these freaks. Now I'm covering it up, telling myself it's the lesser evil. There are enough shades of gray to make you think you're colorblind. Red shivered under her jacket. You can step away. Find a sleepy town in need of a sheriff. There is no quitting with these vampires. Calloway pulled out a small notepad. Let's get this farce over with. It should have been simpler with her there. The detective would be able to get Basil to a private hospital staffed by mage doctors and then let Red slip away from a night of police questioning. Red could be honest, say it was the Bell Witch. It wasn't simpler because she didn't want it to be true. Kate had stopped the onslaught when she called out. The witch had more slack in her chains than she let on. What else had she lied about? Maybe Vic was right, and Red was a sucker for a sob story. Red stared down at her bloody hands and the stains on her borrowed dress. Answering Detective Calloway's questions in a monotone voice, she couldn't stop the looping thought in her mind. How could the same soul who could teach magic with the patience of a mother be the same one who could fling a man off a balcony? 
Seven. Ein Sidi Ein Ha. December 17th, 1154 p.m., Quinn Investigations, Culver City, Los Angeles. As the witching hour approached, Red poured a salt circle on the bare front desk. The lights were low in Quinn Investigations, and the computer equipment, coffee supplies, and rolling filing cabinets were hidden in a storage closet. She concentrated on her intention to fuel the warding in the spell. Her focus felt scattered with the laser-like gazes on her. Vic perched in his chair like a professor ready to give a grade. Quinn leaned against the wall, arms folded. His typical emotionless expression was locked in place despite interested eyes darting around the ritual setup. Lucas paced. Midnight was minutes away. Red would have to confront Kate outside of a dream. She didn't think she would see the folksy, gentle side of the spirit. Now when the spell starts, you'll be the focus. Quinn reminded again. The Bell Witch will manifest when she realizes we are cutting the cords that tie her to this plane. She nodded. If she really does have a master, they won't like us taking their big weapon away. This will get hairy. His reserved features tightened. Let Lucas and me distract her. On the other side of the desk, Vic bared his teeth in a clenched smile. I've already told my intern the score. She's been well-trained. Toilet trained and everything. Red arranged the iron ingots to protect the circle of salt and hematite crystals. She had modified the ritual circle to include elements to repel the bell witch. Sometimes she followed the recipe, other times she mixed it up. She hadn't gotten far enough with her dark side dream tutor to know if magic was more like cooking or baking when it came to a recipe. Lucas crossed his arms, glaring at Quinn. I don't like this. This chit already has a fascination with our girl. Why couldn't we have the shaman do it? Because Basil is in the hospital with his jaw wired shut. Red already answered that question how many times. Each time it pained her to say it. Basil had been laughing and eating tater's tots only hours ago. Now he was going to have to drink his Christmas dinner through a straw. She hadn't brought the bell witch into his life, but she had been dream buddies with Kate. The bloke doesn't need to speak, psychic shaman and all. He needs to recuperate. That is why I had him move to that private hospital run by Smith and Reaper. They can protect him there. She didn't point out that Basil was a soulmancer. That was his secret to share. We can do it. You don't need to shelter your girlfriend, Greg. Vic huffed before shooting Quinn a withering side eye as if telling his boss, I told you so. She looked away, neck heating up. Even if she and Lucas had Facebook profiles, they still wouldn't have put it on It's Complicated, let alone boyfriend and girlfriend status. Enough with the Greg business, Lucas said. I'm just looking out for her. Let's concentrate. It's almost time. Quinn put a hand on Vic's shoulder, looming with his above six feet height. You've done a good job. Yeah, I'm a proud single mother, all right. Vic sounded sour, but he still looked up with a hint of hero worship. Thanks, Mom. Red held out her hands to him over the rusty doorknob in the center of the salt circle. Projecting more confidence than she felt, she gathered up her unruly magical energy, imagining herding cats. She spoke to seal her own intentions. When we start this ritual, we will sever all ties to the Bell Witch and the objects from the Bell Farmhouse. It will go in a wave. This doorknob should be the last one. We'll all be targets, but hopefully she'll go for you two first. Try to keep any flying objects from hitting us so we can finish the chant. We've tied everything up and damn near put sandbags down. Vic squeezed her hands. Let's rock and roll. They started the Latin together. Their pronunciation wasn't going to win them any classics awards, but their intention was on point. If they had been dealing with multiple spirits like they'd first assumed, they would have had to deal with each object connected to each spirit. Seen with her third eye, the psychic cords on the doorknob led to a faint spectral web going back to a single source, the Bell Witch. Red imagined cutting all the ties from the cursed objects to their origin. The lights sputtered in the office. She tightened her grip on Vic's hands. Incoming. Again.
She restarted the chant, heart speeding, back muscles tightening from the increased energy. The lights went out, leaving only the red emergency exit sign run by distant generators. A rolling chair in the corner scooted in retreat. The windows shook in their frames. In the center of the room, a glow appeared, outlining Kate's form. Her spectral feet hovered over the floor. The hem of her dress swished and swirled in shadows. She raised her hands, her calloused fingers curled like claws. Red tried not to look into the transparent hazel eyes. The witch had been kind to her. Forced into it or not, she couldn't forget poor Basil. Lucas popped up in front of Kate, swinging an iron fire poker. The bell witch vanished. A framed private investigator license soared off the wall, hitting him in the head. The ceiling fan spun rapidly, sending sparks down. He rolled away and rose in a crouch. The ghost reappeared behind Vic. Quinn slashed an iron dagger over the human's head, slashing the intruder. Kate shuddered and turned around. Her screech sounded more like a velociraptor in a primeval forest than a woman. She flung her hand in a sweeping arch. Quinn flew back, striking the empty coffee stand. The cheap particle board shattered under his bulk. Wincing at his impact, Red did her best to ignore the fighting to keep her voice steady. It wavered at the creak across the room. The coffee table slid, hitting Lucas behind the knee. He stumbled black hair tumbled into his amber-flecked eyes. Fangs elongated over his canines. He hissed up at the specter in the center of the room. Kate disappeared. Vic chanted louder, covering for Red's faltering. The temperature dropped. Lungs skipping a breath, Red wheezed at the touch on her shoulder. The hand felt solid. She knew it was the touch of death. A scream bubbled up in her throat. She swallowed it down to keep reciting the chant. Lucas sprinted to stab over her shoulder with the iron poker. Kate cried out again. Sweat dripped down Red's face. Energy boomeranged back into her. She nodded to Vic, her mystical senses telling her that the other objects had their cords cut, leaving only the doorknob connected to the bell witch. Vic's eyes screwed up in concentration for stage two of the operation. Together, they dipped their hands down to sweep the salt aside and broke the circle. He chanted as he raised his head. His eyes widened. Red. Deathly cold claws dug into her neck. Red gasped, chest tightening, yet kept up the Latin chant. Somehow, she knew Lucas would get there in time. The whoosh of an iron poker cut through the air behind her back, dispelling the icy touch. Shouting the last words, Red focused on severing the psychic glowing cords attaching themselves to the doorknob. She forced every ounce of concentration into visualizing cutting it. The thread trembled. It snapped like piano wire pulled too tight, pitched note vibrating in her head. In the center of the room, Kate roared and evaporated in a flash of green lightning. Bolts of vivid green hit the ground like torpedoes. The brilliance rose like a mushroom cloud. Red dropped onto the desk, blinded. Her head swam as her sweaty forehead pressed against the cool wood, heart pounding in her chest. The iron oars blazed hot like coals against her hand. She panted as if crossing a finish line, knees buckling. Vic fell beside her, half out of his wheelchair. Lucas gently pulled her up and took her into his arms. Your eyes. Red leaned her head against his chest, blinking out the shock of the bright light of Kate's exit. The days from doing such complicated magic covered her like a San Francisco fog. She wavered on her feet. I'm a little out of it. Save the questions. Quinn furrowed his brow, glancing at them as he put a hand on Vic's back. How about an observation? Lucas brushed his thumbs across the apples of her cheeks. You're cold, Red. That took a bit out of you. I'm fine, Greg. Thanks for asking. Vic sat himself upright in his wheelchair with the groaning effort of an old man. I think we did it, guys. Closing her real eyes, she looked at the desk with her third eye, trying to sense the spell. Even the doorknob on the desk just looked like a doorknob without the hovering toxic aura it had before. She smiled, leaning into Lucas's touch. Only the usual energic bric-a-brac floated in the ether of the office. A stab of guilt tightened her lungs. Kate had taught her that. Vic was right. Red did have sympathy for every devil. Her smile faded as she opened her eyes and pulled back. 
The objects should be disconnected from the Bell Witch. Lucas kissed her with the urgency of a drowning man swimming for shore. Surprised, her hands fluttered on his shoulders before snaking around his neck. Sinking into his passion, she let herself find oblivion in it. Enough thinking and worrying tonight. She was ready for the post-vanquishing banter and kisses. He grinned against her lips. You had a man worried when that ghosty had her paw around your neck. He stroked her hair, nuzzling her neck, reminding her there was another way a witch could balance energies after a spell. Thought that I... His voice was muffled, kissing her skin. Red caught the sphinx-like look exchanged between Vic and Quinn, but she was too tired to do anything but close her eyes. She wanted to soak up the security in Lucas's arms. The spell didn't require as much energy as harnessing one of the elements, but it still took a lot out of her. She felt that light-headed fatigue of a flu coming on. Can you two pick up the place? Vic pushed Tip his hat down to shield his eyes from their display. Because I don't have it in me to write up the report. Yeah, you two go rest. Did you want to crash here? Quinn asked. She smiled, happy for a change of scenery. A sleepover suited her fine. She'd had enough nightmares and freaky dreams in her own bed. No, I think that it's past our bedtime. Vic shook his head. His features took on a hard, determined cast. We need to be fresh tomorrow. We might have a pissed-off spirit caster looking for us. Red knew enough not to argue with him when he was like this. He wasn't wrong. It was weird because he usually relished the chance to luxuriate in the sublime water pressure of Quinn's massive shower. Vic had joked that it was worth a drive from Reno. Then she belatedly remembered that he couldn't crash on Quinn's couch like before. The basement apartment under the office wasn't handicapped accessible. She could stay since the van was modified for him to drive home, but she didn't like leaving him by himself. Sure, but after that magic, I need some food before I pass out, Vic. I got a banana in the Falcon. Nosh on the way home. He waved her on. She turned to Lucas and gave him a peck on the lips. We defeated the Bell Witch. He smirked, rubbing his hands up and down her arms. Bully for us. Ugh, but we also saved an unnecessary Hollywood reboot. Vic powered his wheelchair toward the door. They should have stopped after Scrooged. Stop by humbugging! Red laughed and grabbed her purse, then waved to Quinn and Lucas. She shut the office door, but still heard Lucas's voice through it. Don't start, old man, just grab a broom. They're already squabbling over the mess. She stretched, trying to loosen up fear-tensed muscles before tapping the unlock button on the van remote. The wheelchair lift undocking could be heard even before they walked out into the parking lot. Yeah, they're a real odd couple. Vic rolled ahead to the lift. Lots of wacky vampire sitcom shenanigans, bickering on Sundays over who drank the last blood bag, quipping absently about chicken blood on the newspaper. She felt miles away from the conversation as she stepped up into the driver's side of the van. The bell witch was gone. The others wouldn't have mourned Kate Batts, but Red would mourn the potential for good. Maybe things could have been different if Kate had had an easier life, a life free from burn scars and poltergeists. She sent out a hope into the universe that the spirit would find peace. Still, Red was happy that she would get some sleep tonight without a drive-by cameo. She couldn't have been more wrong. Eight. December 18th, 3.33 a.m., California, Sunrise Apartments, Culver City, Los Angeles. Red rolled over and opened her eyes to see the unearthly bright moonlight shining through her window. She was dreaming, but not the absurdist, ride the bus in your underwear sitting next to Napoleon kind of dream. It was the dead witch's whispering magic kind of dream. Shit. Kate Batts sat at the desk, features arranged in a resigned, I'm not angry, I'm disappointed manner. Sister witch, we parted most grievously. You gave a mighty fine try, but your craft wasn't enough to release me. Wincing as she tilted her head back, Red pinched the bridge of her nose. What went wrong? How had the witch survived? The spell had gone exactly as planned. But you have nothing connecting you to this plane. I am being held and she is not letting go. I am not as expendable as Dean. 
My master has unfinished business. Kate sighed, rubbing her hands, gaze growing distant. I yearn for the simple life again, when I had a cow in my field, a child playing at my feet, and a sweetheart in my bed. What kind of spirit are you? A mage spirit like yours will be. Come some hopefully not soon day. There are others who can travel in the dreamland besides our kind. Kate rolled up her sleeves, revealing the hideous burn scars that covered her arms to the elbow. I do not delight in what I will do next. Red woke with a question on her lips and the sun on her face. Panting, she rolled away from the sweat-soaked sheets. What unfinished business. Who would suffer next to ensure that it was done? She shifted off the phone, digging into her side, and pulled it out. A notification of a text message from Sheila Jones, her agent at Smith & Reaper, blinked at her. Basil had fallen into a mystical coma. Pushing the phone away, she put her head in her hands. She unfolded herself, taking deep, meditative breaths, staring up at the ceiling, her internal dialogue veered between pep talk and bargaining to get up. She couldn't afford a guilt-fueled panic attack. <laughs> Climbing out of bed, she went into the living room and paused as the TV caught her eye. She recognized the split-screen footage of a quiet urban canal through a shopping district. The TV anchor's eagle gaze and non-regional accent grew somber. It has been six months since the tragic domestic terrorist attack in Oklahoma City, which has been marked by a candlelight vigil in Bricktown. Red shook her head. She had been there, and it might have been terrorists, but they weren't human. It was a showdown between one desperate werewolf and a gang of vampires. The Dark Veil PR machine rolls on, Vic shook his head. I bet they were the ones who did the mysterious donation to the victims. The TV anchor shuffled his papers before continuing. In entertainment news, the nightmare on the set of A Christmas Carol hasn't stopped production, even as Hollywood mourns late director Ari Goldstein. A montage of police cars outside the mansion on the hill faded into a cascade of written statements from the film's stars. A paparazzi still shot of Nevi Morgan and her husband DJ Shake flashed on the screen. In a statement from Nevaeh Morgan, starring as Martha Cratchit, she offers condolences about the director known for such films as Red grabbed the remote and turned the TV down. Basil is in a coma. Vic coughed, wiping coffee off his chin. Ah, oh, fuck. I also had another cameo from Kate Batts in my dream. Double fuck. What the hell? We've done that spell before. It works. I felt it work. She bit at her thumbnail, other arm wrapped around her middle. All that confidence from mastering her third eye disappeared. She had freestyled on some of the ingredients, but the energy was correct. At least she thought it was. Kate said she has unfinished business. I mean, her master does. A buzz hit the air. Lifting a vibrating phone, he hit the speaker phone button on the screen and set it on armrest. Vic Park Constantine... The hunter so nice, they named him Trice. Talk to me. Quinn's voice filled the room. Just got off the horn with Detective Calloway. She says that a casting director was killed last night in a fucked-up ghoul way in her words. Dread sinking into her stomach, Red asked over Vic's shoulder. Was this casting director named Shelby McGee? Am I on speakerphone? Quinn's tone turned befuddled, but he continued. Yes, how did you know? I met her at Ari Goldstein's last party. She did the casting for A Christmas Carol. She pursed her lips. The answer had been right in front of them. She said something about nearly losing her job after the Martha Cratchit debacle. Vic tossed a side eye at her, stroking his chin. Neve Morgan is playing Martha again. The role she'd kill to keep, apparently, Red said. She hadn't considered Nevi, because why would Bell Witch's puppet master have invited them over for an exorcism, but it was her husband who had actually called Quinn investigations. The ghost, Dean, hadn't found peace through connecting with DJ Shake in a feel-good hallmark moment. He had left after Nevi told him to. It had all happened when Red and Vic had finished the chant, so she had thought it was from their efforts. I am not following... 
Quinn's voice bobbed as if he was pulling the phone away and then closer. How do I sound? Can you hear me? Ari fired Neva A before he died, Vic pointed out, leaning toward the phone on his armrest. And you just talk into it, Q. Stop waving the phone around. Her husband is a rapper. Red did a quick search on her phone for DJ Shake and Mr. Hyde, yo wife, and found only results about their feud. Too focused on chasing down leads for Basil, she hadn't paid as much attention to the musician victims. L.A. was a big town, lots of opportunities for unrelated hauntings, especially around the winter solstice. She hadn't connected the dots until then. Why else would the Bell Witch target him? Vic drummed his fingers on his coffee mug. I'll bet all the other haunted rappers had problems with DJ Shake, too. Then we have all the ghost attacks on her co-stars and director. She must have summoned the Bell Witch. So, you're saying Neve has been using a dead witch's ghost to kill so she could stay in a movie? Quinn's dry question crackled out of the speaker. Why am I asking? This town... Basil said something weird had been going on with all of those Hollywood types that he had been working with. They were all producers, directors, and casting agents. Red counted on her fingers. The web of manipulation spread over the city. Navai isn't just pulling the bell witch's strings. Compulsion? Vic sipped his coffee, then cocked his head. No wonder she tried to take out the shaman. He's the one who was breaking through the mind control. How don't we know that she didn't earn her parts? Quinn questioned from the other end of the phone line. Let me field this one. Red stepped around Vic to speak to the phone. Did you see the remake of Emma? Yes. Quinn's tone was short and confused. Who was the worst part of the movie? Vic rolled his eyes. She had forced him to watch it with her, and then she spent the rest of the night complaining about Neve. The blonde who couldn't keep up the English accent, Quinn said. It was like they found her in some community theater. That's Nevai. See, Vic, he agrees. Red pumped her fist in victory before turning more serious. What do you think? Probably has an altar to maintain the spells? It would take a lot of concentration to hold that many under control. She'd need to have something set up to maintain the compulsion. I taught you well, Padawan. Vic wagged his finger as the visible thrill of a new lead jolted through him. We'll need to come in force if we're going to take down a five-time Razzie winner. The altar has to be in her house, Quinn said. She needs to be near it often to keep it energized. We can destroy her power center and neutralize her. How can we get her out of the house, she asked. If she's that powerful, an open fight will be tricky. I don't have much energy in general, and I used most of it up last night. She got her big roll back. Her enemies are out of the way. It's time to party. We just have to give her a place to go. Vic's lips curled up in the trill of an idea. Narrowing her eyes, suspicion slowed her words. His expression was one Red had seen too many times. Those times usually ended with her running for her life. What are you scheming over there? What's an invite she can't refuse? Vic lifted his eyebrows and rolled his fingers to spur a guess. A place where even socialites wait in line? Oh, balls! Red cringed as realization slapped her. She rubbed her neck before jerking her hand away from the fang scars on her neck. Kristoff's bite. She tried to be clinical about it. The human-to-vampire transformation modified the salivary glands in addition to reforming the teeth and adding a lot more veins. When a vampire bit a human, their venom put the victim in a thrall. Like a snake, they all had rough control over the amount of venom to inflict. There were reports of regional bloodline differences like a clan of vampires in Siberia whose venom felt like ice. But outside chemical quirks, that was it. It didn't connect vampire and victim mystically, just put the human in a daze to make feeding easier. Not Kristoff Novak. When he bit you, you didn't want him to stop and she would rather cut out her own tongue than admit that to anyone. Vic stared at her expectantly. You in? The idea made sense even if she hated it. Do we have to? Oi, what are you going on about over there, Quinn? Lucas's sleepy voice rang out in the distance from the speakerphone, as if he had just woken up and stumbled into the living room to find his roommate. 
Steam rising over a determined expression, Vic held the mug in both hands, head bowed like a mafia don calling out a hit. Make the call, Red. You know he'll do it for you. Lucas's question boomed through the speaker. What favor is that? You're breaking up, Greg. Vic made static sounds with his mouth and hung up the phone, then put it on the table with his mug. Hands up, he arranged his expression with the calm composure of a diplomat. They had been tiptoeing around each other since their last blowout. There wasn't any fight in his strong shoulders. He presented his argument in a soft voice. Club Voltava is the best place we could lure her. Fine, but you're the one who really owes me for this. Red nibbled on her lip, trying to think about what she would write Kristoff. If she wanted him to stop sending her messages, texting him was a mixed signal. He was probably asleep in some penthouse in Portland on sheets with a thread count that she couldn't imagine. Heart fluttering, she coughed. For all your gripes about Lucas, you seem fine throwing me at Kristoff. When it's for a case, he's obviously not going to bite you again, probably. Vic winced, rubbing his neck. He's the only one we know who has a club that celebrities are dying to get into. Chloe Kardashian was his alibi. She sighed, then pulled out her phone and angled it away from Vic so he couldn't see the screen. Chest tightening, she dialed and waited for the rings to turn to voicemail. Hey, Kristoff, could you help? Red bit her lip and cringed. She could already imagine that aloof mouth easing into a smirk when he listened to the voicemail. She tried to inject professionalism into her voice. She told herself it was just a job. I know it's last minute, Mr. Novak, but could you get a VIP invite to Neve Morgan for Club Voltava tonight? Yeah, that Neve Morgan. It's urgent business for Cora Moon. I need her to get out of the house. I don't know what you do to lure the beautiful people out, but I'd really appreciate it if you could. Um, don't hurt her or anything. Just get her some free drinks or something. Thanks. It's red, by the way. And this time you didn't even have to go on a date with him, Vic said cheerfully. No, I just owe him a favor instead. Red froze, her face heating up like a stove coil. She hadn't hung up yet. The phone slipped from her chilled fingers. She fumbled to hang up the call, cursing. That's on the voicemail. This plan is already getting me into trouble. A, you can get yourself into trouble just fine. I helped our case. I'll power up the research machine. Vic grinned widely, head bobbing. Can you make eggs? The special kind. You know you make them the best. So you're lucky that you're my best friend, because you're pushing it today, mister. She could have smacked the back of his head. Instead, she went into the kitchen and pulled the egg carton out of the fridge. Vic did not deserve eggs, but her tummy had already started rumbling. This day was already turning out to be a doozy. She felt her phone buzz, knowing who it would be, and put it in the crook of her neck. Hey, Lucas. Hell of a way to wake up. He shook off the suppressed emotion in his tone, sighing before his voice became neutral. Make the call? I left a voicemail. Here's hoping that he does it. She scowled at Vic, who only turned up the TV in reply. He will. That tosser, Lucas sighed again. Red, I trust you. I just blow hot. Too much old bad blood for me not to worry. I know. We just need to get Nevaeh out of her house. Then the case is over, and the good people of Hollywood can rest easy. She leaned down and pulled a pan out of the cupboard. Do you think you can check out the blueprints that Vic found on Nevaeh's house? I know you two can't get in without an invite, but it'll be good to have you there, watching my back pushing me up a fence if I get stuck. I'll get you through the gate. You'll take it from there. His voice warmed with pride. Chewing on her cheek to hide her grin, Red made her goodbyes and began to hum and chop up a bell pepper. Vic made a barfing sound behind her. Do you want shells in your omelet? She asked with poisoned sweetness. Then get to the computer, nerd. Hours of research flew by and the sun was setting when their Chinese food arrived for dinner. The last rays disappeared as they finished, the takeout boxes piled up around them on the kitchen table. Red looked up from the PDF of an old grimoire on her laptop when her phone vibrated. 
She picked up the phone to see a message from Kristoff. Favor done. She'll be there by 11 to be fake surprised by the paparazzi. Repay me with dinner. Portland has the best ramen on the West Coast, by the way. Novak pulled through. Red gritted her teeth as she read the message again, somehow knowing it would be dinner. Ramen. He knew one of her weaknesses. Kristoff probably saw the night she'd interrogated him in his gallery's dark room as a date. Then there was the Halloween ball, where she literally went as his date, undercover or not. She resisted the urge to sigh. Maybe she could convince him to accept her return the favor by banishing gnomes from his gallery in L.A. She didn't know if he had gnomes, but she could plant some and wait for the call about an infestation. She got up, texting as she tossed the takeout box in the trash. Thanks for setting the bait. Portland is a long way for ramen. How's about you tell me when you have a monster to fight in L.A. instead? The reply from Kristoff arrived immediately. She read it four times. If you want to wrestle a demon, you know who to ask. Face flushing, Red wet her lips as the memory of the terror than the strange pleasure of his bite blindsiding her. She swiped out of the text conversation, setting the phone on the table, and blew out a sharp breath. There was no good in replying. Who should we be, cable company or florists? Vic asked. She snapped her head up, mind still on demon wrestling, and squeaked out, Cable, I look good in that uniform. I'll be the wheelman. Vic frowned at the slip of the tongue and looked at his electric wheelchair. Phone ringing to break the awkward silence, he put it on speaker and set it on his armrest. You won't believe who really owns Nivea's place, Quinn said. Airy Goldstein. She grinned. Vampires only needed an invitation to go into houses claimed by the living. You have backup who can come inside, Red, Vic crowed, leaning back in his chair, putting his hands behind his head. Be ready by ten. I'm driving. In the front seat, Red gave directions to Vic as they slowly navigated the long private street to the large bungalow hidden in the Hollywood Hills. A magnetic sign disguised the Millennium Falcon with a company logo. Mud covered the license plate to fool any lurking cameras. They might have a few friends on the force, but breaking and entering was still a crime. He looked more at ease than he had in weeks, behind the wheel with a monster hunt on the horizon. The van had been modified, so he didn't need to use his feet to drive. Dark eyes watchful under the dark blue cap imprinted with a cable company logo, a small smile teased at his lips. The high wall of the estate glowed in the van's high beams. Vic looked to the back of the van. Vampire time! Take out the cameras, boys, and get us through that gate! Lucas and Quinn hopped out the back door. The younger vampire picked up a handful of gravel and tossed it with the surety of a boy skipping stones. The security cameras at the gate spun to the side, lenses cracking as the stones hit. Red tried to watch the pair, but they were impossibly fast going over the wall in a blur. The gate glided soon open on its track. Vic drove through and stopped at the front door before turning around to make the van ready for a quick getaway. You're on deck. Keep the car warm for us. Red lifted the boxy leather case at her feet and put the strap over her shoulder. She trotted to the house and tried not to jostle the contents of her case. Tossing his errant hair back, Lucas stood by the front door. Quinn is taking out the electrical box and generator to kill any alarms. We have to make this quick. Quinn appeared and broke the doorknob off. He took a tentative step inside. I'd say ladies first, but considering... Don't worry, she doesn't have a ward set up, just an overpriced security system. Turning on a flashlight, Red guided the two through the bungalow. She had spent too long watching Nevaeh's YouTube channel for research. There was one room in the house she never showed when she was giving tours or doing live streams. Her closet. A curious absence in Hollywood when everyone wanted to know what their favorite stars wore. Red stepped into the bedroom, walls lined with portraits of the celebrity couple, and went straight for the walk-in closet. She focused her third eye to check for wards or sigils. Only one glowed in her spirit gaze. It was to repel fires. A sensible precaution in the wildfire-prone area. It also proved that a witch had made her mark here. She pushed beyond the designer duds to the door just barely in view. I need some help here. 
Lucas slammed against the door and it fell open with a crack. Papered with hand-drawn sigils and photos, the secret room lay shrouded in toxic auras. Black and red strings connected sigils to pictures illuminated by salt lamps. Headshots of rival actresses mingled with candid photos of busy-looking executives on their phones. Crimson marker had been scribbled over Ari Goldstein, Basil Bansko, and Shelby McGee's faces. More anti-fire sigils radiated neon on the ceiling and walls of the small room. Guess we know what happened to their careers. Red wanted to make another quip, but the gap in her memory included a lot of pop culture trivia from the last decade. She barely recognized half of the actresses. Was it the amnesia or Navia messing with their careers? Quinn stepped inside to study the complex altar. What's the best way to destroy it? We can't burn it out. She's already thought of that. Red flipped open her case and grabbed a big bottle of holy water and shook the ground up cold iron inside. It wasn't fire, but it would neutralize the altar long enough to desecrate it. The room gave her the creeps. It wasn't just the cat bones, but the twisted intention that oozed from the very walls. Clay pink hearts decorated a grim shrine that reminded her of a roadside memorial, except there was a wedding photo in the middle. The sacrifice was DJ Shake's free will. It was dwarfed by a shelf altar of crystals and relics on the back wall. Gems and relics glinted from the open. Nearly lost in the serial killer grandeur, a small corn husk doll sat atop along with a selenite crystal and a pyramid of layered organite in a sacred circle of bones. Red handed Lucas the flashlight. She poured some of the supercharged holy water over a ring of bones on the altar. It hissed and bubbled like peroxide on a wound. She passed the bottle to Quinn, then picked up the still dry corn husk doll. Kate's essence radiated from it. Got a light? An unnerving green flickering light glimmered on the shiny photos pinned to the wall. She spun around. Kate stood behind the vampires, hands clasped at the waist. Her downcast eyes pleaded through ghostly eyelashes. Lucas stepped forward, reaching for the iron dagger poking out of his inner jacket pocket. Kate hissed. Easy! No daggers! A lighter! Red held her arm out and shook her head. Lucas obeyed, but he kept the dagger in reach. Quinn inched closer to the specter. Kate, I don't know what kind of witch you are, and I don't know why you spared Basil, but not Airy, but I think I can see what kind of witch you could have been. Mouth twisting, Red sniffed back the lump in her throat and grabbed the aged corn husk doll to light it on fire. The flames caught on the fibrous husk. We're here to set you free. Glowing tears ran down Kate's face. You're a good one. Red smiled wanly, breath skipping in her chest. Even after it all, she still wanted the Bell Witch to find her peace. It was long overdue. I release you, Kate Bats. I release you. I release you from your bondage. Kate cried out. Don't neglect the power center. It must be destroyed. Lucas smashed the organite pyramid with his fist. Pent-up energy seeped from the room like air out of a beach ball. Hair blowing in the unearthly breeze, Red blinked back the tears building up in her eyes. I hope you find peace. I hope it finds you. Voice receding, Kate turned and faded into the shadows. Her green glow blinked bright before disappearing. Gulping back a dry sob, Red let the doll drop before the flames reached her fingertips. It landed on the altar in a whisper of ash. Kate Batts was gone. Now it was her master's turn. She sniffed and swiped the tear of her cheek. Destroy all the crystals and relics. Everything creepy. The vamps crushed the crystals in the small room, picking each up with their bare hands and squeezing. Powder fell from their palms. Red felt energy implode in swift bursts as each crystal crumbled. Years of charged magic escaped from the shrine. Witches could hold power in themselves, rechargeable but limited to their natural abilities. They could also put energy in objects for later storage or to power a spell. The smash job would destroy the integrity of the sacred space. It would take Nevea years to store this much up again. She furiously splashed the blessed iron water over the ritual space, making sure to dump water on the pictures of DJ Shake scribbled with hearts. What happened first, the marriage or the love spell? 
If not for worry about burning down the Hollywood Hills, she would have torched the place. Every picture staring back at her had been violated. Their wills had been stolen, even if they'd escaped with their lives. Vic says we have to go. Quinn looked down at his phone, the glow illuminating his ruggedly handsome face. Lucas slammed a crystal against the wall. The dust glimmered as it fell. We've done this scene. Make sure Cora knows who was haunting her people. Red retreated from the room, the vampires behind her. The icy reality of her words hit her after she said them. If Neve walked into Moon Enterprises, supernaturally warded and renovated to withstand a tank, she wouldn't ever leave. Nevae was still a human, no matter how gross. I know the Supreme will want to send Joe Chang, but could we have Detective Calloway track Nevae down instead? Give the LAPD a chance before the Fang PD? She might cut a deal, just to avoid breaking the dark veil. Quinn lit the path out of the darkened home with his phone. I warned Calloway first. They should both be looking for her. Jogging to the van and hopping into the passenger side, she watched the back door open in the rearview mirror. It didn't reveal the two vampires hunkering down behind the tied-down wheelchair. Tick-tock, motherfuckers! Vic put the van into drive and sped out of the open gate down the road. He slowed as a cop car passed by. Tension uncoiled in her shoulders when she recognized the vampire behind the wheel. He was going in the wrong direction. She breathed out in relief. Detective Calloway should have the lead on arresting Neve at Christoph's club. She leaned her arm on the empty window and saluted with the other. Officer Joe Chang tipped his hat from the open car window. House music poured out in a techno blitz. He sped away into the night. Her stomach rumbled. She had done more magic in the last few days than she had in two months. She couldn't figure out if she were hungry or sleepy more. Who else is hungry? In and out burger? Vic asked. Red shrugged with the boneless relief of another job survived. She already craved a burger at his suggestion. Driver calls the shots. Don't you forget it. He laughed, flipping on the stereo. Metallica's Enter Sandman boomed as they cruised out of the Hollywood Hills. We dropped a house on Nevae tonight. She tried to make a Wizard of Oz joke, but it came out too serious. Feeling awkward, she looked up at the sky with her third eye to see the echoed twinkle of stars beyond the smog. Could Nevae see the same spirit stars on the rooftop of Club Voltava? The starlet obviously had more than a few dream witchcraft trainings under her belt. Her ritual space was complex, blending traditional and personal elements. Mediocre at stagecraft, her witchcraft couldn't be denied. All that power and Nevea used it to be popular. Even worse, to kill. Red knew how a dark witch could be stopped, but she didn't know how they started. Neve Morgan hadn't been born with a stalker wall of compulsion magic. There was a choice, a first step along the way. What was it? Red leaned her knee against Lucas's. Heavy eyelids lowered as they sat in the booth at the burger joint. She had already finished her burger, but she felt a perverse curiosity watching Vic dig into his third. Was it from his treatments? He had been undergoing special magic medical procedures to heal his spine, but mostly he just seemed to be eating more. The mystical couldn't solve everything, even if his recovery looked miraculous by muggle standards. Quinn looked down at his phone. Detective Calloway has picked up Nevi for questioning. The LAPD already had her on their radar due to the Goldstein family's suspicions of financial exploitation. Nodding, she released a deep breath in relief. Neve would have the chance to face human justice, and if she behaved, the vampires wouldn't step in. Prison wasn't the Pandora Hotel, but she'd survive longer. I guess the movie needs a new Martha Cratchit. Lucas smiled and kissed Red's cheek. You have saved Helen Mirren from that stain on her filmography. Swallowing a big bite, Vic took a loud slurp of his soda. Does that mean we have to see this movie next Christmas? She grinned as the banter rolled around the table. Vic laughed, 
Lucas's eyes twinkled, and even Quinn smiled for a millisecond. They had gotten the bad guy. What else could she want for Christmas? She looked around the booth in the overly lit fast food place and wished she could capture the moment forever. It felt like a daydream. Red should have known it would turn into a nightmare. Nine. December 19th, 1111 p.m. Club Voltava, Sunset Strip, Los Angeles. Red leaned on the rooftop rail of Club Voltava. No moon battled through the smog above. Sunset Strip twinkled from the nightclubs and the headlamps of the cars below. This empty part of the rooftop was closed to the public, but the velvet rope had been dropped and the tinted glass barrier separating the sections opened for her. Had Kristoff emailed her picture to the staff, or did they just remember her last visit? She certainly wouldn't forget how the Halloween ball had ended. Pulsing dance music on the other side of the roof competed with the car horns echoing off the buildings. She tapped her toe from impatience, not the beat. The view was lovely, but she was getting a little worried. Where was Lucas? It was weird that he wanted to meet here, but it was probably vampire business for Cora. The Supreme Master of the City dubbed the club the place to be for the undead in her quest to convince Kristoff to relocate. Red brought her big hunter's kit just in case. Lucas wouldn't have asked her here for drinks. She listened to his voicemail again, smiling at his voice. His voicemail was short. He explained he was borrowing a phone since his was dead, but he clearly said the time and location. She posed with a raised eyebrow to send a selfie and caption, hoping he had plugged in his phone. Were you late to your own funeral? His reply was immediate. Another text bubble popped up. Behind you. She spun, heart racing, in a black sequined mini dress slashed with green ruffles. Nevy Morgan glared out of mascara-smudged eyes. Golden hair hung in frizzy curls. The inky darkness of her pupils seeped over the whites of her eyes, covering them. An orb of flames ignited in her hand, illuminating the chunky ruby ring on her finger. I'm going to make sure this hurts, bitch. You've already got trouble with the vampires. This is a bad move. Red put up her hands. After all the magic use in fighting the Bell Witch, she didn't have anything left but sarcasm. She stepped to the side, closer to her hunter's kit where it rested on the ground, wishing she had brought her smaller one that strapped to her thigh. Fucking with me was a bad move. Navi hurled the orb. Red dove to the side. The orb hit the rail, embers springing from the impact into the alley stories below. Beautiful face marred by rage, Navi hollered. I could kill my hubby for even hiring you damn ghostbusters behind my back. So, what's your play? You don't have the big bad bell witch to back you up. Rising from a crouch, Red tried to tap into the well of energy inside her, but nothing bubbled up. This was an orb fight, and she only had an out-of-reach hunter's kit. I have my tricks. I was able to lure you here, didn't I? Neve smirked. Figured you'd come if the right voice called. How did you get Lucas's voice? Red broke out in a cold sweat. That helpful Detective Calloway told me about your boyfriend after I pushed the right buttons. Then I just needed to call your office to get a sample for my witchy track on the voicemail. Navai fluttered her eyelashes and shrugged before flinging another orb. Blonde isn't my natural hair color. Red ducked the orb, flames searing the jacket pleather with a chemical-smelling burn. You ruined my relationship. The faux sweetheart tone in Navai's voice curdled. Yours is fair game. Don't make this worse for yourself. Pulse throbbing in her ears, Red looked over at the tinted glass that divided this side of the rooftop from the dance floor. Did anyone else notice a Golden Globe winner throwing fireballs? How could it get worse? Neve snarled, stomping forward. I've been fired from my movie, my husband left me, and my agent dropped me. You ruined my life. You still have one. Rolling in a somersault, Red dived for the hunter's kit on the cement floor. She flipped open the square case, digging through the flaps of vials to the pocket of steaks, salt packs, and a spray bottle. You're totally breaking the black veil here. 
I can't promise you'll have a life after this stunt. Neve wiggled her fingers over the ruby ring. Noxious flames bubbled from the gem. This isn't my life. You took it. That wasn't a life. Those were lies. Red squinted at the ring, mentally cursing. They hadn't taken out all of Neve's tricks when they'd crushed her crystal collection. She pulled out a small spray bottle, mixing up the iron sediment at the bottom. Standing, she brandished it, finger on the trigger. She felt silly, as if she was taking down a rowdy cat. You were controlling them. I took care of them. I always have. Nevaya gritted her teeth, glaring down at her ring and shaking it like a remote on the fritz. Ari made money hand over fist because of me. Do you think Steve would have gotten off YouTube and onto the charts without me? Now he won't even look at me. Say, these are real people you're playing with. Why don't you understand what you've done? Red asked. Bile rose in her throat as she remembered the pink heart drawn around the picture of Steve, DJ Shake, on the Psycho Love Spell Altar. Neve had used compulsion to get movie roles, convince Ari to buy property, and more, but no one had been subjected to more mind control than her husband. How long had she been holding him in a love spell? Red moved closer, aiming her spray bottle at the magic ring. Your husband was right to leave you. You've been raping him, mind, body, and spirit, for years. It's not like that. I loved him. The other witch lobbed a smaller flaming ball, arms shaking, pale under the fake tan and makeup contouring, sweat glistened on her forehead. The black of her eyes flickered to blue. I took care of him. You forced him to love you, Red ducked under the rocketing orb. She glared, disgust lowering her voice. You invoked the Bell Witch to murder people. You used mind control to get what you wanted. You destroyed everything you touched. Why? You could have been a hero. I was a star! Neve stamped forward, heels clicking on the concrete. The ruby ring glinted on her clenched fist. You're just a hater. You have magic and you're too chicken shit to use it. Red pressed the spray bottle trigger, shooting the watery ground iron onto the ring. Dropping the bottle, she twisted at the hip and popped her elbow up into the other woman's face. The impact ricocheted down her arm. Nevi grabbed her nose, the darkness in her irises fully faded. Metallic flakes dripped down her hand as the ruby ring lost its luster. The actress turned to run, slipping on high heels, her ankle jerking down. She hobbled. This is Oscar night with Amy Adams all over again. Red tackled the celebrity, pushing her down face first. The ring had been weakened and Navai was running low on juice, but either could rally. The other witch pushed herself up, probably thanking her personal trainer for arm day now. Mascara ran down to her swelling nose. Blood dribbled from her nostril. Red flopped, knees tightening on the struggling torso below, trying to wrestle the ring off. The concrete floor scraped her ankles. She clung to the starlet. Taking the ring, she tossed it over the rooftop rail. Twisting, Neve slapped Red across the face, knocking her aside to crawl away. Her red-bottomed heels lay abandoned on the concrete. Red scrambled over to her hunter's kit and snatched the cold iron cuffs spilling out. Clicking one side open, she leapt onto the other woman. Falling forward with a groan, Nevaeh tried to buck Red off, tossing her elbow back. Red snapped the handcuff around the flailing wrist. The fuck? Nevaeh struggled, jaw hanging, lips twitching under smeared lipstick. Catching her breath, Red jerked Neve's other arm back and finished handcuffing her. She planted her feet, hoisting them up with a huff. Cold iron. You can't bespell anyone, so just look pretty. Maybe I can convince the vampires to keep you alive. It doesn't matter. Everything is gone. Neve hung her head, shoulders slumping. How did it come to this? Red swallowed thickly and tightened her hold on the iron loops connecting the handcuffs. Nausea churned her stomach even as her face heated from anger. Neva had the ability to be a shield in the darkness. The Brotherhood existed to mentor those with great power to protect the world. She could have been one of those heroes. Instead, she tormented actors to get petty revenge. In iron cuffs, the witch no longer radiated furious energy, only shell-shocked defeat. 
Was this how Juniper St. James had looked when the hunters came for her at the Stone Tree Monastery so many decades ago? Through lank hair and a bloody nose, Nevaeh said, If you could make all your dreams come true, wouldn't you? Your dreams were other people's nightmares. Red spat the words out like bullets. She reached for her cell phone. Damn, it was by the rail. A smartwatch was now on her overdue shopping list. The tinted glass door burst open. Both witches looked up. Lucas bolted forward, eyes flashing amber and fangs jutting out of his mouth. He stopped in mid-run. Officer Chang stalked inside, pressing the button on the walkie-talkie pinned to his uniformed chest. He kicked the glass door closed behind him. Target has been cornered, bringing her in. Neve Morgan, you are under arrest on the orders of the Supreme Master. I want to talk to my lawyer, Neve complained. He raised his gun, his fangs elongating over his smiling lips. You should have stayed with the LAPD then. You know those rappers were under the protection of Cora Moon, right? Red clicked her tongue. She hadn't wanted it to get this far, but the other witch slapped that second chance down. This was the end of the line for the Dark Witch. The Supreme Master is a mega fan of Mr. Hyde, been waiting forever for his new album. Lucas grinned, the amber fading from his eyes. His teeth returned to normal, and he shook his head. For future reference, know that I bloody well would never come here voluntarily, Red. Yeah, yeah. She pulled one hand off the iron cuffs to push Neve's shoulder to urge her forward. Neve flung her head back, catching Red on the chin, before twisting away and rushing to the rooftop rail. Dodging the hunter, she threw herself over the edge, legs kicking as she fell out of sight. Lucas sprinted forward. His hands scrambled, catching nothing. A high-pitched shriek bounced off the building, amplified by the alley walls, before ending with a sickening crunch. Red bent over the rail, heart pounding in her ears, limbs sprawling, Neve landed on her back five stories below. Time skipped as the witch's aura flickered and disappeared. She stared from the alley floor, tanned arms and crooked legs, posed as if for one last photo shoot. The pooling blood and sequins shined in the camera flashes. Yells rose over the techno music on the dance floor. Clubbers pointed down on the other side of the rooftop, some already with cell phones out. Flashes from their cameras strobed in the darkness. America's sweetheart had made her dramatic exit. 10. December 22nd, 6.06 p.m., Moon Enterprises, Inglewood, Los Angeles. Hunched over her notes, Red tried to keep up with the meeting at Moon Enterprises. It wasn't a lighthearted case debrief with the murder-suicide cover-up on their agenda. She knew that Vic wasn't paying attention closely enough and would borrow her notes later. Her hand cramped as she rushed to scribble down the warnings about the human media. They had technically defeated the bad guy, but it didn't feel like a win. The wooden shades on the windows rolled up with a clatter, casting the artificial glow of nighttime Inglewood into the high-rise boardroom. She jumped in her chair at the automation. Her pen dropped to the floor. Glancing around the conference table, she leaned over to pick it up. Her chair scraped loudly on the ground as she righted herself. Blushing, she hoped no one noticed that some fancy shutters scared her. All eyes snapped to her. Of course they had heard. She was surrounded by vampires. Red winced, shrugging at her own weak explanation. Um, loud noise? So you replied with one. Fabulous. Delilah glanced skyward as if seeking the strength to keep tolerating the hunters. Shifting in his wheelchair, Vic opened one eye. Still talking about Twitter or have we moved on to Instagram? The vampire swiveled in her desk chair toward the head of the table. If they weren't going to pay attention, this could have been an email. Cora Moon perched on the tabletop, her legs crossed over a tie-dyed yoga mat. The Supreme Master of Los Angeles raised her prayer-posed hands. A rainbow headband of crystals rested above her forehead. Halo-like, her brown afro framed her concerned face. I am sensing the vibe, squad. I'm paying attention. Piping up her own defense, Red held up her notepad. I took notes. I'm getting the impression I should stay off Twitter and wear more wigs. 
I'm not sold on the wig part. Vic brushed a hand through his mullet. This man can't be contained. Delilah lifted her eyebrows. You really want to put these two on retainer. I don't like colonizer phrases, but we need to circle the wagons, D. Cora put her hands on her knees and studied the three from her tabletop perch like a waiting eagle. We need unity. Neve Morgan juggled orbs on Sunset Strip after killing the guy Steven Spielberg wants to be when he grows up. The icy blonde crossed her arms. We need to control this narrative. That's your job. Cora's voice didn't lose its airiness, but her mouth tightened. At the edges of the conference room, her black-suited guards stood like silent sentinels. They were new. Her last group of guards had either been staked the night of the coup or chained to wait the sunlight for betrayal. I already have the DVA scanning the photo feeds to make sure no one saw the fireworks. Delilah leaned on her elbow. The tabloids only want the money shot of Neve's swan dive. DVA, Red asked, jotting the initials down. She knew a lot about how vampires organized themselves, yet the acronyms were still a jumble in her head. Supreme masters ruled their cities like fiefdoms, but they answered to a higher authority, the Blood Alliance. It had risen from the ashes of the August harvest to unite bloodlines and clans around the globe. The shadowy government seemed to have as many departments as their human counterparts. This one sounded familiar, but she couldn't place it. Dark Veil Assurance, on loan from the Blood Alliance. Cora answered, her mouth twisted as her yoga vibe slipped. I asked for help before it was forced on me. Red made a note of it in her journal. Supreme Masters were the ones responsible for leashing the local media. The Blood Alliance stepped in when they failed. The DVA was their version of the Men in Black, hiding the evidence of vampires from the human world. Gaze distant, Cora rubbed the crystal dangling from her neck. The paparazzi are sniffing around like werewolves on the hunt. It's lowering my frequencies, D. The story is too juicy. I am stamping it down, but some of my... Delilah stopped her mouth puckering as she began to say Michelle. The former media manipulator of L.A. hadn't just betrayed her. He had broken her heart. She clasped her hands on the desk. Not all of the previous connections are answering summons. I don't expect you to manifest the same miracle cover-up he did in Bricktown. Inscrutable, Cora lifted her chin, jaw tensing. She couldn't seem to say her former right hand's name either. How much did she know about Oklahoma? I expect you to maintain the Black Veil. The Blood Alliance is watching closer than ever. Silence grew between the two vampires, locked in a tense stare. The shadowy authority had wrenched vampire society out of decades of the chaos in the wake of the first souling spell. They were more than willing to knock a supreme master off her throne to maintain order. Red exchanged a glance with Vic. Should she be writing this down? His answering gaze said he wanted to bounce and find a beer. A rising actress committing suicide at the hottest club in L.A. would be news by itself. Delilah started slowly, her cajoling smile forced. Then add that it happened after her director was murdered and throw in more mayhem featuring some of the most notably names in Hollywood. Yeah, every reporter is going through the trash at Club Voltava. I say we let them pick up the crumbs we choose to leave behind. Cora cocked her head. We are curating the evidence for a scandal-hungry public. The power is in the footage. They don't have anything on Neve's magical spaz fit. The DVA will make sure of it. We've already collected phones from the humans, and everyone else knows how you feel about snitches. We've already had leaks. Red looked at her notes. That was the coroner's office. Delilah's expression froze with polite calm as she maintained eye contact with Cora. Those leaks were plugged. It's not a pop quiz, Vic hissed, leaning toward Red. Spinning in her chair, Delilah faced them, arms crossing. Our weakest links are these hunters. Their van was spotted in the Hollywood Hills. Pulse spiking up, Red held up her hands. Bonding over dresses hadn't made Delilah her friend, obviously. 
We don't want trouble any more than you do. We know to be stealthy. Vic snarked, I'm not going to post about my magical night with Neve Morgan on Reddit. We aren't talking about a post buried in some forum. The news is reporting that Neve's corpse showed signs of a struggle. Cora's fingers clenched over her folded knees. The hippie visage melted away as a predatory yellow glow shone in her eyes and her fangs grew. You were dropping clues like acid at Woodstock. Fingerprints, tire tracks, and eyewitnesses. You were in her house days before she died, Vic. My little hunter chick here was at the rail when the witch jump head. You two fuck it up. The room became quiet enough to hear the soft rattle of the air conditioning. Red tightened her grip on a pen, holding her breath. Cora blinked, her eyes returning to brown. Let's recenter and refocus. The humans nodded. Groovy. She smiled, fangs still out. D, start again with the paparazzi protocol. A sliver of the moon barely broke through the smog above Inglewood as Red and Vic left the debrief on the Neve Morgan case. The crash course in avoiding the press had overwhelmed her in the moment, but Cora wasn't wrong to force them to learn. They'd had brushes with the law before, an investigation would find enough fake names and mug shots to fuel a conspiracy. The information still smothered her as she got into the Millennium Falcon. She knew Vic was in the same state when he didn't even turn on the stereo after starting the van. Vic drove out of a parking lot to a side street behind Moon Enterprises. The headlights illuminated the graffiti on the alley walls. He petted the steering wheel as if soothing the van. Can you believe they wanted to paint the falcon beige? We put a sticker on the old boy. It's a high-profile case. They want to make sure we don't end up in the news. She rubbed her arms, goosebumps rising, even though the air conditioning wasn't on in the van. Lingering dread tightened her stomach. She hadn't dreamed of the Bell Witch again, but she sweated through nightmares of watching Nevaeh falling over the rail. But beige... He blew a raspberry, then continued his venting. A scream drifted into the open window. Back straightening, Red put her hand up, alarmed. Did you hear that? Vic put the van in park and turned off the engine to listen closer. What the fuck are you? Help! The panicked words carried on the winds, but the rest was lost in the noise of the city except for the word fangs. God damn it. Inglewood is supposed to be off limits. He slapped the steering wheel and shook his head. We gotta call this in. Technically, there was a truce between the vampires of L.A. and the Brotherhood of Bards and Heroes. All vampire kills were sanctioned through Cora Moon. The paperwork was double if it was a sold vampire. More complications to her life after coming to L.A. It'll take too long. Red strapped her hunter's kit to her waist and fished a silver cross out of the dashboard compartment. Recently blessed... It should make even a master cringe. A snub-nosed revolver with wooden bullets would have been more effective, but people noticed gunshots, even in an alley like this. It was still in her kit if she needed it. This is strictly a rescue mission. They are supposed to catch and release. A blood-curdling scream rose closer. I think they're just catching tonight. She jumped out of the passenger side of the van and ran toward the scream. At the end of the alley, she stopped to peer around a corner into an empty lot. Two vampires held a struggling black woman in overalls and a beanie. Their pale skin glowed in the lights of a nearby building. Taking the small revolver out of her kit, Red held it behind her back. The blocky six-inch gun had a bulldog look to its barrel. Vic had given it to her because even if the recoil was mild, it packed a punch. The vampires didn't need to know about it until she used it. Being underestimated was the most powerful tool in her kit. She raised her cross with her other hand, walking forward. Outnumbered, but even a distraction could give that woman time to run while backup arrived. Inglewood is off the menu, boys. The Supreme Master's orders. The two vampires shared conspirators' grins. Pressed against the wall, the woman lifted her head. Her eyes glowed amber. White fangs glinted over her lips. Fuck. Red stopped short, breath catching, and backed away as her victim turned into a vampire. 
she practically heard her odds dropping. Putting a thumb on the hammer of the revolver, she had one shot to surprise them with. The click of the mechanism would give her away if she readied herself to shoot too soon. The three sprinted to form a semicircle in front of her. This can't be the bitch that took out Michelle. A male vampire gestured to her before making a jerk-off motion with his hand. She waited for the creepy villain banter to continue before pulling back the hammer to cock the revolver. Our sire ate hunters like this for a snack. The male to her left spit before turning to the female in the beanie. She had help from the sold vampires. Her boyfriend was the one who killed TJ. At name, the woman's yellow eyes glowed brighter. TJ had looked like a banker in his pinstriped suit, not a lover. After Lucas slammed a stake into the vamp's heart to defend her, Red had almost forgotten him. Clearly these vampires hadn't. Less talking, more ripping out her entrails and leaving them for Lucas Crawford to find. The female vampire charged. Red swung the hidden revolver out. Their limbs blurring from supernatural speed, the three rushed her together. Firing, she didn't need to aim for a headshot. Outstretched claws were inches from her. Blood splashed on her face. The sound of the gun blast ripped into her eardrums. The vampiress fell back, her beanie slipping off as she twitched on the ground. Decapitation, fire, sunlight, and wood to the heart were the ways to give the last death to a vampire. Blowing a hole in their forehead might not kill, but it put them down. Ears ringing too loudly to hear the woman's moans, Red whirled around to fire at the male vampire to her left. She missed, heart leaping in her chest. She kept her cross raised to hold off the one on the right. She had too many blind spots, they were too fast, and now they had seen all the tricks up her sleeve. She fired again. He dodged. His partner knelt at the head of his fallen friend. Her brains are everywhere, Fred. Red didn't hesitate. She fired at the kneeling vampire, aiming for his chest. The wood-tipped bullet went through his heart, spraying blood behind him. Immediate decay turned his pale skin gray, and he fell over. A relatively new vampire, he didn't crumble to bones or dust. Either the cops would find a body, or the sun would ignite his corpse. The last vampire stopped, wavering on his heels, as he stared at his prone partners, fangs receding in his gaping mouth. Poor guy had probably never seen a vampire die. Michel de Gramont had turned a crop of cocky minions, promised eternal life, and set them loose on Los Angeles. He sired them to be cannon fodder. Fred must not have gotten the memo. I'd suggest running. She had two more rounds left in the cylinder. If the vampire was smart, he'd flee before she had to use them. Then again, if he had been, he would have left L.A. as soon as Cora regained control. Fred wasn't smart. He charged her, demon yellow flashing in his eyes. Eleven. December 22nd, 919 p.m., empty lot near Moon Enterprises, Inglewood, Los Angeles. Dizziness slammed into red before Fred did. Charging through the patchy grasses of the empty lot, the vampire duplicated in her vision. Two sets of fangs dripped venom. She tensed, a dry heave caught in her throat. Blinking, she planted her feet and fired. Fred cursed, clutching his stomach. She kept steady, chiding herself. That wasn't a kill shot. If he had been older, he would have leapt on her. She had seconds before he realized a vampire could walk off a gut wound. She fired again. The last bullet hit a brick wall. She blinked again, and her vision shifted between her normal sight and her spirit gaze. The lot transformed it into a moonlit scene with neon sigils at shed over the real graffiti like a surreal photography filter had been slapped over the real world. She turned to run from the rescue-turned ambush. Her trembling knees gave out, fingers loosened on the revolver and cross, even as she tried to tighten the grip. Fred turned her to face him and reared back to bite. Red tried to scream, but her mouth wouldn't move. Vision strobed between the gritty, mundane world and third-eye technicolor. She couldn't control it. Head snapping up, fear flashed on his face before he was pulled away. She fell backwards, stomach dropping, muscles freezing in a rolling wave from her toes to her legs, then past her hips. Panic overshadowed the relief that Cora's minions had arrived. 
Locking up, her arms didn't listen to her demands to catch herself. Paralysis had overcome her, and she couldn't even close her eyes. The seconds in freefall felt like minutes. Blood, brighter in the spectral moonlight, arched up as if trying to caress the stars. It splashed at her feet. She mentally steadied herself for impact on the dirty gravel and broken glass strewn lot. Strong arms caught her. She couldn't move her neck to see who held her, even swept up into her rescuer's arms. Fred moldered from decay on the ground. Rot had darkened his pale skin. A hole gaped in his chest. A dark aura rose from his body before disappearing. She couldn't turn off her third eye. Stars twinkled, superimposed on the smog. Electric blue and green ether streams wafted over the overgrown lot. They looked like manic doodles drawn over reality. Gaping at the light show, she tried to raffacuse her regular vision. The light shows only grew brighter as her muscles stiffen it. Cold hands angled her uncooperative body, limbs falling awkwardly to tilt her face. A corona of midnight purple threaded with snowy silver around her rescuer's head. His face came into focus, Kristoff Novak. She tried to say his name, but her tongue lay heavy. Her pulse quickened in her neck near his mark. The buzz grew in her ears. Kristoff held her closer, cradled like a bride, as he peered down at her face. His blue eyes seemed brighter. As he studied her, his chiseled jaw tensed, deepening the cleft in his chin. The dots of splattered blood seemed to glow on his suit collar and dark blonde hair. He put a bloodied hand on her cheek. Red? She tried to scream. She tried to shake. She tried to glare. It was like her body was on strike. Only the involuntary mechanisms like swallowing and breathing functioned. Fuck. He sprinted, and the urban landscape blurred around them. They passed a cop car. Silent sirens painted the alley in red and blue. He didn't pause. Novak! Waving his arms, Officer Chang called out. His voice faded, but the incredulousness followed them. I smell vamp blood. Suddenly slowing, she couldn't see where they were. Headlamps shined too bright, making her wish she could close her eyes. Kristoff came to a dead stop, then walked the rest of the way to the side of a black van, the Millennium Falcon. He adjusted his hold on her, opening the door. If she could have, she would have sagged in relief at the sight of the scruffy old van. What the? You have blood up to your elbow, Vic yelled from the driver's seat. Red, what happened? She wanted to yell back at him, but she could only stare mutely up at Kristoff and the single dark blonde hair out of place in his neatly side-parted hair. She can't talk, he set her in the wheelchair strapped in the back of the van. Now, Red could look out through the windshield. It felt like an improvement, even if she was leaning like a wooden board in the chair. There was fear on Vic's face in the rearview mirror, but the vampire was too powerful to cast a reflection. She strained every ounce of willpower to move, not even a toe twitch. Her internal dialogue devolved into panic. What if they couldn't remove this curse? She battled to stay calm even if it didn't show on her frozen face. Why are her eyes all creepy and open like that? Vic asked. I don't like it. Neither do I. Kristoff hopped into the back of the van to wrap a chair belt around her waist. Vic put the Millennium Falcon into gear, the stick shift squeaking into position. I know a place. I'll take it from here. Kristoff slammed the side door shut, remaining inside. Please come with me. Welcome to my van, the hunter muttered, turning right to get onto the street. The more vampires, the merrier. Red wanted to scowl at the traffic. She managed to drool. Facing ahead, she could only see nighttime Los Angeles spread out beyond the windshield. She couldn't see the vampire as he settled himself, but she sensed his interest. She imagined him studying the van like a dinner guest, checking out the host's bookshelf. This isn't natural, Vic grunted, hunched over the steering wheel. Obviously, Kristoff commented dryly, kneeling next to the wheelchair. She yearned to turn her head, hair up in a high ponytail. His claim on her neck was right at eye level. Her heartbeat trotted up when he reached for her. What was he doing? He gently wiped the mess off her face with a silk handkerchief. Oh. 
Red appreciated not having drying blood on her cheeks, but she didn't know how to feel about having him so close. Probing gaze searching her face, he pulled away to move her legs into a more natural sitting position. She wanted to sigh as her muscles relaxed in relief. He could stay. Hey, stop pawing at her back there. Vic glowered, peeking in the rearview mirror. I already have enough trouble chasing one vampire away from my intern. I'm saving her knees from locking up, Kristoff said calmly, setting her hands on the armrests. I am assuming this is due to that witch. How did you know? Nevi Morgan threw herself off one of my clubs. I had to fly down from Portland to be questioned by the police about why another body was found in that alley. He climbed through the open space between the front seats to settle on the passenger's side. His brow furrowed and his jaw tensed as he looked back at her. A steel edge ringed his calm tone. Why was she alone? I can't exactly run after her when she gets a wild hair to save someone. Vic glared at him, then sighed and reached for his phone on the dash. I need to report to Q. Oh, let me. Focus on the road. Tone mischievous, he picked up the phone. Thumb moved quicker than a human could see over the touch screen to search through the contacts. His voice turned delighted. Why do you call him Greg? That's not Quinn. Vic groaned, slapping the steering wheel before waving for the phone. Come on. If she had been able to move, Red would have died for the phone. She could barely see the screen in her limited vision, but there was no mistaking the vampire's unfurling grin. Lucas's English accent boomed over the speaker. Oi, what's up? Repressed amusement curled under Kristoff's tone. How's my sire this evening? You're on speakerphone with the gang. Novak, if you've done something to Constantine, I'll do it double to you. The promise dripped with malice. Vic sighed. I'm fine. Just regretting picking up a hitchhiker. He stowed away in the van after he brought Red in. What's wrong? You fucked up on this witch case. Kristoff looked back at Red, grin retreating, leaving only a peaked clench of his jaw. She took down two minions, but the third almost had her until I ripped his heart out. Bragger! The rearview mirror caught Vic's scowl. She appears to be in some kind of mystical paralysis. Kristoff's voice lost its earlier amusement. Only a deathly chill remained. Why are minions going after her, Lucas? If she could have gulped, she would have. Hey, no vampire pissing contests. We're going to take her to the same private hospital where Basil is. Vic grabbed the phone and hung up. He held the device against the steering wheel, keeping it out of the vampire's reach. You're a real pot stirrer, Novak. Noted. I'll make the next call to Sheila then. Or is it Shelley? Whichever lady at Smith and Reaper. I'll know her when I see the contact. Smith and Reaper? The banking or legal division? Kristoff asked, sitting up. How do you have an agent there? Long story. Not mine to tell. Vic looked in the rear view window. We're almost there, Red. Hang on. She wanted to roll her eyes, but could only hang on in the wheelchair as the van maneuvered through the traffic. Every moment felt like years as her eyeballs grew drier and her desperation doubled. Lying on the raised medical bed, Red would have been screaming if she had control over her body. The decorator had tried to hide the hospital environment with lush curtains and fine furniture, but an antiseptic smell remained. She could have gagged. The drops that they had put on her dry eyes were the only relief. Involuntary chills dipped down her spine. She could only stare up at the hospital room ceiling. Sight, sound, smell. She was present for it all, but her body didn't react to her commands. The whirl of Vic's electric wheelchair announced his entrance. I heard you were being difficult. Kristoff stood at the head of the bed. He hadn't left her side. Walking with the orderlies who had met them at the entrance, he had growled at them when they tried to get him to leave. Supervising as they adjusted her position, he listened intently to the stern nurse who gave him instructions on how to administer the eye drops. He brushed a stray lock of hair behind her ear. They will treat her better if they know I am around. The blood up your arm is enough of an incentive. Get that suit jacket off before you make a nurse faint. 
Vic leaned over to look down at her. I called my brotherhood contacts, but not even Fat Crispin had anything for me beyond suggesting that Nevea did a death curse. Red stared up at Vic, trying to communicate. He didn't see the secret messages in her eyes, and all she saw was up his nose. She had heard about death curses. She didn't realize that they came in frustrating paralysis. The fear had ebbed enough for annoyance to set in. The door slammed open. Visiting hours are over. Even lowered, a hot current of hate pulsed in Lucas's voice. Vic jerked his head up. Jesus, do you want to be down another hunter? You nearly gave me a heart attack. You haven't kicked this tosser out? Lucas's quiet observation turned into a low growl. Why is he here? I thought, well, gee, he seems like a clean, virtuous young man, Vic said. Christoph's hackles raised. I saved her, you incompetent. Lucas strode forward, his chest nearly bumping his progenies. When he came into her line of sight, his aura swirled navy and gray, streaked with gold. His disdainful gaze scanned Christoph, judging him in a snap. Convenient that you just happen by, waiting in the wings. Have something to say, sire. Why were you there? She had been wondering the same thing, but of course she couldn't make her sluggish tongue chime in. I was leaving Moon Enterprises after being debriefed by the DVA. I smelled red, then heard the scream. Put the clues together quick enough to save her. Kristoff crossed his arms. I rescued her, so spare me the implications. What diabolical scheme do you think I'm plotting now? The same predictable one, as always. Do anything to get closer to her. Get on our good side before you stab us in the back. I know from experience. Casual as a coiled snake, Lucas tilted his head, hands in his pockets, and rocked back on his heels. She doesn't want anything to do with you, so what's a frustrated stalker to do? Maybe send some minions. Gotta weaken her up first before making your move. That's from your playbook, not mine. Stiff jaw eased into a forced grin. Kristoff pulled out his phone. I don't need to engineer sinister plots to talk to her. It's not 1899. His expression turned innocuous as he lifted the screen, swiping his thumb on the screen. We text. Red wished she could interrupt. They had texted each other, but it was usually her asking a favor for work. It killed her to be talked about without a chance to give her side of the story. You pester her. That isn't talking, it's harassment. Lucas formed the word slowly, glaring at his progeny. He strode to the door to hold it open. You've been tolerated long enough for what you've done, now get the fuck out of L.A. I'll hop on my jet when I'm ready. Kristoff crossed his arms. Oh, a jet, is it? Lucas sneered, waving his hands. Commercial not good enough for the corporate Croesus? Matter of fact, no. Drop the poser attitude. I know where you came from. More money than I started with. Vic put his chair between the vampires. We need the extra muscle, but I swear I will have security haul you both out if I have to listen to this all night. Red couldn't take any more. She used all her will to throw herself forward to try and sit up. The room tilted. She grinned. She sat up. Punching her fist in the air, she moved beside Lucas before turning around. What the... The bed wasn't empty. Lying there in black jeans and matching tank top, the red-haired woman stared straight ahead with unblinking, bloodshot eyeballs. Walking to the bedside, Red leaned over the body. It was her. Twelve. December 22nd, 11, 11 p.m., St. Bridget's Hospital, Los Angeles. Red waved her hands in front of an oblivious Lucas and Kristoff. Groaning, she planted her hands on her hips and hung her head. Interpretive dance and screaming hadn't gotten their attention. Why did she think that manic waving would? They couldn't see her waving, hear her yells, or feel the kicks to the shin. She looked real to herself, solid, yet she felt hollow. Her heartbeat drummed in the distance as if it belonged to someone else. She might as well have been a ghost. If it weren't for the steady heart monitor beep, she would have thought she was. Her thigh passed through the corner of the hospital bed as she paced. She tried not to look at her physical eyelids frozen open in shock. 
Unnatural moonlight illuminated the green depths of her eyes. Red felt close enough to see, but not touch the real world. In it, but not of it. She had determined that she was in a spirit form, but hadn't gotten farther in solving the issue than being pissed off about it. Neither had the guys. They were too busy sniffing at each other. Always sniffing around. Lucas walked right through her to point at Kristoff. If you could keep her safe from our kind, would I need to? You're lucky I was there. Lucas's lip curled. You like coming on in like the big hero to save the damsel, so you can get a bite of her yourself. Kristoff lifted his hands to the side with a bitter smile. I learned from the best, didn't I? Vic sighed, then barked into a phone. Hurry up, Quinn. Your grandsons are causing a scene at the hospital. Red rested her forehead on her palm. Foggy auras and vivid sigils of the supernatural hospital dazzled in her peripheral vision. She was still working on turning down the brightness of her new Cerillo sight. Mushrooms didn't have anything on this trip. They're enough to wake the dead, aren't they? A familiar British voice said. Red jumped and turned her head. Basil, you can see me. Of course, clear as I see those two lugs. He smiled, but tension crinkled at the corners of his eyes. His accent slipped in and out of the British one as his voice trembled. He stiffened his lip. In the doorway, he tugged at the teal hospital gown hanging below his knees. It's not fair that you're in street clothes and I'm in hospital couture. It shows off my gams, but it's a bit drafty in the back. Red rushed over and pulled him into a hug. She nearly cried out when she successfully touched him. He felt real. She cringed when she finished the thought, as real as she did. What's going on? Far as I can tell, we're trapped in a limbo between worlds. Basil returned the hug before pulling away. And there isn't a gift shop. I already checked. Judging by the moonlight, it looks like the dreams I had with Kate Batts. She said I was only looking into something. I can't think of the name, but damn, my spirit gaze is dialed up to ten here. Red glanced at her real booty. She honed her sight to see her chakras burning steadily. In the background, seagulls glowed on the walls and radiant mists passed by the window. Have you figured out a way to get back? Maybe another one of your famous hunches? Afraid not. I've picked up some tricks, but that's the one eluding me. He walked through a glaring Kristoff to stare down at her body. I'm now suddenly grateful that my eyes are closed. Dry eye is a bitch, not as much as a mystical coma, she groused. Well, we all have something. My jaw is wired shut. Basil scowled. His focus was stolen by Lucas, who walked through him. He glared after the vampire who stepped to the other. Pardon me, then. Ugh, I will never get accustomed to the rudeness. What game are you playing now, Novak? This is a move, Lucas insisted. You bit her, but that's not enough. You need to get into her head. Unlike you, I don't have time to mess with her head. I have a job that my grandsire didn't give me. Kristoff clenched his jaw. I'm betting those minions were looking to settle a score with you and found her instead. Let's exit the testosterone storm, shall we? Basil gestured to the door. She nodded, following him out to the hallway. Things are getting heated. Judging by the hostility wafting off Lucas, we're lucky he has a soul. It could get uglier. Basil leaned against the wall, sinking halfway into it. His surly face disappeared into the wall, leaving only startled, flailing arms behind. Red jumped back, jaw dropping. Holy shit, she had accidentally walked through objects, but she didn't know it looked like that. Ghost body aside, she didn't feel like a spirit, but watching him forced the surreal reality on her. Ugh, I forgot to concentrate. He pulled himself upright to rest on the wall in a second try. How did you get here? Red relayed the tale, short as it was. The fight with the minions had been pure physical force. She hadn't sensed any magic use from them. Even the magical sigils over the nearby graffiti had been drawn to prevent fires and theft. Nevai. She lowered her eyes and said quietly, She's dead. 
Christmas came early then. I already eavesdropped enough to know I have her to thank for my condition. Basil raised his eyebrow. Death curse on us. If it was a death curse, then it has a delayed reaction. Red kicked at the ground, trying to concentrate on letting her foot slip through. Her eyes widened when her toe disappeared into the linoleum. If she still had a heart in her chest, it would skip a beat. Was she cuffed in iron? She refocused on him and not on her experiment in defying matter. She was when she fell. What about after? Basil asked. He continued at her confused look. After she was buried. I don't know, she said. Vengeful witches could be neutralized after death by being buried in cold iron. Had Funeral Home gotten the curious request? Cora Moon had taken over the case as a high-profile dark veil breach in her jurisdiction. What have you learned so far about this place? Not enough. The bell witch, Kate Batts, appeared in a cloud of green mist that tangled over her like vines before disappearing. Deep creases around her mouth emphasized her frown. Her fists balled up next to her long gingham skirt. A scolding tone reprimanded them. Two babes lost in the dark forest. Good God, is that paling? Basil jumped back. The bell witch! Call me that not, soul mancer. She glared at him, green shimmering in her hazel eyes before she turned to red. Shaking hands in front of her, Red wanted to call a mental time out. How many lives did Kate have? They had unplugged her from the world of the living, and her slave master had died. Was she a witch or a cat? How are you here? We released you. I lost my chains to the mortal realm, but I cannot cross beyond yet. Expression tightening from worry, she touched Red's shoulder. Sister witch, you are in danger. Yeah, I'm separated from my body. Red waved her finger at her own face, then her torso to point out that she had already copped to the obvious danger. Hello, spirit here. How do I get back in? That is a concern. But a far graver one is the evil after you. Kate gazed down the hall. Her brow wrinkled as her lips tightened. I feel a returning enemy on the horizon. Never, yeah. Red steeled herself for round two with the Dark Witch. My former master is coming, yes. I fear you will have more than one trial, Kate warned, then turned to Basil as if taking his measure. You both need to learn how to defend yourself here. My hand goes through everything. I can't pick up a weapon or even smack anyone. Red put her hand through the wall, letting the material go up to her wrist. He crossed his arms. We're in the spirit world. Oh, no soul, Mancer. You aren't in that plane. You are in the dreamland. I hope that this is as far as you stray. You still have some power here. Kate clasped her hands in prayer. We need to work quickly. What can you show us? Basil asked and lifted his hand. He squinted at his palm. A glowing, translucent sphere appeared to glitter through his fingers. Intention seems to rule. What else? True. This is a land where you can wish, and if you can let yourself have it, it is yours. Kate waved her hand over his, and the orb turned into a scorpion. If you have the power to keep it. Black and the size of a man's head, the scorpion whipped its tail forward. He yelled and dropped it, jumping back. The scorpion skittered for red. Her first reaction was to step on it. Then she remembered Kate's words. Brute force wouldn't work in the dreamland in the same way. She wished the scorpion was a cat. Good with cats, she ignored them, and they went away. She tried not to think about the times they purred and curled up in her lap. The scorpion transformed into a fat black tabby. It still had a stinger at the end of its tail, but instead of attacking, it only rubbed itself on her legs. The furry bulk felt real. Kate nodded. Your will is strong when you release what is and accept what could be. The scorpion cat disappeared. Impressed, Red leaned closer to examine the empty space where the creature had been. Straightening, she nodded resolutely. Then I wish to wake up. She concentrated, her eyelids crinkling closed as she imagined herself waking. She even tried the Samantha nose twitch from Bewitched. 
You just look constipated. Basil sighed. He turned, wrapping his arms around his waist. If it was that easy, I would have done it to us both already. You're both being kept here. Nevi alone holds you, Soulmancer. But Sister Witch, you have a dark one seeking you, Kate said urgently. His magic isn't his own, yet he has wielded it for many years. It feels like... In the closed hallway, a breeze picked. Red shivered even without a body. What is that? Nevi hasn't come back on her own. Kate put an arm out to block the other woman from striding forward. Red arched forward, trying to block the panic of a male torso popping through her chest. She glanced down, sniping. Really? Uh, Quinn looked over his shoulder before entering the hospital room. His nostrils flared before he gave a minute shake of his head. Shoulders relaxing, she followed him. Finally, he can break up the cockfight. Maybe he's seen something like this in 280 years. You have much to learn, Kate called after her, scolding. Something is up in here. Red poked her head into the hospital room to see Vic arranging salt and iron ore on a rolling table by her bed. She walked deeper into the room. I came as soon as I could, Quinn said, staring mournfully at the bed. His knotted brow framed sad eyes. Cora is looking for any stray rogues and waiting for the minion to heal to question her, too. They have connections to Michelle. Of course they do, Kristoff said bitterly, leaning against the wall. Has the Black Libertine brought us anything useful? Red looked away from the distasteful sight of herself lying like meat on the bed. Maybe Selene could... Lucas trailed off, wrapping his leather-clad arms around himself. Red shook her head. Celine Burns wasn't just Lucas's ex-girlfriend and sire. She was a vampire who still retained her magic powers, including visions. Also, she was insane. Certifiable. Who knew, even as a sold vampire, what she would do? If intention ruled the dreamland, then she intended to not have Celine anywhere near her. She tried to imagine a golden web of protection around her physical form. It flicked up in her vision. That had gone far better than any of her other spells. Her magic felt closer to the surface here. Oh, neat. Absolutely not. Dismissing the idea, Kristoff slashed his palm through the air as if swatting it away. Even with a soul, Selene is more likely to kill her for looking like Juniper than save her life. Red bobbed her head. Things were already chaotic enough without Selene in the mix. It could help, Quinn considered, rubbing his nails on his chest, looking down at them thoughtfully. Possibly. Vic glanced between the vampires. Can she be trusted? Will you be able to control her? Kristoff snorted. Celine has had them whipped since the beginning. Lucas always chooses her first. Fist clenching, Lucas glared at him. Don't you... Let's try it ourselves before we call in the crazy guns, Vic said with diplomatic firmness, putting his finger up. I think we've gathered enough of your freak show family together. Lucas sat on the edge of the bed, tense, as if he expected to spring up again. Does Cora have any mages on staff? My girl is in rough shape. My marks are on her neck, Kristoff reminded darkly, laser focus on his sire's proximity to Red's body. Lucas stood. He matched the daggers in his progeny's gaze. His fiery words were delivered as a sharp promise. I can reclaim that blood whelp. Try. I'm curious to see what happens. Blue eyes glinting like ice chips, not a single inch of Kristoff's six-foot-four frame backed down from his maker. I won last time. That was last century. The younger vampire wore the grin of a man anticipating revenge served cold. Enough. Quinn was quiet, but the order cut through the bickering. Finally. Red tilted her head back, rubbing the bridge of her nose. Were they going to kill each other before they could save her? Thank God. They've been like this since we got here. Vic gestured to the ritual set up. I don't know if Cora can bring in a specialist, but this hospital has mages on staff. The doctor ruled out a host of mystical toxins, but her symptoms match curses from warlocks to alchemists. They're analyzing the spell, 
but it's an old arcane style. European, he thinks. Bloody fucking useless. Red sighed. Lucas was right. It wasn't much. Vic glared at the interruption. Best guess it's the Bell Witch. Neva might have been able to summon her in a death curse. Sometimes malignant spirits freak out on the ones that killed their master. Red might not have killed Neve, but she was near her, or it could have been spectral residue from taking out the shrine. Maybe it's that dumb blonde from beyond the grave. I don't know. Wincing as if a migraine hit him, he rubbed his temples. That's the best I have right now. It's something. Let's go for the obvious. Quinn put his hand on the hunter's shoulder. She's just lying there, Quinn. Our bat girl in our untraditional bat family. Vic took Red's physical hand, chest heaving as his mouth twisted to stop the quivering of his chin. I know what it's like not being able to move. She's in a prison. I don't know what to do, not when I'm like this. We're going to get her out, Quinn vowed. Determination hung on his strong brow. What if she can hear this? All this bullshit and bumbling, they say they can still hear, even in a coma. Vic glared at the others. And you two shit heels, fighting like dogs over a bone. Get it together, fuck sticks. I'm still here! I can hear you! Red said the words, even knowing he couldn't hear. She glanced back at Kate. They're setting something up. I have all three eyes on them, sister witch. She called from the hallway. You need to practice. Hone your powers in the dreamland before you are tested. I'm already becoming the best student, Basil bragged. They need me. Feet dragging, Red turned away from her friends and went into the hallway. She didn't like looking at her body, but it felt weird to leave it behind. You need you. Basil put a hand on her shoulder and guided her away. Now, listen carefully. It's a tale that deserves a proper retelling, but we shan't linger. Time passes mighty queer in the dreamland. Kate's usual southern draw galloped into a rapid clip. This old enemy, he thought you were lost in time. He carries pieces of you. This man has many names. Maxwell is not what he goes by at the present, but he will answer to it if you call. The last name, he clenches tight to like a family secret. He believes he is chosen. Maxwell, that name... Red glanced at Basil. An unknown dread filled her as she struggled to remember. He shrugged. Fix your attention to me. The first step to mastery is acceptance. You have more than you know here. Let yourself... Kate clutched at her heart, breath heaving, a warning sparking in her aura. Then the bell witch slumped over. Thirteen. December 22nd, 1155 p.m., Dreamland, St. Bridget's Hospital, Los Angeles. Kate, what's happening? Phantom gut dropping, Red pivoted to the door. Vic, stop! Glowing green and purple ether silhouetted Vic. It strobed out of the doorway to reflect on the hallway walls. Hoarse, his Latin chant came out in rumble. He held the leather journal, but he knew every word handwritten by his adopted father. His gaze lasered in on the hospital bed. Candlelight reflected on the sage smoke wafting around him. Rough iron nuggets gleamed on the rolling tray, jutting from the salt circle like shark fins in choppy white waves. Quinn stood behind him as a silent monolith in shadow. The electricity in his aura crackled. He was ready for a fight. Kate pushed past her to glide into the hospital room. You know not, dead men. They're exercising her. Panic rising, Red ran after. She tried to pick up a lamp to toss it at their heads, but her hand went through it. Helplessness tightened her chest. Kate had tried to teach her, and Red barely listened. It might already be too late. She yelled at her useless ghost hand. Fucking hell! The bell witch rippled in green light as she passed through the foot of the hospital bed. Tight layers of reality and consciousness parted for her. Kate had crossed out of the dreamland and into the real world. Eyes flicking up, Vic didn't slow his chant. Jumping up and pulling an iron dagger from his leather jacket, Lucas stabbed Kate's side in a swift jerk. His amber gaze glared through his tousled black hair. He blew an unruly lock out of his face, revealing sharp fangs. Kate arched her back and veered toward the head of the bed. 
Her greenish glow filtered over Red's comatose form to glitter in the glassy open eyes. She tried to explain, I'm here for her. The words sounded less comforting to the men as it did to Red. Kristoff slashed his hand forward instinctively, fingers curled to rip into a heart and pull it out. He cursed, grabbing air. Lucas tossed the dagger up before catching the downward handle to plunge down in the bell witch's back. Blade point inches from the heart of the comatose patient, he jerked his hand back. Kate cried out, Away with ye! Darting around the fight to get to the bed, Red cried out to her helpless body, Get up! Flinging herself up to cling to the ceiling, Kate hissed down at the vampires. I name thee devils making a muck of being angels. The shadow reaches for her, I warn you. A determined jut to his chin, Vic shook an open silver flask to splash holy water. A page, et abirunt. Quinn took the leather journal from Vic and intoned the exorcism. Grabbing a blessed silver cross from the table with his sleeve, he raised it. Smoke sizzled from his palm. Hands up, Red stood between the hunters and the bell witch. Stop, please. Fools, this will be hell upon her, Kate bellowed. She swung herself horizontal to soar toward the body on the bed, skirt fluttering behind her, arms cast out, and back hunched to shield. Her wide eyes darted to Red. The old enemy comes, run, children. You heard her, Basil yelled, accent dissolving into a Midwestern panic. No, Kate, we can't leave you. Tears in her eyes, Red shook her head, standing her ground in the chaos of the room. Lucas lunged to slice Kate's arm. Vic held the flask straight down to pour holy water over the body on the bed. He tossed it over his shoulder and took the silver cross from Quinn to brandish it. A page! And stay the hell out! Basil shouted from the doorway. Get away from whatever he is conjuring. We need to help her! Red ran to pull the other witch away from the hospital bed. What if the third exorcism was the charm? Kristoff pivoted toward Red, his fangs drawing back. Lucas slashed the bell witch over the kidneys with his dagger. Kate howled, zooming to the floor like a downed plane, leaving red sparks in her wake. She pushed herself up to her knees. A swirling green vortex expanded behind her. Loose locks from her low bun swept back toward the shimmering light. Shadows grew over her thin, plain features. Regret dulled her eyes. I tried to save you, sister witch. What did she say? Kristoff asked. His voice was lost in the chanting. Hold on! Heart tightening with a pang, red shaded her eyes from the conjured brilliance. She had cleansed spirits before with this ritual pushing them from limbo and into the afterlife. She had never seen it like this. In the psychedelic lens of the dreamland, the vortex to the beyond churned like a sea of fireworks. She couldn't imagine how Kate could come back this time. Loose it, Uri! Vic whipped around the hospital bed in his chair, cross held forward like a lance. He bellowed the ominous Latin like a war cry. Abiet in sempiternum. Not that! Red leapt forward to push Kate toward the vortex. It was better than the new one being summoned by Vic. Crying out, Kate pointed east. The dark one. Exilium, Vic panted as he slumped back in his chair. Flames surged over to the bell witch's waist. Her hazel eyes reddened to embers. Fire burst from her eye sockets. The conflagration coursed to flood over the ceiling before slamming to the floor like a rough tide coming in. Sucked back below, the flames disappeared, leaving the room dim even in the unnatural moonlit grow of the dreamland. Scorches marked the spot where Kate Bats burned. Red knelt by the marks, expecting to see ash instead of moonlight on her fingertips. She glowered at Vic, blinking back tears before slapping the scorch marks. Her ghostly hand didn't make a sound as it passed through the floor. You got the wrong witch! Basil knelt, wrapping an arm around her shoulders. Hey, hey. They sent Kate to a very bad place. Sob escaping her, she laid her head on his chest. Her face burned as if she had sat too close to a campfire in hell. I know, and I was just getting over her putting me in the hospital. Basil pulled her up to take her into the hallway. Okay, let's regroup. We're down an ally, but we still have three hunters and a supernatural hospital on our case. 
They're on the other side. Kate was our protection here. Red wiped her eyes. The tears felt wet on her cheeks, but they were a mirage, drying instantly on her fingers. She gnashed her teeth as self-recriminations looped through her head. We don't know anything about the dreamland. I don't even know how I can still cry here. Well, we're alone, so face it. We have to protect ourselves. He puffed his chest up and put his hands on his hospital gown-covered hips. Our shells are just lying there. Anyone could send us into the spirit plane, or worse. I put a protection on myself. She jerked her thumb back at the translucent net hovering over her body, rippling golden sparkles. But I don't know if it's an umbrella in a hurricane. Fingers crossed that a normal spell works right here. Basil hustled down the hall, tied hospital gown flapping around revealing a bare butt and tan lines. He darted through a closed door next to her room. His face popped back out of the wood to glare at her. Help me then. Hop to it. Jogging forward, Red closed her eyes as she thought transparent thoughts. She walked through the door, half expecting herself to hit it. Instead, her spirit passed into the room without even a squish or a jostle to the nearby picture on the wall. She opened her darting eyes. She did it. Ghost, level up. He leaned over his body, a perfect duplicate, except in spirit form he looked healed and whole. Outside the dreamland, he looked rough. His physical face was swollen with purple bruises. Chapped lips stretched over the wires on his teeth, keeping the jaw shut. A heart monitor beeped in the background. In the physical realm, she would have had to summon up her magical energy, cast a blessed circle, and boost herself up with various crystals, herbs, and relics. Even with all the mystical accessories, it had a good shot of failing. She didn't feel more powerful in the dreamland, even if her magic felt closer. Intention just had power here. Her own magic simply gave it a jolt. Red visualized a golden web of protection over Basil. She pushed her gratitude for his presence into her intention as she wished for his body to be free from harm. He needed to only to be safe, but also to feel safe. That required something more splendid than the minimalist net of light around her own body. She tried to make the visuals of the web more ornate with spectral curls of gold surrounding the Soulmancer's body. The web glittered as intention pulsed through it. I see it, Basil sighed wistfully. Makes me wish I was a witch. You're a soulmancer. Can you just send us back into our bodies? Who am I? Father Matthew ready to soul the fanged four and start the August harvest. Red shrugged at the snarky mention of the most famous soulmancer in history. You charge enough. That's because I have the best marketing. He crossed his arms. I can read souls, I can cleanse them, and I can kick off compulsion like the one Neve put on Airy Goldstein, but I'm a tad limited right now without my body. Have you tried? No, I've just been painting my nails here waiting for the supernatural Avengers to show up. Of course I have. I can read a soul here, and I can even conjure a pretty picture in the air with my mind which is new. I learned that from Kate when you were eavesdropping on the boys, sewing myself or you together, not so much. He gestured to the room next door. Until they figure something out, we're on our own, Red. I wouldn't say that. An amused voice chimed out from the doorway in a British accent. Unlike Basil's, it sounded authentic. A tall man leaned on the doorframe, form flickering in and out of focus, Framed by shoulder-length chestnut brown hair, his face would have been handsome without the amused sneer that said the joke was on them. Dreamland moonlight shimmered on the folds of his purple velvet suit. A matching top hat perched on his head, his teeth bared in the semblance of a smile between his mustache and goatee like a fox spotting a rabbit. Stand back! Basil retreated, pulling on her arm. She didn't need the warning. Malignant intent drifted off the man. Nevaeh Morgan elbowed past the stranger. The green ruffles on her black sequined dress quaked in agitation as she stomped barefooted into the room. We have the bitch! Breath-catching, Red shook her head, hoping the vision of the dead actress would fade. 
The soulmancer clung to her. You know how to ruin a man's entrance, Navai. The specter tipped his hat, form solidifying as if finally anchored in the dreamland. My crude companion is correct, however her verbiage. It's been lifetimes and yet too soon, which you're finally in my grasp. Glaring at him, Neve pouted. Our grasp. Calculation twinkled in the strange man's dark eyes. Anticipation grew in his smirk. One would have thought I'd feel a sense of completion, as if I'd sent the last alimony check. Queer. I feel more righteous seeing you again. That's not quite it. He stepped forward, snapping his fingers in realization. Vindicated. That is the word. I knew you'd be back. We don't know each other. Her doppelganger senses tingling, Red sensed the incoming mistaken identity shenanigans. She didn't have any tricks in there, nothing beyond the gift to turn a scorpion half into a cat, and she was fresh out of scorpions. He shook his head. You're like a cockroach that is determined to not remain squashed. That's me. Red didn't intend to stay for repartee with either of them and grabbed Basil's hand. Let's motor. She appeared behind the wheel of the Millennium Falcon, blinking in shock. Where had the hospital gone? She didn't waste a second wondering. The street beckoned her to jet out of the quiet parking lot. She reached for the van keys, only to fumble with air. Fuh. Basil landed in the passenger seat. He glanced around, eyebrows raised. What is this, the mystery machine? It smells like pot and Mountain Dew. Hey, I used to call this home. I feel it coming closer. We need something safer than the parking lot. I know, I'm thinking. Her chin trembled from the unnerving power of an unseen force rising like trouble on the horizon. She didn't even picture a location, just willed herself away. The van disappeared, replaced by table booth at a restaurant. She bounced in the red vinyl seat from the force of her landing. Wide aid, they sat across from each other in the booth next to oblivious diners. Even without a real body, she panted, trying to catch her breath without lungs. The shock of being somewhere else in an instant made her skin crawl. She thought teleportation would be cool, not terrifying in practice. He leaned over the table, torso half passing through it. Where in the world are we? I don't know. I just wish to be safe. I didn't put a whole lot of thought into it, Red snapped, looking around the diner at the completely normal people scattered around them with chili fries and iced teas. I'm still stuck on the part with the English guy in the purple suit, Maxwell. But seriously, where are we? Who are they? Basil pointed to the black woman with a halo of curls next to him. Pink energy shimmered around her hands as she ate French fries. Red glanced at the Hispanic man on her side of the booth. Her spectral hand popped out of his black t-shirt where she rested her arm. She winced and moved away. Pardon me. The man shivered, eyes darting around, green heart chakra radiating in the dreamland moonlight. Basil glanced at the woman. She isn't fully human. Maybe you found us some heroes. Are they from your brotherhood? Red shrugged. She'd met a lot of hunters, but she didn't remember these two. Wonder what her power is. He is kind of glowing in the chest, too. Zack, if you could go back to high school, would you? The woman asked her friend. I miss it. It was simpler. The three of us. Don't start down that road, Stace. Zack dipped his head. Red waved her hand over the fries. Hello? Do you have the power to see me? Of course not, Basil groused. Brilliant. We can die in the dreamland while unidentified supernaturals go on a carb binge. He leaned in, ketchup bottle passing through him. Where are we? Do you feel safest in places with greasy seats? I have no idea. Maybe, actually. She looked around at the diner. This feels familiar, but I can't place it. Signs for the Oregon Ducks hung on the white walls amid license plates. Folksy crafts like dream catchers and carved signs with drinking mottos like Never Fear When There Is Beer. A pop song bubbled through a boombox on the counter. People chattered and dined on burgers. It looked like one of those local institutions that bragged about having the best of some wacky regional specialty, 
called a garbage plate or the mountain moose. Maybe I pass through here with Vic? Red frowned, looking at the tree-lined gravel parking lot out the window. Dark branches shined with ghostly leaves that had long since fallen. She kept expecting to see her reflection, but her aura was blurred in the glass, even in the dreamland. Her eyes darted from the pictures of James Dean and Marilyn Monroe on the bathroom doors to the pretty middle-aged brunette waitress at the counter filling a pint beside a duct-taped boombox covered in stickers. Even in the dreamland moonlight, the place looked like the picture of small-town normalcy, with red and basile's weirdness scribbled on top. I think we're in Oregon. I haven't been there in a year. Well, let's just order pancakes then. Oh, wait, we don't have stomachs. Well, Mr. Best Student, you do something. I'm the one dragging us all over. I told you I can't put us in our bodies. Basil crossed his arms and breathed heavily out of his nose. He rose from the table. I'm useless. My fee remains the same. I didn't mean it like that. Frustrated with herself, Red tugged at her hair. She stepped out behind him. They couldn't fight each other. We're both stressed. We're stuck in a coma dream with some ungodly force in a top hat after us. And Neve's back. She is the worst. What was that dress? Basil shook his head as he whirled around. Green ruffles? Black sequins? What is this? The Viper Room in 88? Is she auditioning for a White Snake video? She wanted to go out in style. I guess she chose Bad Bitch at a 1980s prom. We can figure this out. Or maybe Vic already has something. You never know. He's probably judging a dick measuring contest between those vampires right now. She cringed at the inappropriate visual. I didn't need that in my brain. You don't have a brain right now. It's back in your body, which is far more dressed than mine. My arse is hanging out. He slammed his hand on his hip. Wincing in sympathy, she looked away. I didn't want to say anything. He sighed, picking at the waist of his hospital gown. Kate taught us parlor tricks. Don't see how that will help us now. Maybe we can find you some phantom pants. Can you wish harder to cover up for both our sakes? The lights of the diner flashed. None of the small town folk seemed to notice. They drank their sodas and ate their chow, chatting with each other, voices fighting with the music. I don't like this! Basil wrapped his arms over his head, cowering. This is like a tornado warning. Stomach dropping, Red felt a tug around her middle. Her mouth gaped open. She could only blink as the room transformed. The walls of the diner seemed to melt. They reformed into a dingy, whitewashed brick chamber. A single bare bulb flickered in the darkness. Even the ghostly moonlight of the dreamland seemed dimmed here. Where are we? she asked, spinning in a tight circle, fingers habitually gripping a stake that wasn't there. What was happening now? In the dreamland, fear of the unknown was justified. Right where I want you. The strange man in the top hat stepped into the light. Just kill them already, Maxwell, Nevaeh nagged, appearing at his side. Maxwell Baldacci. Red realized where she had heard the name before Kate had warned her. It had been locked away in memory of a dark conversation with a master vampire on a rooftop high above L.A. He tried to use knowledge of Juniper's warlock enemy as bait to join his side. She had mocked Michelle, saying that the warlock was dead when he tried to give her intel. She should have listened. In the metaphorical flesh, Maxwell smirked at her. Juniper St. James, you should have stayed lost. Neve surged past him quicker than a vampire with her shoulders squared like a linebacker. The hate on her face was as clear as the smudged mascara around her eyes. 14. Erin. December 23rd, 12.01 a.m., Dreamland, the Asylum. Neve rushed forward. Rage flashed in her gaze brighter than the bare light bulb swinging above the brick-walled chamber. Her blackened aura dimmed the sparkle of her sequined cocktail dress. Pivoting to the side, Red stuck her foot out to sweep the other witch off her legs. Instinct ruled as fervent intention pulsed through her. She could touch Basil, but he was still alive. 
Could she touch a ghost in dreamland? Neve tripped with a snarl. She hopped as she regained her footing and swung her palm up. Hey, I can touch you. Smiling, Red raised her fists in a boxer's stance. Basil laughed. If this is the kind of fight you want, Neve, I don't think you're going to win it against a hunter. Posing his fingers on his goatee, Maxwell raised an eyebrow. He disappeared, teleporting to stand at Red's side. How many handsome chaps will you lead to their deaths, Juniper? Time to go. Basil paled and grabbed for Red's hand. The brick walls half faded into his hospital room, prone body on the high medical bed, quaked into view, blinking in and out like a broken hologram. Oh my God, I'm doing it. I'm taking us there. Traveling in the dreamland could mean going to a location or bringing it to you. Yearning to escape, Red threw her willpower into going back to her friends. A mystic tie held her feet to the rough floor. She felt pulled in two directions, stretched tight like taffy before it split. I'm faster, Nevi blurred, tense with the focus of an Olympic sprinter about to pounce. She disappeared. Maxwell waved goodbye, smirking at Basil. This is a favor. Reflect on that. Mouth pitched to scream. The soul mancer vanished in mid-breath with the hospital bed, revealing the empty gloom of the chamber behind it. What did you do to him? Red tried to teleport away, but her spirit was anchored in place as if poor red in concrete. I prefer you friendless and distraught. Maxwell held out his palm and crooked his fingers. I still have friends. Ghostly heart palpitating, she backed away, even as his will tugged her forward. She tried to focus on the wavering, translucent image of Basil's physical body on the medical bed. Stay put. Better yet, let me indulge in some nostalgia. Shrouded in shadow, the warlock blended into the murk. Only his smirk remained, his white teeth glowing like the Cheshire cats in the gloom. The gloom morphed. Fuzzy edges became distinct. The square room smelled of ammonia and blood like a hospital nightmare. An unbalanced, traumatized aura hung over the room in a smog. Cold from a long, dark winter lingered. Her black tank top and jeans were replaced by a rough, loose dress, dingy from dust. Bruises and old cuts circled her wrists. Muscle memory tightened her throat. Primal panic coursed down her limbs. She stilled her trembling legs. Even without a body, goosebumps rippled up her arms. Red ran to the door, telling herself she could go through it. She thumped against the wood. There was no knob. Fuck! This is how I like you best, Juniper. I'm not Juniper, you sick son of a bitch. I don't care what you two had. She's dead. You're dead. Get over it. She pawed at the space where a doorknob should be. Her heartbeat, usually so far away in her body, clapped like thunder in her ears. Oh, that is sweet. I had heard you had amnesia, but seeing your slack-jawed ignorance, it's like a fine cognac to savor. Was this meant to be a mercy or merely make you easier to kill? Maxwell's disembodied grin spun around her. Resplendent in a purple suit, his body appeared slowly. He tossed his top hat to the side. It glided to land on a hulking, boxy contraption covered in dials and scales. A wood-handled switch jutted from the center. He chuckled as he stroked his goatee. But then again, this must sound like gibberish to you. What a blessing for not Juniper. You don't have to remember what she did. I remember in technicolor detail how that iron whore murdered my friends, cursed my life force, and then stabbed me. In my favorite suit, no less. Sounds like a good time. Red pressed herself against the door willing herself to sink into it and flee. Whatever piece of Juniper St. James is in you, I will cut it out. The shadows of the room crowded behind the warlock as if backing him up, hovering in a poison haze. A light broke out to shine on a tarnished metal table in the middle of the room. Leather straps lay waiting on the dirty surface. This is a dream, Red said. You can't hurt me. Foolish girl, this is the dreamland, but you are not dreaming. Maxwell's laugh bounced off the walls. He slashed his hand through the air. Slivers of yellow currents followed the wake. She raised her arms to cover her face. 
Pain cut across her forearms. Blood welled on her pale skin. The slashes were thin, as if she had been cut with a rapier. She scratched at the door, yearning for a doorknob with everything she had. One appeared. She turned it before slamming her shoulder against the heavy door. It cracked open into a dark hallway. She slipped through the crack and sprinted down the hall. Neve appeared in a glimmer of red behind Maxwell. Why are you playing with her, handsome? His answer echoed on the whitewashed brick. We're scaring her to death. Panting breath trumpeting in her ears, red covered the cuts on her arm. Closed doors and barred windows lined the walls. The hallway seemed to stretch forever as she ran. She turned a corner. Maxwell waited in the center of the hall, a long white lab coat draped over his purple suit. Nevia glowered behind him. Red spun around to go down the other side. Two orderlies in dirty leather aprons and surgical masks blocked her way. Zombie red eyes, bloodshot and crusted, fixed on her. It's time for your treatment. You'll be so much happier after the lobotomy, Maxwell called out. Lucas Crawford isn't here to save you this time. That's where you're wrong, Red called over her shoulder, summoning as much hunter swagger as she could. He'll come for me. That's an old tune, but you never sang it so gratefully before. He raised an eyebrow, his lips pressed in a thin line of contemplation, the first sign of doubt in his eyes. You really don't remember. There was only one way. Running back down the hall, the light from the surgery room guided her forward. Red visualized Lucas, his beautiful gray eyes and impish smile, and yearned to be with him. Even before she'd met him, she had dreamed of him saving her. Somehow, she knew he would always find her if she got close enough. The grim hallway disappeared, and the brick under her feet turned into hospital linoleum. She didn't stop running until passing through her own body, laying comatose in the private hospital room. The illusion of the dingy dress falling aside to reveal a dark top and jeans. The golden net of protection over her physical body twitched. A rain of poisonous-looking hail slammed into it, bouncing off and pivoting to strike again. The net blocked most of the swarm, but gnat-like orbs still whizzed over her helpless body. She put power behind her intention to not die tonight. Listen, Magic, you don't always like me, and I don't always like you, but we've got to work together. Obey me for once, she told herself, beckoning the coiled energy within. In the dreamland, she could see the fiery sphere behind her belly button. She visualized tossing a thread of her magic into her protection spell and the one around Basil. Energy seeped from her to strengthen the defenses. What's happening, Vic? Quinn walked through her spirit to stand by the hunter. Flinching, she shifted her shoulders before doing a double take. On the bed, her body shook, legs jerking and eyes blinking. Tears streamed down her temples from the corner of her eyes. I thought we vanquished the Bell Witch. Lucas pulled the iron dagger from his jacket. Get a doctor. Kristoff pressed on her shoulders to stabilize her convulsions. I told you that Bats was trying to tell us something. Red gasped at the cuts appearing on her body's arms. Kate said that time moved differently in the dreamland, but didn't mention the delayed reaction on their real bodies. Red closed her eyes and visualized the web of protection around her body harder. Stay up, damn you! A purple siren light went off in the room. Shit! She is being attacked! Vic looked up, gaze narrowing at the vampires. Eyes of predatory amber, Kristoff focused on the blood dripping from her arms. Lucas glared at him, flashing fang. I'll take your eyes if you don't put that look away, boy. I'll get the mage doctor. Keep them from fighting. Quinn sprinted from the room. Great. I'll break up the dog fight from my chair, Vic muttered through gritted teeth. He leaned over to press a towel to her closest arm. If you two can't be helpful, get the hell out. Red stepped through him and leaned over to her body. She gasped as she contacted her own skin, blood stained on her spectral fingertips. She couldn't get into her body. A barrier blocked her, but she could touch it. Her hand went through when she tried again. She focused and touched her arm again. It felt like she was trying to press through memory foam. 
The blood moved under her fingers. Vic lifted the towel. She's bleeding. Where is that damn doctor to zap her with some mojo? Lucas called over his shoulder. What's that? Kristoff leaned forward, his hands clenching behind his back, nostrils flaring at the scent of blood. Ignoring him, she concentrated on interacting with her comatose body. Using the spilled blood like ghoulish finger paint, she wrote a single word. Vic read it. Warlock? Thank God. Red felt herself growing tired from pouring her will into manipulating the physical world. The connection with her own blood was slippery. It was more like the magic in the blood cells reacted to her, not the blood itself. She couldn't give them a full memo of the shit that she and Basil had dealt with. Hoping that they'd figure it out, she started writing two other words on the next arm. The light flickered in the room. She cursed. Not again. Asylum. Dreamland. Vic read with worried wonder. It's like she was cut off. Take care of me. She ran out of the room, passing through the wall into another patient's room and then another. The lights went out in each room as she passed. She knew it wasn't just a dreamland blackout when the confused mutterings of the patients and guests sprang up in the hospital. She turned, ducking and weaving, into the hallway and through Quinn as he turned a corner. She cringed, putting her hands up, the shock stopping her. White coat fluttering, a doctor jogged beside him. Our sensors are off the charts with mystical energy, Mr. Burns. Can you do something about it? I'm a mage doctor, not a psychic, and the medium is being blocked. Terry took one look at her aura and got a nosebleed. Same with Basil Bansko. Lucas ran into the hallway, growling. Quinn, it's the warlock. Maxwell Baldacci, Quinn muttered, dark remembrance in his tone. Red wanted to kick him in the shins and make him explain. Ceiling lights flickered again. The overwhelming presence of the warlock's evil made her chest feel too tight even without a corporeal body. She had found Lucas, but he couldn't save her. Forcing her feet forward, she struggled against the hand of a giant squeezing her around the waist. It pulled her into the darkness. Fifteen. Did he so... December 23rd, 12th and 12 a.m., Dreamland, a movie theater. Red plopped into the velvet-padded chair, legs sprawling. A white screen loomed in front of her. Ghostly moonlight sifted over her spirit form like flour on dough. Manacles appeared around her wrists, attaching them to the armrests. She jerked her arms, but the manacles wouldn't budge. A bouncy tune jingled from unseen speakers. Let's all go to the lobby to get some snacks. After the last few jumps through time and space, she was more piqued than confused. She bounced around from the hospital to Oregon to that asylum hellscape all night. Why not a movie theater? They were in Hollywood, after all. Down in front, Neve called out. She sat with Maxwell two rows back, wearing 3D glasses. The empty theater seats spread behind them, silver smoke wafting up from the aisles. Red couldn't tell if they were superimposed on the real world, or if this was another chamber of torment designed by the warlock. The farther she traveled in the dreamland, the more she wondered where it began or ended. Not just where, but in whose mind. You're going to make us miss the best part. Neve shook a box of milk duds and popped one into her mouth. My delightful ingenue provided some rare insight. Maxwell tweaked her chin before smirking at Red. You are a simple... Nevaeh rolled her eyes and cut him off. He doesn't know what you are doppelganger, descendant, or reincarnation of an actual big bad witch. No one does. I told him that I know acting. If you were this good, you wouldn't be hunting, honey. You'd be another pain in my ass, stealing my parts. She put another milk dud between her teeth in triumph. He twirled his fingers. Embers of energy crackled between them. Do shut up. The milk dud grew large enough to gag her. She glared at him trying to spit out the candy lodged on her front teeth. Red struggled against the manacles. So, you don't even know if I'm the right witch? Fabulous, that's what I wanted this Christmas, to be weirded out by a warlock. 
Can I speak, or will you two hens cluck through this whole production? I am going for drama here. Maxwell waved at the screen. The lights faded. Properly done. Before your impertinent interruptions, I would have intoned the litany of Juniper St. James's sins. Michel de Gramont had been the only one to tell Red the darker side of this Victorian courtesan or her mysterious quest for revenge against Maxwell. Beginning to sympathize with the cause, she was ready to send a zombie after him, too. Yeah, she killed your friends, betrayed the Brotherhood, ruined your suit. I got the highlights. Red rolled her shoulders and twisted against her bonds. Her stomach sank. She didn't want to know more. Even if she knew it wasn't her, she didn't want to watch her doppelganger going full villain on merry old London. Oh, come now, I am giving you vital information here. If you're not going to listen, he crossed his arms. Roll the picture show. The projector crackled to life. A glowing dot grew to cast over the whole screen. Dramatic music soared. A female face appeared, pale and lovely, a dirt smudge on her cheek below her green eyes. Dark woods loomed behind her. A second face appeared over the first. The woman wore a golden wire crown hung low on her forehead in front of a rich tapestry. The next woman had an ebony ruff around her neck and a stone wall behind her. The faces morphed into one another, backgrounds shifting, before the montage of faces sped by too fast to capture the details. Black, blonde, brown, and red hair framed thin faces, heart-shaped ones, and even more configurations of features. Red couldn't look away. It's not what she did that concerned me. It was the line of witches she came from and what she was destined to do. Maxwell narrated before pausing letting the dramatic soundtrack fill in the gaps. Every man has a mission. Mine was to save the world. She tried to pay attention to catch a glimpse of the mother she couldn't remember, but the images moved too fast. Finally, it stopped on her face. Her eyes were widened in fear, illuminated by candlelight. The vision pulled out to reveal the long white Victorian dress and matching veil in a mahogany-paneled study lit by candelabras. Red blinked at the image. It wasn't her. That wasn't her time. Juniper St. James on our wedding night. I thought she would be dead by morning so I could enjoy the honeymoon. She was your wife? Red turned away from him, mumbling to herself. No wonder she stabbed you. Neve threw a milk dud. You're missing it. The display had transformed into the ruins of a small castle. Three broken towers reached for the full moon. Fallen stones huddled at their bases, shining like old bones in the moonlight. A path rose between the rubble of lost walls. Face frozen in a silent groan, a cracked gargoyle pleaded with eroded eyes from the grasses. Flocks of birds fled overhead, racing across the bright stars. Maxwell appeared on the small stage in front of the screen, 3D glasses gone. Is this too passive? You're seeing the future. I gave my own blood and much more of others to stop. Red felt the unseen tug around her middle, and then she was standing by him before she could blink. Nevier leaned forward in her seat, tipping her 3D glasses down, chewing milk duds. Maybe you need to be closer to the action, he said. Red tumbled into the screen and landed on dry grass. Standing and brushing herself off, she looked behind her. The theater was gone. Dark auras swirled around Juniper St. James as she stepped around the aged tower, dramatic gown brushing over the grasses. Two thin panels of sheer black lace came down over her breasts to the empire waist of the dress. Her red hair came over one shoulder in waves, exposing the onyx gems on her throat. Gawking, Red jogged toward her doppelganger. This wasn't a picture hanging in a gallery. This was life-sized and dressed to raise heck at the witching hour. Juniper glided through her. Red followed up the path between a crumbled tower and broken stone stairs leading into a hole filled with vines. Stalks of lavender and rosemary brushes wilted at Juniper's feet. Their energy was sucked out, joining the jets of black mists gathering around her skirts. Passing through a weathered archway, she left ashes in her wake. Red had never felt dark power like it until a stronger presence rose, leaving her doppelganger feeling like a candle wavering before a wildfire. 
Nearing the doorway, her jaw dropped at the long shadow lingering on the stone wall inside. Two massive horns jutted from its head. Shivering, she didn't want to follow Juniper. Her feet moved anyway. It wasn't compulsion that drew her. It was morbid curiosity. She walked on, sensing the shadow of a noose hanging over her. Time had eaten the roof of the derelict chapel, leaving the stars above to bear witness to the unholy scene below. Chipped paint marked spots where crosses once adorned the walls. Stubby candles illuminated small statues of the Virgin Mary in eroded niches. Wax dripped onto the overgrown grass. Juniper walked to the stranger on the edge of the fallen wall of the chamber. A man stood outlined in the full moon. Under an aged archway perched on a windswept cliff, he surveyed the wild meadows and evergreen oak trees below. Dressed like an undertaker, black hair spilled over his shoulders. Only his shadow revealed the horns. He was shaped like a human, but he wasn't. He was something other, something more. Red slunk along the walls. It's so beautiful. The stranger's deep voice bounced off the stone. Sadness tinged the observation. He turned his head and shadows covered his face, leaving no trace of the features. I remember when this castle was whole. The chapel priest used to hide a jug of wine in the confession booth. Did he offer to share? Juniper smiled at the devil, stepping to the edge. Even obscured, the shadowed face twitched in amusement. He stroked her hair. You know the time has come. She put her hand on the being's cheek, touching him through the shades around his face. I was bred for this. I'm ready to die for it, too. Red shuddered at how it could have been her own voice. Juniper lifted a dagger hidden in the folds of her dress. A breeze whipped through the ruins, blowing her skirts forward. She cut her wrists. The blood traveled in the wind, drawn forward with magnet precision, hitting an invisible wall over the meadow beyond the crumbled chapel. Crimson spectral light glowed on impact. Cracks appeared in the air. The moon turned eclipse red. Widening, the fissures turned a blinding, brilliant gold. The ground rumbled underfoot. Shadows pulled themselves out of the rifts before dropping to the wilderness below the cliff. Emerging from the tree line, they reassembled in hideous forms, tall with horns and twisted legs. Their howls ripped through the quiet of the night. Even the stones trembled from the cacophony. The demons raced through the meadow toward the castle. My brothers will be free. The strange man lifted Juniper's hand and kissed her fingers. And there will be hell for heaven to pay. Red ran to Juniper. Her shoes stopped at the steep drop. No! He glanced towards her, eyes glowing a vermilion through the miasma over his face. Red grimaced, jerking back to press against the rough chapel wall. Her throat felt too tight to even breathe. She'd forgotten she didn't need to. Hovering, he became airborne. Shadows flapped around him like bat wings, outlined in the full moon. He hurtled over the far field to land in a crouch at the head of the demon army and rose to guttural cheers. This is the future that I prevented. Maxwell emerged from the shadows. Grim set to his chin. He nodded to Juniper, who stared after the horned stranger like a captain's wife on a widow's walk watching the seas for her love's return. Red couldn't take her eyes off her doppelganger's face. It was worse than she feared. I don't care if you are her or not. I won't have you wake the creature with that familiar face, the warlock vowed, shaking his finger. I'd kill a thousand witches to ensure he never rises, even for a case of mistaken identity. Who is he? She gasped out, flinching at a burst of roars echoing through the hills. Do the horns not give it away? Reason, woman, use it. He is one of the fallen. Maxwell motioned to the hellish army gathered on the meadow below. Why do you think I would roam the dreamland looking for you? T. I wouldn't do this. The breath shuddered in her chest as the howls of the damned ricocheted on the castle ruins. You don't need to do anything. He will. The warlock warned solemnly. Juniper glanced over. The moonlight caught on the black gems around her throat. Recognition flashed in her coal-lined eyes. Red screwed up her face, trying to teleport away. He sneered as he strutted towards the chapel's edge. Now you finally shut up. The gravity of watching hell open up to consume the earth has made an impact. The collar of his suit peeked up. 
He rose by the scruff of his neck, tiptoes scratching on the ground, pulled by an unseen hand. His rolling eyes tried to see what held his collar. Dramatic as ever. Rolling her eyes, Juniper waved a dismissive hand. Launched over the side of Cliff, Maxwell shook his fist as he tumbled into the air. Smiling, Juniper watched him dissolve into a burst of shadows. For the record, it was a kidnapping, not a courtship, that led to our wedding. As Red sidestepped along the stone arch, phantom bile rose in her throat at the witch who could have been her clone. Maxwell had thought he was the puppet master in the dreamland, but now one of the puppets had gone rogue. This was supposed to be a vision of a foiled possible future recreated from his own memories. How was Juniper flipping the script? Now that we are alone, whatever should we talk about? I think it's time for a heart-to-heart, -heart, don't you? Sixteen. Nina Dissi's e he December 23rd, 12 to 13 a.m., Dreamland the Skinner, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Juniper snapped her fingers and the castle ruins disappeared as the armies of hell roared. The setting replaced by the complete opposite surroundings, a hunter's bar called the Skinner in Oklahoma. Red trembled, sitting across from the doppelganger at a rickety table. Hunters in flannel and Sooner's hats drank beer at the mismatched chairs and tables. Sold Sal, the vampire owner and cook, tapped the bell in the kitchen window to announce an order. A easy smile spread across his dark-skinned face. From the creaking chairs to the framed, signed picture of Tanya Tucker, every detail was the same, even down to the plate of chicken and waffles in front of her. I want you to be comfortable. Juniper raised her eyebrow at the meal before her. She made a curious sound in the back of her throat. Fried chicken on waffles? Adrenaline coursing through shaking limbs. Red leaned forward, elbow on the tabletop. Comfortable? After watching an army of demons pop out of the ground like daisies. Seriously. It is difficult to have a conversation with all the howling. Juniper picked up a fork and cut herself a bite unconcerned, as if it were an everyday occurrence for a long-dead Victorian witch in a gothic gown to appear in a Midwest dive bar. You're Juniper St. James. Tamping down the surging emotions making her eye twitch, she pushed her plate away. Was she really talking to the woman that all the bad guys seemed to want and were willing to kill Red to get? Am I great dream riddles with my dark doppelganger? Red threw her hands up, then tapped the table, leaning forward. I don't get it. Why you're here. Why we're talking. None of it. You're like a funny past life memory, hallucination, whatever. I don't care because I finally get to say, fuck you very much, lady. Juniper lifted her eyebrows and crossed her arms. Excuse me? You're dead, gone, and yet somehow you can still destroy my life. How many demons did you date back in the day? Lucas, Christoph, and Satan, apparently. That wasn't Lucifer, Juniper snorted, flapping her hand in dismissal. Why am I not surprised you're on a first-name basis with the Prince of Lies? Are you in an evil book club together? What are you reading next? Eat, pray, love. Here, I was thinking Maxwell is the bad guy. Brows knitting together, Juniper leaned forward. He's very much the bad guy. How do you know? You're a monster, too, even if you weren't a figment in the dreamland. I could also just be talking to myself in my own head. Hard to know here. The aboriginals in Australia called this the dream time, I know. How about you surprise me with something I don't? Juniper smiled with the confidence of a chess player just before checkmate. I know who you are. Hopefully not you. Red turned her recoil into a dry snicker. She was fed up with the doppelganger, from her aloof mystery to the fact that the top of her dress was sheer in the bar lights. Was this really the person that everyone thought she was? Up close, she would have sworn the face was hers. She had hoped for a freckle or a birthmark to mark the difference, but they were like twins with a very different moral compass. I spent the last year trying to discover who I am. Now I could come from a long line of evil witches bred like pedigree terriers to end the world. Your mother wasn't evil, Juniper emphasized the point with her raised fork. I wasn't either. That future never came to be. 
if it was ever true to begin with. Maxwell likes his games. He always must feel like the cleverest man in the room. Ignore whatever smoke he conjures. I didn't try to end the world. Red mockingly nodded, folding her arms across her chest. Because you were put down before you could. I've done my own research. The Brotherhood of Bards and Heroes hunted you down, and whatever happened on August 1st, 1900, they sealed the records up. The Stone Tree Monastery might as well be Area 51 for how classified it is. They would redact that from the records, Juniper rolled her eyes. Maxwell is trying to rattle you. Mission accomplished. Being dragging through a ghoulish asylum and then presented with a demon with a capital D would do that to any girl. The Brotherhood classified most predatory supernatural creatures as a type of demon species. But there were even older, darker beings rumored to still sleep in the earth, waiting for the final apocalypse. Red saw a glimpse of what it looked like when Hades opened. That was a fucking legion of hellspawn that you released. I didn't do that. Red raised her eyebrows at the sincere vehemence. Doubt bubbled up. Catching herself, she twisted her lips into a resigned sneer. What about the rampage through London? Betraying the Brotherhood? The necromancy? I didn't raise zombies. I released them from bondage. There's a difference. Ducking her head, Juniper poked at her fried chicken. I had my reasons. Most people's reasons don't end in a zombie attack. Red sighed and tossed her hands up. Why am I even arguing with you? I am cracking up and taking a detour to crazy town before the warlock scares me to death. You're arguing with me because you're curious. I understand. It was always my vice. Juniper took another bite of the chicken and waffles before pushing the plate aside. She stood and walked over to the jukebox. Now what is popular music nowadays? Have a coin. I'm fresh out of ghost quarters, left them in my other ghost pants. That was a joke. If you don't want something new, let's go for something old. Artificial glow twinkling in her green eyes, she tapped the jukebox. A Hank Williams Jr. song came on. You remember this one? Red rubbed the spot on her neck where laser scar removal had worked its magic. I nearly died to this song. But then you killed that master vampire on his own throne. I am proud of that. I'm so glad to get brownie points from the Wicked Witch of the West, she cringed. I hope there is no part of you in me. I was a regular girl once. Juniper looked down at the digital interface of the jukebox, knuckles whitening as she gripped the sides. Family, friends, I used to walk with heroes. Red frowned. Heroes? Was that just a figure of speech? Either way, it was easier to think of the doppelganger as a bad seed than corrupted. Life would be tidier if dark witches were born and not made. Where did it all go wrong? Maxwell. Juniper shook her head. He claims he was trying to stop me. He started this when he kidnapped me. That is what he doesn't realize. He played a bigger part in this production than he understands. Understand this. I'm not enjoying this trip down your freaky memory lane. I'm done with this hallucination. I'm going now. Pleasure to meet and be weirded out by you. Standing, Red glared before gesturing to her chest. And think about proper coverage when you wear a half sheer dress. If someone sees you naked, they've seen me naked. Why are you letting Maxwell direct the show? This is your shit hitting my fan. Red jabbed her finger towards the other woman. My hands aren't just tied, they're incorporeal. I can't do anything about either. His greatest trick is making you believe you are powerless. You're in the dreamland, and I know how strong your will is. Juniper's lips curved into an enigmatic grin. Because mine is. Don't act like we're girlfriends in this together, Mona Lisa smile. Red shook her head. All I know is that any second you'll ghost on me, then he's going to drag me back to that creepy asylum and go all horror movie on me. He would take you there. Scorn settling onto her features, Juniper scoffed. It's the last place where he had control over me. So that's because of you? I thought it was just because I hate hospitals. Red rubbed her arm. The image of the dirty surgical table flashed in her mind. 
Some of this is from your brain, your memories, repressed as they are, but some of it is from his. And he's had longer to play brain games. Great. Red shook her head and went to the front door of the Skinner. She'd rather be stuck in Oklahoma, hitching a ride back to L.A., than keep listening and stepped out onto the moonlight-covered parking. You can fight him if you face that fear. Juniper appeared beside her and snapped her fingers. They appeared in a cramped hallway with damp, smoke-damaged, whitewashed brick walls. Moonlight and stars glittered in the window at the end of the hall. Large bulbs buzzed with electricity on the ceiling. The asylum. It was better lit and cleaner, but it was still Maxwell's funhouse of psycho pain. Cut the cryptic! Why are we back here? Juniper glanced at the narrow hall behind her shoulder. Because you need to know. Red followed the line of sight, gawking at a third version of herself. It was Juniper. Not the one who had stood in gothic splendor at the side of the horned man as hell walked on earth. That Juniper had disappeared. The Juniper who remained was held between two orderlies in leather aprons and flat hats. Two circular bruises marked her temples. Frizzy tendrils trembled around her tense face, escaping her pulled-back hairstyle. She wore a shapeless gray dress. It was the same one that Maxwell had conjured up for Red to wear in his torture room. The modest neckline couldn't hide all the bite scars. Red had never seen anyone with such torment in their eyes. You don't know who you are working for. Dragged past by her elbows, Juniper hobbled to keep up. The electric lights cast long shadows behind the trio. Her whisper sounded strained, as if she held an ocean's worth of warning back. You don't know what he is. Do you want to see Dr. B again? The orderly asked in a thick Scottish accent. Then stop squawking about him. Juniper snapped her teeth shut. Hey, what are you doing? Striding up the three, Red demanded. Instinct at the sight of a person in trouble pushed away her confusion. Who are they? This Juniper didn't answer, only stared at the closed door at the hallway's end like the devil was waiting for her. Look smart, your family has come. The other orderly patted Juniper on the shoulder, a perfunctory kindness in his voice. You're leaving the asylum. Juniper closed her eyes, and it was as if a veil had come over her face. Her tight features eased to a wary blankness. Only the tension in her neck betrayed the corralled worry and fear. Shoulders straightening, she nodded with the acceptance of a resigned prisoner on the scaffold and walked forward. The orderly opened the door. Apologies, I am not prepared outside business hours. It's rather late. A white-coated doctor sat at an oak desk. He bent over the papers spread over the green ink blotter. His fountain pen raced over the patient record. Bronze script displayed his name on a wooden block, Dr. Good. The door opened wider to reveal a black-suited Lucas sitting across from the doctor. Cellini sat beside him in a lilac dress that would make Queen Victoria swoon. What the hell are you two doing here? Red asked the room, long accustomed to not getting an answer. Walking inside, she circled Lucas. She shook her head as if that would dislodge whatever weird hallucination this was. The vampire looked far from the punk rock, motorcycle-riding defender of the innocent that he would become in the present day. Instead of tousled locks flopping into his eyes, his short dark hair was neatly parted in the middle. A black and midnight blue aura, darker than in the future, hovered over his expensive suit and embroidered waistcoat, his fingers flexed out of a clenched fist before he adjusted his crimson necktie. Our lawyer wanted to attend, but I assured him that we could settle this quietly, quickly. Yes, of course. No need for lawyers. The doctor coughed and wrote faster. Stomach clenching, Red stopped by the door, scanning Lucas as if expecting a leather jacket to appear. This is strange. Juniper stepped into the room between her guards. There she is. Selene pointed to them grinning wildly and clapped her hands. How perfectly strange indeed. Juniper focused on Lucas like a rat watching a terrier, hand on her heart. Her cuffs slipped. Bruises and cuts circled her wrists. She tugged her arm down as if covering a tell in a poker tournament. Red knew it was a tell because she had done it too. 
Seeing Lucas in the past was tripping her out, especially since the Downton Abbey look was working for him. His chilly gray eyes narrowed in restrained frustration. None of the empathy or guilt from his soul shone through. He didn't have one. Composed with the arrogance of a lord to the unsuspecting humans, a flash of amber appeared in his irises if you knew to look. This was Lucas in his mad, bad, and dangerous-to-know phase. Red stepped in front of Juniper, fingers instinctively curling as if around an invisible stake. She looked back at her doppelganger and into those green eyes so familiar to her own. She could have drowned in the fear. Chin raised, Juniper hid her shaking hands in the folds of her skirt. Her gaze darted between the doctor and the vampires. My colleague recommends more electricity treatments for your ward, Dr. Good said, lifting a document and blowing on the record's wet ink. Dr. B likes to shock him sane, the rougher orderly guffawed. His co-worker elbowed him, dipping his hat in silent apology. Dr. Good glared at the two. Carnegie, McLeod, out. They tipped their hats, bumping shoulders as they left and closed the door. The doctor rustled his papers as he apologized rapidly. He wrote quicker as if phantom lawyers chased his pen. That is uncouth talk from a simpleton. Let me just finish this record. Fangs peeked out from under his top lip. Lucas discreetly pressed his palm to his mouth to jam them back in. The predatory glow lingered on the closed door. Red could tell that Lucas had memorized the orderly's names and faces. She crossed her arms and called after them. He is so killing you two. Yes, tonight or tomorrow. It's hard to tell when one begins or ends. Selene clasped her hands, leaning forward like a gossiper with a juicy secret. Red jumped back, half passing through the door, gawking at the vampires. This was supposed to be a flashback, not an interactive scene. Where Maxwell was hiding. Whose flashback was this? How could Selene see her? They said she was a seer, but this was more than 2020. She stomped forward and waved her hands in front of Selene's face. You can see me? Are you in the dreamland? I am everywhere at once. Some memories, some futures. Your mind or mine. Dreams, too. Selene pouted with a delicate half-shrug. It's confusing at the best of times, I must say. Pardon me? The doctor glanced up from his papers, startled by what must have sounded like a nonsensical outburst. Lucas smiled at the vampires and rested his hand on hers to calm her. The madness hadn't shown when we first wed, but like her cousin, well, it strikes them late in my wife's family. A lie sounded as smooth as the truth coming from his mouth. His expression soured as if offended to have to explain such personal business more. The doctor coughed, scrutinizing Celine over his round spectacles. You have the patience of a saint. Lucas dipped his head in feigned acknowledgement to hide the amusement twitching at his lips. He played the role of well-born gentleman to perfection, wielding implication and social mores as a swift shield to further questions. Let's get to signing these papers so I can return our dear cousin to the family estate where she can be cared for in greater comfort. Juniper's jaw clenched. Excuse me, I must return to the file room. I seem to be missing a form. The doctor shuffled through his papers before pushing back his chair and standing. He walked through red to the exit. Lucas slouched farther back in his chair, but the illusion of relaxation was broken by the tension in his muscles. Amber flashed in his gaze even as worry puckered at his lips. Blast it, Juniper. Why the devil did you get yourself locked up here? It wasn't on purpose. She sounded hollow, yet a low fire threaded through her tone. You sent us on a goddamn chase through the British Isles. I had to box Quinn to do this my way. The Black Libertine had darker plans for your punishment. Lucas glared. In a flash, he was in front of Juniper's, stroking her cheek. You could have died. Electricity treatments? You call me a monster, but that quack has probably tortured more people than I have. Red held her breath. He was impulsive, even with a soul holding him back in the future. Did she want to know what he was like without one? Reading a demonology text was different than seeing it in real life. 
Lucas tilted Juniper's chin as he examined the marks on her face. His ferocity softened into confusion. Bloody hell, kitten. You have beautiful dresses, shining jewels, and all the books you can read. Why run? I couldn't close my eyes to the killing anymore. Lucas spun, groaning in disgust before flopping into his chair. That tender, bleeding heart of yours. Always such a curse, Celine said, pityingly in a girlish voice. She pointed to the doppelgangers before switching hands, staring puzzled at her own fingertips. Maxwell's energy signature approached, yet it resonated differently from the one that had been hounding her. Red looked out the window pane. The warlock walked from the long driveway lined with trees and sprawling lawns to the building. In a long white coat and black hat, he looked like any other Victorian doctor about to take residence on the asylum night shift. He tipped his hat to passing nurses. It wasn't the spirit that haunted her in the dreamland, but the living man he must have been. Pleading, Red pointed at the window. It's him! Dr. B! You need to get her out of here because he won't let her leave. Celine nodded. Lucidity came over her big eyes and she tilted her head. Compassion tinged her voice. You always did want to go home. Did you ever find it in the end? I... The flickering sanity in the mad seer's gaze unsettled her. Chewing on her lip, she didn't know how to give an answer to the past when she didn't know it in the present. A knock on the door cut off her reply. The orderly came in and took off his hat. Begging your pardon, Dr. B will want you to stay. Go to your Dr. B. Do whatever you must to distract him. Release a patient. Selene stood and stared into the orderly's eyes. She patted the top of his head and watched him go, then winked at Red. Er, what are you doing, princess? Lucas raised an eyebrow. Mesmerizing the help? The man with the eyes full of lies is coming for our red witch. Sparks shoot from his hands into her brain. Walking over to the human, Selene traced her fingers over Juniper's temples. Pulling away, her fangs jutted out from under ruby-tinted lips. The pixie notes in her light Scottish accent disappeared. She is his favorite to torment. Now I have another wanker to kill. Brilliant plan, Juniper. At least three bloody Scots down. Lucas gritted his teeth. Close your eyes to that. He deserves it, Red retorted even if he couldn't hear. Maxwell trapped me here. Celine cocked her head as if listening to a third unheard conversation, giggling. Her rolling eyes flipped back to Red as if confessing freshly heard gossip. You know he is scared of you. No, he isn't, Juniper whispered. No, I'm not. Lucas glowered. Oh, hush, not you two. Celine shook her head before smiling sheepishly to Red as if apologizing to company for unruly children. Always interrupting. Maxwell doesn't act like it. Red shifted on her feet under the expectant gaze, feeling awkward, not knowing what to do with her hands. It was off the charts bizarre to talk to the vampire seer in some flashback gone off the tracks. She was meeting Lucas's ex, and it wasn't entirely unpleasant considering the circumstances. This wasn't the weirdest part of her Technicolor satanic Christmas dream voyage, but it was up there. Men are arrogant like that, Celine said, flapping a dismissive hand. Spatulas, spoons... They don't expect the humble. He wouldn't hide behind a star if he weren't afraid with good reason. Who are you talking to, princess? Lucas asked, taking Celine's hand and guiding her to the chair. You have to go now. Celine waved, looking down, finger at her pursed lips. Or maybe we do. Red blinked and the room was empty, even the electric lighting. Only the eerie light of the moon on the bare floor remained. Malignant auras hung in the corners. The murk crawled down the walls like a horde of spiders skittering closer. Maxwell had found her again. Seventeen. December 23rd, 1216 AM, Dreamland, the Asylum. Red fled down the Asylum Hall, spectral feet only yards from the scurrying darkness chasing her. Pushing the double doors open, she ran into a stairwell. The light faded behind her. She only just kept ahead of the shadow's edge. 
Bursting out of the front exit, she spilled out onto the lawn. The lush greenery she had seen through the windows in the odd flashback was replaced by brittle gray grass. She bolted farther down the private driveway. But the ground grew spongy at her feet like black quicksand. Her ankles slipped under. Maxwell materialized in front of her. Shadows curled around his purple velvet suit like coiling snakes. Neve emerged from the gloom. Sparks marched up her arms, glimmering on the black sequins of her dress. Her irises went from blue to onyx, the black leaching into the whites of her eyes. The asylum crumbled. It reformed into a broken medieval longhouse, attached to a tower, pocked with holes as big as dragon bites. A flickering flame in the shadows grew in her peripheral vision. It spread up a pile of logs attached to a tall wooden pole, a stake to burn witches on. Red pumped her legs through the quicksand, wishing to be in a flower-filled meadow instead. The dark warlock and witch closed in as fire sprouted up higher. The dreamland didn't obey her wish. It obeyed power. Maxwell had more. Nevi's form blinked, then solidified yards forward, towing the quicksand's line. Lunging, she grabbed Red by the upper arms, fingers grew into claws, and tossed the other witch. Red landed on solid ground by the pyre, protecting her head. Just the proximity to the smoke and flames heated her face. She sprung to her feet. Nevaeh stepped forward, grinning. She even seemed taller, augmented by the surreal power of the dreamland, holding an orb of light. Not so tough, Hunter Skink. Without your friends around, huh? She never was. Maxwell smiled at the stake as if it were an old college friend. Juniper should have burned in the shadows of this old watchtower. Regrettably, that vampire saved her. Red sprinted to the side to the collapsed gates of the mysterious tower. Can't run if you don't have legs. Neve raised her claws. I had a doll that had hair like you once. I liked her better. Red fell forward, heart skipping. Her feet clinked together. Below her knees, her legs had been replaced by porcelain, shiny white with black saddle shoes. She wanted to throw up even as she marveled at the power that Neveille seemed to wield in the dreamland. Who knew what the two of them would do together when they had no one to oppose them? Anger pulsed through her. She focused her intention on turning her legs back into flesh. The dreamland obeyed her will. Maxwell didn't hold all the cards, finally. She popped back up and wished for a baseball bat. It appeared in her hand and she swung it up. Nevaeh caught it and smirked. I was all state varsity on the softball team. Red punched her in the face. How's about taking an ass kicking? Were you all state in that? Is that how ladies should behave? He teleported beside Nevaeh. Enough. Red flew backwards, landing beside the burning pile. She stumbled, but regained her footing. Even if all you share with Juniper St. James is her face, that is one connection too many. Maxwell raised his palm. Tarnished gray energy rippled from his fingers. You have seen why I came back. That was a courtesy to your damnable curiosity, wife. Yanked airborne, Red hovered above the flames. The heat simmered against her back. The bat didn't reappear in her hand. Her brief rally was broken as he brought the full force of his intention to bear. His power surrounded her. This is the time that I finally finish you off. Maxwell flicked his finger, sending the energy tumbling forward like eager young hounds. Red flew back onto the stake, leather straps pinning her tightly. The rubber soles of her boots bubbled from the heat. Guts churning, she kicked her heels at the wood. We should get marshmallows. Neve grinned. A toasting fork adorned with fluffy marshmallows materialized in her clawed hands. I told you ladies first. Maxwell smirked at Red. This is like old times, except there are no pesky witch hunters trying to burn me too. I prefer this. Heart racing and ears buzzing, ghostly goosebumps chilled her skin despite the flames. Red tried to remember the power of wishing. She tried to remember the strength of intention. She tried to remember that she possessed magic. All she felt was the fire. 
The flames licked at her boots, causing the leather to crinkle. Even in dreamland, her pain receptors screamed. If it were an illusion, how could it hurt so damn badly? Red bit back the first screech, but she couldn't stop the rest. Had her protection spell failed? Was she burning in the hospital room? Was a mage doctor trying frantically to put her out as she spontaneously combusted? She hoped Vic wouldn't have to see her die. He had already lost so much. What could they do? She wasn't burning from anything on the physical plane. Mystical flames were consuming her from the inside out. Maxwell and Neve watched her with the engrossed interest of spectators at a play. Were they going to pull out milk duds next? Voice turned hoarse. Red tried to pull herself together before the flames turned her to ash. The only thing that came to mind was a spell from an old grimoire she had found in an abandoned house after a hunt. Vic had taken it away, saying she shouldn't read it before she passed the hunter's challenge. Yet she had never forgotten the brief passage that she had read, A Death Curse. They were short and bitter. When you needed to use one, you usually didn't have much time to spit it out. Why did that passage stick in her mind? Maybe somehow she knew it would come down to this. Maxwell spoke of destiny. Was this hers? Red said the foreign words even as she choked on the smoke. Her gaze narrowed on him. Even if his body was long gone, his spirit was still too powerful. Neve looked to the warlock. What is she doing? A death curse, but it's no matter. The fool thinks she has power. I shrugged off junipers. I conceal that mouth too. Maxwell twirled his fingers, eyes flashing with malevolent joy as purple orbs flew to red. Pain threaded through her mouth like an invisible tailor pulled the stitch tight. Blood gushed over the sealed lips. The new agony dueled with the pain rushing up her legs as flames inched higher. She fought through the stitching to aim a rigor mortis smile at him. He might have shut her up, but she'd still gotten the last part of the death curse out. It wouldn't matter if he killed her now or later. When she died, he'd suffer. Panting, chin dipped to her chest. Red couldn't find the breath to scream. Coughing, the smoke smothered her even without solid lungs. If only she could see a friendly face again. She couldn't remember much of her 25 years on this earth yet. Despite it all, she still had people who had cared for her. She tried to think of her friends before the pain and fire stole the ability to do more than choke. Now I will finally be a true widower. Fire illuminated the warlock's anticipation. Nevea laughed. You should get on Tinder. I can make your profile. Single warlock seeks same. DTF. Red glowered at them, head hanging down. Appearing behind the fiends, Basil wavered on bare heels, the hem of his hospital gown trembling. Fingers spread out as his hands jerked up. He pushed past Maxwell and Nevea, elbowing them in the face before he reached out at the foot of the fire. Come with me. Wish yourself. Red didn't know if it was the power of her intention or his, but she fell from the stake. Basil wrapped his arms around her, and she buried her face's neck as they teleported. The stitching dissolved on her face. Clinging each other, they reappeared. The bright moonlight made the hospital room sparkle after the gloomy terror at the watchtower. She breathed a shuddering sigh, shaking in his arms, until Vic's voice broke through the relief. We're losing her! 18. She was the nasty I ain't. Um, December 23rd, 1217 AM, Dreamland, St. Bridget's Hospital, Los Angeles. Oh, shh! Red covered her mouth, stepping to her blindfolded body on the hospital bed. Unburnt pants had been cut away at the knee. Her clothing had no marks, but her body. The red blisters covered her shins and calves while pus and blackened skin dotted the burns. Scorch marks tarnished the battered golden protection still over her physical body. The mage doctor sprayed ointment on the burns from a green pentagram embossed metal can. He whispered directions to the nurse who rolled the pant legs farther up. It goes up her thighs, doctor. The nurse broke into panic. Now her arms are burning. Vic sat at the bedside, fists clenched. He looked to Quinn. I don't know what to do. What's happening to her in that dream? Basil nudged her toward the door. You don't need to watch this. Red walked into the hallway, turning around to lean her forehead against the wall. 
She cursed when she went through it. The flurry of grisly medical activity around her body popped into view. Sighing, she pulled back. Thanks for getting me out of there. I don't know how I even got there. Basil raised his eyebrows, shrugging. That warlock sent me to the top of the great Ferris wheel in London. I was sitting bare-arsed on a Welsh pensioner's lap. That sounds nice. He sent you on vacation and you made a friend. I'm not in the same shape that you are, that's for sure, but they aren't going after me. They're going after you. He wrapped his arms around himself, eyes darting to the open doorway of the hospital room as the nurse walked out. How do we stop them? What's their weakness? There has to be a way. I don't have any answers. Mind buzzing, ghost nerves still rattled. Red dropped her head. Her spectral body didn't feel the burn pain anymore, but the phantom flames still ravaged her physical skin, impact delayed in the weird passage of dream time. They'd almost had her. It was more than intense. She had cast a death curse. I need a second. Just watch me. Well, my body. Yell if something else happens. We need to run. Where? I just got burnt at the stake. My literal feet in the fire. I've got to take a beat or I'm going to scream loud enough for them to hear it on the other side. Her chest tightened and her vision blurred from the tears she refused to let fall. They could come for you again. They will come for me again and they could come for me anywhere. She wiped her eyes. At least here I have friends. Just take watch. Basil nodded before leaning on the threshold of the doorway. Peeking into the hospital room, he cringed. Ghastly. Lost in her grim thoughts, she walked down the hallway, hands in her pockets, passing a stairwell door. What's happening up there, Lucas? The growled words drifted through the cracked open door. It was Kristoff. Red had wondered where he had gone. She followed the sound of grumbling vampires and stepped into a stairwell. The two men clustered by an open window at the foot of a nearby lower landing. She trotted down the steps, wondering if she was going to have to watch them wrestle it out like boys in the schoolyard until Quinn broke it up again. <laughs> Lucas shook his head as he pulled a cigarette out of his pocket. Can't believe they kicked us out. She wrinkled her nose and pointed to the no-smoking sign. Rolling her eyes at their expected lack of response, she sat down on the steps. Their problems were a distraction from her own. The only benefit to being a spirit was all the eavesdropping. She had been so worried about Vic's privacy when Basil offered to read his soul. Now she was ready to make some popcorn and settle into the show. When all you could do was watch, it was hard to feel guilty about it. I thought you quit. Kristoff crossed his arms, legs tense, ready to spring up the stairs to return to the action. Who are you, my mother? Lucas asked, without any malice in his tone. He puffed quickly, blowing the smoke out the window barely inhaling as he stared up the stairwell. Or Quinn. He's trying to burn her again. Kristoff regarded the stairwell door to the patient hallway, as if wishing his dark gift had been X-ray vision. She's not Juniper. Immortal pallor, ashen from worry, Lucas pointed his cigarette. The glowing ember traced smoke warnings. But how much of a difference does it make to a warlock? Red leaned back on her elbows on the stairs, ankles crossed. She cupped a hand to her mouth and called out to the vampires who couldn't hear her. Spoiler, not much. Bloody hell, I don't know. Lucas rubbed his chin. It's been over a century. That skeleton should be dead and long buried in the closet. That's where he has us. He's getting his revenge from the grave. We walked out of ours. Wrapping his head back against the wall, Lucas cursed and curled his fist. He puffed harshly on his cigarette. The smoke coated his frustrated words. And the damn brotherhood is beyond useless. Of course they are. That warlock is one of those secrets they don't air out. Kristoff clenched his jaw, the cleft deepening in his chin. I doubt that Iron Jack, crafty as the old bard was, even entered the dark tale into their lore. I should have tortured his son after all. Might have gotten the full truth then. Red sat up, 
<laughs> Jack Constantine had been the head of the Brotherhood in Juniper's day. Had he known Maxwell Baldacci? She had tried to look up the warlock on the bard net, but nothing had come up. The entry on the Stone Tree Monastery had been classified, yet it had been listed. Scholars were pack rats, and for all the might of the more militant branches, the bards were scholars. They never threw anything away. What if Kristoff was right and the warlock was never recorded, or had he been hidden? What the bloody fuck are you going on about? Lucas asked. Kristoff tilted his head, disdain flattening his lips. Even after all this time, you still don't know much about the woman you spent nearly eight years with. What do you think I was doing with her in London? His sire scowled. I could use a good fight if you're starting one, mate. Not that. Kristoff smirked, but then grew somber. Juniper hired me to run recon. The warlock was after her to tie up a loose end, a job gone wrong. He wasn't working alone. What does an asylum mean to you? Now, that was a dark day, even in a dark decade. Lucas leaned his head back against the wall and took a drag off the cigarette. He blew out the smoke as if trying to release the bitter memories with it. It was before our contract. She ran, told the wrong person the truth, and was labeled a nutter. Ended up locked up in a blasted asylum in Scotland. There was a doctor. Shit, they called him Dr. V. Baldacci, no doubt. He looked away, tension deepening the hollows of his high cheekbones. Those are the times that I don't like to remember. No, you like to remember all the times you played the hero. Forget the blood that you spilled. Kristoff pushed away from the wall with his foot, arms stiffening at his sides. Amber glowed in the depths of his blue irises. Juniper had a limp. Do you even remember? Slight, but whenever it got too cold and damp, who gave it to her? Dr. B or you? Holding her breath, Red glanced between the two vampires. Was this when the fist fight would begin? Chin jutting out and top lip curling, Lucas's fangs glided from his gums over his canines. He snapped his head to the side, retracting his fangs, and glared at his progeny. That wasn't me. I busted her out, then I busted heads. Freed her from the hellhole you drove her to. So heroic. Kristoff bared his teeth, canines growing before he pushed them back up with a rough palm and turned away. You didn't even get the bastard. Never could hold up your end of a deal. I tracked down a few orderlies, but the warlock escaped. A soul-deep conflict flickered in Lucas's expression. Delilah was impatient to leave, caused a bit of a ruckus in the search, and after the last time they were in Scotland, we headed quick to the continent. You never deserved her. Lucas glanced down, the fight slumping out of his shoulders. No. She jumped when Basil leaned over to touch her arm. Geez, make a sound before you ghost up on me. Has something else happened? You're still bubbling on the bed. Mouth pursed, Basil glanced between her and the vampires. Stop eavesdropping on your boyfriend and whatever tall, blonde, and undead is to you. Nerves raw, Red knew she was being sensitive, but she couldn't help it. She pulled her arm away, scowling. You know, I don't need your sass right now. I nearly died. Well, you're nearly dying again. The annoyed set to her jaw quaked. Already knew that! Hand on his hip, he asked smugly. Did you know that a medium just showed up? The talk to spirits kind? Finally. Bouncing up from the step, she trotted towards the hallway door. She might have been on fire, but she wasn't cooked yet if she could just talk to the guys. Kristoff looked straight through her, his brow furrowed. Hope surged when his gaze locked on hers. Clouds gathering on his expression, he walked up the stairs. Gesturing for Basil, Red followed the vampire, cursing her deluded hope that he had heard her. The only one with a chance to hear her was the medium. She hoped they spoke fluent dreamland. Let's see how good he is. Hey, Novak, I thought we were having a shitty conversation here, Lucas asked before putting out his cigarette and tossing it through the open window. Kristoff didn't look back. I can rub your sins in your face any time. Red blinked and wished herself into the hospital room with Basil. 
She couldn't focus on anything but her half-barbecued body on the bed. Even in spirit form, the smell of burning flesh on her legs was overwhelming. The energetic connection pulsed between her and the shining dome over her body. Sucking desperately at her magic, the protection spell struggled to maintain itself. The mage doctor left a huddle with Vic in the corner, walking through her to exit the room. Red shook off his passing to stand at the bedside and stare down at her tormented body. It didn't stare back. A bandage had been placed over the non-blinking eyes. She felt like she had arrived early to her own wake. Lucas and Kristoff arrived, bumping shoulders as they tried to enter the door at the same time. Great. The Wonder Boys are back just when Quinn leaves. Vic flipped them off, heavy brow and dark circles under his eyes punctuating the gesture. He motored over to the bed, grumbling. Thought I kicked you two out. Where'd he go? Lucas asked. Made a call. Grim-faced and laconic, Vic examined her intact face and burned legs covered in a blue foam. Blisters peeked from the bubbles. It had better not be to that psychopath seer. Kristoff warned as he strode to the medical bed. He loomed like a bodyguard at the bedside. Vic shot back snidely. Don't know. I'm not his secretary. Hi, I'm Terry the medium. Can the family come out here? A short Hispanic man in hospital scrubs leaned into the room, nose suddenly bleeding. He pressed tissues to it, grumbling to himself. Not again. Hiya, Terry. I'd say it's nice to meet you, but this night sucks ass. Tell me you can make it better. Vic scooted in his wheelchair out into the hallway. Give me the medium minutia. Kristoff turned to follow. Family. Lucas blocked the other vampire. That doesn't include the help. He walked away with a warning glare. Oh God, they're going to fight again, Red said to Basil, but he had already disappeared and reappeared behind the medium in the hall. Kristoff wrinkled his nose as if deciding his sire wasn't worth it before turning away. Lucas paused at the threshold to look back at the woman in the hospital bed. His pale fingers dented the metal door frame. Expression crumbling, he stalked out. Red clapped her hands. Good. Everyone go to different corners. Get out here. This medium is useless, Basil called out. Hello, Terry. Ghosts on line one. Red went to the doorway, touching the indentations in the frame. Lucas had done this because of her. He could bend metal, but that brute strength couldn't help her in the dreamland. Kristoff walked to her body on the bed. Gaze softening, he visually examined the scorched flesh on her shins and then her forearms. He leaned down to whisper in her sleeping ear. Sneaking a glance out at the door, he unbuttoned his wrist cuff. You pissant, Basil boomed. Spirits here. Basil, be nice! Head whipping around, she stomped to the soulmancer, sighing. Even if he can't hear you. He waved his hands in front of the medium's face, hospital gown fluttering in agitation. Do I need to pull down your pants? Terry the medium put two fingers to his temple. I sense the dark power. It is cloaking itself. There is an aura of protection around her, but I do not know how long it will hold against the darkness. There is a lesser spirit after her, not long in the grave. And Lucas rolled his hand for the man to continue. Look at your crystal ball again. We already know that it's a warlock's ghost and the spirit of a blonde bint chasing her. Terry glared at him. She is in limbo. If she were a ghost, I'd know more. I am not a soulmancer. He blanched when he realized he'd said the word aloud. I am not, I swear, Scout's honor. You'd be more helpful if you were. Kristoff leaned against the open door, a small smile twitching at his lips. A ting of new wetness shinied on the dreed vampire blued on his unbuttoned shirt cuff. The peeved air from being commanded by his sire gone. Only a quiet satisfaction remained. Red frowned at Kristoff. What are you up to? Vic whistled for attention. The medium can't hear the dead if you two are yapping over them. Red could be trying to communicate with us now. I am! 
Heart skipping in nervous excitement, she hollered through cupped hands. Maxwell nearly burned me at the stake. He thinks I'm Juniper 2.0, and Neve is learning new tricks from him. Figure something out. She isn't, Terry said without opening his eyes. There is no spirit in her body. Basil groaned. Where did they get this guy? The bus depot. Can you find out more? Vic asked. I will try. The energy in the room is too strong for me to penetrate. The medium backed away, head bobbing, neck dripping sweat. I'll let the doctor know what I can determine. The female spirit, she is furious, unstable. I fear them both, but her rage is fresh. Keep using the sanctified oil and prepare a new ring of salt. Add more cold, Iron. Once you think you've put down enough, put down some more. Vic nodded and thanked Terry before spinning around and going into the room. Hooting in relief, he called out through the doorway. At least that potion worked on her legs. She doesn't look like we pulled her out of a burning car anymore. The vampires followed him. Red crossed her arms. They aren't going to figure it out. Yeah, the Scooby gang has really gone downhill. Basil huffed and looked down, hands on his hospital gown-covered hips. Maxwell has us on the outs. He's probably watching from somewhere, laughing at us. What do you know about Navai? Did Ari tell you anything? He ranted about her a lot. Trailer trash from Tennessee. Blinded him with her country witch wiles. Called him handsome when her husband wasn't around. Convinced him to buy property. I don't know. Standard sugar baby stuff, even though Ari never touched her. She had so much power. What does she do with it? Torment her rivals to get an Oscar. Red sneered swallowing the bad taste of Nevi's misspent talent. In her defense, there are plenty of actresses in this city who would do the same. Not many witches, though. She looked down, pushing away her disgust with Neve's actions to think about her motives. Had this dark witch been born bad or made that way? The woman had clawed her way to the top of Hollywood like something was on her tail. You know where she lived in Tennessee? What did you sense from her soul? I saw some images, a drive-in theater, a beauty pageant, a mobile home park, but she kept her energy on lockdown. It should have been my first clue. This is all my fault. I should have let her keep ruining cinema, not our lives. Red patted his shoulder. She understood the allure of shooting all over herself about her own regrets. Well, when we wake up, consider the debt between us paid off. Get us back in our bodies and I'll think about it. Basil gave her a cynical side-eye. He expects us to run. They both do. That's the smart choice. Let's run to my place in Tahoe, he said brightly. It's lovely this time of year. You did a great job with the paint job. She raised her chin. The dreamland had been nothing but a nightmare. She had been blindsided and on the defensive all night. We aren't running. Basil put his head in his hands, groaning through his fingers. We can't stay here. We're taking control of the fight. Through the hospital room door, Red inspected the bent and battered curve of the protection spell domed over her body. How long could it hold? Bad idea. We can't take them both on. We aren't, Red smiled, the plan unfolding in her mind. Think you can wish us to that trailer park? 19. December 23rd. 12.34 a.m., Dreamland, Smithson's Corner, Tennessee. A large plastic banner hung between two trees in front of a one-floor home. Illuminated by Christmas lights, its shadow stretched to the edge of a mobile home park. Crowded block letters read, Smithson's Corner, Tennessee, home of Neve Morgan. Stop here for celebrity tour and memorabilia. Autographs, mugs, and commemorative plates. Cold drinks, too. I always wanted a Neve Morgan commemorative plate. Red smirked at a tire swing on the other side of the yard labeled by an arrow-shaped sign declaring, as seen on Instagram. Basil rolled his eyes. Hardy har har. We could get matching t-shirts. She laughed, tugging on the hem of her top. Maybe even autographed. He walked ahead of her. Can we just get on with this before the evil ghost warlock comes after us? I thought the Morgans lived in the trailer park. 
The home wasn't a mansion, but it looked like a recent build. Moonlight made the new-looking riding lawnmower shine from the open garage next to an orange Camaro. Holiday decorations strobed from the eaves. In the gloom, the mobile homes looked more like shacks behind it. Nevi bought it with her parents when she made it big. Starlet and Slumlord got her into Entrepreneur Magazine. Basil shook his head, walking through the front window. Poor Airy co-signed on it. I was called when his brother finally found the paperwork. After being a spirit for so long, Red didn't even blink at passing through a window pane. She glided into the dim living room where the eerie light of the dreamland competed with the blaring TV. A velvet rope stretched across the open archway to the hallway. Slumped in a plush recliner and staring at the screen, an older man wore a Christmas sweater, but his expression wasn't merry. He gripped a glass of whiskey with fight-torn knuckles. Five bloody scratches on his forehead reflected the hazy glow of the TV. This must be the Morgan patriarch. She wasn't surprised that this was how a scuzzy landlord spent his holidays. Is this where the tour begins? Red quipped, surveying the china knickknacks in a glass cabinet. Basil shot a miffed side glance at her. You're a pretty chipper for a woman who was nearly burnett at the stake. I've been getting my dream ass kicked all night. I'm kicking back. That requires swagger. It's in the hunter handbook. You have what you need off the dad? He wrinkled his nose. I'm reading his soul loud and clear, mom's too, in the kitchen. They aren't mages, that is for sure. Red walked down a hall lined with pictures and movie posters. It looked like an exhibit. Neve's toothy smile stared at her from all angles. She glared at the portraits, stepping into the brighter lit kitchen. Dirty aura smudges stuck to the corners of the room. The lady of the house, Erlene Morgan, was rail thin and careworn, her thinning blonde curls not fully covering her scalp. She sat at the circular table in the center of the tidy kitchen. A sign by the door read, Private. Painted a cheery pink, the walls brought the woman's black eye and matching sweatsuit into grotesque, sharp relief. She clutched an old picture of her daughter and a cigarette between her long yellow acrylic nails. One was missing. Sobs made her bangs tremble. Basil waved his hand around the kitchen. You don't need to be a soul mancer to see there's a lot of wrong in this house. Yeah, we have the makings of a villain origin story here, all right. Red put her hands on her hips, trying to project more confidence than she felt. This place was depressing. She could see why someone might do anything to get out of here. Read the lady. We need you stocked up on terrible visuals. He opened his mouth to speak, but a shout from the living room cut him off. Knock it off in there, Earlene. I'm watching my show. How can you watch that rerun with everything that's happened, Frank? Earlene crushed the picture. Red swagger slipped. She steeled herself to watch a mother's grief. Neva might have been a murderer, but how it ended was a shame. The black veil and the supreme master of Los Angeles shrouded the case in mystery. All the human world knew was that a beautiful actress had killed herself in a fit of sorrow over her beloved director's murder. That was all the Morgan family would ever know. You bastard. Erlene tossed her cigarette in the ashtray. We're going to lose the damn house and the park to that damn Jew's family. The insurance company won't pay out the policy on a suicide. I can't go on the talk show circuit with my face like this neither, just when public interest is at its peak. Her holler turned low and sour, and you're watching reruns. Slap on some makeup, Frank grumbled from the other room and turned the TV volume up. Fucking useless. Erlene picked up her waiting cigarette. She took a long drag, as if she was trying to get all the nicotine in one go. The cylinder turned to ash. Her lips trembled as she stared at her daughter's photograph. Eyes narrowing, she released the smoke out her nose like a waking dragon. She put the cigarette out between the printed blue eyes. Red always wondered if she was missing out by not knowing who her family was. Five minutes with the Morgans was making her change her mind. She hoped that her family weren't like this, even more than she wished they weren't a clan of evil witches. She used to imagine they were gentle professors or cheerful dentists. 
now her aspirations lowered to evil but loving. Rubbing his temple, Basil walked out of the kitchen. I think I got enough. Going after him, Red followed the arrows and the increasingly large signs that proclaimed Neve's room was down the hall. The room itself was a letdown after the build-up. Painted pink with ruffled white curtains, it seemed more like a shrine than a bedroom. Barbies on a bookshelf and a poster of the Spice Girls were labeled with a museum seriousness. A red-haired porcelain doll rested on the white-blanketed bed. Red waved her hand and wished, visualizing her intention clearly. A tidy ring of iron ore materialized on the pink carpet. She added salt, hematite, and a few other repelling herbs in the spell. Dried petals and stems drifted onto the cold iron circle like a garnish. Her body back in California needed her energy, but she still pushed a trickle of magic into the witch trap. Nevaeh could outwitch her in the dreamland and needed to be distracted enough to forget. Will this do it? She touched the doll, her fingers passing through it. Can you home in on it? He nodded. Unlike most of this stuff, that was actually hers. Now focus. Red took his hands, holding them up and out to create an oval with their arms. Navy had missed her cue to go to the great beyond. They were going to remind her. Should we say her name three times like Bloody Mary? Concentrate. Lock in on her soul, Basil snapped. Give me a sign when you've gotten enough soul vibes off her. She braced herself for incoming bad juju. Neve formed out of smoky, dark mists like a Disney villain invading a Barbie dream house. Magic fury wafted off her. The black of her smeared mascara matched the inky jet color of her eyeballs. She stomped toward them, shaking her finger. You have no right to bring me here. He pressed himself against the closet door, half sinking into it. Red grinned. Look down. Neve glanced down at the ring of iron she was trapped in. Her face fell into confusion, then fear, lips curling back. As her eyes flicked from black to blue, the shadows faded around her. Shit! This is some room you have here. Stalling for time, Red pointed at a commemorative plate with the actress's smiling face and a price tag on it. You know, I need one of these. It'll really bring my living room together. Fuck off. Did you just summon me to rubber lean stupid roadside freak show in my face? That's just a bonus. I was curious to see how little Neve got her start. Red crossed her arms, mock examining the room. She was being snarky, but the interest was real. Had it been the crappy parents, the shitty upbringing, or the love of the Spice Girls that had turned the other witch evil? It's frillier than I expected. I've never even slept here. Nevaeh glowered at the merchandise on the desk. No, you're the reason they got out of the trailer park. Red gestured to the distinctly not mobile room. Beyond casting Neva in his movies, Ari had been her piggy bank for her excessive lifestyle and real estate ventures that her own blockbuster salary couldn't afford. It wasn't the magic that brought suspicion on the actress. It was the money trail. Greediness seemed to be genetic. I'm mulling over the pop psychology behind your mother wanting to buy it instead of move. Maybe to lord it over the peasants that she squirted out a star. Neve put her hands on her hips. Are you just going to be catty with me? Because I've had to do press tours with bigger bitches than you. Just making conversation. This park was the clue that unraveled it all. Nevaeh widened her eyes. She didn't know, Basil. Red scoffed. Oh, geez, you went on a murder spree without even wondering what card made the house fall. The Goldsteins brought him in because they found out that Airy had invested in this cruddy place. Navy cursed. Red chuckled. You could have killed him, and they would have just sent in auditors. Looking at the investment, I can see why they figured it was witchcraft. She glanced at the worried soulmancer who chewed on his nails and looked ready to run again. Was he up for the next part of their plan? She shook her head, trying to stay casual. You could have compelled your way to an Oscar if it wasn't for the paper trail. Just cocky or sloppy. I can't figure it out. Fucking Erlene? She wanted to buy the place. Nevaeh gritted her teeth. 
hands trembling as she stared at the wall as if seeing through it to her mother in the kitchen. Her voice came out choked. I told myself I wouldn't be caught dead in this town again. There's a joke in that, Red said, wagging a finger. The quip curdled in her throat as she thought of how kind Kate could be. It was easy to imagine a young Neve triggering the maternal instincts. How long had it taken the actress to pull out the chains to enslave the spirit? I'm curious to know how the Bell Witch fits into all of this, but I'm guessing a sad little girl with god-awful parents found an abandoned house, then made a ghostly friend. No, that would be endearing. Basil wiped his hands on his hospital gown, nose crinkling as if he'd touched something unexpectedly disgusting. She doesn't make friends. She forces them. Kiss my ass, you fake British pansy. As if I would lower myself, he informed Neve with distaste, while signaling to Red with a hidden thumbs up. Not literally, idiot, Neve huffed and tossed her hair back. I'm getting the feeling that we're not each other's types. Basil, start the show. Red shot him a brittle smile, hoping he had recruited enough Christmas ghosts to shake up this Scrooge. Too bad I don't have any snacks for you, Nevy. Deep vertical furrow between his brows, he screwed up his eyes. A younger version of Earlene Morgan in a pink skirt suit appeared in the room like a streamed hologram. Shoulders padded and bangs curled high, she leaned over as if talking to a small child. I don't care if you're tired, you will smile, Miss Neve Madison Morgan. You will dance, sing, and then sit on the head judge's lap, just like we practiced. The older Neve Morgan pointed at the illusion. What the fuck is this bullshit? Welcome to your life. Red crossed her arms, watching intently to see what he dug up from the witch's mind. Where had Nevea gone wrong? The vision of Erlene stepped closer and pulled a canned energy drink out of her purse. Drink this quick. You better get the burps out before you go on stage. You're a little lady, damn it. Clear voice quiet, Basil studied Nevi's face. His blue gaze narrowed as if he were closing in on a slippery truth. Your mum started you on the pageant circuit when you were three. How many ribbons did you win? I won them all. She shot him a tiger's victory grin. I already talked about this with my shrink. My shitty mother is old news. The figment of Erlene disappeared. Replacing her in the center of the room, a somber-looking black woman in a striped dress held a Bible. She had a face made for smiling, so the frown on her lips looked like a forlorn mistake. A cross glittered on her white collar. It must not have protected her in the end. If she was in this twisted montage, then clearly things had not gone well. Did you tell the shrink about her? Red asked. Because I'm curious what happened to this lady. Neve grew pale even for a ghost, retreating as the figment stepped forward, shoulders hitting an invisible wall of the witch trap. Make her go away. This isn't cool, you sickos. She was your Sunday school teacher, Mrs. Crenshaw. You liked her, he said voice solemn and brows pensively drawn together. I'm not telling you nothing. Neve put a hand up to block Mrs. Crenshaw's face from sight. It was an accident. You don't need to, I already know, Basil said, shrugging with resignation. He gestured to the illusion of the Sunday school teacher. And you know it wasn't an accident. She had what you wanted. They always seem to, don't they? A dark-skinned man in a white shirt and blue gym shorts stepped out of the shadows to put an arm around Mrs. Crenshaw. A whistle glinted above the words, Smithson's Corner High School, on his chest. His easy, steady smile reminded Red of Nevy's husband, DJ Shake. No, no, no. Like she was going to toss her astral cookies, Nevi shook. Stop it! He wouldn't touch you even after his wife died. Not until you compelled him to. How long after did he kill himself? It was the guilt over what you made him do. Basil lifted his hand, eyes closing. Three small children with the same infectious smile stepped beside their parents. Frowns wilted the joy from their eyes. The room felt crowded as Nevi's victims huddled around the iron ring enclosing her. The Crenshaws made you feel safe and you destroyed their family. Basil intoned with the seriousness of a judge. 
I didn't know what I was doing then. Neve clutched herself, arms tightening around her mini dress, smudged mascara framing panicked eyes. I never meant to hurt them. Right. You knew what you were doing when you sent the Bell Witch to attack me. He flung the soul-deep truth at her. You've known what you were doing for a long time. Crafted from illusions and bygone memories, Ari Goldstein joined the Crenshaw family. He grinned, latte in hand, and a script tucked under his arm. I just talked to the producers. You have the part, kid. It's only a few lines, but you'll make rent this month. It was fake, but a chill still walked up her spine. Red had watched him die. Ari helped you before you compelled him. They all did, but it wasn't enough. Nive covered her ears. Stop it. The figments disappeared. In the silence, a new vision materialized out of shadow. Image shuddering between darkness and light. A bunk bed by a wooden cabin wall. A corn husk doll sat on the pillow. Two snakes slithered across the bed under a black hole of an aura. What happened at Bible Camp, Neve? Basil asked, a shake in his words. He stared at his own conjuring, as confused as Red felt. Something happened here. Something terrible, didn't it? Neve sniffed back an ugly sob, body shuddering, slapping her skull. Fuck you! Get out of my head! It's not your mind. These are imprinted on your soul, Nevae, he tapped his chest. You will be marked by these crimes for as long as you remain here. This was her cue. Red stepped forward. There is another way. You don't have to keep carrying this. You can move on to the other side. Maxwell said there was nothing there for me, just blackness. There's a whole other world there. You don't want to be trapped here, not with this haunting you. The lie was easier to tell than Red expected. She had pitied Neve once, tried to make sure the actress faced human justice instead of the vampire kind. She'd been burned at the stake for her trouble. If the universe was fair, nothing good was waiting for the Nevae on the other side. Cross over to find peace. Neve fell to her knees and nodded. I just want to be free. Behind the witch trap, a spectral green sphere drifted from the ceiling, glittering on the memorabilia. It filled the room with blinding radiance. Twenty. December 23rd, 1241 a.m., Dreamland, Smithson's Corner, Tennessee. Kneeling in the iron circle, Nevi looked small, silhouetted in the glow of the vortex. A hush fell over the bedroom. Swirling neon wisps illuminated the still faces on the Spice Girls poster, with a jade radiance that made all five singers look seasick. She looked at the entry to the beyond. It doesn't seem too bad. Let yourself go into it, Red urged, resisting the urge to shoo the other witch away like a stray pigeon. The clock was ticking, and it could tick fast in the dreamland. If they were going to split Maxwell from his henchwoman, then it had to happen quick. The grotesque illusions from Neve's memory had taken too long to break her. Exit stage left. Shoulders drooping, Nevea turned on her knees. A familiar presence wafted in like a bad smell. Go now, while you can. Red glanced around, stomach dropping. Spikes of darkness slashed across the swirls of the green vortex like a gate blocking off the gateway to the beyond. The bookshelves began to shake. In a tornado of shadows, purple suit darkened to black in the gloom, Maxwell marched into the center of the room. The splendor of the bright vortex shied from him. His usual smirk was replaced by a grimace of fury. Lump in her throat, Red jumped back, pushing Basil behind her. This was her brilliant idea to go on the offensive. She knew it could come to a magic duel with Maxwell. He mastered the dreamland, but he was still just a warlock. Warlocks were a class of mage that didn't have internal magic, but studied the arcane to manipulate relics and charms. She didn't have the training, but she did have the natural magic advantage. Time to starting using hammers instead of rocks. Hidden behind her back, her fingers curled to summon a fire orb. It sputtered in her palm. She shook her hand, willing the magic to flare up to get some punch to her intention. Now, Nevi, there is no welching on this deal. Maxwell gnashed his teeth. 
Get off that atrocious carpet and stop listening to that strumpet. Hard to ignore her when I'm stuck here, cold iron. Still kneeling, Nevaeh pointed at the circle of metals, cat bones, and herbs enclosing her. Don't be an idiot. It's not there in reality. She tricked you into seeing a cage. Then you held the bars closed yourself. He kicked at the iron ore and it disappeared. Don't believe your eyes. The flames finally ignited in her palm to form a baseball-sized orb. Red tossed it at him. Believe in this. Maxwell caught the fireball in front of his chest and blew it out. Smoke curling around his face. He slammed his palm out. I believe in higher angels. Unseen energy forced Red and Basil to stagger backwards. The soulmancer tugged on her arm, hissing a warning so smushed together from panic that she couldn't understand. She glanced back at his terrified face, trying to visualize a safe place to make a location jump to. By this point in the dreamland, she could just think and boom, there she was. The trouble was that she couldn't get them to move. It was like they were anchored to this depressing corner of Tennessee. The angels aren't waiting for you, Nevi. You know what is. Crouching to her eye level, Maxwell brushed her blonde hair back from quivering lips. He spoke softly, petting her like a child. That lift will send you straight down. I am trying to take care of you, but you have to follow my plan to the letter. Don't listen to him. He'll only damn then discard you. You saw what happened to his wife. Red clenched her jaw, imagining the vortex behind Neve growing to swallow the actress up and force her into the great beyond. Her intention felt as effective as a dental floss lasso on a rhino. Rising to his feet, Maxwell lifted his hand to the whirling maw of light and curled his fingers into a fist. None of that. The vortex disappeared, leaving the room dim. Nevaeh wiped her tears and stood. You almost tricked me, hater. You've already been tricked, Red retorted, as her plan imploded faster than she could think. I am giving her vapid life meaning, far more than these pink trappings of celebrity. Maxwell arched an eyebrow at a miniature Nevaeh smiling at him from a mug on the shelf. I can't teleport out, Basil whispered, huddling behind Red. Care to retire? Smashing. I want you gone. Maxwell smirked, pointing at him. Basil clutched his heart, crying out, it's my body. The strange anchor on their spirits eased. Stomach sinking, Red grabbed his hand and willed him away to the hospital. If he were under direct attack, she couldn't protect both their bodies this far away. Sending energy to maintain the protection spell didn't need to be at the forefront of her mind, but it had already been strained by building the witch trap around Neva. The hospital had enough mystical protections to at least warn the doctors to pull out the mojo and fix Basil. The warlock hadn't beaten them to the room. Was he toying with them or dealing with Neve? The bright moonlight of the dreamland cast reality into sharp edges of horror. Basil's body convulsed on the bed, chapped lips curled over his wired shut jaws. The IV ducts strained from his flailing, knocking down the stand, pulling the tubes out in a spurt of blood. Basil hunched over his body, fake British accent disappeared into real Midwestern fear. My heart, good fucking God, the pain, how is he doing this? Stay with me now, fight him. Red urged more magic forward to maintain the golden net of protection that she had cast over his body. Fight! The heart monitor blared a siren. Alarm lights flashed above the bed. The rolling tray beside the bed shook and scooted back. Maxwell materialized in a cloud of smoke at the foot of the medical bed. He glared at Nevai, holding on to her upper arm. I am beginning to believe you don't have enough of an incentive in this game, my girl. Revenge doesn't seem to be the biscuit it once was. Let's sweeten this deal. You'll get more than revenge on this hunter's spirit. You can get her body. Throat tightening, Red backed up. Instinct hollered at her to run down the hospital hallway to guard her own flesh and blood. The spirit form felt like an echo of her real body, but the connection was still there. What happened when she lost her body? Would she float away into the ether or be stuck in the dreamland forever? Straightening in his grip, Nevaeh goggled. You don't mean... 
Is that possible? Tone low and vulture gaze serious, he glowered at Red. Everything is possible. Red knew he was right. She stepped forward to block the soulmancer from view and nudged him. Mouthing the words silently, she told him to come with her. Run, Red, Basil moaned, spirit form prone over his body. Haven't you two learned a jot after teleporting all over God's green earth? There is no running. Understand that this was business in the beginning before Juniper made it personal. Maxwell jerked his hand as if swatting a fly, shadow energy springing forward. Red flew backward. The impact made her eyes cross as she landed against the wall. She slipped half through the hallway but caught her balance and pulled herself back into the room. Basil landed like dead weight on her. Catching him with a groan, she hauled the shaking soulmancer up. He flew out of her hands, arms tossed back, pulled toward the warlock. Maxwell reached both hands into Basil's chest, smirking. In the dreamland, I am a god. Basil screamed as his spirit form faded until only his outline remained. It dissolved like bubbles popping around the spectral hands in his chest. His body on the bed shook. Blood dribbled out of his nose. Red charged and jumped for Maxwell. Her spirit collided with his, and she landed on his chest. She punched his face, tossing her will behind giving him the pummeling of his life. Enough mystic duels. He had more orbs up his sleeve than she did. Mages expected magic in a fight. A solid pop to the nose usually didn't occur to them. Plus, she really wanted to hit him. Nevaeh kicked her leg out, her bare foot transforming into a steel-toed boot as it rushed toward her enemy's face. Red grabbed the ankle. Two could play at the freaky body modification game. A roar straight out of National Geographic shot like a cannon from her throat. Neve fell back. Maxwell jackknifed his hips to dislodge Red, taking advantage of the distraction, and backhanded her. Red grabbed his collar as she fell to the side. They rolled through the knocked-over IV stand. Fury coursed through her veins. The raw emotion would have scared her if she had any conscious thought left for it. All she knew was that her friend was dying. Maxwell grabbed her hands and headbutted her. You are letting poor Basil die. You think I can't sap his life force even while brawling like a common thug with you? Chilled, she raised a hand back to strike him. He grabbed her throat, long fingers tightening. I am a god here. You keep forgetting that. He stood, shaking her by the neck, and forced her to look at her friend. Choose. Keep up the roughhousing, or save him. Shaking, Basil choked on the blood coming out of his mouth and nose. His senseless body still forced involuntary motions to save him. He is fading, Red. Or are you like Juniper, willing to see others suffer to achieve your aims? What kind of witch are you? She couldn't look away from the bruised face. He is choking on his own blood. Terrible way to go. Maxwell clicked his tongue. Ashen under his California tan, Basil looked ghastly. Blood seeped from the gaps in the wire on his teeth and broken jaw. The seconds dragged on. Red cried out, Save him! Maxwell tossed her into Neve's waiting arms before opening his clenched fist. A dark mist streamed out of Basil, absorbing back into the warlock. He adjusted his jaw before sniffing. Right then, we have a deal, wife. Basil opened his eyes. He turned his head, blood dripping out of the corner of his mouth, and twisted onto his side. The choking convulsion subsided. He looked around, darting eyes flipped open wide, before falling back on the stained pillow. A nurse rushed into the room, yelling into her walkie-talkie. We have a patient experiencing psychic distress. Another one ran in. We're not paid enough for this. Red sighed heavily, dropping her head, growing limp in Nevier's grasp, a knot unclenched in her belly. Well, maybe you are different from Juniper. Maxwell cocked his head. Now, dear Basil has a chance. Of course, that leaves you awfully alone. She's not alone. Neve pushed Red's hair back before tugging on it, her delicate features twisted into a sneer. She has us to torment her. Maxwell was right. Red was all alone. 
Basil might have been an awake soulmancer, but with his jaw shut and weakened body, how could he do anything? You've pulled yourself together, Neva. Brilliant. I need you sharp. Maxwell smirked and tweaked her chin. Iron cuffs appeared around Red's wrists and ankles. Cold metal chilled her skin. Her sense of failure felt just as constricting. You're right, Neve said. It was all in my head. I'm more powerful than you, Red. You almost made me forget that. And before you get smart, wife, understand that my iron is a lot tougher than yours. Maxwell gloated, eyes twinkling. The rules of the dreamland are quite simple. Will is power, power is power, and I have had far longer to hone mine. Stiffly sneering at him, Red shook her head. Stewing in your own bitter juices for over a century, and I still kicked your ass in a fair fight. He smirked. I don't do fisticuffs. Or fair fights. You're going to wish you never took me to my dear old ma. Neve scowled as she tugged the iron chain connecting the cuffs. No talk shows or book deals for her now. You can ask her about it after we kick you to the great beyond. You killed her? Damn. Red shook her head, her throat tightening. Your own mom? And fucking Frank. No one left for you to use against me, Nevi said, blue eyes grim and flat. Now that is skin in the game. There is no going back now. Maxwell clapped his hands before rubbing them with a conspirator's glee. You don't need a mother anymore. You're going to have hers, wherever she is. The warlock shrugged flapping his fingers as if it were a minor detail. More importantly, you will have a shiny new body. Neve examined her prize like a customer on a car lot looking at a Honda. It could be curvier. Red scowled. You can make improvements later, Maxwell said distractedly, eyes unfocused as if he were sending out other senses. Now, you're trading me like a sandwich in a schoolyard? Red fought against the cuffs. Even if it was physically in the next room, her heart thumped in her ears. What happened to scaring me to death? Oh, we are still scaring you to death, but no reason to waste that body, he said with the earnestness of a die-hard recycler. So, you're going to give my body and the power that comes with it to this psychopath? She just killed her family. What makes you think you can control her? Red cocked her head. I thought you wanted to stop the apocalypse. She'll jump on a chance to join What's-His-Horns. Hey, watch it. Navia jerked Red's arm, causing the iron chains to clink. You have such a very narrow vision. Maxwell shook his head. Neve can still do much damage to the opposition with the right coaching. It might even buy her a ticket into the heavenly choir. Think about that, my starlet, singing with the angels. Cheeks reddening and eyes sparkling, Neve glanced skyward as if already seeing her angelic reward. Imagine me right next to baby Jesus, a diva in heaven with fluffy white wings. Red rolled her eyes. It was delusional. Ugh, he was right. You're an idiot. Neve huffed and took her hands off the cuffs to pull her palm back to slap. Enough talk. Red dodged the blow and ran out of the room. Unable to teleport, she waddled in the iron cuffs. She heard the medium chanting from her room. If she could just get to him, maybe he could hear her this time. It's 21. December 23rd, 1242 AM, Dreamland St. Bridget's Hospital, Los Angeles. Red stumbled into her hospital room through Quinn and Lucas to stand behind the medium at the bed. Terry held her body's hand while holding a handkerchief to his nose with the other. Sweat dripped down his forehead, eyes screwed up as if waiting for a punch. She raised her chained hands to put them at the sides of his head. Betting on a hunch and her ability to balance, she lifted her foot to a healing burn wound on her physical leg. Enough blood was exposed for her to make contact like she had before when spelling out her situation for Vic. She pushed everything into being heard whether it was in his ears or the psychic connection that he had with her body. The magic bubbled inside her as if churned by her twisting stomach. She didn't know if touch would amplify her voice, but she was desperate. Listen up, Basil's awake and Maxwell's coming, she said. He'll give my body to Neve. We could use this in a plan B to defeat them. 
but you have to make sure she doesn't keep it, even if it means killing me. The medium trembled. Red's here. She has a grave warning about Basil, but is talking too fast. You heard me this time, she stiffened, stomach dropping. The warlock. He collapsed, face planting into the foot of the bed. Wheeling over, Vic leaned over to try and pick up the medium. He blanched as the other man slipped onto the floor out of reach of his wheelchair. Oh shit, Terry. Kristoff shielded the bed as he tensed. He looked directly at her spirit, blue eyes searching. Quinn glanced around the room, shoulders squared. Look alive. We're in this together, Lucas said to his progeny, his usual disdain replaced by urgency, and held out his hand. Let's finally get this bastard. Forehead crinkled in suspicion. Kristoff studied the offered hand before shaking it. He nodded. This time, we'll win. Orderlies carried Terry out into the hallway, adding chaos to the physical plane, but in the dreamland, there was the stillness of a Mexican standoff. Red tightened her fists, trying to summon intention, magic, or even the power of Beyonce to break the iron cuffs. No joy. Cold iron bound her energy. She couldn't teleport or toss an orb. All she could do was glare at the two malignant spirits gloating as they appeared in villainous mists. They can't help you, Maxwell stroked his goatee. Stop fighting the inevitable, you stubborn witch. Nevaeh raised a fist, flames growing between her knuckles. Don't make me mess up my new body. Red tried to mimic Neve, but not even a spark shot from her fingers. This wasn't real, she told herself. It didn't matter. It felt too real. Just when she had figured out the dreamland, Maxwell cut her off at the source. Go to the soul mancer, Nevea. He's still on the threshold of death. Kick him over at my word, Maxwell ordered, dismissing her with a casual gesture as if murder was just another errand on his to-do list after buying milk. Gladly. She grinned, showing too many even, white teeth as she vanished in a slow fade. They'll stop you, even if I die. Red shook her head. Backed into a corner, she tried to stall to figure a way out that didn't get Basil killed especially if I die. They won't be able to do anything if they are fighting each other. Maxwell laughed. The malevolent chuckle deepened, twisting in an echo as it filled the room. Red stiffened. Icy fear radiated in her gut. What are you going to do to them? His shoulders drew back, and multiple versions of himself burst out of his chest, each one transparent, yet the smirking face and purple suit were the same. The Maxwells flew forward, swift as a bad omen, to hover beside the three vampires, and Vic clustered around the hospital bed. The original smirked, form flickered between transparent and opaque. Nostrils flaring, he concentrated on his wraiths. Truths can be wielded like arsenic. Red waddled forward in her cuffs, swinging the iron chain at the specter looming over Vic. The chain went through the Maxwell double without even splitting the form. Ignoring the assault, the replica drifted down. Sludgy black spectral smoke poured out of his mouth, surrounding Vic in an octopus's hug. They see you as a useless cripple to be pitied. You used to be a werewolf hunter, yet who will avenge your family now? All your enemies will return when they discover your weakness. Michael might have put you in this chair, but Quinn put you in the crosshairs. Another clone leaned close to Quinn, dark smoke shooting out of his mouth like a murder of crows. You don't deserve atonement. The blood will never wash off. Even when you try to be good, people suffer around you. Death is your true talent. The third wraith fluttered by Lucas with a grin stretched too wide. Toxic insects skittered down his chin. Red will learn the truth about the demons you hide. Your spawn will be there when she turns away from you. He will betray you again. The last Maxwell clone stood behind Kristoff. Hissing, his forked shadowy tongue half-formed into a railroad spike, he pulled out the glistening appendage. Breaking it in half, he drove it into Kristoff's ear. Lucas is better than you. She will always choose him, and it will be the death of her. You'll lose her again if you don't take her now. The words blended, but each biting note dripped with jealousy, resentment, guilt, and fear. 
Noxious mists and sinister shapes curled around each man. It happened at once in reality. It happened slower in the dreamland. The second that Red tried again to swipe one away from Vic, it was already too late. The four copies glided back to the warlock. Shuddering, they rejoined his form. He twisted at the waist to crack his back. Wincing, he rubbed his neck with a sigh. I keep thinking you will be smarter than Juniper, maybe better in this age of innocence, but I see you need to learn things the hard way too. Skin crawling, she examined the poisonous gloom seeping into her friend's auras. You bass! Maxwell lifted his hand. The stitches reappeared on her mouth, the chains tightened. No talking. The warlock shushed her. Fucking hell, Quinn. You brought us here, and it's been nothing but shit. Vic boomed the words, breaking the silence in the room left by the retreat of the hospital staff. If I wasn't in this chair, she wouldn't even be here. Oi, Vic, Lucas snapped. Lay off him. We're supposed to be a damn team. Vic flipped him off. Horror growing, Red watched hackles raise around the room. The unity between the men began shaking violently apart. They had been working together only seconds ago. Now tempers boiled from a wraith's whisper. Shadow tentacles flailed between Vic's lips. You know it's true. We'd be on the road and fighting something that we could see. I know, I know. Quinn shook his head, shadow wings circling. How many teams have you lost over the decades? Hands up in submission, Quinn said, I deserve this. Vic sped forward like a knight bolting at a joust. Because of you, she's going to end up like me. Yelling behind the stitches, Red warned her friends not to listen. Even if they could hear her spirit voice, would they listen over the enchantment? The yelling intensified. Quinn stoically took a tongue lashing from Vic, but Lucas and Kristoff had fangs out, preparing for brawl. Even their auras flashed lightning. I'm taking her to Portland, Kristoff said. The tawny sheen of a predator obscured the blue of his irises. A shadow spike jutted out of his ear. Like hell you will, Lucas growled, leaning forward, reaching for his iron dagger. Spectral spiders skittered over his shoulder, startled by the sudden movement. She would have never met Kristoff if we hadn't come to L.A. Vic motioned to him. The outline of dark fish scales raced down his hand. This is undead love triangle bullshit that she never wanted. A repeat that didn't go too well the first time. Quinn slunk back against the wall. I never expected... I didn't think... Vic spewed indictment after vindictive indictment against his boss. His voice grew hoarse and nearly inaudible as the darkness grew around him. He rasped out, You worked with Delilah against us. Red yelled, telling him to stop, but her lips only pulled painfully on the stitches on her mouth. She cringed at the growing discord between the vampires on the other side of the room. Iron chains rattling, she tried to shuffle to them. Stop me, Lucas, and see what happens. I'm not a fledgling shining your boots anymore. Kristoff puffed his chest out and lifted his chin, extending to his full height to loom four inches over the older vampire. Shadows spread from his ear as if ink filled his veins. His muscles corded in his neck as his jaw tightened. You'll be the death of her. Again. She's not Juniper. Lucas matched the eye contact, fist clenching to rocket up to his progeny's face. Sable arachnids clung to his knuckles. She'll share her fate if I don't act. Worry dimmed the anger, Kristoff's intense gaze growing vulnerable. The jet black shadow veins pulsed, spreading under his collar. He rapped at his chest. The territorial fury returned. I am not losing her. I just found her. You'll lead her to destruction again. Lucas shook his head. A dark spider skulked over his high cheek, then crept into his ear. That was you egging Juniper on in London, whispering God knows what in her ear, doing whatever you could to twist her head up and get a bit of touch. She asked me for that touch in Prague, in Dresden. Grinning, Kristoff counted the cities with his fingers. I still dream about what we did in London. Snarling, Lucas punched him. Then she came back to me. 
Head snapping back, Kristoff shook it off and laughed. Delusional. Lucas tossed an uppercut across his progeny's chin. That's what you are if you think that you're leaving with her. Red jerked against Maxwell's hold, but his grip locked her in place. The very air seemed tainted by his malicious charm. She could only watch her friends fight. The two vampires fell to the floor by the hospital bed. Fang met fist as shadows grew in their auras. Movements blurred from the speed, blocking each other's blows. They rolled half into the doorway. The iron dagger fell out of Lucas's pocket. Someone got slow. Rearing up, shirt torn and blonde hair must, Kristoff straddled his sire's waist. Fangs jutted from his wide grin. Malevolent joy shone in his amber eyes. He spent over a hundred years dreaming of this fight, and he was winning. Lucas pushed him and over his head into the hallway before standing. He sniffed, wiping blood from the corner of his mouth, the rolling storm in his gaze. He waited just as long for this rematch. He kicked Kristoff in the ribs. The toe of his Doc Martens dug in with a crunch. You want to know why Juniper stopped you from killing me? It's why Red wants to be with me. It's because I've always been the one. On his back, Kristoff grabbed the attacking foot and twisted bone cracked under his grip. He tossed Lucas out of the sight down the hallway. You were a rich, pretty boy who couldn't take care of his toys. Still can't. You were never one of us, and it burned at you. Still does, his sire said from the doorway. Kristoff stood with an icy glare. Poison from the curse darkened in his neck arteries. His right eye twitched. You made me one of you. Maxwell marched Red towards the brawlers in the hospital hallway. I don't want you to miss the excitement. Let's pull up a chair. Your boys are fighting. I'm putting my quids on the one without a conscience. Stitches muffled her profanity-riddled reply. Lucas twisted his ankle into place, squaring his jaw against the pain. Admit it, you only want Red because she is a point against me. Kristoff pushed his broken cartilage back into alignment. He sniffed and wrinkled his straightened nose. His tone came out 20% nasally and 100% disdainful. I don't need points against you. Look at how the last century played out. I created an empire. Bootlegger in the Depression, a profiteer during the war. What a grand start. Lucas cracked his knuckles. Dark, spectral insect legs poked out between the pale fingers. Drop the sanctimony, especially with that rusted suit of armor. I know why you don't like to remember the twenties, sire. Go back to Portland, alone. Noticing his distraction, Red tried to elbow Maxwell in the side. The mystical bonds tightened and multiplied. An unseen hand gripped her chin and forced her to watch the death match. She'll know who to turn to in the end. Kristoff smirked through fangs. Black veins covered the side of his face and neck like a road map. You think she is that blind? We're fighting the good fight. What are you doing beyond selling overpriced drinks? Might not have a soul, but I'm still not committing massacres. You want to know why you'll never stake me? Kristoff rushed forward, punching him. The darkness in his violet and silver aura billowed around his head. So, you can still convince yourself that there is someone worse than you. She'll see that even with a soul, you are as selfish as you ever were. It's how you were born. Staggering back, Lucas blocked a second blow. Shadow spiders scuttling from under his shirt sleeve absorbed into his blue aura. You're gagging to do all the nasty, bloody things to Red that you couldn't do to Juniper. I protected her then, and I'll kill you now to keep her safe. You guarded her to torment her exclusively. I kept her from the warlock for years. It took months for him to find Red with your claim on her. Months. You said Red was your concern? Broke a vase in my office to make the point. Kristoff spun and kicked him in the chest. Grinning, he got in a flurry of quick blows. Admit it. You know you should have told her to leave L.A. Want to know why I'm certain you're the same selfish prick? Lucas dodged to the left, pulling him into a headlock. Dark webs grew under his arm to wrap around his progeny's neck like a garrote. He punched him in the face. Enlighten me. I went back to Portland and left her in peace. Kristoff elbowed Lucas in the gut. 
Inky lines traveled down his arm. The shadow railroad spike from Maxwell's clone glinted in his ear. You're still lurking in her DMs. Tightening his grip, he sneered. I let her go. You never could. Eyes widening, Lucas froze. Gold lightning flashed in his shadow-tarnished cobalt and steel aura. Kristoff pulled his sire by the neck to flip him over his head and to the floor. He straddled the other vampire's waist, grinning like a tiger mid-pounce. He punched Lucas in the face to punctuate his sentences, doled out with the same force. I'm letting Red choose, just like I did, Juniper. Even without a soul, can you say the same? Grabbing hair, Lucas yanked him down to the side and rushed for the iron dagger on the floor. Hot, helpless tears stung at Red's eyes. Colder than an Antarctic winter, no smirk lingered on Maxwell's face, only grim promises. I will make them kill each other, then I will go into Basil's room and I will let Neve kill him. You will watch. Everyone you care about, everyone who cares about you, they will die tonight. Then I will find your family. Every trace of DNA that could create that infuriating face again. And I will destroy them. Lucas and Kristoff circled each other. Vic bellowed curses. The alarm of the heart monitor echoed from Basil's room. Seconds felt like hours. Frank and Erlene Morgan died tonight because you brought their homicidal daughter back into their home. How many more need to die, Red? Maxwell demanded, shaking her, the chains clinking together. How many lives are you willing to trade for your own? You might not remember your life, but what about your morals? The weight of five lives hung around her neck. She owed each of them. Basil had stood by her in the dreamland. Vic was her mentor. Quinn was her boss. Lucas was complicated. Even Kristoff had saved her life a few times. She might not have been able to impact the physical realm, but Maxwell and Nevi could unleash more hell on her friends. Taylor got your tongue? He chuckled and snapped his fingers. The stitches disappeared from her lips. Red yelled over the cacophony of furious arguments. Nothing stops you from hurting my friends after I'm gone. After you are gone, I can finally rest. Your family, friends, they will no longer be my concern. Maxwell shrugged. Without me, Neve is only a metaphorical harpy. They bring me back and you're at square one. They won't be able to find you. Not in the true beyond, he smirked. Don't worry about your body. It's a vessel, a suit of base carnality. I've gone through a few. You won't miss it. You want me to agree? Red asked. I want you to rest in the bloody great beyond, you bothersome pugilist. Maxwell tugged on his lapels, brushing a stray tendril of smoky ether away, lips pressed into a line. He gestured to the hospital room doorway. Go with the angels and whatnot. I'll settle for not hearing yet another scion of the Constantine clan screaming invectives. Jabbing a finger out, rageful accusations pouring from his lips, Vic overbalanced in his chair. He tumbled to the floor. Thrashing tentacles surged up around him as if he fell overboard into a kraken's embrace. Quinn huddled in the corner of the hospital room, eyes darting at unseen ghosts of his past. Obscured black mists feathered over his face. The warlock was full of smoke and mirrors. Doubts blared in her mind about his motives, history, and powers, but his ability to destroy, that was proven. Red turned to the brawling vampires, heart sinking. Without a soul, Kristoff fought ruthlessly. He threw his solid-muscled frame into every attack and never missed a chance for a low blow. Visible darkness pulsed down his hands like seams. Quick and light, Lucas kept moving. Shadow spiders circled his shoulders as he stepped around his child. He dodged a shove and a sneaky kick before it could sweep him off his feet. Taught you that? Kristoff smirked, pulling away, his arm jerking back. The iron dagger glinted in the dreamland moonlight for a second. He struck. Stabbing Lucas in the kidney, he pushed him against the wall. Not everything. Lucas pulled the dagger from his side. He grabbed Kristoff by the back of the head and slammed his knee up to meet the other vampire's face. He did it again, smiling wickedly at the sound of a nose crunching on his kneecap. Pickpocketing. Clever. But I got my knife back. You were always a bad criminal in a good suit. 
Hunched over, Kristoff spat out blood. His tone oozed with bitter self-deprecation. I make bad look good. Tugging blonde hair to bring his progeny to eye level, Lucas twirled the iron dagger in his other hand. In a quick jerk, he struck. Groaning, Kristoff's eyes widened, and blood came out of his mouth. The blade disappeared into his stomach to the hilt. It's fucking sad, Novak. Lucas twisted the dagger. You're always trying to play a game that no one invited you to. You can take me away, Red pleaded with Maxwell. Helplessness coiled in her chest, making it hard for her to remember that she didn't need to breathe. Just leave them alone. Maxwell snapped his fingers. Now, was that so hard? Three burly orderlies came around the corner. One blew a whistle. Another yelled into his walkie-talkie. Vamp, fight! Lucas backed away, staring at the blood on his hands. The dark spectral arachnids evaporated on his face. Rutting fuck, what are we doing? Grunting, Kristoff pulled the dagger from his stomach before dropping it. The ghostly railroad spike had disappeared from his ear. Just like old times. Quinn helped Vic into his chair. Both were shadow-free. Their auras cleared. Maxwell dug his fingers into her shoulders. The iron chains fell. Heart racing, Red lifted her chin as a darkness blacker than any she had ever known swallowed her up. She plummeted, tossed back on a rolling tongue, sweeping her into hungry jaws. 22. December 23rd, 1.11 a.m., Dreamland, the Asylum. Tumbling into the belly of the beast, Red landed on a surgeon's table. Time had no meaning here. In the asylum, she didn't know what was real. She only knew what hurt. Head throbbing, she squinted to bring a bare light bulb into focus. It hung on a chain like a harbinger in the gloom. Dread curdled her stomach as the illumination flickered. On, off, on, off. She prayed for it to come back on at every twitch of the phosphorus, calling out to any god she ever heard of, save the light. When the bulb went out, she knew that the pain would begin at the creaking of the switch. Pain and sanity. Reality and the dreamland. The line blurred in the darkness. Dr. B was in session. She couldn't even scream with the wooden bar lodged in her teeth secured to her head. Cold seeped into her from the metal surgical table. The straps on her wrists and ankles dug into her skin. When the shocks hit her, electricity exploded behind her eyelids, her limbs flailed on their own. Time, matter, auras, it all seemed to drift. In the darkness, her spirit gaze touched on glowing sigils and orbs. The energy traces looked like deep-sea creatures with dazzling lights to lure little fish into a waiting gullet. Nevai had teleported into the room to yell at Maxwell to stop the treatments. Did it happen? Red almost had a shred of hope that some compassion returned to the actress. It was only concern for her future body. Both of her tormentors blinked out of the room. It didn't matter if they weren't there. Even without his hand on the switch, the electric shocks still rolled through Red's body from the cloth-wrapped electrodes placed on her temples. If wishes were horses, Red would have ridden out of the psycho's den. The bell witch herself had taught her that intention ruled dreamland. If only she'd had more time to learn. Her knowledge didn't beat Maxwell's experience, or his zeal. The winter solstice had given her phantom enemies a boost. Red had given up wondering how she could be in such pain so far removed from the real world. The protection spell wouldn't last much longer, yet she still pushed limping magic along the lingering connection to her body. An unseen, unfelt wind blew the bulb back. The light grew stronger. Glowing green and red ether danced on the wall like the dreamland's answer to Christmas lights. Her eyes watered even as she closed them. Maxwell tormented her with his device, but this presence felt different. A drawling voice rambled to her ears like a tumbleweed on the plains. Now, this is a sight for undead eyes, isn't it, Strawberry? A shiver ran down her spine. This specter could only have come from her memories. What was this new mind game? Or was the dreamland bucking Maxwell's script again? This was the longest night of the year when the veil between worlds was thinnest after all. A black cowboy hat shadowed the face. 
but she knew the sun-beaten tan death couldn't fade, the former king of the prairie dead. Kurt tipped his hat, his lips curled over his fangs. He twirled a long-handled wooden spoon in his fingers. A distant song played in the background. Red killed him to this song. You got me good, Strawberry. That was a neat trick you and my Sancha cooked up. Nearly ruined Hank Williams Jr. for me. You're dead! Her words came out jumbled around the gag. The short summer night in Oklahoma when she had killed a vampire king seemed so far away. And you're about there. Makes us almost even. Kurt held up the utensil, examining it with a deprecating huff. In all my years, I never thought a wooden spoon would do me in. I reckon now that my rattlesnake of a queen set me up for the fall. I can't rightly blame you, being a habitual pawn and all. Red flipped him off under the bonds. Humming, Kurt two-stepped to the electric shock machine, an antique boxy contraption covered with dials on the front and a wooden-handled switch on top. Let's light you up like the 4th of July, little girl. The ceiling bulb went black. Electricity flooded her system. A blue-white current rocketed behind her eyelids. She convulsed, pinned by the straps. The bulb shuddered to life. Oh, little Amazon, look at what the warlock has done to you. Michel de Gramont stared down at her with one brown eye. A cross-shaped scar peeked out from his black eye patch. Black hair spilled over a missing ear to his shoulders. The exiled Prince of Paris looked just as he did in the seconds before Cora decapitated him to the sound of cheers. He smoothed her hair, murmuring soothing French. I told you that I could help you destroy him. You only had to give me my Penelope back, a love for a life. Sweating, Red shook her head, trying to dispel the hallucination. She liked him better when he was dust-blowing in the Santa Ana winds. You still don't understand the purity of my cause. The vampire tisked, walking over to the switch with the air of a contrite hangman. Even without my soul, I am distressed to see you so. I may have betrayed my supreme master, but I would have held to my word to you. I held to my word to Iron Jack, after all. The warlock is an enemy of the world, and I had grown quite attached to the world before you slammed a gardening hoe into my skull. Imagine the wasted time. You could have vanquished him by now. Then help me. She slumped her head to the side, nauseous from the movement. I have gotten what I wanted, but the little Amazon will not get what she wants. I am with Penelope. We are beyond the last apocalypse. That is more consolation than a monster like me deserves, Michel said. A tear dripped from his eye. I would have shown you who you are. The shocks began again, and her scream echoed in her ears long after it ended. Red didn't know if it was a trick of Maxwell's or her own mind. Conscious thought felt fuzzy around the edges like a vignette of darkness around a photo. She made Basil show Nevi a horror reel. Somewhere, the starlet was laughing at the reversal of fortune, probably over Red's body taking measurements while she planned a shopping spree. Christmas ghosts came in threes, and Red didn't need to see the last one. The first two sucked. At least Scrooge got to go to a party and see people he cared about. She only saw a montage of monsters that she rightly slain. Would the bandage man of Cannon Beach come to taunt her as the ghost of Christmas future next? As if her thoughts awakened a watchful leviathan in the depths, the floor quaked and the ceiling bulb brightened and shattered. Glass shards scattered. Red braced herself for the cuts. Whisper softness landed on her cheek instead of jagged glass. Ruby red petals rained down. Rose-colored flames ringed the table. Reflected light tangoed on the brick wall. A presence rose from a crouch, materializing as it stood. Darkness swirled around the figure, leaving no facial feature visible, only the outline of a tall man in a black suit with a dark pomegranate-colored cape. The shadow of horns rose behind him. She didn't need to see his face to know him from the warlock's vision of a hellish army. Beloved. The masculine voice echoed in the chamber. Somber compassion threaded the word. A cold caress ran down her cheek. I hear your calls even beyond this veil. No. She moved her head from the invisible touch. He was a hallucination. It all had to be. 
the shock treatments finally cracked her. How confused you are. The horned stranger stood beyond the flames, yet his voice whispered close as if he were curled up with her on the surgical table. She couldn't tell if he was speaking out loud or in her mind. Our enemies seek to drive you mad. They want to keep us apart. They don't understand that you have a greater purpose. I'm not, Juniper. I don't want her purpose, Red cried, knowing somehow that even muffled on her gag he would understand. She pushed the intention out with her soul that she would never give in, even if he could read her thoughts, even if he had bred her doppelganger to be some apocalypse queen, even if she was strapped to this table for eternity. Do not mistake their illusions. You can't be contained by tricks, beloved. This is not the prison you deserve. Flames surged, yet the shadows remained around the horned figure. You will stand once you choose it. Your destiny is yours to command. Freedom is my gift to you, as it was to the first of your line. I don't want it, she denied, muffled by the gag. They tell lies in their good books. They tell lies with their holy visions. But you will know the truth. The world will know the truth. The last word boomed as the figure disappeared, and the echo ricocheted around the chamber. Red waited for the flip of the switch and the endless zap of electricity. It never came yet she shook anyway. Well, 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 what mischief have you gotten yourself into? Maxwell's Cheshire smirk appeared in the gloom, elongating grotesquely, then snapping back to normal. The rest of his body slowly formed. He snapped, and the light bulb returned. He snapped again, and the wood gag disappeared. Just enjoying your torments while you were out. She glared, swallowing back the acrid taste of fear. Her heart thumped against the metal table. Really dug deep with those. The country music interlude was a nice touch. Er, silver tongue struck dumb. He frowned. His dark eyes glanced around the room before scrutinizing her. I suppose you are ahead of schedule for the train to madness. I should make haste, then. Was that doubt in his gaze or another hallucination that her fried brain had cooked up? Red tried to sneer, but the Alice in Wonderful reference only came out an incoherent mumble as vertigo came over her. What, late for tea, Mr. White Rabbit? No need to be out of sorts. You'll be beyond this soon enough, he nodded to the switch. Think about what I am curing you of. Oh yeah, thanks for the treatment, Dr. B. You should be thanking me, yes. I found you a foot down the same path that damned Juniper. Maxwell lifted his hand to gesture to the side, iridescent mist spreading in the wake. New figments appeared. These were just as familiar as the others, yet she had never seen them quite like this, the fanged four in their prime. It was Quinn Burns with a flowing mane of blonde hair spilling over his refined Victorian suit and demonic anticipation in his eyes. He stood with his hands on his lapels, Nothing beyond his face matched her gentle boss in the present. Delilah Burns lifted opera glasses from her eyes. Golden curls piled on her head contrasted with the crimson of her dress. Now she might have been a hard bitch running the hottest modeling agency in L.A., but at her cattiest, she still didn't compare to the antique ice queen before Red. Cherubic in lilac, Selene tipped a small derby hat. Fangs peeked out from her ruby-tinted mouth. Hunger curled her lip up and sharpened the dazed, far-seeing look in her eyes. Lucas grinned and rested his thumbs under his suspenders. His tie hung loose around his neck. No warmth glinted from his gray eyes. Kitten, have you been bad? Maxwell clapped his hands and the four disappeared. They found you again. Killing you would have been a mercy compared to life with them, let alone a repeat of it. Tell me you're grateful. Just get this over with, Red said. You have what you want. The gag reappeared in her mouth. I'll get that stubbornness out of you. Maxwell gritted his teeth. He gripped the switch and tugged it down. Electricity raged between her temples. Red screamed. An eternity of pain started on the longest night of the year. 23. December 23rd, 2.22 a.m., Dreamland, the Asylum. Red. 
go away, she murmured, twisting against straps holding her to the surgical table. Vertigo spun her equilibrium even in the dreamland. Red, I don't want to see any more. Her voice was garbled even without a wooden stick between her teeth. She'd had enough of past sins and future omens. Hallucinated sparks and orbs dazzled her vision. Red, the voice finally broke through the buzz in her ears. It wasn't a monster, just persistent. Basil? Yes, I don't have much time. I don't think the medium can keep boosting the signal for long. Terry finally pushed through the nosebleed. He sighed to announce his heroic tolerance. Her ears heard him, but she couldn't see him. His disembodied voice sounded far away as if on a walkie-talkie nearly out of range. Save yourself. You know what Maxwell is going to do. Her head flopped to the side as she tried to listen in harder. That's why I'm trying to save you from whatever self-sacrifice he's convinced you to make. It's already too late. Damn it, Red, I know. His voice faded as a louder argument drowned him out. She squinted against the light. Basil hadn't appeared like the ghost of Christmas past. Only Maxwell and Neve squared off in the dark chamber by the brutally utilitarian machine that powered the electric shock switch. They didn't seem to hear him. Had she imagined his voice? In the asylum, anything was possible. For fuck's sake, Maxwell, you're barbecuing my new body. It's been too long. We talked about this. Neve blocked the switch with her body. You say you're going to bring me back, but I'm up there watching smoke come out of her ears. This is a delicate process. I am nearly there. Cajoling tone disappearing, he grabbed her arm. So shut your gob and be patient. Neve jerked away. I'm sick of being patient. I've done everything you asked, given everything you asked. I even let that shaman live after he ruined my career. When am I getting what you promised? I raised you from being an annoying wraith, destined to haunt show folk and vaudevillians. That should be worth undying gratitude. I am surrounded by ungrateful women. Don't act like I am my father slurring for a drink and some respect. You wouldn't have gotten a whack at this bitch without me. She matched his haughty pose, the green ruffles on her dress stiffening like the scruff of an angry cat. I opened the door to Red. You wouldn't have found her. Hell, you wouldn't be able to see her if I weren't homing in. She can hear you! Red stayed silent, too tired for one of her usual jokes. Her last shred of sanity told her to play possum. She's damn near dead. Navea huffed. She was hallucinating when you came back, mumbling crazy talk. She's probably halfway to the beyond and dragging that meat dress with her. I have plans, Maxwell. He leaned against a wall near his grotesque medical equipment, switched to the electric shock treatments in hand's reach. Your banal plans include gown shopping and trotting the stage again, hardly of any importance. They also include a boob job and hair bleach. I won't be able to do any of that if she's dead. Neve tossed her hair over her shoulder. And by the way, theater is for actresses over 40. You are most tiresome right now. And you need me. Neve leaned forward, hands planted on her hips. None of your creep show visions are breaking red, just her body. Toss her into the afterlife already. That was a one-way ticket. Red gulped. The word afterlife ran in a loop in her aching head, shaking up the settled fog in her mind. Basil psychically called out to her again, his voice soft compared to the agitated spirits. Can you hear me? Everyone's yelling, Red mumbled. No one said that dying would be so noisy. Neve sulked. Look, she's babbling again. I don't want a body with brain damage. Finesse isn't your strong suit. Neither is planning. That is why you died. Leave the thinking to me. Maxwell pulled her aside, and they passed through the brick wall. Red turned her head to both sides to see where they had gone. The room tilted. It wasn't an illusion or a trick, just her equilibrium. Could spirits get vertigo? Her captors had left. Great. All that left her to deal with was her swiftly intensifying insanity. I know you're a hallucination. Sweetie, I get that you're in a tough place, but I'm about to go tough love on you if you don't focus. 
Basil's annoyance was clear through the tinny volume of the mystical connection. The whole team is rallying to save their best girl. Don't ruin Christmas like you did my Tahoe vacation. She laughed at the wry, salty tone. I'll listen. That sounds like Basil. So, you know you're dying? Good, because I'm sick of yelling that to you. I keep forgetting my jaw is wired shut, so I yelled for real once or twice. I'm watching your body fade. I'm trying to send what I see. A foggy vision of the hospital room swirled above, blinking between opaque and transparent. Her body convulsed on the bed. A bandage hid her open eyes. Blood dripped from her nose. She looked through his eyes, sight projected up into the heavy gloom hovering on the ceiling. Slouched over in a wheelchair, Vic held his head. The seizures aren't stopping. The Brotherhood is dragging their feet and my alchemist connection can't get here with a potion for hours. My first apprentice, I thought I could keep her alive until she could take the hunter's challenge at least. Quinn put a hand on his shoulder. We're fighting for her. I can't do anything for her. Basil's disembodied voice rang out. If I was one of those TV sports analyzers, I would be drawing a circle around the man tears that he isn't letting fall. All I have been is trouble for Vic lately, she murmured, throat catching. Snap out of it. Mentoring you gave that man something to do besides get himself killed hunting werewolves. He doesn't have working legs. Are you going to take his best friend too? Is he really breaking down? What do you think it's like here? I'm holding hands with a medium while my jaw is wired shut as two vampires loom around me. You know, the two who were stabbing each other. One doesn't have a soul, remember? Who knows what he would do to us if you died? Lucas sat on the bed holding her arms, trying to temper the convulsions enough for the medium to keep hold of a hand. The iron dagger lay by his side. Kristoff stood at the headboard, Hands clasped behind his back as if he were restraining himself. Neither looked away from her face. It's like bloody Prague seeing her like this. Lucas bowed his head. I could do something then. I ripped through those witch hunters, bringing blood and war. Christoph's top lip curled to reveal fangs. If that medium doesn't hurry up, I'm pulling this warlock out of hell myself. Wouldn't be the first time we've marched there together. The image of the vampires faded, leaving the ceiling bulb. It's all grimacing and repressing emotionally stunted macho men here. Basil's rolling eyes were unseen, but it broadcasted through the psychic walkie-talkie line loud and clear. Red swallowed back the anguish at seeing her friends looking so lost in the vision. The jagged glimpse of reality cut through her mental fog. It made her feel more hopeless. They're suffering because of me. Me coming back into their lives only hurt them. I don't want to go full. It's a wonderful life on you since we've kept with the Christmas carol so far, but you're needed and wanted. You keep moaning on about possibly being the reincarnation of Juniper St. James. Whoop-dee-doo if you are. You have a past life with baggage. Why do you think people get reborn? So they can become better. This cosmic learning. Everyone does it. You have a choice here. Do better, or let this warlock win. Closing her eyes, she confessed her deepest fear. If he's right about Juniper, then he is right about me. He's showing you evils that haven't happened and trawling out all her skeletons. How many lies are mixed in? He's certainly not showing you the best of her. Basil's acid tone grew pointed. He's using your amnesia against you. You don't know yourself, and he's trying to fill in the blanks with poison. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath. Her memory loss was the best weapon that anyone could use against her. It was why she kept it secret. You're right. There's something you have to see. I'm getting it loud and clear from Lucas. I think this is from the night he was cursed with a soul. The vision of an outdoor hallway bloomed above the bed, projected off on the gloom. Screams echoed between the stone pillars as monks fled through a courtyard. In the center of the hall, Lucas and Juniper knelt together. The doppelganger looked hopeful, even with blood dripping from her neck onto a white dress. 
Ripped stockings and black boots showed through the shredded white fabric bunched over her folded legs. Suit disheveled and face bruised, Lucas brought his knees to his chest, eyes darting at the screams. Blood clung to his chin. Who are you, miss? Listen, hush. Tearing up, she touched his cheek. Luke, you're going to remember a lot of terrible things soon. Most of it you did. All the guilt and the pain of twenty years as a vampire will hit you. What? Confusion merged into horrified remembrance on his ashen face. No, that couldn't have been me. You have been given the greatest gift. A new beginning. You're more than you know. Now is your chance to show it. Juniper smiled through her tears and kissed his forehead. The vision faded. Gasping from the surgeon's table in the asylum, Red jerked up in the straps to get closer to the dissolving memory figment projected on the ceiling. She knew! How did she know? Yeah, no clue. I just scraped this from Lucas's memories. She seemed quite calm for someone seeing the first soul cursing. This must have been moments before she was murdered. She might have been a bad witch bitch, but it looks like she was a part of whatever set the August harvest in motion. Juniper St. James helped save countless lives. You might have her bad karma on your soul slate, but the ballsy move of neutralizing vampire kind, that's on there too. Red digested the news like a still wiggling squid. None of the public records even showed Juniper being there, only the vampire's accounts. She sank back onto the cold metal table, trying to imagine the ripple effect of that one night in an English monastery. The spell that changed the world. That little bit Juniper said to Lucas, that kept him from walking into the sun after he got his soul. It made him try to make amends. You keep thinking it's the magic. It's the soul. The energy. It's what you do with it. You want to do good, so do it. Right now, that's getting back to your friends and kicking warlock ass. How? Red croaked, trying to lift herself up despite the restraints. I'm throwing you a lifeline. Take it. 24. December 23rd, 2.22 a.m. Dreamland, St. Bridget's Hospital, Los Angeles. Red felt the grip of Basil and the medium on her spirit. Their presence cleared her throbbing head. Concentrating on Basil's voice, she jerked against the straps binding her to the surgical table. This was all in her head. Or, well, Maxwell's. In the dreamland, their consciousnesses overlapped with the real world and the spirit realm. But the asylum felt generated specially to torment her. Little veins of poisonous green threaded around her wrists in a cobweb connection between her skin and the restraints. She hadn't noticed them before. It was her energy. The wisps of self-loathing and confusion anchored her to the table as much as the warlock's magic. She strained against the burden of a century of karma. The leather straps felt so real even if, intellectually, she knew the laws of physics were optional here. It wasn't just mind over matter. Mind was matter. If she was crazy enough to dream it and let herself have it. Maxwell's bonds kept her from getting up. She wasn't strong enough yet. There was only one way to go. Down. She sunk into the surgical table, hoping Basil could catch her and let go of all of it. The self-loathing, the anger, the confusion, and the hate. Tumbling like Alice through the looking glass, she didn't see clocks. Only darkness. The spectral gusts blew away the asylum's haze on her mind. She glided like kite on a tight line in a storm. That's it. Now turn. We're waiting. He sounded tense as a father guiding his teen in parallel parking. Her spirit dived through the ceiling of the hospital room and rolled on the floor before popping up on her feet. Basil and Terry huddled over the bed while Vic and the vampires were spread out in the room in various poses of watchful anticipation. The golden net of protection around her physical body was tarnished and strained after deflecting the worst of what her spiritual form had endured. Red did a double take. The burns on her legs had already healed below her cut-off jeans. The mage doctors had done something right. You're here. Thank the goddess. Basil smiled crookedly over the grisly wires on his teeth and squeezed the medium's hand. 
His mental broadcast sounded stronger than when she was trapped in Maxwell's asylum. We're going to try and get you into your body now. We can worry about Maxwell after. Do you have anyone that can fight him? Any brilliant ideas? Calming her quaking limbs, Red walked closer. He had freed her, but Maxwell would notice she was gone soon. They didn't have time for a ghost hug, even though she wanted to. The Scooby gang is still figuring it out. That doesn't matter. One thing at a time. Oi, what is going on? Lucas glanced between Basil and the medium. Basil reached out for a notepad resting on the bed to write, Red is here. Tell her to hop back into her body. Lucas's voice was gruff, but there was nothing but gentleness about the way his fingers brushed her cheek. Has the warlock followed her? Kristoff glanced around the room, arms tensed for a fight. That slippery fuck was bad enough when he was alive, pulling strings, scheming if he had a body right now. Vain bulging in his tense jaw, Lucas shook his head. Kristoff shushed him. Basil hears something. Tell them we need to set up a ghost trap for two, Red said, planning quickly, mentally steeling herself for the risks. She still felt shaky from the electric shocks, but this was the hand she was dealt. They had to knock out the ghoul twins in this round. Would she last another battle of wills? She could rest when she woke up from this nightmare. If I go back into that body, it still leaves them rocking and rolling in the dreamland and able to haul me back in. Basil jotted down her command. We can't catch them in this realm. In the dreamland, we're going to be working together on both sides. The two traps will hedge our bets. We can delay them long enough for you guys to exercise Neve. They'll have to manifest in the real world to fight it. Red gambled on a lot of assumptions in her plans. If the witch trap didn't work, she had another trap lying in wait. Basil would want to talk her out of it. Maxwell is strong, but he needs her for some reason. She ties him here, maybe. He's a warlock. He could be drawing on her magic, like a battery for his spells. Whatever she has on him, she's the weakest link. Maxwell broke your last witch trap. We'll have more oomph in this one. For a bit. She set her jaw and furrowed her brow. A red scorpion materialized to scurry across her lifted palm. It morphed into a sparking flame. I just have to lure them here. And trap them. You have a lot of things that could go wrong with this plan, Red. Where are you going to get the juice for the traps? Just tell them. She closed her fingers around the flame, soaking the energy back up. Without having to maintain two protection spells, she had some of her mojo back. Soon, she would have even more. If her plan went south, she was already half dead anyway. It wasn't as brave as it sounded. The guys would get her out. Have Vic set them up at the foot of the bed and then get everyone out of the way. We need to focus on exercising Navai first. Whatever happens, you must keep focusing on her. If she goes, it weakens Maxwell so I can make my move. That should distract him. Basil wrote her instructions down. What's your move? I'm still deciding. Scratching behind her ear, Red glanced away to hide an uncertain cringe. I have a plan B if Neve gets in my body, but you guys have the same mission either way. Exercise her. Hell, it might be easier if I was literally the witch trap. He flapped his notepad at her. Pick another plan B, toots. Lucas took the pages. Vic, get in here. The psychics have a message from Red. I didn't tell them about Nevi. They don't know what Maxwell promised her. Do the spell, and we'll laugh about the idea of her taking me for a test drive later. Red cringed even though it was a contingency in her plan. Death was also a contingency in her plan. The idea of Neve in her body gave her the bigger creeps. Reaching out, Basil motioned for the notes making the rounds in the room. Terry the medium tightened the hold on his hand. Focus! It's arts and crafts time at the hospital, boys. Vic scooted closer. He grinned and reached into the backpack hanging on his wheelchair and pulled out a jar of salt. He doled out ritual ingredients to the vampires, serious instructions mixed with snark. They arranged the iron nuggets and other ingredients into circles at the foot of the hospital bed. This trick better work, Red. Your body can't take much more. 
Basil warned. It'll fool them for a bit. Just make the boys follow the plan. We need to exercise Neve first, then Maxwell. She closed her eyes and imagined the dirty brick walls of the asylum lining the room. Juniper implied that the warlock felt powerful in the asylum. Red wanted to make him feel right at home. The eerie moonlight of the dreamland was more powerful here than in the bowels of Maxwell's twisted memories, but the other details were right. Like an iceberg waiting for a ship, the wood-handled switch jutted from the antique electroshock device. The hospital bed was replaced by the surgical table, straps coiled like snakes around her physical form's ankles and wrists. She couldn't shake the eeriness of the out-of-body experience. Tell them to leave, Basil. You too. You'll ruin the illusion. Wait in the hallway. Start the exorcism as quickly as possible. I need them distracted and weakened to get back into my body. Grabbing the notepad from Vic's lap with a glare, Basil wrote down her instructions one-handed, not letting go of her body. How are you going to lure them? The same way I'm going to get more magic to ignite those traps. Red chewed on her lip. She was betting a lot on her team's backup. Basil's eyes darted between her and the trap. I don't get it. Go, get that notepad back. Besides, you know you want to be supervising Terry right now, she said, pushing false lightness into her tone. Thanks, friend, for everything. I don't like how you said that. Are you doing something stupid and brave to sacrifice yourself? That's plan C, but I'm expecting you guys to pull my fat out of the fryer, Red said, wishing he couldn't feel the fear in her soul. Tell them to have the exorcism rolling when they burst into the room. Don't let them stop. Vic pulled on his arm, breaking the contact with her. The wheelchair herded the soul mancer out the door. Come on, you said time moves different there. Let's go. She revealed the hidden chakras on her body in the bed. The light radiating from them shone brighter than before. She figured that her energy, scattershot as it was, reacted to being near death all night. Her green aura pulsed with wisps of gold and purple. Red formed a phantom ring above the ghost traps laid in the physical realm. Cat bones and marigold petals orbited the iron ore before settling over the traps. She channeled energy into the traps connected between the worlds, turning on the magic faucet to pour as much as she dared. Laying down beside herself, she touched a dab of dark blood on the corner of her physical mouth. It didn't react to her fingers like it had before. She didn't give herself the chance to ponder and slice the connection to the protection spell. The room grew dark in the dreamland without the golden glow of the net. She directed everything, even her life force energy, into the traps. Maxwell was monitoring her. He'd feel her spirit fade and come to gloat. The last bursts of maggot grated as if clinging to her. She groaned and panting before easing up. Servival instinct kick it in. The heart monitor chirped a distressed robotic alarm, cajoling as if trying to reason with her. Red was flatlining. When Maxwell's pitch-dark presence reverberated through the room, her spirit was ready even as her body died. 25. December 23rd, 2.34 a.m. Dreamland, St. Bridget's Hospital, Los Angeles. Her life didn't flash before her eyes as she watched her body die. No family secrets were revealed. No epiphany of a life not remembered. No angel choir sang to welcome her only struggling rise and fall of her own chest. Red put a spectral arm over her body as she laid beside it, a ghost comforting her shell. Shadows rained into the room like hail. Maxwell stepped out, smoke drifting off his velvet sleeves. He stroked his mustache. You already look at peace, wife. Navy rushed out of the shadows, pushing ahead of the warlock to gesture to the hospital bed. She's escaping. No, look at where she is. My claws are still deep in her psyche. He smirked, examining the spirit clutching her body on the bed. She's a stone's throw from giving in, and then the body is yours. Red tucked her head, hiding the stubborn set to her chin. Concentrating on the asylum illusion, she focused on the shade-strewn floor where the traps hid. She'd show the warlock just how much she had given in. So, are we just going to dick around until she cracks? Nevaeh scoffed. Because this is getting old. 
be of good cheer. Chuckling, Maxwell took her hand, raising a calculating eyebrow as his tone grew consoling. You know it's happening. I want my body. Neve pouted, forehead wrinkling, stomping her foot. You promised. This is the closest you'll ever get to dancing on her grave. He pulled her closer, features turning mischievous. Don't you want that pleasure? Neve giggled, blushing and leaning into him. I'm a triple threat, you know. Take the opportunity. Maxwell brought them together into a waltz, then dipped the starlet low. He pulled her up out of the dip. Haven't I given you all you wanted so far? This is almost your time to sparkle. I can't wait to get back into the world, handsome. Gotta decide if I'm going to get a pumpkin spice latte first or see a plastic surgeon. I told you your patience would be rewarded? He tweaked her chin. Hearing enough, Red lifted her head to glare. I'm not dead yet. Not for long. Neve laughed as Michelle twirled her to the side. Dancing on a grave, haven't done that since high school. Waiting until they danced into the right spot, Red pushed her magic into the spectral witch trap in Dreamland and the ghost trap in the real world. The floodgates opened. She shuddered as the energy drained from her. Neve cried out, pulling away from Maxwell. You're not dancing on me just yet. Pushing herself up on the bed, Red smirked through the discomfort. She urged all her energy, will, and magic to rise in the witch traps. Near death, her magic jolted to attention with more zest than it had in weeks. It trooped to fuel the circles of iron, relics, and salt. He glanced at the arcane rings on the floor. Oh, you harridan! The hospital room's door opened. Vic, Basil, and Terry stepped in with burning sage, chanting in Latin. You're trying an exorcism? Maxwell demanded. Do you know who I am, little girl? You're god of the dreamland, blah, blah, blah. Red stood and lifted her chin. Well, consider this Ragnarok, motherfucker. You're no god killer. I'll make sure of that. Lucas rushed in, bumping past the medium. She's dying. She pivoted to scowl. This wasn't the plan. Vampires only riled up ghosts. The snare was empty on their side of reality, but it was very much full on hers. Sprinting to her bedside, Lucas moved too quickly to see, but his impact wasn't. Speed was relative in the dreamland, and even the smallest act could change everything. The pebble bouncing out of his boot sole moved slowly, as if drifting through molasses, rolling across the floor to bump against a single grain of salt in Maxwell's trap. It felt like sledgehammer to the chest. Red fell back against the wall in a shockwave. Breath sputtering, she pulled herself upright. The spectral aura around the ring of salt and iron vanished. I would have gotten out eventually, but that was convenient. Maxwell pushed his arms out and dissolved into a whirling violet cyclone. His shadow poured out of the single crack in the ghost trap. He reformed outside of it, stretching his neck and sighing. Finally proving to be of some use, Crawford. Stumbling to her feet, Red pushed more magic into the blinking neon aura of the witch trap. The power of the traps came from working together between worlds. Individually, they were useless. Her energy felt tapped, and all she'd done was piss the warlock off. Punching his fist through the blinking cracks of the witch trap, Maxwell pulled Nive out. You can kill that soulmancer now. Shaking her hand, Red tried to summon an orb, but failed, magic sputtering like a spent lighter. The illusion ripped off the private hospital room like a mask. She shivered as lightheadedness overcame her. Life force energy rebounded back into her when he broke through the trap, but she felt drained. <laughs> Maxwell stomped over to the medium and shot a fist through Terry's head. Spectral hand passing through to the elbow, he pulled back to squeeze at the brain. Veins pulsed in his forehead. No, Terry! Primal horror driving her, Red teleported behind Maxwell to tug his arm. Maxwell elbowed her in the face. Falling back on the bed, she landed on her twitching body as it struggled for breath. You don't have to do this. This is on your head. Shoulders tensed. He didn't look back at her. 
blood tears fell out of Terry's brown eyes, the eerie moonlight of the dreamland reflected in their depths. Maxwell twisted his wrist. Terry dropped to the floor. A mist of light hovered above his body before it whooshed upwards through the ceiling. Nevi tried to do the same to Basil, but her fist just flailed around his head. It's not working for me. That's because you're not me. Maxwell smugly commented and pushed Nevi back. Ignore him for now. We need to get you into the body. Red tried to shield her physical form. Kicked in the chest by an unseen force, her spirit flew back to land on the floor. Neve took a running leap and dove onto the bed, sinking into the body. Green shockwaves rippled as an alien aura spread from the bare feet to the sweaty ginger hair pulled into a top knot. Finish the exorcism! Red yelled jumbled words, curses smushing together in her panic, as she popped up to her feet and reached for her body to pull Neve out. Her fingers only gripped blank space, passing through her occupied flesh. She couldn't even touch her own body now. Fear rippled down her spine like falling dominoes made of ice. Basil held up his hand, sweat pouring from his brow, muffled speech straining behind his jaw wires. His aura pulsed with white orbs as he drew on his soulmancy. He ran towards Maxwell. Power radiated from his palm in the kaleidoscope vision of the dreamland. Balderdash, I knew I should have killed you. I am always too nice. The warlock disappeared in a flash of embers. Basil slumped over on the foot of the bed, legs giving out, the light dimming on his hand. Red knelt by him. Come on, get up. Did you tell them? You need to tell them she's in my body. Her body sat up, but it was Neve at the wheel. Crimson and black spectral stitches glimmered on the dark spirit, as if connecting it to the body. She pulled the bandage off Red's face. Red met her own eyes to see someone else stare out. Again. Why did her life have to be a series of doppelganger hijinks? Dazed, Neve put a stolen hand to her head. She blinked as if straining to remember a line. Her voice peeped out, quiet and weak. What happened? You overacting! Red leaned over the bed, but despite cursing loudly, they couldn't hear her. Even in Plan B, the exorcism was supposed to have been farther along before Maxwell managed to escape and toss Neve into her body. If they knew, they would have been able to send the starlet to the afterlife. Instead, Red had just handed over her body to an evil witch to do an even eviler warlock's bidding. Neve won. She had escaped the dreamland and got a brand new people suit as a door prize. Amazement in his voice, Quinn said from the hallway. Basil must have banished the spirits. No, he didn't. The job is half done, Red called out before raising her hands in a choking motion at Neve. She processed nearly dying just fine, but seeing this bitch in her body was driving her crazier than the asylum. The plan hinged on the team doing an exorcism without messing with the trap. She bet on the wrong horse. It's so frustrating how you guys can't hear me. Kristoff raced to the imposter's side. Sitting beside Navai, Lucas had a wonderstruck expression of relief. Maxwell, he put me in this coma, then tortured me in an asylum. Shaking, the actress fell back on the pillows. She hammed it up in her new role. Blinking away crocodile tears, she turned from the vampires to the hunter speeding in his chair into the room. I pushed him into a swirling green vortex. Was that you guys? Call the nurses, Quinn. Vic ordered, checking Basil's neck pulse. The shaman is still alive. He's what? Navai asked, her voice pitched too high in restrained dismay. She coughed and pushed up on her palms to study his prone body at the foot of the bed. Good. I should thank him. Clapping ghostly hands, Red sneered. Great save. You really deserve that, Razzie. Okay, fellas, time to evict her. She's a walking, talking pod person. Her bad acting is the only red flag you need. You should lay down, kitten. Lucas put his arm around the body thief's shoulders. He brushed his thumb against her cheek, his soft, soulful gaze caressing hers. I'm not in there. Shoulders seizing up, red glared at the two. I'm over here. I don't want to stay here. Too many ghosts. Navai leaned against him, eyelashes fluttering. Hold me, handsome. 
Lucas pulled her closer, kissing the top of her head. Red stomped around the room. I can't believe you're falling for this. I don't flutter my eyelashes like a moron. Vic, do something. Her mentor rolled over to Nevae, his sweaty face lifted into a relieved grin. I am glad to have you back, in turn. She helped kill Terry. Red shook her hands. Invisible in the dreamland, she could have done cartwheels for all the good it did. She was superimposed on their world. Pacing, she could only watch as a monster possessed her body. Exercise her. You chewed me out for not telling you one dream, Vic. And now you aren't even going to run any extra cleansings? The room grew quiet as the orderlies came with stretchers for the medium and basil. Quinn murmured to the mage doctor in the hallway. Vic waved over a nurse to attend to Navier before going out to join his boss. No, that's fine. Just make the psychopath who stole my body more comfortable. Red crossed her arms. It was weird seeing her body lying on the bed, seeing it move without her in it, and her friends just accepting the pod person. That was the ultimate creep out. She glared at Navai playing the weak damsel. Kristoff leaned by the headboard, leonine eyes softening back to blue in relief, fists finally unclenching. Red, you're back with us. Um, yeah, thanks. Neve ducked her head and wrapped tighter around Lucas, the wheels of failed remembrance rolling in her gaze. Red stomped away and walked through the wall in a snit. We should keep her in the hospital overnight, Quinn said. Vic glanced back at the hospital room, as if wanting one more look at the unholy miracle. His red-rimmed eyes crinkled from his smile. She wants to leave. Figures. She spent the whole night in a psychic attack here. If Red had a stomach, Bile would have been inching up her throat. He had no idea that his roommate had been replaced. What would happen when they checked Neve out of the hospital? The dark witch could empty her accounts at Smith and Reaper, then jet off anywhere to set up a new life in Red's body. I have a connection to a healer that might be able to help Basil. Quinn turned to walk away. Vic put a hand on the other man's arm. You kept me steady in there, Q. What I said. That was... I didn't mean it, old man. Not like that. That was the warlock's doing. I'm sorry, anyway. I know. We'll get a burger after this is over. Reserved expression thawing to reveal a small smile. He nodded and left with vampire speed. Kristoff entered the hallway, his hands clasped behind his back. Green and yellow bruises wreathed his face in the brighter lights of the hall. Are you sure about that exorcism and the witch traps? Are there any side effects? Thank you. Red shook her head, trying not to think about what it meant that none of her friends were suspicious of Neve, only the unsold vampire who barely knew her. Who knows what happened to her? It's enough to make anyone emotional. Vic frowned, his face sagging from guilt. They aren't going to stop hovering over each other until I break it up. If the warlock got away, either I or Lucas will be around if he attacks. Thanks for tonight. We can take it from here. I'll be at my club. Call me if something changes, Kristoff said with one last look at Lucas kissing Neve without jealousy. Only a quiet contemplation. Red cringed and turned away. Ugh, now I know why Vic says we're gross. I want to say thank you to Basil before I go, alone. Neve walked out. Shadowy aura smudging the air as she passed. She didn't wait for an answer. You leave him be, Neve. Isn't making out with Lucas enough? Red followed down the hall to Basil's hospital room. She jumped through the door, grateful for the unsuspecting nurse within. Neve slipped into the room. Could I have a moment? The nurse didn't look up from her patient record. It was the one who said she wasn't paid enough for this job. Red agreed with her. Visiting hours are over. Now, for fuck's sake, sparks shot from Neve's fingertips. The nurse gaped at the magical display, clutching a clipboard to her chest, and darted away. Sleep tight, sweet prince, because I'm coming for you. Closing the door, a fiendish grin grew on Neve's stolen face as she walked forward. Red, I know you're here. Kiss this ass goodbye because it's mine now. I will get back into my body and drag you to hell. Eyes crinkling at the corners, Nevaeh licked her lips. 
I might even take that vampire of yours for a spin to keep up the act. Heard they're real firecrackers in the sack. Maybe I'll wait to stake him until the afterglow. You won't get that far. Frustration burned in Red's throat. It felt impossible to keep the vow even as she said it. You don't need that anymore. Nevae picked up the cell phone on the nightstand and chucked it out the open window. She waved her hand over Basil's right hand. Just to be on the safe side. His fingers twisted and the bones snapped. Red cried out, swinging a fist into Neve's face without even mussing her hair. A holler drifted in from the hallway. Red, let's roll. Coming, Vic. Neve sashayed to the door before forcing her walk of triumph into a somber pace. Disappearing into the hallway, she left a broken body and a stranded spirit behind. 226. December 23rd, 3.03 a.m., Dreamland, St. Bridget's Hospital, Los Angeles. Stomping over neon sigils on the parking garage's floor, Red ground her spectral teeth, following her stolen body. A silent watcher behind funhouse glass, she was outside the real world. Nevi had made it out of the Dreamland after hot-wiring her body and taking it out on a joyride. Red was stuck on the bus. She shook her hands, trying to ignite even a spark of magic. She could create illusions out of intention, make a sloth appear, create a deformed cat, and teleport to Oregon for french fries afterward. There wasn't any real power to back it up after the aborted exorcism. Had some stayed in her flesh? They were only mirages and parlor acts. She didn't have a trick that could make a dent. Basil might have banished Maxwell, but the damage had been done. Nevaeh had her body and all the perks that went with it, Hopefully that didn't include Lucas. Wearing Lucas's jacket over a ripped t-shirt and cut-off jeans, Nevia held his hand. Smoky ether hovered over her skin in the dreamland. Her icy gaze turned calculating as she addressed Vic. Where'd the others go? Quinn is doing his Defender of the Night thing, and Kristoff went to the club. Vic spun the keys to the Millennium Falcon around his fingers and rolled to the van's waiting chair lift. Let's get you home. The hospital says you can leave as long as you come back for a checkup tomorrow. Crossing her arms and tapping her foot, Red glowered. Returning the jacket, Neve kissed Lucas goodbye with an unnecessary amount of tongue. I'm blushing and wasting gas here, Vic hollered from the driver's seat. Visit me tomorrow, handsome. Neve squeezed the vampire's hand before scanning the van's interior and getting into the passenger's side. I still have one thing over you, Neva. I don't need door handles. Red jumped through the van's side door and settled herself in Vic's strapped-down wheelchair. She leaned her elbows on the two front seat backs and flicked at Vic's ear. You'd better figure this out, Yoda. Neve twirled a lock of hair around her finger, scrolling through text messages on Red's phone. She opened a picture message of a cabin. Don't look at that! Red squeaked. Somehow her cheeks felt hot. That was from Kristoff. Neve asked, So, things are getting heavy with me and the punky vampire? Yeah, I don't need to see how heavy. I assume he'll climb through your window for some angst later. I guess it's a sign that you're feeling better. Vic shook his head, driving out of the parking garage and onto the street. He turned on the radio and Mary Jane's Last Dance by Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers poured out. Can we change this? Arching his eyebrow, he tightened his grip on the wheel. I mean, just turn it down, handsome. Neve waved her hand like a fan around her head. This head of mine is still kind of foggy. He turned the knob down and looked away, nose wrinkling. Psychic hangover? Sounds like a bitch. Vic, Red snapped. Did the other witch have to start twirling a bad guy mustache and evil laughing to raise their suspicions? You know something is up. This is one of my road trip sing-along faves. Nevaeh was bad with a script, and she was worse without one. Wisely, she made the creative decision to keep silent, face composed in a stoic yet pained expression. She gazed out the window at the City of Angels. Breaking character, a restrained grin peeked through her twitching lips. The van made good time toward their apartment through the quiet streets of Culver City, Green lights the whole way. For once, Red wished for traffic. 
What happened in there? Vic broke the silence only a block away from home, scrutinizing his passenger in the rearview mirror. It was awful. That terrible warlock tormented me in an asylum. I thought I was going to die. Voice trembling on last word, Neve rubbed her hands, head bowed. Boo! Red called from the back, sitting in the wheelchair with her feet up. She willed up a transparent illusion of popcorn to fling, her only consolation of being in the dreamland. What about that skanky actress? Skanky? Neve's act slipped, voice pitched up. Scarlet light glimmered on bald fists in her lap. She crossed her arms quickly to hide it. The plan worked, even with those vampires messing things up. She got what she deserved in the end. Releasing a whistle, Vic leaned his head back. I was worried back there. It's the only reason I didn't kick Kristoff to the curb. Felt like we needed more muscle. I know you have some mixed feelings about him. Do I now? Neve murmured, considering the sign of the California Sunrise apartment building as the van turned into the parking area by the courtyard. In the dreamland, protection sigils and other wards glimmered around the apartment complex for supernaturals. The one from Portland has a cabin, right? He came through in a pinch in luring that chick to the cops, Vic said. I don't trust him, but I can't deny what he's done. He did get Neve to the club, didn't he? Neve's eyes narrowed in the reflection in the rearview mirror. What a dead guy. I mean, what a guy. Red hoped the other witch would give herself away by going to the wrong apartment, but Nevi hung back and let Vic guide her straight into their home. The supernatural landlord had provided some mystical protection, but none of the defenses went into the specifics of possession. Nevi's spirit might have been malevolent, but she was wrapped up in an innocent body. He flipped the lights on as he closed the door and rolled to the center of the living room past their furniture and frames of stock photography. If he didn't run now, would he ever have the chance to put their real pictures up? Let me get you a drink to celebrate. Neve walked to the attached kitchen and brandished two bottles of IPA from the fridge. I was feeling thirsty. Be right back. He went into his bedroom. What are you doing? Red stalked to the island counter, separating the living room from the psycho in the kitchen. Wrong drink, too. You should have done some research on this roll. Neve picked up a pill bottle on the counter, reading it quickly, then tapped a pill in her palm. The white capsule rolled and crumbled. Sparkles shot over the mound of powder. She dumped it into the beer bottle. Damn, bitch, you have more juice than I expected. Flipping the bird, Red sighed. Telling you to fuck off is way less satisfying if you don't hear it. What was that? Vic asked, rolling out of his room. Just telling myself to get juice tomorrow. Vitamin C and all that. Neve handed him a beer and clinked the bottles together before sitting on the couch. Tell me what I missed when I was sleeping. He took a long drink. I think your night was more exciting. We were some jackasses in a hospital, running around like harpies with our heads cut off. What about Kristoff? Tell me everything. Neva leaned on the couch cushions, straining for a casual pose. Her crossed legs tensed. She took a drink to hide the bitter pucker to her lips. He's been texting me. Red groaned, head falling back. Oh, come on, Nevi. Air out all my secrets. And when I'm not in the swells of relief from you being alive, we'll talk about that, young lady. He waggled a finger. It's weird as shit to think of an unsold vampire caring about someone, but he was ready to go nuclear on the warlock tonight. I'm sure Maxwell Baldacci will care about some vampire. Neve scoffed into her bottle. I mean, that sounds serious. I think he was on his best behavior. Only ripped out one heart tonight. He shrugged, lifting his beer and sighed. He was the one who realized that Basil could pull you out during the exorcism and gave him paper to write notes to us. So it sounds like this Kristoff will be trouble. Suspicion became certainty in his gaze before it became unfocused. Vic slumped back in his wheelchair, beer spilling over his jeans as the bottle fell to the ground. That took forever! Nevi rolled her eyes before going to a bathroom, swilling her drink. 
Kneeling by the wheelchair, Red searched his slack face and put her head against his chest. He still breathed, his lungs filled and emptied slowly as if in deep sleep. His aura sparked azure like a cloudless day. She stood, hands on her hips, pushing away the conflicted guilt as she thought of Kate Batts. Their first meeting felt so long ago. The solstice alone had felt like years and it wasn't over. Bell Witch had visited her in dreams. How could she get into Vic's? The sound and steam of the shower streamed under the door as Neve sang in the bathroom. She broke the melody for criticism. Geez, Red, you suck at singing. I'm not a triple threat anymore. Rolling her eyes, Red reached for his hands, concentrating on Vic. She homed in on him. The living room faded as she stared at his face. She could still hear the shower, but the room was replaced by the familiar van walls of the Millennium Falcon before its modifications. Tibetan prayer flags hung over a sleeping form in the nest of beanbags and blankets. The back doors lay open to the high desert and purple mountains brightening with a lazy sunrise. Vic sat, legs hanging out the back of the van with a thermos. The sunrise painted his wistful face orange. It had been so long since she had seen him so peaceful. Her vision blurred from tears. Whatever happened, at least she got to talk to her best friend one last time. She settled beside him. Hey, Red, how did you get here? He asked, voice slowing toward the end as a sick realization creeped over his face. It wasn't you that walked out of the hospital. Forehead wrinkled. She sniffed and shook her head tightly. She didn't have time to cry about it. Nope. Nevi is currently using up all the hot water in the apartment. I have failed the ultimate friendship quiz show. Pal or pod person? Chuckling even through the tears in her throat, Red took the thermos and sipped the coffee inside. Somehow, it was as perfect as the sunrise. Your consolation prize is being doped up and snoring in the living room. Drooling, too. Hey, I have the tolerance of ten hunters. Vic yanked his thermos back. I'm hoping so, because you need to wake up. Tell them about Nevae. Maxwell will be back, and she's still his lackey. Oh, God, she wants to get a boob job, too. Bleach my hair. The works. You would not be good as a blonde. Recoiling in feigned horror, he gestured to his face. It's the complexion. It would wash me out, I know. That isn't the point. Neve is on the loose and going to do terrible things with my body. She already neutralized Basil and Kristoff seems next on her list. That's my big dream warning for you, so remember it when you wake up, will ya? Red cocked her head to listen for Neve. A blow dryer turned on outside his dream. They didn't have much time. I'll have to go. Hey, not so fast. I... Vic put a hand on her shoulder. I was dick before about Lucas and everything. She dipped her head, hiding the tears in her eyes. This was something that she needed to hear. The last fight with him had been ugly. After all they had been through together... She was glad it wasn't their last real conversation outside of a case. Hey, I haven't been easy to deal with either. I fell apart after I learned about my doppelganger's dark side, then I overcompensated. I'm just worried about you, kid. Brow nodding, he sighed. That's not even it. It's not even you, it's me. I'm in pain all the time. Physical therapy sucks balls. I feel cornered in my own skin. Every moment I want to jump out of my chair, and I can't. I'm not adjusting. Red touched his upper arm. Hey, you're doing the best you can. No, you've been doing the best you can. I haven't. Even before Oklahoma, I took us on suicide bounties for bragging rights. I was Vic Park Constantine, the hunter that werewolves warned their pups about. He looked down at his legs, lifting a foot. They only moved in his dreams. You're still him. That cocky shit got his ass handed to him at the Halloween ball. You wanted me elsewhere, but I hunkered down in Club Voltava so I could get first crack at Delilah. Would have killed my friend's wife by mistake if Michelle hadn't gotten to me first. Not the first bad call, but now I can't run from my mistakes and failures. He pulled away, shaking his head. 
like fucking up with you. You're like two years old. I'm probably like 25. And so in memory years, I mean, then the eight year gap in all cultural knowledge. So many episodes of Doctor Who that I had to show you. Only a few of Sherlock, though. Vic shook the sad wistfulness away. I hadn't even finished training you, and I half-assed it a lot of the time. Figuring if you survived, you learned something. Now you're in the supernatural trenches solo. Vic, I don't get how you can't see all that you did and still do for us. You're the best hunter and bard that I know. Red poked his arm. If he had opened up a little sooner, she could have prepared a better pep talk about how awesome he was. Regrets were easy for a ghost. She steeled her wobbling chin. Even if you are stubborn as hell when you get paranoid about your own worth, I need you. I also need you to get a life. Get a hobby. Put some pictures in the frames at home. Whatever happens to me, don't brood in front of the TV. What if something good is on? He smiled eyes crinkling before a frown darkened his features. This might be the last time that, you know I won't let her keep that body. Whatever happens, I'd never let you stay that monster. She hugged him. There was so much more to say to her mentor, to her best friend. It had been a hard road in Los Angeles. Closure took time. They didn't have it. Time spiraled away in the dreamland like quicksand through the hourglass. They were hunters, and this was a job. Both knew coming into it that each one could be the last. You don't need to get sappy. Vic wiped his face with a sleeve. Bathed in brilliant purple and red light, the Millennium Falcon was a comfortable cocoon. Red mist mornings like this on the road. Where are we? Arizona. After we escaped Oklahoma, I couldn't drive anymore. You were sleeping in the back, and I had coffee with the best sunrise of my life. He raised his thermos to the heavens. Tearing up, she memorized the curls of fuchsia clouds, mixing with orange sunbeams over the purple mountains. The high desert smelled like it rained in the night, releasing the scent of creosote and rewarding persistent seeds. Fresh green life dotted the ground. It's a good one, she said finally. We'll both wake up to see another. Let's enjoy this for a bit. Trying not to think, Red tried to savor it, but the sun rose too fast. In the real world, dawn was still hours away on the longest night of the year. Vic raised his thermos, forehead wrinkling and chin only betraying one shake. He nodded. Safe trails, Hunter. Red closed her eyes and released the hold on his dream. Reappearing in her bedroom, she flinched at the explosion of clothes tossed around the bed and floor. Who did the actress think was going to clean this up? None of these will do. You have a lesbian's taste in clothes, Red. Neve poked through the closet. Her hair was curled, and she had smoky eyeshadow dialed up to ten. She pulled out a little strappy black dress to hold up to her chest. This is acceptable, barely. How long had Nevaeh been ranting to herself? Red didn't mind missing the rest of the feedback about her clothes, her hackles raised from just seeing the other witch admire her new body naked in the mirror. Nevaeh pulled on the dress and kissed the mirror, marking her territory with ruby lip prints. Time to paint the town red, Red. 27. Kinchiki. December 23rd, 4.22 a.m., Dreamland, Club Voltava, Sunset Strip, Los Angeles. Red trotted to keep up with her body. Unrelenting preternatural moonlight outshone the sparkle of Sunset Strip. Dazzling wisps of energy gleamed in the wind. A winter solstice moon peeked out from the smog. On the longest night of the year, the line between worlds grew thin. Balanced precisely on Red's only pair of high heels, Nevai stepped past the clubbers waiting for the best after-party in town. She worked the sidewalk like a runway in a thin, strapped black dress and crimson kimono jacket. The grisly stitches attaching the black aura to her stolen body were visible in the dreamland. In the real world, she merely looked like a party girl radiating alpha vibes. She sashayed to the front of the line, stretching around the block in front of Club Voltava. You know who I am. Kristoff will want to see me. 
The vampire bouncer elbowed his human partner before raising the velvet rope. It's the redhead. I'll find him myself. Neve slinked past them to the elevator leading up to the club on the top two floors of the building. Red blinked herself up ahead of the body snatcher. Neveye had broken the black veil in this club before. Now she was double dipping into trouble with a new face on the cameras. Whatever she planned, it was happening in vampire territory. Red would have some explaining to do to Cora and the dark veil assurance whenever she got back into her body. If they even let her explain. Packed with the beautiful people of L.A., Club Voltava was in its prime time. Glowing sigils on the walls burned brighter than the club lights. If only Kate Batts was here. Bell witch or not, she would know what to do. She could materialize into reality at least. Vic had exercised the wrong witch twice. Nevaeh strutted out of the open elevator. Speaking of witches, Red glided forward, pausing as a blonde head popped into her side vision. In a golden shift dress, Delilah crossed her arms in a jingle of chunky bangles. The vampiress tossed her beachy curls back. The marbled pink of her aura illuminated the annoyed jut to her chin. Tell me you're not dropping another body from the rooftop. You were supposed to be down for the count tonight. What, didn't get enough attention? False eyelashes fluttering, Neve quirked her blood-red lips into a terse smirk. Let me guess, I'm sliding into your vamp boyfriend's DMs and you're jelly that he was with me all night. How many hits to the head did you take tonight? Don't hate me because your man wants something fresher. Neve wrinkled her nose. Ouch, Delilah, I am so sorry. Red cringed. She felt the heat off this cat fight, even in dreamland. The other witch was going to get them both killed. You get pretty bold after slapping on a little black dress and a pound of eyeshadow. Delilah arched her eyebrow, lifting a hand to examine it. Remember the last time you sassed me? Took forever for my manicurist to scrub the blood out of my nail beds. It's a shame you were turned after you developed those crow's feet. Neve raised her palm, and sparks shot off her fingertips. Now buzz off, or you'll be the body lying in the alley. Stepping back, the vampirist tightened her fists. Blue eyes flashing amber, the predatory gaze followed Neve with a promise. She disappeared behind a wall of dancers. Neve smirked, spinning around to sachet onto the dance floor. She snaked through the crowd, stolen feet dancing. Twirling, she slipped the crimson kimono jacket off her shoulders, tossing it aside. Now, this is what I missed. I like that jacket. Glaring at the shoes stomping on her one dressy jacket, Red winced as a guy in skinny jeans spilled beer on it. That's just salt in the wounds. Kristoff stepped out of the strobe-lit crowd to the pod person. A smirk tugged on his lips. The lights glimmered on his suit and the slight flush to his healed cheeks. He had fed recently for sure. You look lively. Just happy to be in a body again. Neve ran a finger down his chest before she turned around, exposing his bite on her neck. Almost losing it made me think. Go on, Kristoff whispered in her ear. Lips hovered over his claiming mark. A slow hand wandered on her hip. Your body is telling you. Leaning back, Neve rubbed against him. All the things that I'm not doing with it. What are you planning to do to him? Red put her head in her hands. Heat crept up her neck at watching her own body grind against the tall vampire. How was she going to explain this to Lucas? Don't do something I'll regret. You've been missing out. He put his hand on Neve's, lifting it to kiss the knuckle. Leaning back, his mile-long stare over the dance floor grew grim. But we both know that you will go running to Lucas afterward. Don't act like that. I know the truth. Nevaeh gripped his collar and pulled herself closer, face to face. Watching me wake up was the happiest you've been in lifetimes. She pressed flush against him, her thigh rubbing between his. Now you're getting even happier. I'm always happy to see you. Eyes narrowed. He caressed her back as if his hands couldn't help it. The midnight purple in his aura turned black. I just know where you'll go at dawn. 
Guess you'll have to convince me to stay, handsome. She fluttered her eyelashes. Her grin was a challenge. Let's me start by getting you a drink. He stroked her hair. His amber-tinged gaze faded into a contemplative blue. I'll join you in the VIP room. Get me a Cosmo, then, pink sugar on the rim. Neve sauntered off the dance floor to the velvet ropes blocking off the VIP room. Head dipping, he raised his eyebrows at the stolen body walking away. A sad earnestness flickered on his face before the reserved mask slipped on. He straightened his shoulders and strode to the bar. Red stomped after Kristoff. I am a wine girl for the most part. IPAs taste like soap. Sugary cocktails give me hangovers. You've made me a drink before. Cutting the line, he gave the drink order to a female bartender with green hair. Thanks, Anna. Delilah glided up to him while he waited. Her bangles clinked like a restless rattlesnake as she gestured to the VIP room. That's not the red I know and tolerate, Kristoff. I know. Rally the white hats. He swigged a shot of whiskey, then picked up the Cosmo. Delia dialed quickly. Quinn, darling, you fucked up. Something bitchy possessed your little secretary. Get to Club Voltava. Her frozen annoyance melted as she bit her lip. The irritating hunter with the mullet isn't here. Thought you'd want to know. Finally! Red teleported back to Neve to see what the witch was brewing. The starlet twirled in the smaller VIP room by the speakers. Her arms in the air, she tossed her head. Brushing her curls back and catching her breath, Neve stopped dancing, smile souring. Her hesitant steps turned into furious strides. Red pursued Neve, weaving between the clubbers. What is it? I can't believe it. It was DJ Shake. The widower sat tucked away in a hidden alcove, arms around two blondes in pink mini dresses with a bottle of champagne and ice. Reclined on pillows like a tracksuit sultan in his harem, he whispered into one of the women's ears, Motherfucker, you're wearing yellow. Neva strode toward him, agitated sparks bouncing off her hands. You're going to want to ease up, Red. Appearing with a warning scowl, Delilah raised her cell phone knee, thumb already poised on the button to call the supreme master of the city. Breaking the black veil... <laughs> Nevia waved her hand. In the dreamland, a whooshing orb exploded from her fingertips. In reality, it twinkled, splashing a light nearly hidden in the strobing club. The power was the same. The vampires fell back against a pair of kissing dancers, phone dropping. She straightened herself up and blurred into a sprint. Do a thing like compelling her or climbing on a wall, Red called after her. Some vampires had some extra gifts. Delilah's seemed to be running off. The scene was growing ugly. They were going to need a healer soon, judging by the death glare in the other witch's eyes. Nevae marched up to her husband. You bastard. I haven't even been dead a week. I mean, Nevae hasn't. Okay, crazed fan, this is none of your business. DJ Shake put a palm up, alcohol dulled gaze hardening. He shrugged to his companions, dismissing the pod person. I'll call Secker. She brought you up from being a nobody handing out EPs on the sidewalk, and this is what you're doing. Nevy jabbed a finger at the nervous party girls. Groupies? Get security, DJ Shake ordered, jaw clenching. Yeah, where are they? Red asked, looking around for a sign that Delilah had done something about the situation. One blonde woman stood, putting her purse on her shoulder. I need to go. Neve stomped at her foot. Iris's turned black, the inky color seeping into the whites of her eyes. I don't think so. The groupie fell back as other ones struggled to stand. I can't get up. This is bad, Red tipped up on her toes to look over the crowd. Where was Kristoff with that drink? Someone get back here. The black veil is slipping and the tabloids are going to be all over it. This guy's single is at number one. Of course, there was no reply. She groaned. Why do I keep yelling at you people? Walking forward, Neve slashed curled fingers at the low table where champagne rested, and it slid out of her way. The bucket toppled over, sending ice and breaking glass over the dance floor. I did everything for you, Steve. What? You're the weird ghostbuster chick, DJ Shake started to say. Shut up. 
his teeth slammed shut with a sick clank. Teleporting to stand between Nevae and her husband, Red put up her hands. She tried to connect with her stolen body, but the black foreign aura shoved her away. Nevae pointed at DJ Shake, addressing his terrified companions. Did he tell you his real name? Steve. He grew up in Provo. He knows Spanish because of his mission to Costa Rica, not prison. All that gangbanger hype is made up. He's a goddamn Mormon who can't even fight his own battles. Who is she? Wide-eyed, the blondes in pink stammered, clutching him, feet planted in place. What is going on? You side pieces are dealing with wifey now. Nevi's magic black eyes narrowed. She raised her hand, as if to show off a ring that wasn't there. You're going to have to get me one hell of a rock to make up for this, Steve. Red tried to tug at DJ Shake's arm candies, but her hands passed through them. Go. Now. He sweated, nudging the petrified women. Recoiling at their silent, paralyzed struggles, he crawled back on the cushioned bench. He blinked as if he could wish the witch away. It didn't work like that here. It can't be. This is a nightmare. I know nightmares. You're awake, hubby. Wide awake. You died. I saw your body. I'm back. And I'm bringing all kinds of hell with me. Neveye leaned forward, her hoarse voice nearly growling. Southern accent escaped, all pretenses of acting like Red gone. I can forgive this, handsome, but you're going to act right from now on. He pressed himself against the wall. His pulse jumped in his neck, eyes rolling back. I thought that ghost wanted to be free. He was fucking warning me that I was a slave. You were my husband. After you died, I started to remember. His lips quivered. Spiders on my chest. Candles all around. Weird voodoo shit. That wasn't a marriage. It was a hostage situation. I love you. It will be different this time. Shoulders slumping, Neve put a hand on his chest. Hell no. I don't care what body you snatch. I won't be your puppet. Do whatever spooky witch shit. Leave me out of it. DJ Shake put his arms out, chin raised. I'd rather die than be your slave again. Fine, if that is how you want to be. Neveye raised a hand, lip trembling, rage narrowing her eyes. Spectral flames surged up her arm in the dreamland. Say hi to Mr. Crenshaw for me. 28. And you see, you see, sir. December 23rd, 4.47 a.m., Club Voltava, Sunset Strip, Los Angeles. In the dreamland, the moonlit VIP dance floor bounced to a slower beat. Pounding hearts, stomping feet, and carefree smiles were sluggish in the warping of time. They were happy. They were whole. They couldn't see the flames racing up Nevi's arm, reflected in the total black of her eyes. Red braced herself as she slid in front of Nevea, facing the witch wearing her skin. She couldn't block the blow, but moved out of instinct. DJ Shake might have accepted his fate. She hadn't. A fire alarm rang out, deafening in the echoing chamber. The music went silent as the lights flipped on. An emergency exit bolted open. The slow rhythm of dreamland sped up. Nevea glanced around, the sparks around her fists scattering. Delilah stood by the fire alarm. That means everyone out, heartbeat or not. DJ Shake and his groupies bolted away in the startled crowd of dancers exiting the VIP room. He glanced back at Neve. Chin trembled. Move. This is not a drill. Delilah grabbed his collar and pushed him out the emergency stairwell door. She crossed her arms, arching a perfectly shaped eyebrow at Neve. You're as annoying as Helen Mirren. The witch stomped forward. Her hand only sparkled in reality. It was an inferno again in the dreamland. I take that as a compliment. Rushing in, Kristoff grabbed Neve's wrist from behind. If you wanted to spill some blood, you could have brought him into my office to share. Red's heart dropped. Was he joining in on the carnage? You'd like that, wouldn't you, dead boy? Neve grinned cheekily. You'd be surprised what I like. He lowered her hand, tightening his grip. Narrowed gaze was wary. Kinky, Nevai purred, then sneered. She yanked her hand away. Not my fetish. 
You're surrounded by vampires, a sold one who doesn't like you, and an unsold one who likes you too much, Delilah warned, her long red nails tapping on her arms. She sucked in her cheeks, her tilted gaze on the witch's neck. Nevaeh clamped her hand on her hip, her eyebrow lifting as her lips pouted in invitation. I could take you to. The vampiress rolled her eyes. You're no Mary Pickford. Electricity sparking in her aura, Neve flung her hand out, glowering. I could take you to, like I said, but I'm just not that by curious. Delilah tumbled to the ground. Purple ether dragged her to the emergency exit and tossed her out. It slammed closed behind her. Violet mists covered the door. Damn it! Red stomped and tried to bat away the mists. They stung her fingers like needle pricks. The mists only hardened into a spiked wall tipped with syringes that oozed green sludge. She pulled back and glowered at Nevae, muttering about her shoddy homeschool magical education. I really came for one. Neve pushed her palm out toward the other vampire. That's you, big boy. Kristoff fell back against the wall, arms stretched out as if nailed in place. Ghostly axe heads dug into his palms. You lured me here for that stupid detective to find. Nevae stalked forward, eagerness growing with each step. I am going to enjoy pulling you apart. Maxwell appeared in the middle of rolling clouds. Thunder clapped at his arrival. Lightning ringed his feet. What the devil are you doing? I get tossed into the ether for a jot and you're mucking everything up. Red pushed the fear down as her heart sped up, lips curling back in a grimace. Maxwell's electric entrance jolted flashbacks of his asylum. She was a hunter, still. If she was going down, she was going down swinging. As a wise bard would say, your girl done fucked up, warlock. Maxwell shot her a withering glare. Neve pointed at the vampire, looking for the warlock, not seeing but hearing him. Her deflated expression held none of the earlier rage, only panic. Sweat glistened on her face. You told me to destroy her friends. I'm starting with this one. Kristoff snorted disdainfully, straining against the blades, pinning him to the wall. Lightning swirled faster around Maxwell. I told you the Soulmancer. I couldn't kill him with everyone watching. Don't worry, he won't be saying or reading anything. Nevae twitched her lips, failing to form a kayoling smile. She looked like a corpse a-tightening in rigor mortis. He doesn't need to now. You've gone on a very uncharacteristic rampage, Maxwell shouted. Stormy expression chased away his usual smirk. Your host wouldn't break the dark veil in a notorious vampire's club to torment some musician, you inane fury. Red summoned what remained of her magic. It was like making wet rocks spark. Only stubbornness kept her mystically reaching out to Neva, who had her body and some of its magic in addition to her own. Red tried to siphon it away while the dark witch was focused on the warlock. You hired the wrong actress. She can't improv. Will you shut up? Maxwell cursed, head jerking to glare at her. She's still there? Where is everyone? Eyes darting around, Nevae backed up. You said that Juniper chick went on a spree. Red is like her or whatever. It's in character. No, Juniper St. James had finesse. Subtlety. You are like a charging bull. Voice booming, he strode forward to loom over her from the other side of the thin line between reality and the dreamland. Did you really try to kill your husband in front of witnesses? What were you thinking, you buffoon? Hey, he was all over those hookers. Lips trembling, she pleaded. I reacted. Let's just dance it off, okay? You've done enough dancing. Maxwell ran a finger down her jaw. Bruised purple energies followed his touch through the barriers between dimensional planes. I put you in that body and I will pull you out. Neve winced and jerked her head back. You can't. I know your weakness. You can't see. I have none. Let's test that theory, Red said, walking closer. She guessed why Maxwell kept Neve around, but she was keen to know the dirt. You're like a battery or an anchor or something for him, right? Give me a metaphor here. What's the deal, girlfriend? I will deal with you, Red. Wait in line. 
He pointed at Neve, his fingers curling and tracing shapes in the air. This child needs a lesson about dolls. They can be taken away. No, Neve shuddered. A mist blanketed her like snow. Scarlet stitches iced over where they attached her aura to the body. Trembling, shadowy wisps radiated from her, drawn forward as if being sucked away. Red yanked on her separated magic, trying to draw on it. The other witch couldn't protect her new body and fight Maxwell off at the same time. Or hold on to her other spells. It seemed like both forgot about the vampire in the room, too. Kristoff rushed forward, tackling the other witch. Time and reality seemed to slow as the dreamland sped up. Neve screamed. The shadow split off from her to swarm around Maxwell. Locusts, pitch black yet glinting in oily green, crawled and hovered over him. Looks like you're losing your ally. Red knelt beside her body. The foreign spirit peeled on the edges. She put her hands through Kristoff's, probing for weaknesses in the ward on herself. Or she's turning on you. I don't need her. I am limitless in the dreamland. Maxwell swatted away the swarm. An unseen hand dragged Red away. Iron chains wrapped around her. The green wisps of her own energy didn't hold them in place anymore. He couldn't use her self-loathing and despair against her. You're a glutton for punishment. You know you deserve it like my wife did. The warlock stomped on the locusts, flicking one off his shoulder. You know I figured something out. She shook the iron off and stepped forward, hands on her hips. Juniper said that Maxwell had to be the smartest in the room. Red was going to show him that he wasn't. I don't deserve it. You don't know what nasty foul things are in your past. How many women wake up knowing how to kill? I'm a shield against the darkness now. It doesn't matter what I was before. Poppycock, you're not in such an illustrious order. You take their scraps as a mercenary, a terrier to snuff out the rats, not worth even naming. Maxwell flipped his hand, huffing in dismissal. A buzzing locust landed on his face. Moore trooped up the suit jacket from his velvet pants. He shook his leg and brushed the bugs down. The number multiplied. This whole time you've been trying to convince me that I'm worse than dirt, that you're a god. The iron chains flickered on Red's arms before dissolving again. She crouched down by her body. You're wrong! You needed my buy-in! His magic pressed upon her, but its control slipped as he fought on two fronts. The chains seemed smaller now that she knew their secret, that she had helped hold them closed. You're Hellspawn, just like Juniper. He loomed over her. A vein pulsed in his forehead. The smirk had disappeared. Locust skittered up his neck. Then you're falling with me. Red grabbed his hand and yanked him down, pestilence and all. Holding on to Maxwell, she dived to the gaps that the ejecting spirit left in her aura. Weakened by the swarm, his ward fell. She got her ass kicked all night. Now she was taking the fight to a new arena. She focused on one thing, the scariest place she knew, her own mind. Welcome to the Thunderdome, assholes. Falling into a white void, the three weren't exactly in the dreamland now. They were in her head. She could peek into theirs. Where are your weaknesses, Maxwell? The void darkened into a dimly lit smoking parlor. Stern faces and powdered wigs glared from gold-painted frames. A bald man, rapier thin in a Puritan black suit, perched in a high-backed leather chair. He waited with a vulture's patience until his quarry came into view. Maxwell! The young man, hand half in a cigar box, glanced up. He didn't have the goatee or mustache, but the wily face was the same. A nauseous shock replaced the usual smug amusement. Father, I didn't see you there. Even if I didn't have on a glamour, you wouldn't have noticed, swaggering in with thieving hands and a murderer's heart. Spittle flew from the old man's lips. His beetle brows slammed together in bitter disappointment, creating a trench between determined eyes. Young Maxwell's surprise coiled into an oily composure. He brushed his hair back. One cigar doesn't make a the... You came from a funeral, lad, and now you make merry. Lifting out of the chair, the father pointed his cane. I know what you did. 
I saved the entire academy from a demon. I was the hero. Flinching as if struck, the man leaned heavily on the cane, somehow older after his son's words. Dread replaced the anger. The gods didn't bless you with magic, so you took his. How many were saved with his death? The retort was smooth, as if practiced until it felt like the truth. A professor could have saved him if but only alerted. It was glory you desired. By God, you are a disgrace to our good name. I am a credit to it. My destiny is to advise head bards, lead heroes, and guide the brotherhood as you do. Maxwell insisted, smarm dissolving into sincerity. I will be the greatest bard the world has ever known. Our honor comes from shielding the innocent, not sacrificing them to ambition. You have no destiny, only justice to face. His father's bitter voice faded as a howl ripped through the air. Tumbling out of the merged consciousness, Red landed in a sterile chamber. The white expanse stretched into infinity. She panted, shrugging off the dark memory like a stitch in her side after a marathon. Maxwell had been brought up in the Brotherhood. Raised by muggle sociopaths, Neve had no idea how to use magic responsibly. He did. And he drained mages to get it. That little Crispin boy was his first murder, but not his last. If there was one thing that Juniper got right, it was taking the warlock into death with her. He chose to spill blood and say it was for the greater good. He liked it. Nevaya materialized from the locusts, wiggling as the swarm reabsorbed back into her form. Grimacing, Maxwell marched to grab Red. A vein popped in his eyeball, the blood seeping into the white. How did you procure that memory, witch? You visited my brain. I thought I'd return the favor. Now I see who you really are. You weren't chosen for anything. Red yanked her arm away. You'll just do anything. I showed you only one of the visions I was shown. The last was of the Brotherhood falling. To prevent that future and others, I did darker deeds than you can imagine. The world still spins because of me. He jabbed his thumb in his chest and forced out a dark laugh. I do the work that heroes can't bring themselves to do. How long did it take you to come up with that rationalization? Nevaya sneezed. A locust appeared in her hand. Your dad seemed like a dick, Maxwell. Was he really going to turn you in? Of course he was. Bards take their duty seriously, Red said. Joining the Brotherhood was something she'd wanted ever since Vic found her. What did it mean that Maxwell had been one? I was correct. Even as a lad, future head bards would heed my counsel. Maxwell gritted his teeth and summoned a shadow tentacle to whip down on Red. I dirtied my hands so theirs could stay clean. She caught the shadow whip instinctively. He sullied the brotherhood with his touch. You like being a dirt bag. You fancy yourself better than me? I saved the world. He yanked the shadow back. Your presence ensures chaos. Juniper might have some karmic baggage, but I'm not her. Sorry, buddy. Wrong number on this call for revenge, Red said. A hunter's journal opened in her hands, handwritten pages flipping as sage smoke drifted out. Chasing after ghosts, pretending to be a god. You're the powerless wraith here. You have no idea what powers I have. Head lowered, Maxwell glowered, and shadows surged around his purple suit, flaring like a windblown cape. We're not in dreamland. I make the rules here. A giant dustbuster dropped from the ceiling. That was still on her shopping list. In her mind, it was already hers and big enough for a dust bunny the size of a warlock. It flicked on and zoomed noisily to circle, sucking up the shadows wafting off him. Beginning the chant, Red yearned for a camera. This would have been perfect for a Christmas card. Navy snapped her fingers, laughing. Oh, no, she didn't. What the devil? Maxwell swatted at the cartoonishly large vacuum, wincing. Confusion battled with dismay on his face. His blows only made it fly faster around him. Smiling, Red recited the Latin exorcism. She pivoted, grin disappearing. A sickly anger pooled in her gut as she named another in the chant. The hell? Nevea doubled over. Too weak from her battle with Maxwell, pain dug deep creases around her mouth. She lobbed an orb. 
The weak toss crashed against the floor in a tailspin of sparks. You're being evicted, Red resumed the chant. Shrieking in frustration, Nevai convulsed, turning transparent, revealing the endless walls behind her. She turned on her heel to Maxwell. You said you were going to help me. You promised to not be an idiot, he retorted, his brow furrowed. Toxic energy surrounded him as he summoned his magic, dark gaze boring into reds. You're so mean, Neve pouted, stomping her foot, lowering her head in a sulk. She shrieked at the discovery of her dissolving legs. Oh, sweet baby Jesus, I'm disappearing, y'all. Red paused her chant. He'll let you die for real this time. Nevaeh whimpered, tears in her eyes. All I've done is give and give. This is what I get. Everyone is so ungrateful. Quiet, you! Maxwell scowled, conjuring an orb. Glowing like a live ember, it cracked the air, jetting forth. Repeating the Latin chant, Red raised her palm. A shimmering golden shield rose like growing vines to the ceiling, sprouting springy leaves, puffed flowers, and razor-sharp thorns. Not in my house. The orb sputtered, hitting the shield. Hunching over, arms akimbo and legs shaking, Navai jerked to the pace of the exorcism, limbs contorting into bone-shattering angles. Her pained moan skipped like a hiccup. Writing herself, she flung a sputtering fireball at him. Deals off, you twisted old freak. A cursed wench, Maxwell dodged, staggering to the side. He lashed a whip of shadow to crack across her face. Finishing the last lines of the exorcism as the other two battled, Red levitated a cross in the Leather Hunter's journal. Sage billowed over the pages to fall to her feet. Lucit Uri, abiet in sempiternum. Exilium. Nevaeh cried out, arms locked at her sides as ruby flames consumed her. Lightning glinted like black diamonds in the fire's depths. Maxwell fell back from the raging fire, hands raised. Black lightning shot out of the inferno. The tower of flame burst up, ebbing over the ceiling before sinking down into the floor, burning away the last traces of Nevaeh Morgan, America's sweetheart. Blinking, he stumbled body growing transparent. That's for Kate. Red steeled her shoulders. Her theory was that, as a new spirit, Neve anchored his old soul closer to the mortal realm. The power of the solstice had eased his way. He had destroyed a lot of her theories tonight. She was ready to bet her life on this one. Summoning her magic, she chanted the last exorcism of the night. The hunter's journal rose as a phantom wind pushed her hair back. Her fast heartbeat resounded in the white room as if they were warring inside her own chest. She'll send him to the worst place she could think of. The bell witch would be waiting. You don't have the faith in the Almighty for that. Maxwell sneered at her, teeth bared in a mocking smirk. He stepped forward, huffing in pained effort. You need that slovenly bard to do the job. Hardly. You needed Neve to tether you here. You needed me to agree to death. I'm beginning to think you don't have much power at all, warlock. Not your own. I can prove it. Red spit out the last verse of Latin exorcism. Exilium, I banish you, Maxwell. Now get out of my head. The shadows leapt off his shoulders. Prowling and circling him, they solidified into hunched, four-legged monstrous beasts. Ridged-backed and eyes glowing red, they leaped on him. The warlock flailed. Claws slashed his purple suit. Mongrels turning on their master. The phantom hounds howled before their shadowy jaws clamped down on his limbs. He cursed, falling to the ground, and reached out to her. One last curse on his lips. A shadow hound dove for his throat, foam dripping from its jaws. The gloom pressed in like a pack before the beasts dragged him through the floor to what he richly deserved. Red searched for any lingering residue of Maxwell, not even a scuff mark on the white room with its walls stretching out to infinity. Her racing heart echoed in the emptiness. She was alone in her mind. Finally. Red blinked and suddenly she was in the VIP room. Kristoff hovered over her, suspicion tempered by concern. No mystical auras or psychedelic energy squiggled on the walls. The only light was fluorescent. This was reality. 
she had woken up. I'm really here. In the dreamland, she had felt like an echo, a dull replica of the real thing. Now her physical senses were overwhelming, the sound of her panting breath in her lungs, the scent of his charcoal soap, the feel of the vampire above her. She flexed her wrists under his palm. The raw physicality made her sigh. She was actually a part of the world again. Air never tasted sweeter. Brows furrowing, his gaze drilled into hers. I see you. I certainly feel you. Now who are you? Kristoff? The crush of her senses faded in the realization of exactly who was on top of her. Blushing, she shifted and glanced at the hands pinned above her head, then to his legs straddling her waist. It's me. Get off before I find something to stake you with. I'm not sure. He studied her face, his hands still on her wrists and blue eyes crinkling mischievously. It made his immortal face seem boyish. Her breath caught. She reminded herself that mischief meant something different to unsold vampires. A slow grin spread on his face. The words were a dare. What would you stake me a with? A wooden spoon. Setting her jaw, she matched the master vampire's gaze despite her racing pulse. She couldn't show fear, even if his claim was on her neck and she was finally in his arms at his mercy. Maybe a spatula. Pleasure to see you again, Red. Kristoff rolled away, his bulk off her in an instant to sit beside her hips. He bit his lip and cocked his head. Handshake? You've touched enough of me tonight, Mr. Novak. She breathed out the quip, absently touching her cheek, her real flesh. The relief was tarnished by discovery. Oh, God, my face. Are these fake eyelashes? She tugged at one and nearly cried from the sensation of feeling her eyelids move. Smiling dreamily, she ignored his amused glance. Having a body was amazing. Sitting up, she tugged her short dress down, realizing it was hiked up past mid-thigh. Dizziness spun her vision. Her body might have looked healed, but an all-over stabbing pain stiffened her muscles. She fell forward, fatigue sapped at her from using magic, then everything Nevaille had done. It was truly unbelievable how much she had done in one night. She'd pay for it tomorrow and would need to do more than just eat to center herself. Sleep was first on the list before trying dance or another physical activity to anchor her energy in her body. Already feeling feverish, she slumped forward. Kristoff caught her, propping her up against his firm chest. Examining her face with a serious gaze, his voice turned teasing. Leave the lashes. You don't need to pop up on another crusade. She sank against him, breath caught in her lungs. Just feeling something solid made her grip his shirt in gratitude. Tears came to her eyes. She pulled away. How did you know that Neve wasn't me? I just did. He tucked a stray curl behind her ear. Red raised an eyebrow straightening and fluffing her hair back into place. Really? We were in a room together and Neve didn't threaten to stake me once. That's not that dynamic that I've come to expect from my favorite hunter. The rest would have figured it out when she bleached my hair. Facing her, Kristoff lightly ran his finger down the back of her shoulder. Soft touch woke goosebumps under the thin dress straps. Body modifications starting early? Did she get ink too? That came with the body. Peeping over her shoulder, Red raised her eyebrow at the old black liar tattoo on her back. She could barely see it and forgot about it most days. The movement made her head swim. I didn't see this when you were wearing that delicious dress at the ball. Oh, makeup! We were going for uptown claimed human as the look. She slumped from the effort of quipping. As expected, he caught her. Lie back. Voice gentle, Kristoff put an arm around her shoulders and eased her onto the floor. He folded his suit jacket to rest under her head. Is the warlock gone? What about Neve? What happened? How did she get into your body? What is this? An interrogation? She settled back on his jacket. I thought interrogations were our thing. You certainly enjoyed the last one. Get me some water, and I'll tell you all about my time falling into the looking glass. 
She tried to get up, but could only weakly push up onto her elbows. Sighing, she rested her head on the jacket, breathing in the scent of charcoal soap with a hint of woodsy musk. She laid on her side, glaring at him, still trying to cultivate an aura of badassery despite the repressed yawn. I'll do it from the floor, though. Chuckling, he stepped away before his form blurred to vampire speed. He came back with a pillow under one arm, a water bottle under the other, and a glass of red wine. I'll start with the wine. It's that kind of story. Red laid the suit jacket on the offered pillow before leaning on her elbow on it. She groaned as she straightened up. She was determined not to have to lean on him again, swaying around like a damsel in distress. Nevaye is not getting her deposit back on this rental. Christoph handed her the wine, his eyes focused on her arm trembling from the force of will keeping her up. He arched his eyebrow, restrained amusement on his lips. You know, you could ask for my help. I'm fine. Just send out the signal to my friends. I have no idea where Nevaye put my... She sipped at the red wine. Her eyes rolled up. Wow, that is good. What is that? I could get a case of it. Head tilting, his white teeth caught his lip. Christoph grinned, eyes twinkling. I'll send you some. The throb in her head dimmed as the airy fairy fog of the dreamland cleared. Setting the glass down, Red spread the jacket over her lap before she crossed her legs. The wine grounded her energy like she had gone for a nature hike. Muscles were already relaxing. She sipped at it again before reaching for the water and put the cool bottle on her forehead. Someone needs to check on Vic. Navai drugged him. Delilah already warned Quinn. Kristoff texted, thumbs moving at supernatural speed. And now she knows you're awake, so we have some time before the White Knights storm the castle. Start from the beginning. We're going to the hospital, and you're paralyzed. I was tagging along in the dreamland, and the name is very misleading, by the way. It's not the fun kind of wacky. Red launched into the tale. Leaning forward, she told him about how the Bell Witch tried to help her and Basil. The spectral saga was punctuated by sips of water and wine unraveling like a spiral. A weirdly cathartic one, in hindsight. She faltered when it came to the visions of Juniper's alternative future, or their bizarre conversation over chicken and waffles, and kept those secrets to herself. Head pillowed under her arm, she pulled herself out of an accidental silence. You guys had it rough. You saw me fighting Lucas. Eyelids lowering, Kristoff leaned on his elbow, resting on his side beside her on the ground. She rolled onto her back, trying to ignore his scent on his suit jacket. Not a great moment for either of you. Maxwell conjured imps to make you guys be assholes to each other. Yeah, using our dark truths against us. We also pieced it together ourselves, but you were too busy escaping the asylum to overhear. He rose on his hip to meet her eyes. A frown pursed at his lips. Still, I'd rather you not have to see me kick my sire's ass under those circumstances. I don't know. Where I was standing, it was coming down to a draw. Red shook her head, resisting an eye roll. He had traded barbs with his sire even before the warlock had bespelled them. You two really have problems. Juniper is just one on the list, huh? You'll find plenty of reasons to despise Lucas. It won't take a hundred years, he said dryly. I'll remember that when I start to get up there in age. Pulling the jacket over her legs and picking up her glass, she raised her eyebrow at him. I heard what you said to Lucas about Juniper. What did she hire you to find out? I should get you another glass before I start that story. Keep in mind that Juniper was as mysterious as you. I never learned all her secrets. Red bit her lip and glanced down, trying to mediate the fight between curiosity and common sense, his alluring scent curling around her. He had been a knight in soulless armor tonight, but she had seen him fight. Unleashed, he was match for even his own sire. It should have scared her more than it did. She wanted his answers as much as his wine. Kristoff lays like a lion at midday, waiting gaze on the antelope approaching a stream. Suddenly realizing how close he was, she scooted back. I think I'll switch to water, but if you wrote down the name of that bottle, 
That would be great. I knew you'd develop a taste for it. He watched her go with amused patience. The lion knew the antelope would get thirsty enough to return. We didn't get to have dinner, but we had drinks after all. So, does that mean we're even on favors? Lowering her gaze, she tried to be casual, hiding her cringe at the idea of owing him something else, especially after Nevaeh threw herself at him. This kind of a night would spook a normal dude, but a vampire might only find it interesting. Then add a bit of grinding and grabbing. His dinner invitation might list ramen, but she knew he'd want her on the menu as dessert. Christoph grinned. I'm still helping with your initial favor. Just call me if there's a gnome in your gallery, Mr. Novak, Red said primly, trying to put some distance into the conversion. She didn't need that probing stare studying her over fine Japanese cuisine. He already looked at her as if he had already seen her naked. She realized he had seen the next best thing, Juniper. Her face grew hot, eyes darting away from his knowing gaze. Those are the kind of favors I'm good for. The doors to the VIP room flew open. Red turned, shock mingling with gratitude that something had interrupted what was clearly a third date to him. Lucas charged in and stopped short, gaze narrowed on her on the floor. Relief softened his tense features until he focused on his progeny next to her, jaw clenching. Delilah strode in with a fixed scowl and crossed arms. It took forever to get back into this building, Kristoff. Evacuation procedures require locking the building. What can I say? He sipped his wine, staring at his sire over the rim. You missed the dramatic climax. Red shot at glare at him. Did he have to say climax? She curled her legs under herself, letting the suit jacket roll off, and waved awkwardly. Hiya? Delilah flashed a fang, putting her hand on her hip. How do we know it's her? I will sing along to any Tom Petty song. My favorite color is purple, and I've been to nearly every state in the West. Red smiled at Lucas, repeating the words she had introduced herself with at the Pandora Hotel before Halloween. She might not know everything about herself, but those were true. Lucas relaxed his shoulders, relief wringing a grin from his worried face. It's her. 29. December 25th, 4, 44 p.m., Hollywood Hospital, Los Angeles. Holding a Christmas tree-shaped balloon, Red walked into the hospital room. Knock, knock. Visiting hours just started. Basil bent over an open suitcase on the medical bed. Bundled up in a drab beige trench coat, facial bruises peeped over his collar. I have a late lunch appointment. Holy cats, you can talk and move your hand. She jerked her thumb behind her. These mage doctors are the best. Yeah, mage doctors, that's it. Eyes darting down, he sighed. I can talk, walk, and juggle. Better than poor Terry. Not everyone had survived the long witch night. Terry's death would be covered up by Smith and Reaper, while Erlene and Frank Morgan would end up a mystery in Tennessee under the Black Veil. The Blood Alliance wouldn't allow them to fuel a new urban legend to replace the Bell Witch. They were all casualties of a battle that had spilled out of her own nightmares. Shoulders slumped, she sat on the bed, picking up a travel document from the bedstand. The balloon slipped from her hand. You need a passport to go to Tahoe now? He took it gently. Look, Red, what happened on the solstice was intense, and there were entirely too many vampire witnesses to my power. Red bobbed her head, eyeballs pricked with tears. I get it. You need a holiday. I need more white sand than you can imagine, he said, folding a shockingly tangerine dress shirt with a dramatic flourish. You helped banish an evil dead warlock. That requires some downtime, Red conceded, needing a weekend in Vegas herself. I don't know what Maxwell was, but he wasn't your average spirit. If he was, I wouldn't have been able to push him out of the dreamland for a bit. If I was melodramatic, and I am, I'd quote a line about not being of the living or the dead. He sighed, wrinkling his nose. I only realized it when I was reunited with my body. I saw him get dragged below. The shadow hound still howled in her dreams. 
Let's hope it was a one-way ticket. Mustn't carry on about it. Hanging his head, Basil sniffed, trying to hold back the memories and put a hand on her shoulder. He closed his eyes. Red said goodbye a lot in her line of work, but it pained her to watch him go. She quipped to break the tension. How much is that reading going to cost me? This is your Christmas gift. The soul reading is more common sense than anything else. You need to get psychiatric help. This has certainly been a heartwarming goodbye, she commented dryly. It was true, but he could have gotten her a gift card instead. Oh, I don't mean it like that. Well, actually, I do a bit. I mean that you're carrying around trauma. I can refer you to my shrink. She's in on the supernatural shenanigans. I was trapped in a nightmare asylum. The cure is what makes you crazy. She tapped the side of her head. The MRI showed no lasting damage after her stint in Maxwell's funhouse, but it wasn't just the electroshock treatments that lingered in her psyche. Not just that. You're in a full body clench around some guilt. It's not going to become a pearl. Giving her shoulder a comforting squeeze, Basil met her eyes. I don't know why, but you must be here now. I mean it. You can be happy, too. Vic is going to shape up. You have a vampire who wants to be your white knight. You're making a life here. Whatever Maxwell said to mess with your head, you have to let that psychic baggage go. Funny, coming from a guy packing a bag. My L.A. phase is coming to an end. Too much publicity even for me. I want to be rich, not famous. He laid an air kiss to her cheek and closed his case. Don't come looking for me. Breathing hitching, Red nodded. She knew he did it for both their safety. Your people will call mine. Something like that. Basil paused, eyes watering. He pulled her into a hug, falling from his English accent into his natural Midwestern one. Take care of yourself, honey. I mean it. Your stiff upper lip is falling. Red grinned into his shoulder. Say goodbye to Basil Bansko. He pulled back, wiping his eyes, then tapped his chin. His voice came out as French as Pepe Le Pew. Pierre Devereaux? She shook her head, stifling a giggle. Dieter von Rothstein? A rough German accent bounced from his lips. He paused, clearly deliberating, then shrugged. He hoisted his bag off of the bed and walked toward the door. I'll work on it, Red called after him. Be safe, if you need me. I know. It'll probably be when my vacation house needs another paint job. Wariness deepening the lines in his forehead, Basil paused in the hallway. Don't trust Kristoff Novak. When he gives you a gift, check the fine print. She fought a chill like a ghost's touch. He doesn't have a soul. How'd you read that? You saw him fight on the solstice. He wants you and is willing to kill his sire to get you. He might not be the only one. Neve put a spotlight on both our heads. I've already had the vampires in black suits questioning me. Keep your stake sharp, darling. Basil turned, white knuckles tightening on his suitcase handle, and Power walked down the hallway. The balloon string dangled in her face as she gawked at the open door. Basil had fled like a tracked man. No wonder. He'd been spooked, questioned by the dark veil assurance. She kept him out of her report to Detective Calloway and Officer Chang when they had arrived at Club Voltava on the solstice. Cora Moon was obviously tying up every end to squash the latest in the scandal. After this much vampire attention, Red would never see Basil again. Her heart sank. Lost the balloon and Basil, too? Vic asked, rolling into the room, a present on his lap. They both chose to leave. She blew at the string before stepping away. Well, we can cross this holiday obligation off the list. He pivoted and hummed along to a drifting Christmas melody. Sulking after him on the way to the van, Red couldn't help but brood on the despaired resignation on Basil's face. Waking from the nightmare hadn't shaken its claws off him. She didn't blame him after waking in a damp sweat, swatting against invisible terrors herself. Basil was running from it. She would have to face the ghosts. They were hers, after all. Can I talk to you about something? Already doing it, Red, Vic said. What's up? Taking a breath, she forced herself to say it before she chickened out. The air rattled in her lungs. 
I want to go for the hunter's challenge. I know you said I wasn't ready before, but I can do it. After all you've been through, you still want to join the Brotherhood? His face froze in disbelief. You've barely survived being an intern. They need good people in there. She leaned against the van, thinking about Maxwell. Like Nevi, he could have been a force for good if he had taken a different path. He'd corrupted the gifts he had. The dreamland taught her the power of intention. Her fate was in her will, not the stars. She wouldn't become the Wicked Witch of the West. And I'm sick of using your profile on the database. Vic nodded, smiling proudly. I'll sponsor you. Over a year ago, Red woke without any memories, but she knew monsters lurked in the night and that someone needed to stand up to them. He took that raw knowledge and trained her to use it. No one knew her in a fight like him, or about the question marks in her origins. Maxwell Baldacci claimed to be the best bard in history. Psychopathy aside, he'd failed. She was looking at the best bard, sappy as it sounded. If Vic said she could join the Brotherhood, that counted more than even winning the Hunter's Challenge. Do you really think I can do it? Ducking her head, she hated the insecure note in her voice. You've been ready. He tipped his baseball cap up. Is this what it feels like when you see your kid graduate? You're a damn fine single mama, Vic. You bet your ass, especially after you see what I cooked up for Christmas. He rolled to the wheelchair lift. Let me tell you about my hunter's challenge. Behind the wheel of the Millennium Falcon, Red smiled and got them back on the road. Tunes in the speakers, her friend in the back, and a city with two fewer ghouls in it. She couldn't complain. It wasn't your typical Christmas, but that was the hunter's life. You know, you don't need to make a big deal, Vic. Red sat cross-legged on the couch with a mug of cocoa in her hands. She smiled over the floating marshmallows. Presents, roughly wrapped in newsprint, dwarfed the tiny plastic Christmas tree on the coffee table. A tin of cookies laid half-ravaged beside the remote. It's literally the smallest tree in the world. Vic rolled forward in his wheelchair to put another present on the table. It was more wrinkled newsprint than box. You're wearing a Santa hat. Even without the hat, he looked like redneck Christmas in his vintage Richard Petty NASCAR shirt adorned with tinsel hanging from his shoulders. My head is cold. Tis the winter's chill. It's like 80 outside. You turned on the air conditioning. She laughed, motioning to the full draft filtering from the noisy vent. Let me do something nice. Vic grumped and rearranged the presents, pushing a square one out. Now open this one. Fine, fine. We can celebrate Festivus later. Rubbing her hands together, Red chuckled as she scrutinized the roughly wrapped present. You know I'm over Navy, tricking all my friends into thinking that she was me, right? I thought we weren't airing grievances. He scowled. Let's repress like a proper family. I'm serious. You don't need to feel bad about it. She was a professional actress. I was a ghost. It happens. Just open the present, he groused, waving a hand at her. Grinning, she dug into the gift. Tape and crinkled newsprint formed a solid defense around the square present. I knew something was up when she wanted to change the radio. Then she called me handsome, which was weird. Totally not you. I was luring her into a trap. I even wrote out a text to Quinn in my room. Vic gestured with his mug to the tree. It's not that. I just know it's been hard for us since we got to L.A. That called for some Christmas cheer and pirated claymation television classics. Finally breaking through the layers of printed coupons and tabloid headlines, Red pushed the paper aside to see it was one of the photo frames that came with the apartment. The fake family was gone, replaced by Red, Vic, and the Millennium Falcon on Cannon Beach in Oregon, taken months ago on a hunt for the bandage man. She smiled. It's perfect. Not yet. I know there's something about Christmas that makes you crave Chinese food. Vic sipped his cocoa, gazing knowingly over the rim. We kind of do all the time, but it's more special on a holiday. She giggled. How many of those dispensary gummies did you eat? How dare you? They're medicinal. 
Hand on his chest, he cried out in mock outrage. Santa brought them because I've been a good boy. A knock thumped on the door. Right on schedule, Vic yelled. It's open if you can get in. Popping his head in, Quinn held up a bag of takeout in his hand. He ducked his head as he stepped in. Merry Christmas. Mumbling the words back, she braced herself for the second Christmas visitor. It wasn't Santa with more presents. Lucas smiled crookedly at her. Seasons, greetings, and all that. You're just in time for how the Grinch stole Christmas. Red looked down, taking a deep breath, her stomach nodding. It was hard to think about Lucas without remembering Neve kissing him. She didn't know why it was easier to forgive Vic for not realizing it was her. Then again, he hadn't shoved his tongue halfway down Neve's throat. Red stood to go into the kitchen. Let's pause it to set up. Me and Quinn can do that. Vic held up a hand. I can tell he hasn't done Christmas since I was his intern. See, you put up this tree? The two went into the kitchen, keeping their backs carefully turned away from the adjoined living room. Then can I turn off the air conditioning? Maybe open the door to let some heat in? She walked away, arms crossed, fiddled with the thermostat, and went to the balcony. You're just cooling the neighborhood, Vic called over his shoulder before grumbling to Quinn. Red rolled her eyes at the dad tone from a childless bachelor. She stiffened as Lucas approached. How are you? Lucas leaned against the sliding door, his voice pitched low. I texted you how I was. Red stared at her solo reflection in the glass, trying to keep her breathing even. She didn't need his super senses spoiling her attempts at repression. You wrote one word, fine. One word replies from a woman make a man worry. He shrugged and touched her upper arm. Drawing away, she looked back at the kitchen, where the others did a valiant effort to be loud to drown out the conversation. Basil had been right. She was ruining Christmas. Or at least making it socially awkward. She slipped out on the balcony and waited for Lucas to follow her. I'm still processing it all. I always have an ear when you need it. Lucas rested his elbows on the rail, close enough to smell his sandalwood scent. The lights of the city accentuated his high cheekbones. You don't need to bottle it up or go to... He didn't finish the sentence. They both knew who he wanted to name. She swallowed back the sharp retort that Kristoff saw through the pod person. It wasn't fair. Nevaeh had acted like her, looked like her, sounded like her, knew enough about the players in her life from bespelling Detective Calloway. It was enough to fool almost everyone. Throwing it into his face was a low blow. He didn't consent to make out with a psycho. She wasn't the only one Nevai hurt. Lucas didn't know it wasn't Red. That was the problem. Guilt and anger circling each other as Red tried to be rational. It's not that complicated. I was pulled into a dream world and tortured with terrible visions by a warlock. Then a popular actress stole my body. That sounds pretty complicated, he commented drolly, staring out over the courtyard. The angle of the balcony light cast his face in half shadow. Snorting, she leaned forward on the rail to rest her chin in her palm. Yeah, I, I guess so. You're mad at me? Lucas tapped his shoulder lightly against hers to coax a reply. Red huddled closer to him. Yeah, he confessed. It's not going to be the last time. I'm told I can be dense. Who told you that? Quinn, Delilah, my father, pretty much everyone who knows me half well. You're smart enough to know I'm mad. It's stupid, but I'm a little thrown because you didn't know it wasn't me. You talked to her, played some tonsil hockey, and not once suspected. She straightened and put a hand up. I know it's not fair. She was in my body. I get it. You're like no one else, Red. I don't flutter my eyelashes like this. Crossing her arms, she mimicked Neve's dazed, I'm so helpless look. In my defense, I thought it was head trauma. She rolled her eyes, but she unfolded her arms. It was hard to resist that quick wit. I'm sorry. His impish smile transformed into earnest apology.
Relaxing and turning to him, she sighed. He had never stopped fighting for her, even when it seemed like she was lost. I know. I was blinded by... I spent the longest night watching you die, and when you woke up, I just couldn't think straight. Lucas took her hand. The same timeless energy crackled between them. His storm-gray eyes gazed at her like there was no one else in Los Angeles. I never think straight around you. It's like ever since you came into my life, I keep expecting you to disappear. I thought you did that night. I saw you when I was in the other place. Biting her lip, Red entwined their fingers and leaned against him. There was so much she could say. She could ask him about the asylum or confess what she'd learned about Juniper. But this moment was for them. She didn't need any more ghosts for Christmas. I still checked in. I fought to get back to you and Vic and Quinn. I don't ever want you guys to have to hurt like that because of me. It wasn't because of you. It was because we care about you. Lucas hugged Red, stroking her back. Even when I thought you hated me, I woke up like an excited kid this morning because I knew you were still in the world. That is the best Christmas gift. Good, because all the gifts I ordered are arriving late, she mumbled into his chest, wrapping her arms under his leather jacket. He chuckled. I got you a crossbow, but I forgot it at the office. Then we're even. Pulling back, she leaned up on her tiptoes. She tugged on his jacket lapels and pulled him closer. Now, for the record, this is how I kiss. I'm a bit slow. You might have to kiss me loads before I get it. Your PDA is delaying Christmas, Vic called from the living room, voice wry with amusement. He pointed to the wide, flat screen. This is family time with the TV. Blushing, Red took Lucas's hand and led him inside. She mock gasped at the screen. Hey, rewind the Grinch. I can't believe you started it. Sit down and eat your beef and broccoli. Vic grouched, hitting the rewind button. Sitting on the couch, Red grinned and marveled at the holiday magic of it all, even down to their humble little plastic tree. We survived our first Christmas in L.A. There's plenty of time for something spooky to jump out. Maybe Krampus? Vic laughed. I would be down for that rumble. I'm serious. I wouldn't be here without you guys. You still had to take out the warlock, Quinn pointed out. She chuckled. I didn't want to be the one to say it. I'm just grateful to be here and spend Christmas with you guys, especially since you can actually hear me. You know we wouldn't leave you with Freddy Krueger, Vic said. You are precious cargo. Lucas brushed her hair over her shoulder. I haven't forgotten it. Smiling at the callback to the first time she experienced his wild driving, Red wiped her eyes. Okay, I'm done being sappy. We can get back to the show. I can't believe you let me forget. We can't watch yet. Vic wagged his finger and turning to Lucas. I have a theory about the Who's in Whoville. She groaned. Not the Who's or Cannibals theory. Yes, the very same. He crowed, finger in the air. Brows lifting, Lucas sat next to Red, leaning forward to listen. Okay, I'll bite on this one, mate. I've met a few cannibals, Quinn commented from the recliner, sipping a mug filled with blood. His face was stoic over the prancing puppies decorating the ceramic. They didn't sing much. The Who's are not cannibals. They are a wholesome Christmas people, she insisted, jabbing her fork towards Vic. This is the traditional rendition of a cartoon conspiracy, Red. Don't spoil it for them. The working title is The Harvest of the Susie Balls. Vic launched into his theory, pausing the video to point out the hidden clues. Smiling, Red let herself absorb that cozy feeling of home. She never thought home would look like cookies, cartoons, and sold vampires. Whoever she had been before, this was her life now. Reincarnation, doppelganger, or heir to a bloodline of evil witches. She could still be whoever she wanted to be. She was a hunter. This was the life she chose. Sighing happily, she went to the kitchen to make some more cocoa. Her cell phone vibrated in her pocket as she waited for the kettle. Pulling it out, the preview of the text made her gulp. Her hovering thumb tensed over the screen. 
You have been summoned by the Dark Veil Assurance. Red was going to need something stronger than Coco. Epilogue. December 25th, 5.55 p.m., the Oregon coast, United States. Stace Bonner shivered, stepping onto the cheerful yellow linoleum. Biting winds followed her inside the kitchen. They howled in the gap as she closed the door. Shaking off her rain-dampened dark curls, she placed the cold house key on the counter. Nana Sanchez always left it in the same spot. Ever since they were teens, it was always by the lawn flamingo guarding the back steps. Stace rubbed her hands to shake off the chill. She narrowed her eyes at the friend who was supposed to meet her at the curb. He wasn't even in his coat yet. Annoyingly coatless, Zach Sanchez sat hunched over a laptop at the table. He looked unusually pale in the computer's light. His finger hovered over the touchpad in deliberation. Stace planted a hand on her white raincoat-covered hip. Pink sparkles glittered on her fingers. They needed to get on the road now if they were going to beat the storm battering the coast. Are you seriously checking your email right now? Jumping in his seat and twisting to clutch the chair back, Zack blinked at her. His brown eyes were red-rimmed and wet. Running a hand through short, dark hair, he caught his breath. Shit, I... You okay? She tilted her head, letting her hand fall from her hip, taking in the scene. The kitchen lights were dimmed, and his black sweater was the opposite of festive. It looked like his hometown holiday had been grimmer than hers. We gotta start back to Portland before your nana comes back from mass to bribe us with more tamales to stay. I only just escaped my Aunt Gina. He turned back to his laptop and tapped the touchpad. You have to see what I found. It was on a thumb drive in my old room. It better be good. We're going to hit rush hour by the... She went to look over his shoulder. Her words dried up in her throat. She hadn't seen the face on the screen since the funeral years ago. Not enough was found to fill the casket, but it was buried anyway. She put flowers at the grave on All Souls Day before the first freeze of the season. Fingers raising to her mouth, her eyes grew hot with tears. It's... Zack began. A nearby car alarm sounded, obscuring his words. He hung his head, waiting for the sound to pass. Stace's heart broke for him as he tried to collect himself. His long eyelashes framed a vulnerable gaze. I'm sorry that I didn't want to talk about her before. Sometimes I do want to go back to high school. It just still hurts. I never wanted to believe she was dead. We grew up together. I didn't want to grieve. I wanted to find her, you know. Accepting she was really gone was the hardest thing that I've ever had to do. I shut down. Then this is all that is left of... Grief kept the name lodged in her throat. It stung her to even think it. She leaned closer to the laptop. Familiar green eyes stared back from the paused video. Head ducked shyly. Loose red hair fell over the teenage girl's face as she sat at a booth at Lily's diner. Captured on video, a younger Stace reached into the frame to snatch a French fry off the other girl's plate. Older and harder than the version of herself on the screen, she couldn't help but be taken back to high school. They had spent so much time in that red booth, it still had their names tagged on the underside of the table. How did you find this? The newspaper posted an old clipping online of that play she was in. Remember? We had to run lines that whole month with her. His brow nodded as he swallowed thickly. He shook his head and cleared his throat. It got me thinking that we couldn't have lost every picture in the house fire. Insomnia hit and I found this in the closet. Taking her hand, he sent a soothing wave of comfort. His empath powers amplified the feeling. Brace yourself. Hey, I want to feel this. Unfiltered. Stace shook her head before clicking play on the video. Goosebumps rose on her arms. She focused on her lost friend on the screen. It had been nearly a decade, but she never forgot the night that their lives changed forever. She still had nightmares about it. An old pop song played in the background as the ambient restaurant chatter came through the speakers. Ancient history rolled on the screen. Holding the camera, a younger Zack turned the lens on himself. The spiked dog collar and eyeliner time-stamped the video. 
firmly in his goth phase. He laid the drama on thick in his narration. We are entering our junior year of the Thunderdome that is high school. As a serious documentarian, I must chronicle our epic coming of age in this crazy ass town. He turned the camera first to a teenage Stace who was pulling out her retainer to eat a fry. Our hero, Stacy a Daisy Bonner, is at the center of this tale. Hey, squeaking, she spun away in her seat. Delete this. Watching the younger version of herself on the video, she smiled through her tears. She had hated that retainer. Someone should have told her that her fairy teeth were going to come in soon. I'm glad you didn't. Zack squeezed her hand as the video played. His damp eyes glimmered in the glow of the computer screen. The empath was the one who needed comfort now. This is the best part. The camera unfocused for a moment as a quick visible hand fumbled to adjust the setting. A blushing pale face came into view. The teenager tried to hide behind red hair. As a modern witch of the new millennium, what do you want to share for the ages? Am no one calls me by my full name. The redhead giggled. Not even my mom. He faltered, interrupted before he could finish the solemn recitation. He adjusted the camera in his grip. Whatever, woman of mystery, answer the question. I don't want to be in a video. She covered her face, the nervous snickers escaping behind her fingers. Her peeking eyes pleaded for rescue. I'm serious. This is like a time capsule. The scold came from off screen. Don't you want to remember? A wide smile stretched over the girl's face. She bounced in her seat, leaning closer to the lens. How could I forget any of it? Cutting class to patrol the cemetery for gnomes or the time we had to stake the gym teacher. Yeah, those times are firmly lodged in my memory banks. She sighed happily. Her green eyes twinkled as she leaned back in the red vinyl booth. But we could forget, he insisted earnestly out of the frame, the camera shaking from his vehemence. You know how these little apocalypses pile up and next thing you know you're 30, practically dead. Eyebrow quirking at the bizarre notion, the red-haired girl laughed, wobbling on the booth bench as teenage Zack nagged at her to stop. Immortalized on film, she looked so full of life that it hurt to look at the screen. This girl would never see 30. She grew serious and nodded. I'll remember the important stuff, I promise. The screen darkened as the battery died on the laptop. Standing, he wiped his eyes. Worth waiting? Stace hugged him and closed her eyes, face pressed against his black sweater. An old friend's grin rose behind her eyelids. She held Zack tighter. This was the best Christmas gift ever. The Red Witch Chronicles continues in Witch Gone Viral. Find Witch Gone Viral and the entire series order at samavalentine.com books. Continue reading to find a bonus short story. Trespassers. Um... December 30th, 7 p.m., Culver City, Los Angeles, California. What is a Mananangal? Looking up from his wheelchair, Vic Constantine tossed Red the question like a flyball. They waited by the pickup counter at the New Delhi kitchen. A dinner rush was in full swing at the bustling Indian restaurant. Normies talked about holiday family dramas and New Year's resolutions, drowning out the hunter's paranormal chatter. She furrowed her brow trying to place the strange name. Once she had asked him to sponsor her and the hunter's challenge to join the Brotherhood, he had taken it as an invitation to toss pop quizzes at random. Usually she had an answer, yet all she could focus on was her stomach growling from the delicious curry smells coming from restaurant tables. No clue. Bloodsucker from the Philippines. Splits in half. Gotta use garlic and salt on it. Extinct in this dimension. Extinct? Then Wiley, Red started to say, then interrupted herself. This dimension? Science hasn't caught up to supernatural theory and lore when it comes to multiverses, vortexes, time wobbles, other dimensions. It's a big scary world out there, he said dryly, checking his Batman watch. I'm hoping my samosas are still in this one. Will that be on the test? Red frowned. The written portion of the hunter's challenge was supposed to be intense, 
but that was next level weird. She had read about those myths, but figured most were just that. Myths. Now, I think I'm looking forward to the practical more. That should be a cakewalk after my tutelage. Pausing as if for applause, Vic gestured to the green trucker hat on his shoulder-length black mullet, ACDC shirt, and his denim-covered legs. He quirked a sardonic eyebrow at her lack of response. It'd be even easier if you played around with your magic more. Red bit her lip to keep in a sigh. Magic only got her in trouble lately. It had been five days since she was sent summons for a Blood Alliance tribunal in late January. A tango with a dark witch left her on the wrong side of a dark veil breach. Even banished to hell, Neve Morgan still managed to fuck with Red's life. Magic for personal gain and twisted desires set Neve on her fatal path. Then add all the fallout at Halloween from Red being a dead ringer for a black magic using courtesan from Victorian times. It made her leery about her powers. I'll pass the challenge as a hunter, not a witch. I'm better at that, anyway. Vic shot her a look that spoke volumes about how much shit he thought she was full of right then. A waitress walking out of the kitchen with a steaming tray of tikka marsala stole his attention until he shook his head. This isn't because of Lucas? She blinked at him, more confused about this question than the one about the extinct demon. The meaning sunk in. She rolled her eyes. Her sold vampiric co-worker and occasional snuggle bunny, Lucas left for a desert motorcycle trip without much explanation beyond needing to clear his head. Sure, he wasn't excited about witchcraft. His last relationship with a witch ended with her dying, so it made sense. It hadn't affected Red's decision. No, I'm a little insulted you'd think that. Well, what is it? You were gung-ho about it before. He pitched his voice higher in an impression of her. My mom might have been a great witch. I need to impress her when we finally meet. One, I don't sound like that, and two, I just saw a different side to the craft. It's not something to play with, Red said, walking to the pickup counter, grateful that their order was ready. They left the New Delhi kitchen for the chilly sidewalk. It was the day before New Year's Eve and winter had finally come to Los Angeles. The stunned TV meteorologist hadn't seemed to believe the forecast when he said they might have rain. She wasn't looking forward to it. Angelinos couldn't drive in a drizzle. After walking to the back of the strip mall, they entered the hallway containing a profitable massage therapist and the less profitable Quinn Investigations. The agency door was open and ready for walk-in clients. They specialized in the supernatural, but it seemed like the demons were hibernating after Christmas. She was cool with it. It gave them time to continue organizing the years of Lucas's poor filing. He was a better hunter than a secretary. Quinn Burns sat at the front desk by the wide windows to the parking lot. He used a finger on each hand to henpeck type on his keyboard, computer glasses drooping down his nose. The glow of the screen highlighted his pale features, seething over the screen. He pushed the device away with a huff and pulled off his glasses, fangs peeking from his lips. Typically, emotive as a rock, technology could rile him up more than demons. What did I say about computers? Vic asked, rolling past the couch and table for clients to go to Quinn. Wait for you. The vampire rubbed his brown eyes, bowing his spiky blonde hair, broad shoulders hunched. He had lived over 300 years, but insisted that this era was the most confusing. Red would sympathize more, but she was too hungry. She sat down on the couch, away from the others, to dig into her food. Despite what she said to Vic, she had been practicing with simple exercises to float feathers. She raised one a few inches at midnight and didn't wake until noon today. It was a good thing she worked nights, part of why she couldn't trust her magic. It was unreliable most of the time. When practicing, she ended up churning up her energy and unbalancing herself, pigging out on brownies with little to show for it. And what are we trying to do? Vic asked Quinn like a teacher addressing a kindergartner. Connect a video conference with Cora. She has a job for us. Quinn grumbled. It's telling me that I don't have a web camera. I do. Vic patted his shoulder. 
I know you do, dude. More on over. He started clicking the touchpad and typing quickly. Red brought over her chicken kebab, wrapped in foil, and munched behind the guys as they fussed over the laptop. The video conference app opened, and Cora Moon, Supreme Master Vampire of Los Angeles, appeared on the screen. She adjusted a headband covered in yellow crystals on her lush black afro absently, and scrolled through a cell phone. The logo for Moon Enterprises, the public face of her operations, was printed on her yoga top. Quinn's heavy brow puckered, and he frowned at Vic. How did you... I did that same exact thing. Oh, you're here, Cora said, putting down her phone. Her cheerful tone grew forced. You're all here. Red waved her kebab in a sheepish hello as Vic saluted the Supreme. Most master vampires made her want to run, but Cora had a soul and the philanthropic background to match. Still, after the trouble with the Black Veil, Red probably wasn't her favorite human right now. Thank goodness she was next to Vic. So, Cora, he asked, you do hot yoga. I've always wondered, can only hot people go? Everybody is beautiful, the Supreme declared lightly before her tone flattened. Quinn, I have other business, so I'll make it quick. I need you to check out a warehouse by the San Bernardino Airport. I've already emailed the address. You'll get a bonus on top of your usual retainer if this can be done tonight. I hope you still have those cop uniforms that I lent you. Fresh from the dry cleaner. What am I looking for? Quinn asked. Michel de Grammont had the warehouse under surveillance before he died, and I want to know why. Her lip curled. I'm still discovering the finer details of his betrayal. Red took a bite of chicken to avoid adding that Cora was still stamping out the last of his followers. The former public relations czar of the Supreme's empire, he had tentacles that spread over Los Angeles County and probably further. Cora continued, The owners are listed as the Bethesda Group, while the cargo seems to come from two overseas firms, Halionim LLC and Uriel and Sons Corp. Dallas Paper Companies and Subsidiaries. My researchers haven't found the source. Unless that building is owned by the video game company, those are pretty biblical for company names, Vic commented. Red raised her eyebrow, not understanding the references. They were roommates, but when he popped into church on Sundays, she slept in. Bethesda is where Jesus healed a guy. It was like the first pool party. Total rager, Vic explained with a shrug. Uriel is an angel's name. Somehow I don't think we're dealing with angels, Cora said shortly. Take pictures of the inside and send them back. The drive should take longer than the recon. It will be done, Quinn said. Cora pressed her hands together and nodded. Namaste. Red waited until the video chat had ended to say, Sounds pretty simple. Yeah, why isn't she having one of her minions do it, Vic asked. Quinn opened his email inbox on the screen, tapping on the latest message, then wrote the warehouse address down on a notepad. Cora Moon trusts the universe. She doesn't trust her people. Red started wrapping her kebab. I guess dinner's over. Finish your food, Quinn said. We'll need to wait 30 minutes, or it'll take an hour longer to get there. Vic wheeled himself over to the table with his takeover curry. Good old L.A. traffic. It's as predictable as the weather. Later in the front seat of the Millennium Falcon, dressed in a uniform that looked stolen from the LAPD, Red thought about his comment with wry amusement. Dark storm clouds rolled in from the Pacific as they took an off-ramp near the San Bernardino airport to check out the warehouse. She figured the weatherman felt validated now, but she wouldn't believe it until she felt a drop. It had rained more in Arizona. Quinn drove the black van into a dark warehouse district. His vampiric gaze picked up the block numbers and building details better than she did. Nighttime in Los Angeles was diffused from the city lights reflecting on the smoke, leaving an orange haze over the valley. The cast-off light helped Red's poor human vision. Vic perched in her wheelchair in the back, typing on his laptop, doing a hacker thing that she didn't quite understand, despite his metaphors about digging a tunnel. The warehouse was one of those smart buildings that might as well be controlled by an app. 
He was picking up where Cora's people had left off to ensure that the door would be unlocked and security off on arrival. The glow of his screen left a glare on windshield. Quinn parked on the curb across the street from the mysterious Bethesda Group's property. It was a beige building with windows on the second floor and a small front parking lot. Two teens, white boys in sagging pants and hoodies, were happily vandalizing it. The punks tossed rocks at a small awning light above the dark paned glass door, breaking it with hoots and fist bumps as darkness descended on them. They bolted when they noticed Red putting on a cop hat in the van. Shit, 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 Vic chanted as he typed and clicked on his laptop's touchpad. Oh, never mind, I'm brilliant, I just suppressed the security alarm. Red trusted his skills even if he never finished the computer science program at UCLA, but she still froze, waiting for police sirens or guards. They were promised the place was empty. The passenger side was closer to it, but with a broken light, she could only make out that it was slick and modern. It looked like a fresh construction compared to the other dingy warehouses covered with graffiti. The email from Cora said it was registered as a mixed-use building of offices and storage, but only cargo had been unloaded it in so far. Red hoped the intel was right, and they wouldn't wander across a person working late. Quinn leaned over the wooden hunter's kit between the front seats to point over her at the second level. Did you see that in the window? I think I saw a flashlight. Red hadn't, but she scanned the area. Did one of those kids get in? The Pacific winds picked up, breaking against the stout warehouses, blowing litter around. A nearby trash can toppled over, releasing a funky smell that somehow penetrated the closed van. Nothing else moved on the block. It was nearly nine at night on the day before New Year's Eve. The industrial area might as well be a ghost town. Hopefully, it wasn't ghosts. She had seen enough lately. Nose wrinkling from the smell, Quinn started to say. I don't the... The front is unlocked. Vic drew out the syllables as he tapped dramatically on his keyboard. Now. The double glass doors automatically separated to reveal a shadowy interior. Vic, you're a gentleman and scholar, Red said as she reached for the car handle. Intuition deep in her gut, told her to wait. A security alarm wailed from the Bethesda group building, echoing off the others, breaking the quiet. Heart leaping in her chest from shock, she glared at him. That wasn't me, I swear. Quinn shushed them, gaze locked on the front entrance. A cop bolted out of the building, taking a right and running around the back, darkness hiding their face. Quinn texted on his phone, annoyance breaking through his usual stoic expression. Cora said no cops. Probably sent another team, Vic grumbled to himself. Red kept her eyes on the property as the wind howled and the men debated among themselves. Sudden rain pelted the van like a meteorologist's revenge. The ambient lights of the City of Angels darkened in the downpour. We got two now. A taller cop, different from the one before, appeared from a small alley on the left exterior side. He stared at up the building, walking slowly without a care to the storm. Then the original officer re-emerged from the right side, hat brim low against the rain. Probably female, but maybe a small man, the cop was in the same state of confusion, trotting to her partner with glances up at the second floor. There was something familiar about them. Red had met a few other cops on Cora's take like Joe Chang or Aisha Calloway. She'd certainly been at enough crime scenes to start recognizing the ones with the bad luck to be assigned to the spooky cases. Where did she know them from? The smaller officer darted to the small awning over the front entrance for shelter. She slipped on the slick step, stumbling against the other officer's bored shoulder. He helped her up. The two officers look at each other and at the van. Faces in rainy shadows. They darted forward through the small parking lot. They're coming over, Red said to the guys, opening the passenger door without glancing at it. Bracing herself to pretend to be a cop for real ones, she hoped Quinn would do the talking. At least the rain had slowed to a drizzle. The officers were gone when she looked back. The block was empty. There wasn't a stray cat or another parked car in sight. Even the rain had stopped. 
The Bethesda building was still closed and silent. Had the cops ducked into an alley or another warehouse? Did they double back? Holy shit, where did they go? Red stuck her head out the door. You saw that, right? Quinn nodded. I looked away when Cora texted back, but I saw them running here. I can't see shit back here. Vic crossed his arms. You're the techie, Red said. Just do the computer stuff. Do you have access to their security cameras? Vic frowned. Weirdly enough, that's the only thing offline. Did Cora send cops? Red asked. Quinn shook his head. Maybe we have some phantom popo. I have my cross packed around here somewhere for an exorcism, Vic offered. In spite his handicap, or maybe because of it, he relished going into the field. He would have been the best for an exorcism since spirits hated vampires, and Red wasn't much of a believer. She wasn't convinced it was ghosts. Those usually gave her a distinct, eerie feeling. The cops looked corporeal. They were probably chasing after those teenagers. We're just here to take pictures, Quinn said. Do you see anything unusual? Or any sigils with your third eye red? She wanted to say that she just saw something unusual. Instead, she opened her spirit gaze. It was her most useful witch trick. Protection sigils were written in spiky calligraphy like neon graffiti on the glass doors of the Bethesda group building, invisible to regular humans. She recognized one that she had seen before on mystical safes for magical objects. It was to keep the energy inside the box. They scribbled some protections on it, but it seems like a passive spell. I can't feel anything from here. Red frowned at the realization. She couldn't help but feel paranormal energies due to her mage blood. It would have been noticeable before they parked. We'll want to bring some cold iron to see if they're cloaking the magic inside the place. Do you smell people in there, Quinn? No, I just smell trash. It's empty. I don't hear any heartbeats. The boss squinted at the warehouse, his voice unusually hesitant. We might as well go inside. Red sighed, patting the borrowed police utility belt on her waist. It wasn't her hunter's kit, but she had packed it with salt and powered cold iron anyway. I have something for the sigils. She stepped out of the van. The earlier wind had completely died, leaving the chilly air feeling heavy and still. She wished she could stay in the van, but Quinn couldn't be trusted with camera phones, even if he was a talented sketch artist. The vampire was all thumbs, not like Christoph Novak. She had debated internally on texting him about the mysterious Bethesda group since the unsold vampire dealt heavily with real estate. Now she wished she had. Watch the security system. Call if we need to run, Quinn said to Vic before leaving to join Red. <laughs> she squared her shoulders and they walked to the entrance. Blowing powdered cold iron on the sigils scribbled in the ether, she felt them wane but not disappear. Hardy buggers. She felt a tingle of energy seep out from behind the door. Neutral, it didn't make her skin crawl like a demon. Yet she didn't like how it brushed over her like a texture she couldn't describe. No auras glowed inside the glass doors to indicate a human or soupy. Something is emitting serious vibes in there. I don't think it will rip our faces off, but don't hold me to that. Quinn tried the door, but it had locked itself again. Red took care with the slippery front step to avoid the female cop's fate. After a call to Vic, they were inside the narrow front room. Blank white walls stretched to an open stairwell. A small built-in reception area partially broke up the space. The thick presence of the strange force distracted her from wondering where the officers went. It made the nearly empty room feel full. Red inspected the curved front desk, but the drawers and top were bare except for dust. There wasn't even a chair. A haze of ether and energy lingered like fog in the corners. She took a quick picture of the lobby with her phone, blinded by the flash for the moment. Quinn waved her over to the only interior door. It's open. He went inside first, shielding her smaller form in case of a surprise jump attack. The wind howled outside, but a hush lay over the dark windowless storage space. Documenting their patrol, she used her phone's camera light as a lantern, 
Containment sigils on the walls and doors cast a strange glow to her third eye. She shivered. Why so many spells to keep things in? Was this a warehouse or a prison? Less than a third full, the large room had wide spaces between the makeshift aisles. Cargo bins, boxes, and crates lined the walls and occupied the center. Some were open to reveal foreign handicrafts, woven baskets, pottery, and other knickknacks. They weren't new productions. These seemed fragile and old, packed with plenty of cushioning. A stone Olmec head, face carved into the rock, stared out from a crate bigger than her. Red walked quickly to keep up with Quinn's long legs, recording a video as they looped around the storeroom. She told herself that video was better than still pictures, but she really just wanted to get out of there quicker. She didn't know why. Usually she'd be curious about a mysterious warehouse of historical goodies. The artifacts were spectacular, even in the wan light of her phone. Were these high-value cultural items smuggled from their homelands? Nothing was out of ordinary for what seemed to be storage for international upscale imports. Yet, weirdly enough, she agreed with the dead asshole, Michel de Gramont. Someone should be keeping an eye on the place. The strange energy didn't grow as they explored. There were no temperature shifts like a spirit manifesting, and nothing had leapt out with claws. Yet. They returned to the lobby after inspecting the empty loading bay. Starting up the stairwell to the second level, Quinn seemed slower than usual, his scrutinizing gaze lingering on every shadow. It wasn't the shadows she was worried about. Power radiated from behind a closed door at the top of the stairs. It was stronger with every step. Spectral flotsam passed her third eye, bobbing like driftwood on invisible currents that were as fluid as rain, persistent as a hurricane, and limitless as the ocean. It wasn't an aura of a mage or activity from a spell. She'd never felt anything like it, yet paradoxically, it was familiar as if she were experiencing this phenomenon in a different quantity than usual. The difference between having a smear of jam on your toast and being dumped into a vat of it. Quinn's hand hovered over the doorknob as if he weren't sure if he should open it. He pushed it open, locking eyes with her. An unnecessary breath moved his chest. It was never comforting when the dead were nervous. Nothing jumped out behind him. Open completely, there were no boxes to break up the empty top floor. Sigils covered the unfinished walls. Faded, they didn't glow like the ones downstairs, eroded by the force they imprisoned. Outside street lamps streamed in from the windows, breaking up the shadows between the support pillars. Her phone was good as a flashlight as she aimed the camera lens to show on the record that there wasn't a single cubicle in sight. Whatever the city thought, this wasn't an office. The light on her device drifted over a marble white face. Red nearly dropped her phone, assuming it was a vampire until she realized it was stone. The statue, a bearded man in a cloak and Grecian tunic, was slightly larger than life-size. It peeked at her from behind a pillar, only yards from the stairwell as if the movers didn't want to move it any further, or couldn't bear to. Energy pulsed from it. She gave the statue space as she circled it a few times to record it from different angles and zoomed in on the details. There weren't any curses carved into it or painted sigils. To all three eyes, it looked like any other Greek statue. How did it radiate a force that she couldn't see? The alarm blared suddenly again, jamming at her eardrums far shriller inside of the building. Red jumped and twirled around. She hit stop on the video recording. Downstairs, Quinn ordered, rushing into the stairwell. She followed, jamming her phone back into her utility belt. Every step felt oddly sluggish and evitable. Her gut told her the lobby would be empty before it came into view. The glass doors of the front were open again, but the sirens died. Who was here? Did those cops or the teens come back? Hopefully, it wasn't the Bethesda group. Somehow, she doubted that they just found that statue laying around somewhere. Meet me behind the loading bay. Directing her outside, Quinn rushed into the storeroom. Had he seen something? Lowering her hat brim, Red ran out, automatic doors closing behind her. There were no cars in the front parking lot, only the black van across the street. She took a right and ran around the side of the building closest to the loading dock. Her ears were too muffled from the alarms to fully hear the wailing wind whipping her cheeks. 
Quinn opened a side door by the dock before shrugging in confusion. The back fence of the warehouse was flush against another building. There was no hopping over it unless you climbed over three stories. He sprinted to the left side of the building towards the front. She sighed. If he had seen something, it was faster than them. She was used to monsters outrunning her, but Quinn was another story. Rain soaked her suddenly, as if the clouds were wringing themselves out. She groaned. Twice in one night? That had to be an L.A. record. The weatherman would crow about it tomorrow. Red jogged back to the front entrance, glancing up at the second floor, trying not to think too hard about what was up there. She had the unsettling sensation that it might think back at her. She met Quinn by the front door, whispering before she reached him. His supernatural hearing would pick it up as good as a yell. Did you find someone? I heard a car park. Over the alarm, I couldn't tell if it was in front or back. There was only Vic out there, so I figured it must be in the loading bay. Mouth open and gaping like an idiot at the top level. She shook herself. Get a grip. It's raining. Running to the small awning for shelter, she slipped on the wet step and bumped into his big shoulder. Shit! Quinn grabbed her by the waist and steadied her. Damn, that's slippery, she muttered. She forgot that the real cop had fell here. In the face of such contained power, she had almost forgotten about them both. The hair stood up on the back of her neck. Where did they go? Quinn stared down at her. An unsettled realization skittered over his face. They gawked at Millennium Falcon across the street. It wasn't the wet uniform that made her shiver. Her own face stared back at them. It was her and Quinn talking behind the windshield, illuminated by the dash lights and Vic's laptop. The van door opened. Red and Quinn raced to the vehicle. Suddenly their doubles were gone, leaving only the open door behind. Hauling ass at vampire top speed, he reached the van first. How'd the door open? Vic asked, looking up from his computer. We're leaving, Quinn said, nearly pushing Red into the passenger seat. Leaping over the hood, he hustled to the driver's side door, almost too fast to see. The engine was on before she had fully closed the door. She grabbed a bundle of sage from the hunter's kit between the seats. Lighting it with trembling hands, she waved it around her and Quinn. The vampire leaned into the smoke, shaking his head like a wet dog, as he broke the speed limit out of the warehouse district. Growing louder with each word, Vic peppered them with questions. What happened? Are you okay? Did you see something? Were the cops in there? Red ignored him to climb into the back. She stripped off the top of her wet uniform down to her undershirt and rummaged through her get-go bag. The statue's energy lingered on her like secondhand smoke. She pulled on a sweater and discreetly changed into jeans out of his view. Taking a blanket with her to the front seat, she wrapped herself in it, still shivering. You guys are weirding me out now, Vic said. What was the statue, Quinn? Red asked. His expression hadn't moved much, but he looked more freaked out than she had ever seen him. Kronos. She glowered at the vampire when he didn't say more. The time god? For fuck's sake, we saw ourselves in the Millennium Falcon. I slipped on the same spot. Then the rain. You can't tell me that doesn't just make you go, hmm. A time anomaly. Ooh, those are rare. Vic gasped, eyes lighting up. Were you guys caught on a loop? How many times did you guys Groundhog's Day? One time, I think, she whispered. It was enough. Tell me what happened. We're only discussing this once. Don't interrupt, Quinn said, deathly serious as he dialed Cora's number. He explained how they arrived and how the cops appeared and then disappeared. Distracted by Vic and the smell of rotting garbage, he hadn't gotten an ID, visual, or species on them. Red handed her phone to Vic to upload the video for the Supreme. They had enough data on the mobile hotspot to send it now. She wanted it off her device. The instinct was strong and primal like hunger after doing magic. She added to Quinn's story by describing the sigils and what she sensed from the force she could feel, yet not see. Whatever that statue was, it was leaking power like a cracked nuclear reactor spewing toxic waste. Had the energy sunk into the building warping reality inside and around it? Or was it just a confusion spell? 
They both fumbled when it came to describing looking up to see themselves in the van. Red hoped that after all his years that Quinn had a better explanation of the phenomenon. After studying for the hunter's challenge, she was fresh on the lore, but she was still an intern. The Fae were said to enjoy tormenting humans by taking them to their realm, then returning them after a century had passed in the fairy realm, and a minute in the human world, or vice versa. Yet all the hunters swore that you'd know if you were kidnapped by Fay. She imagined it would be more dramatic than a patrol through a warehouse. The human realm had enough possible suspects. There were warlocks, alchemists, necromancers, and empaths, among other mages. Some could induce hallucinations or skew your perception. Mind and matter were one thing, but true time manipulation was supposed to be beyond the reach of any mortal or demon. Some might have seen her job as dealing with paranormal mysteries, but they were always something she could explain by known supernaturals. It was rare that she found something that was truly unexplainable. Cora listened to their story without objection or explanation, her tone as subdued as Quinn. She promised to take care of it. After ending the call, silence reigned in the van as they fled west on the San Bernardino freeway. Sleep eluded Red. She gave up at dawn and trooped to the living room with a blanket and a book. By the time Vic woke up, she had moved on to attempting origami. Her clammy hands fumbled to create a crane as a TV morning show droned on in front of her. You look like fried ass, he pronounced with a grunt, rolling from his room towards the kitchen attached to the living room. Didn't sleep? Shrugging, she accepted the observation. She had already seen the dark circles under her green eyes when she brushed her teeth. Upon reaching a kitchen counter, he did a double-take back at her. You didn't make coffee? Now, I'm concerned. How long have you been decaffeinated? I thought I'd fall asleep by now, but I gave up by the third hour of the Today Show. Maybe I could go bowling. I haven't been in a while. He puttered around to get the java going. I don't know if swinging a heavy ball is a good idea when you're sleep-deprived. It feels like a good day for hobbies until our shift starts. Maybe I can learn to knit. I can pop into the craft store for some yarn. I think your hobby is going to the craft store, he snorted, looking at the stack of origami paper. Trying to distract yourself, huh? Yeah. Quinn called earlier, said that Cora went herself before dawn, but the warehouse was cleaned out. Either way, she already wired payment to the agency. That's a coinky dink he said sardonically, and rolled over. I was doom-scrolling in bed, and I saw this. He showed his phone with an article on the screen. Breaking news, the warehouse has been upgraded from empty to on fire. Good, huh? Red shrugged, resisting the urge to crush her half-made paper crane. Where did that statue go? I don't like the idea of anyone having it. Vic cringed and smoothed back his sleep-tousled hair. That's a comforting notion. I'll make sure to tell Fat Crispin in London. This is something the Brotherhood would want to track. The weatherman appeared on the TV screen. If you were in San Bernardino, you were lucky enough to get a few minutes of rain last night. It was a single downpour, but we certainly need it. Red was too confused to keep listening to the forecast. It rained twice last night, first when we got to the building and later when we ran out. Vic raised an eyebrow. I only remember it happening once. Fingers chilling, Red dropped her origami. Do you think it's possible to affect time? Or was that just a spell to fuck with us? I've been working this job for a long time. He leaned back in his chair and steepled his fingers on his belly like a philosopher. Every time, I think something is impossible. The world proves me wrong. The Red Witch Chronicles continues in Witch Gone Viral. Hiya, Sammy Valentine here, author and matcha latte addict. If you like this short side story, sign up for my Fang Gang newsletter. You'll get access to more bonus reads. Sign up for my newsletter at sammyvalentine.com mailing list about the author. Sammy Valentine is an urban fantasy writer who grew up in the desert and now wanders in search of Wi-Fi and coffee. Formerly a mild-mannered librarian, she had a quarter-life crisis and shook everything up. 
She started working in an LGBT homeless center, shaved some of her head, and got really into tarot. After realizing that her goal in life was to get out of her small town, and she only made it 30 minutes up the highway, she filled a bag and left. That was two years and a dozen countries ago. Get access to a prequel novelette about Red meeting Basil for the first time, deleted scenes, epilogues, read about Red and Lucas's first date, and more. Go here to sign up. HTTP, H, Sama Valentine, dot com mailing list, UI.